The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Oh, it's you. What kind of a greeting is that? Oh, it's you. Well, Sam, I may be only your secretary and all that, but I do have feelings, you know. What have I done now? If you recall... Yes? You were supposed to take me to the Geary Theater last night. Yeah? And you never showed up. Well, Effie, I... Oh, I know. Mm? You'll make up some big story like you always do. Always an excuse. No, I'll try to tell you the truth. And then... The truth? I... It'll probably be a story about at least two or three people being killed. Yeah? How you had to be there to straighten the whole thing out. Well, as a matter of fact... And then uh... there'll be beautiful women with hair like carved smoke and mm. crimson slashes for mouths. Mm -hmm. You would leave that out. Now that you mention it, Effie. And you'll throw in shooting and getting knocked out and glass keying your way into houses and anything else you can think of. Effie. Well, if you think that I'll fall for that. Effie, will you please? What's your big fat story? You've already told everything about it, but the title. I might as well add that. My big fat story is called The Shot in the Dark Caper. <laughs> Transcribed for NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Effie? Yes, Mr. Spade? Now, Effie, don't be like this. I promise you tonight, right after this report, we'll go to the theater. And we'll have dinner, too. Any place you want. Sound good? You're the employer. The faster we do the report, the faster we get out. And I won't even take time out for a drink. So come on, let's go, shall we? Hmm? Oh, Sam. You see? I can't stay mad at you. <laughs> Date fill it in. Two managing editor, San Francisco Evening Gazette. City, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the shot in the dark caper. Or, stop the presses. Spade has his pants caught in them. Caught? Dear News Hawk. The next time you have a bright idea about a story, count me out. There's too much work for the money it pays, and the glory just doesn't exist. I don't mind being knocked on the head, shot at, lied to, double-crossed, and otherwise treated cruelly by circumstance, but to do it all in one night just so you can have a scoop and then be referred to in your columns as a Gazette staff member, well, my professional pride was severely injured. I am a detective, sir, and nobody staff member. Well, now that that's off my chest, here in journalistic prose is what happened starting yesterday afternoon. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Yes, he is. It's for you, Sam. I'll take it in here, Ed. Spade. Yes, it's Woodrow Wilson. Really? Well, I'm sorry. I have Teddy Roosevelt on the other phone. It might take some time. You better try me later. Bye. Spade. Huh? Somehow I thought you were above that sort of carny repartee. I am above nothing, sir, as long as it's ethical. Now, which Woodrow Wilson is this? I'm the new managing editor of the Evening Gazette. Well, welcome to town. What can I do for I you? I have a job you might like. An interesting job and interesting money. How interesting? If you find out what I want, you can almost name your own price. Can you get over here in three minutes? With any sort of a tailwind, I'll make it in two. A new track record. Take a seat, Spade. Hmm. Now, uh, what is this interesting job? First, let me say I don't know much about you personally, but you come well recommended. I've tried. Second, this is a confidential matter, and I want it to remain that way. Of course. I'm going to trust you as I would one of my own staff members. Hmm. The police aren't to find out about it until it's all over. And if any other newspaper gets it, you might as well leave town. Woody, old boy, the man doesn't live who can say I ever double-crossed him. For money or love or anything else. I or had love... to say it so we'd understand each oh. other. I'll take a look at this newest photo. Yes? One of our boys snapped it. What do you see? A street intersection. O'Farrell, I'd say. Two automobiles hit head on. An ambulance, a couple of people injured, a sordid crowd. We took that picture three days ago, Tuesday night, routine accident picture. Mm -hmm. But this morning when we were filing it, I looked at it again. And I noticed something startling. Look at it. It's a shot in the dark, but I smell a story. Well, maybe I have a cold, but uh, whatever it is escapes me. On the right side of the picture is an apartment house. Mm -hmm. Now count up six floors and look at the fourth window across to the left. Here, use this magnifying glass. Mm. Oh, what do you know? Somebody just fired off a gun. That's it. All you can see is a hand and a smoking gun. Mm. You can't even tell whether the hand's male or female. 
But somebody shot at something, probably a person, just a second before that picture was taken. You want me to find out why, huh? This calls for a detective, not a reporter. There hasn't been a single homicide, suicide, or gunshot wound reported in the city since that happened. Now, I want the story. Get it. Okay, Chief. Get ready to rip out page one. The apartment house was the Greystone. It was actually an apartment hotel and a little shabby. I entered an hour later with a suitcase and an out-of-town look. The nameplates on the mailboxes showed about five vacancies, including one on the sixth floor. I rang the manager's door buzzer. Good afternoon. I'd uh, like to rent an apartment if I could. Uh, come in, come in. Mm. Just uh, drop your suitcase any place. Mm? My name's Ed Berry. How are you? Your suitcase is leaking. Oh? We charge one price, one seventy-five per night. Well, I uh, I don't have that kind of cash with me or my checkbook. Uh, could I pay you tomorrow? Oh, sure thing. Your name? Mark Humboldt. Mark. Humboldt, uh, B-O-L-T? Yes, that's it. Where are you from, Mr. Humboldt? Uh, New York, boy, New York. 48 East 51st Street. Ah, uh, near Broadway. Mm-hmm. Next to kin? Huh? Any family, uh, relatives? No, no. Oh, you own a car? Look, I'm just running an apartment, not taking out life insurance. Well, you see, there's a state law here that requires us to get this sort of information. I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do. No car. Uh, a bank account? Corn Exchange Bank. You own any property? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, Albany, New York. Uh, just how much, would you say? Six feet in a cemetery. I expect to be buried there. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess that about takes care of it. Uh, anything on the sixth floor? Well, why the sixth, particularly? My lucky number. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Maybe later. Right now, we got nothing on the sixth. Come on, I'll show you around. <laughs> In a few minutes, I was ensconced in room 512. As he stood in the doorway, Ed Bering, the manager, scanned my luggage, my clothes, my ring and wristwatch, as if he were trying to estimate what he could get for me from a fence. After he went back to his apartment, I took a stroll up to the sixth floor. Woody Wilson and I figured the gun incident took place in apartment 608. So I counted back from the end of the corridor and found we were right. 608 was silent. I knocked, but no one answered. So I sprung the lock and went in. The place was absolutely empty. No furniture, no nothing. In fact, it was being completely remodeled. It's going to look swell when they finish, huh? Huh? I said it's going to look swell. Well, where did you come from? Oh, gee. I guess maybe I startled you, huh? A little. I was just coming down the hall, you know, taking some of these groceries in, and I saw you standing there. You're new here, huh? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Here, let me uh, carry some of those things. Oh, say thanks. <laughs> You know, you're the kind of man a girl should have around. Well, I've tried to convince several of them. Oh, who are you kidding? A big, <laughs> handsome guy like you wouldn't have any trouble getting a girl? Well... At least not if I was the girl. <laughs> <coughs> well, you know best. My place is down here. Shall we go? Well, why not? My name's Honey Kane. What's yours? Uh, Mark Humboldt. Gee, what a fascinating name. Oh, not half as fascinating as yours. Really? Mm. Say, isn't it wonderful how fate just throws two people together? The bags of groceries we were carrying had a layer of dust on them, and the bags looked as if they'd made 50 trips to the grocery store. No one had to hit me on the head, Sam Spade, detective. She was small in peroxide, and if you like them stupid, small in peroxide. She lived in apartment 620 with a roommate who was quite a bit different. Prettier, smarter, and quieter. Sandra, I want you to meet this very nice gentleman, Mr. Mark Humberg. Humboldt. Oh, sure, I remember the Mark part, but this is Sandra Lynn. Uh, how do you do, Miss Lynn? Hello. Yes, well, <clears throat> nice day. Great. Well, I... Just put the groceries down here, huh? Oh. There. Now, let's have some fun. Like fun, Mr. Humboldt? Wouldn't be without it. <laughs> You're priceless. Well, come on, let's start with a drink. How about you, Sandra? No, no, you kids have your fun. I'm going out for a walk. <sighs> Mr. Humboldt, you're supposed to be looking at me. Yeah. 
An hour later, under the pretext of going out for some snuff, I shook her off and left. The next half hour went to giving the apartment house a thorough casing. I looked at all the names on the mailboxes, and the only one that rang a bell was one Max Barstow, a former heavyweight who never got past club fighting. I inquired about him of charming Ed Berry, the manager. Uh, Max Barstow? Yeah, I tried his apartment. He isn't home. Yeah, well, you see, he won't be home for some time. You see, he took a vacation, went to visit his family in uh, Portland. Well, when did he leave? Uh, Last Tuesday night. I remember him saying, Ed, I won't be back for a while. Look after things, will you? Well, you have a good memory. Yeah. Hey, can you tell me something about those two girls in 620? Why? One of them made a pass at me. Well, mister, I feel this way. I rent apartments to responsible adults. What they do is their business. You won't get any trouble from me. Now, that isn't what I asked. I always like to be sure. Now, are they honest, hard-working girls? I don't know nothing about them, but uh, let me tell you something confidential, mister. Why look a gift horse in the mouth, hmm? <laughs> Well, I gumshoot around the apartment house some more, and one thing was sure. They were making a number of extensive alterations. For example, in the basement, there was a new cement floor. Said cement floor had been laid, I was told by the janitor, Wednesday morning, the morning after a gun was fired in 608, the same morning on which Max Barstow suddenly left to visit his parents. And about here in the plot, it was dramatically correct to wonder if Max might be sleeping under the furnace with a new cement overcoat covering him. I went back to my apartment for a couple of long ones and some thought. It was getting along about supper time when there was a feminine knock. I guessed it to be Miss Room Service herself, Honey Kane. But no. Better. Much better. May I come in? You may. Shall I uh, leave the door open? I'd rather you closed it. Anything to make you feel at home? Uh, Drink? No. Talk. Oh. What are you doing here, Sam? The name's Humboldt. Mark Humboldt. All right, play it any way you want. But I've seen you around. I know who you are. You move in today, and half hour later you find our apartment. Why? Your apartment found me. At least half of it did. The gift horse part. Uh, Maybe so, but I figure you helped a little somewhere. Mm Hmm. What are you trying to get on us? Nothing, nothing. I just moved in here for a place to live. With one suitcase and a bottle? Well, I'm an actor. Look, whatever it is, lay off, will you? I've had enough trouble in my life. Things are just starting to go right. Sandra, I don't know what's on your mind, but as far as I'm concerned, you're clean. Maybe I made a mistake. I'll try to make it up to you sometime. Well, maybe you can start right now. I think I'll open the door again. Now, just a question. Seen anything of Max Barstow lately? I knew it was something. I knew it. No, I haven't seen Max Barstow lately. He went somewhere to visit his family, and I'm telling you either leave me alone or something's going to happen to you, you won't lie. She stormed out looking lovely all the way, and I sat very quietly for a minute. It was the second time somebody said it. Max Barstow was visiting his family. And that was very interesting because, you see, Max Barstow didn't have any family. When he first started fighting, he was under the aegis of the St. John's Orphanage. So what was all this rehearsed account of his absence? I watched at the window to see if Sandra Lynn went anywhere, and she appeared on the street. I was out of the room and down the stairs, presto. Ten blocks later, she turned in at a brownstone on Polk Street, went in the first apartment on the first floor. Fifteen minutes later, she hurried out, and I went up to the apartment and knocked. The door opened cautiously. Yes, what is it you want? Is Mr. Uh, Fairchild in? Nobody here by that name. You've got wrong address. Now, just a minute. He used to live here. No more he does. Well, could you tell me where I could find him, Mr. Uh... Sigmund Polkis. Pol- I don't know. Try the minute. Sir. On the way out, I looked at the card on his door buzzer. It listed his apartment as belonging to a Mr. Rothschild. At the moment, there was nothing to be made out of it, so I went back to the Greystone. And when I got to my room, it was very obvious that I had been visited during my absence. Yeah? Oh, well, it's you. What happened to my suitcase? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Humble, but I didn't realize it before. You see, that apartment was already rented, so I guess you'll have to find one someplace else. Look, you have four other vacant ones in this apartment house. Give me one of those. Sorry, no vacancy. Well, then give me my suitcase. Uh, yeah, that's the one that leaks. Uh, just a minute, I'll bring it out, Mr. Humble. I'll go in and get it myself, Mr. Barry. I Barron. said stay out. I said I'll go in All and get right, it. right, you will. He swung at me, I blocked, and stepped into him. He gave way, and I followed in. And then as I moved into the apartment, someone stepped out from behind the door. I turned, but it was too late. I was sandbagged. And the face behind the arm that swung it looked an awful lot like that of Max Barstow. 
I remember asking myself as I went down, if Max Barstow wasn't shot in room 608, who was? You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. chimes mean good times on NBC. On Sunday, March 4th, that's one week from this Sunday, Theater Guild on the Air will present radio's most exciting dramatic event. It's a full hour and a half presentation of Shakespeare's immortal Hamlet. John Gielgud will portray Hamlet, Pamela Brown the Queen, and Dorothy McGuire will appear as Ophelia. The intrigue, beauty, and romance of Hamlet come to life Sunday, March 4th on Theater Guild on the Air. Now back to The Shot in the Dark Caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I wasn't out for long, but it was long enough to have been carried out of the apartment manager's place and dumped in an alley. I sat up and rubbed the back of my head and discovered the boys had a sense of humor. Pinned on my chest was a note that said, beat it. This time, when I went back, I had my gun handy to hand. Nobody was home at Mr. Baring's apartment, so for something to do, I looked in on Max Barstow's diggings, 413. I glass keyed in and turned on the lights. And a search revealed items, a rent receipt showing Max was paid up for two months and intended to stay put. But more interesting were two phony detective badges, a policeman's uniform, and a flash camera. Couple these with a dossier on a man named Sigmund Pulkus, and I knew just what Max had been doing since the fight game stopped paying his bills. It read... Sigmund Polkis, 60 years old, Minneapolis, just sold two restaurants for $175,000. Intends to retire and settle down in San Francisco. That's as far as I got when Honey poured herself on me again. Oh, Mr. Humboldt. Yeah. What are you doing in Mr. Barstow's apartment? Come in, come in. Thanks, you shouldn't be here. Mm. Mr. Barstow ever found out. Honey, honey, you can drop the act. You know who I am and I know who you are. You're part of the bait for one of the oldest rackets in the world. World? The Badger game. Who, me? You. All right, Sam. I didn't know who you were at first until Sandra told me. Now, you tell me, what are you doing in Max's room? A number of things. First of all, getting enough evidence on him to give him a free vacation on the state. Second, I wanted to see who would show up and why. Now, what's your story? I just dropped in to see if Max was here. Try again. Sam, if I tell you anything, will you leave me alone? If I can bear it. I came over to get some things from Max. You know Where's he he staying? Right across the street in the Arlington, 314. Mm -hmm. Ed Baring manages both apartment houses. Why doesn't Max stay here? Who are you working for, Sam? I'm just asking. A client. Not the police? No. Sam, I don't have a thing to do with the mark Max is working on now. Sigmund Polkus. Some old man. Did you hear any shooting here last Tuesday night in apartment 608? Oh, Sam, I didn't hear a thing. Not a single thing. All right, get whatever you came for. But remember this. You tell Max I was here and I'll tie you into something that'll get you to Hatchapi if it's the last thing I do. Oh, sure. I knew she'd be impressed with that type of threat because her kind of girl lives by playing tag with the law. They want to be it as seldom as possible. I finished the dossier on Pocus and thought a more business-like visit to the old man was in order. What, what is it? Oh, you. I want to talk with you, Mr. Pocus. Come in. I want to talk to you. Now. Now. Stand right where you are. He was pointing a gun in one shaking hand right at my chest. And as close as I could tell, it looked very much like the gun I'd seen in your picture, Wilson. And the hand that held it was the very same hand. I tried to think of something clever to say. At this stage of my life, it would be very easy to shoot you, mister. Look, I came here maybe to help save you a lot of trouble. Now, if you listen to me, I'll... I know why you came here, because I killed Max Barstow. I'll give you a choice. Will you take money or will I... Will I shoot you right here? I'd take the money, but you didn't kill Max Barstow. Don't tell me what I did when I know what I did. Sandra told me one of his gang... Members was looking for me. But she doesn't understand the power of money. 
How much will you take to leave us alone to our happiness? What is much faster to you now that he's dead? Look, I don't want any money. I just want it. I felt like a ghost. The gun was pointed directly at me, but nothing hit me. I was surprised, albeit gratified. The little man must have thought I was wearing a bulletproof vest. He didn't look surprised, though. He just folded. I disarmed him and pushed him down into a chair. I had to do it. I had to. I, I couldn't let you spoil the only bit of happiness I had left in my life. Mr. Pocus, you tried to shoot me, and I'm grateful. It told both of us something. To begin with, you can't kill anybody with blanks in your blanks. gun. Blanks? I don't know blanks. Where did you get the gun? I... I always have guns. Always? And you don't know the difference between real bullets and blanks? You got it from Sandra, and she loaded it, right? Maybe you should know, gangster. Look, I'm a private detective. Name of Sam Spade. Now, if you'll help me, I'll help you. When did Sandra give you this gun? Last Tuesday? Yes. Did you use it to shoot Barstow? Yes. Then he couldn't be dead, could he? This gun wouldn't kill a fly, and besides, I met Max Barstow tonight, I alive. I saw him fall to the floor, and... Blood came out of his coat with my own eyes. Mr. Polkus, you just came from Minneapolis with $175,000. You walked into a shakedown gang. They're after your money. That girl Sandra's just bait. Oh, don't speak about Sandra that way. Sure, she tried to shake me up for money, but only because that man, that Barstow maker, she was a slave. She couldn't get away from him. Why did she stage a phony murder with you killing Barstow? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm so confused. Tell me how it happened. Oh, Barstow posed as a policeman. He found me in Sandra's apartment. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to pay him $5,000, but Sandra told me she loved me, and Barstow was a racketeer. We were to meet in apartment 608 for to pay him. Mm -hmm. She gave me a gun to frighten him mm -hmm. with, but instead I... Killed. Nuts, 5,000. They knew how much money you had, and they wanted to get all of it away from you on a phony murder scare. Sandra doesn't want my money away from me. She loves me. Mr. Polkus, I'm sorry disillusionment should come to you so late in life. But... I say she loved me, and I can prove it. How? This morning, she became Mrs. Sigmund Polkus. <laughs> That made me sit down and think things through a little more carefully. She could have gotten his money, or most of it, without marrying him. Maybe she did love him. Or maybe they felt he was too dumb to pay off. Or maybe she married him so she could murder him. And maybe a dozen other things. His suitcases were packed, and he said that he and Sandra planned to leave town tonight. He'd been waiting for her when I came in, but she was already two hours late. I could think of only one place she could be. So I left poor Mr. Pultus and went to the Arlington. 314, the address Honey Kane had given me. And she was there. Oh, Sam. I'm glad you came. I was scared. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I'm scared. Now, now, honey, quiet down and tell me what you're scared about. In the bedroom. Max. He's dead. <laughs> A knife, John. When would you find him? Five minutes ago. I was with him before, and then I went out for some Chinese food when I came back. All right, all right. Who else was here tonight? I didn't see anybody, but... But what? He was awful mad at Sandra, said she was double-crossing him, and he wouldn't let her get away with it. I went back to Polkus's place. He was gone, but his bags were still there, so I figured he'd be back. I put out the lights and sat in a chair. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ask me what I'm doing here. Where's Polkus? Well, if he's smart, he's on a train back to Minneapolis. I... I'm going to look for him. And you're not going anywhere. Sit down. Oh, yes, I am. Oh, yes. I said you're not going anywhere unless it's to jail. What are you playing Mr. District Attorney for? Because you killed Max Barstow. Now tell me why. Oh, don't be a joker. Max Barstow's as live as you are. I'm not talking about the phony murder stage for the benefit of Polkus. Barstow was stabbed to death a half hour ago. He wasn't. He was. I saw him. Who? You. Sam, I didn't, I didn't. I saw him earlier today, but, but he was all right. You married Polkus to double-cross him, didn't you? You were going to skip town with him, Mark. Well, sure I was, so why would I kill Max? Because he knew what you were going to do, that's why. I tell you, I didn't. I couldn't kill anybody. Why did you... What did you have planned for Polkus? A shove over to the Grand Canyon? No, I... I love the old guy. Come on, we'll drop in at police headquarters. No, Sam. No. Sam. Nothing. I wouldn't take you with the U.S. men thrown in. Will you let me go if I tell you what happened? If I tell you who killed Barstow? Well, if you didn't do it, nobody could hold you. For murder, anyway. Baring. Ed Baring did it. We 
We planned the whole thing together. It was a freeze-out on Barstow. Somehow he found out it had to take care of him. I didn't have anything to do with it. I tried to tell him not to. Tried to tell him not to what? Uh, I've got a gun in my hand, Baring. So have I. Which one of us is going to shoot first? You wouldn't shoot. <laughs> But he did. Period. End of report. Sam! Is that all? Well, what do you want? An echo? No! But he shot you and you're all right. Mm -hmm. Were they blanks like the other guns? They were not. They were genuine steel jacketed bullets. But, uh, you didn't I... listen carefully enough, Effie. I figured he'd shoot right away. He did, once. Just as I jumped sideways and fired two shots back. Did you kill him? No, no. But he's down with a little case of lead poisoning, though, under police guard. You're wonderful. It's true. All right, go type it up. Off with you. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow, you're invited to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony under the direction of Bruno Walter. Featured soloist for tomorrow's performance is celebrated violinist Joseph Zigetti, who will be heard in Mozart's brilliant concerto for violin and orchestra. It's the very finest in musical listening. Every Saturday with the NBC Symphony. Here it is, Sam. But there's something I don't understand. To wit. Well, what happened to nice old Mr. Polkis? Mm. Why wasn't he in his apartment waiting for Sandy? Well, he did just what I thought he should have done. He walked down to the railroad depot and got on the first train for Minneapolis. Who knows? Maybe he's opened a new restaurant. Yes. And uh, what happened to Sandra? Well, she's being held as an accessory to murder, among other things. Well, if they were married... That's well... enough, Effie. That's enough. Do you want me to make everything so simple that everybody will be able to figure it out? No. But, uh... but you what? I get so confused sometimes. That's most of your charm, Effie. You know, if you were brisk and efficient and cold... We'd never have any fun, would we? I guess not, Sam. <laughs> we do have a good time at times, don't we? Yes, we do indeed. Like right now, coming. Oh, Sam. Fire in a man's veins. <laughs> Maddening, that's what. Don't say any more, Sam. I don't know what I might do. I'd love it, whatever it was. I'd better say good night, Sam. Good night, Sam. <laughs> good night, sweetheart. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Sam Spade was produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by John Michael Hayes. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Sam Spade lives a life of peril. Well, in these days, we all live in a time of peril. Each of us is contributing something to help meet the emergencies that we face as a nation. There is one definite thing that every one of us can do to help. February 28th is being celebrated as Red Cross Day. Supported by the people and schooled by years of experience in war and peace in times of disaster... The Red Cross has now been assigned unprecedented tasks in the interest of national security and world peace. You can help mobilize the forces of mercy for the protection and defense of your family, your community, and the nation through generous support of the 1951 Red Cross Fund campaign. Join the Magnificent Montague, then it's Duffy's Tavern on NBC. 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 The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Sam! I heard 
thought you were hobnobbing with a wealthy set of our city. If what I was doing is their idea of hobnobbing, F, I'm glad I'm in the lower income brackets. What do you mean? What happened? I will only reveal that, Effie, in the intimate secrecy of our office. Was it that bad? Worse, F. Emotions ran amok. Passions were strewn from Fisherman's Wharf to the peninsula. Oh. Hatreds festooned the very air. Oh. And... There was jealousy, too. Oh my. It was positively lurid, as they say. Well, do, you, do you think it's all right for me to, to hear it? Well, I'll expurgate it a little, F. I'll water it down to your strength. I'll use monosyllabic instead of polysyllabic words, and so on. Now, Sam, I want you to tell me everything you think I should hear. And then, just a little more. It's a deal, F. Prepare yourself for listening, and I will shortly make my entrance with a saga of society skullduggery. The lowdown on the uptown and all that. Now, if we need a name for it, why not call it the Vendetta Caper? Or the Revenge of Monte Christoph? <laughs> Transcribed for NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. You don't have to call, Sam. I'm right here. Uh, Let me take your coat. Well, Effie, isn't this sufficient of you? Now, be quiet and give me your coat. All right. All right, thank you. Now, I've oiled your chair so it won't squeak. Sit down. Well, you make me feel like an emotional invalid, but it's wonderful. And here. Oh, well, miracles never cease. A double. Well. It's eight-year-old stuff. I had Friskin's drugstore send it up. Applejack, it's called. Applejack. Well, what brought it on, F? Why this particular polishing of the Applejack? Well, uh... Come on, out with it. No, I, I just thought... Well, you've been working with the rich people, and maybe you were handsomely compensated. Mm -hmm. And, uh... My back salary? Uh, uh, you're not mad, Sam? Well, as it happens, I did make a few dollars, and uh, yours will be the first account settled. Oh, Sam! So, it wasn't me. It was the money all the time. No, Sam, no, I just... I accept your apology. To Lieutenant J.F. Randall, San Francisco Police Department, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the revenge of Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo? Is this a historical drama? Christoph. C R I S T O F F. Oh, wow. Monty. M O N T Y. And it's still a historical drama. Dear Lieutenant, Revenge is an old fashioned motive, but when you get it raw and distilled, as in the Gosden affair, it's new all over again. This was the slow burning, deliberate kind of passion that starts smoldering way back in the forgotten days and explodes among some people who never knew they were living over a keg of dynamite. It was yesterday morning that the distant sputtering of the fuse began to be heard by a man named Chandler Gosden. You know him, the hulking rich boy, the electrical appliance scion who took up professional boxing for a while. I think he was billed as Gold Plate Gosden, a society scrapper. And he was doing well, too, until a right cross by someone who needed the money more than he did sent him back to clipping coupons. Spade? Yeah? I'm Chandler Gosden. Well, I recognize you. What do guys like you charge? Well, it depends on the job. Investigation. Sixty dollars a day and uh, any unusual expenses. Cheap? Well. Do you guys have some kind of a code, huh? Code? You know, like doctors. Do you keep things in confidence? Well, most of us do, including me. Yeah, I don't suppose it'd make any big difference if it got out. I'm not afraid of him. I'd just as soon punch him in the mouth as look at him. Who? Monte Kristoff. Heard of him? No, no. Moved into the peninsula, my neighborhood. Bought the Major Dunhill place. Oh, oh yeah, I know the estate. Must have cost plenty to buy. 250000 I hear. Mm -hmm. But what's money these days? Everybody's got it. Yeah, isn't it awful? It's a tax scheme, I suppose. Ever since he moved into that ark of a house, he's been throwing parties. They're a cross between the last days of Pompeii and a Polish wedding. Hmm. He invites hundreds of guests, everybody who is anybody. Disgusting. But uh, it seems legal so far. He's been there four months throwing parties, inviting everybody in the phone book. Everybody but me. Well, maybe he just doesn't like you. What are you talking about? I'm one of the best-liked guys in the peninsula. Everybody likes me, little kids, cops, the guys at the country club... I never had an enemy in the world. Besides, I got Virginia. Oh, who's she? My wife. Oh. One of the sweetest little girls that ever came down the pike. Well, my apology. She was a bald one. Oh. The year I married her, she was the social catch of the year among the women. Really? Yeah. So was I among the men. Well. Well, look, I got to tell you some more. 
A month ago, one of my company warehouses burned down. Somebody slipped up and the fire insurance hadn't been renewed. I lost $350,000. Mm-hmm. Guess who had lunch with my insurance man a week before the fire? Monte Cristo. You got it. Next thing is, the rumor gets around that the Gosden Electrical Company is on the verge of bankruptcy. No, of course it isn't. Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. A gossip columnist reports that I'm going to close up shop and beat it to South America with what dough is left. Then when the stock prices start dropping, somebody suddenly buys them up so fast they disappear overnight. Some corporation I never heard of called the, the Dantes Corporation. I see. And then all my friends start getting unfriendly. Hmm. As soon as I show up, everybody stops talking. Act as if there's some big secret about me that I don't know. And they've all been to Monte Cristo's parties lately. That's right. The week after he arrived in town, all these things started happening. Now, what I want to find out is why. I don't even know the guy, but he's making a big change in my life. Well, it sounds like you're entitled to know. I don't know how far I can get. The best I can do is find out who he is, where he comes from, who his friends are, all those things. Okay, you're hired. Now, find out everything about this Monte Cristo. I've got to know what's going on. Mm. Hmm? I'm sorry, Chandler. I wasn't able to get here when you said. The traffic was absolutely unbelievable. Cars, cars everywhere. They must be giving cars away these days. Everybody has one. I think we should get a helicopter. Mr. Spade, my wife, Ginny. Well, how do you do, Mrs. Gosden? Chan, I hope you haven't lost your head and blabbed everything to him. I told you these sort of men weren't trustworthy. I beg your pardon, madam? Look, Ginny, I told him, and he's a good guy. Well, if you just want to go around giving your life secrets... Oh, shut up, will you? I'm the man of the house. Really? And I suppose I count for nothing? Oh, no, forget it. Spade, I'm depending on you. Don't let me down. You wouldn't think a millionaire would be hard to biograph, but I came up with very little information on Mr. Monte Christoph. He'd arrived in town four months ago, stayed ten days at the St. Mark Hotel, then bought his house. He had a bank deposit running into seven figures. He had no known business connections, just money. The register at the St. Mark said he came from Chicago, and an airline company verified that he'd been a passenger aboard one of their ships from the Windy City. This was as far as I'd delved when my place of business was entered by a man in powder blue livery. You, Spade? The same. Mr. Monte Christoph sent me to pick you up. I see. Up for where? For his mansion on a peninsula. Oh. He said he knew what a rough time you must be having at your present job and that he'd be glad to make the whole thing simple to you. Oh, you really said that? That's what he said. Well... But I don't know what it means exactly. Well, I don't know what it means exactly either, but uh, there's one good way to find out. Home, James. Uh, my name is Bertuccio, sir. Bertuccio? I see. How long have they been calling you that? Well, let me see. It's about... Oh, what do you mean? I mean, it's my name. All right, all right. We'll talk it over in the car. The car was long and blue and smooth. I'm as democratic as the next guy, and I'd just as soon have ridden up front with Bertuccio, but no, he wouldn't hear of it. I had to ride in a back seat with a window of bulletproof glass separating us. And thus we rode down to the peninsula. We glided down elm-shaded streets and finally through the gate of Monte Cristo's estate. The driveway was lined with spring green poplars. The mansion door was opened by a rear admiral, and I was ushered in. I wouldn't want to say that the living room was large, but I coughed once, and it was a full minute before the echo came back. A door opened somewhere, and a tanned, hard-bodied man walked in across the marble floor with an outstretched hand. It was tougher than whalebone. I appreciate you coming, Mr. Spade. Mr. Christoph. Did you have a drink? Champagne? Scotch? Irish? What? Oh, anything. Whatever you like. Good. I figured you for rye. It's already ordered. Rye it is. Cigar? No, thanks. The custom rolled Havana's, made expressly to my own taste. Oh, thanks anyway, but I have some beat-up cigarettes here, son. Oh, try mine. The king of England, I did him a favor once. He ships them over. Uh, how is George? Are you drink, Mr. Spade. Oh, thank you, Bertuccio. Now, you've been investigating me. Yes. And you haven't found out anything. How'd you know, Mr. Christo? There was nothing to find out. Well, you're red. I'll do you a service and save you time and money. Well, that's a handsome offer, I accept. I was born in Michigan to a prosperous lumber family. I went to Phillips Andover in Harvard. Well. Yeah. Mark's fair. I served with the Army in the recent war. Major, military police, wounded twice. Uh-huh. Parents died while I was in Italy. I inherited enormous lumber holdings, which I sold. Hence my bank account. I like San Francisco. 
game here. Settle down. Well, you're very kind, but I don't need all this information. I have more money than a man can spend in a lifetime. And by that, I don't mean to boast. It was an accident of birth. Yes. Yes. Now, Mr. Christoph, I'm only trying to find out. I know out what, what you're trying to find out. Chandler Gosden put you on my trail. Well, there's no need to deny it. And, uh, what would you take to get off my trail, Mr. Spade? Well? New car, a selection of fine liquor, a better job, cash? All rather enticing, but uh, I'm afraid you've misjudged me, sir. I only work for one client at a time. Is there anything wrong with switching your allegiance? Well, I'm afraid it wouldn't be cricket. Uh, Is that the way they say it at Andover? Very well. Then I'm afraid I've given you all the information I can about myself. Well, you've been very generous, but uh, just one other thing. How long did you live in Chicago? Chicago? Yes. I never lived there. But you flew here from Chicago. Oh, that. I was just there on business. Uh Uh-huh. Well, if you say so. Bertuccio is outside with a car. He'll drive you back to your office. And with that, he turned and left me. Outside, Bertuccio was waiting. Impassively, he ushered me into the limousine and started out. Only we didn't head for my office. Instead, we seemed to be leaving town. I banged on the glass between us, but Bertuccio didn't choose to answer When we stopped at a light, I tried the doors, but they were both mysteriously locked. I was a prisoner in a moving jail. I made desperate signs to passers-by and traffic policemen I knew, but they just smiled and waved back at me. It was all very jolly. So I sat back and waited. About 20 or 30 miles out of town, we pulled onto a lonesome road and stopped. Here we are. Well, just where are we and why? Now, don't blow your top. Kristoff told me to take you out here and to give you this. Oh? What's in the envelope? Money. Two grand, the big sack. Well, that's a lot of grands. Yeah, they're going to do a lot for you. You're going to take it and keep going north. 48 hours will be long enough just so you keep out of Frisco. Well, just so you know how I stand, I'm going back. You know, I was hoping you'd say that. Now I can do things my own. <laughs> He pulled out a long black sap and started wielding it. The first cut just grazed my head and smashed into my shoulder. I blocked his second blow and moved in for some close work. The third time he swung at me, his arm caught an overhead tree branch, and that was his undoing. He took four or five and then went down and out. I searched him, and his billfold revealed that he was Joseph Kowalski, late of Chicago, Illinois. The cards and addresses it contained left little doubt that Kowalski was in the rackets. I threw him in the car and drove back to town and police headquarters. He was awake by then, and I had to drag him into the hall. You want him locked up, Sam? What for? Assault and battery. Assault with a deadly weapon. Assault with intent to murder mayhem. Anything. You can't lock me up. I didn't do any of those things. Anyway, if I did do them, it was in San Martin County, not Frisco. Well, Sam, I don't know what I can do. He's got to do something in our jurisdiction. Sure, see? All right, he picked my pocket on the way into town. Here, Kowalski. What? See, look, he's got my wallet in his hand right now. Why, of all the brazen lawbreakers, you gonna let him get away with this? Walking right into headquarters with the evidence in his hand? Oh, wait a come minute. Come on, come on, Kowalski. We go pretty hard on pickpockets in this town. I'll be in time. I want a lawyer. Get me a telephone. He was dragged away, protesting. He got no sympathy from me. He started. Lieutenant Randall then teletyped Chicago to find out more about him. In about an hour, the report came back. I won't read his whole record, Sam, but he's paid for everything they say. He's clean. Huh? However, it does say he he was the bodyguard for a man named Barney Moffat. Mm. Says Moffat was a shady business operator. Picked up several times, but nothing hung on him. Mm-hmm. He left town about the same time Kowalski did. He's listed as undesirable, but he's not wanted. Oh. Thanks, Lieutenant. If a man named Barney Moffat had a hood named Joseph Kowalski as a bodyguard and they both disappeared from Chicago at the same time, the obvious conclusion was conclusively obvious. I drove the limousine back to Kristoff's estate. But as I parked the car, my headlights hit another car. There was someone getting into it, Mrs. Chandler Gosling. Who are you? What do you think you're doing? Remember me, Sam Spade? Oh, detective. Yes. What are you following me for? What were you doing in Kristoff's house? I thought he was a, wasn't was a friend of yours or your husband. Mr. Spade, get in, please. Let's talk. Okay, spill it. It's none of your business what I was doing in there. But whatever it was, I want you to forget you ever saw me. That'll be pretty hard to do. Would money help you? In this case, no. What do you care what happens to my life or Chan's or Kristoff's? Because your husband's paying me to worry. All right. But if I were you, I'd just forget that you ever met any of us. Because this mess we're in is so bad that nothing you or anybody else can do is going to get us out of trouble. 
With that, she burst out crying, and I couldn't get anything else out of her. So I let her go, and she drove off. I walked up to Christoph's house, knocked on the door, and a servant opened it. Took a couple of steps inside when six pairs of arms grabbed me. Some of them had fists on them. The struggle was just getting lively when Christoph appeared. All right, let him go, let him go. Hey, leave me. Hell, I don't appreciate this kind of treatment, Christoph. You weren't it, Sved. All right, men, take a walk. Now, what's it all about? It was my orders if you ever showed up here again. Why'd you soften? I just heard about Kowalski. You managed that very well. I admire resourcefulness. How would you like to work for me? No, thanks, Moffat. Moffat? Barney Moffat, late of Chicago and the Rackets. So you know, huh? Well, I wasn't sure until just now, but you've cleared up the doubt. How much do you know? Very little. Just that you were a shady operator, but nobody's looking for you or anything. Sved, I did a lot of things. Several years at tightrope walking with the law. But I never did anything they could jail me for. I have an idea you're considering doing something in the near future. What makes you say that? Well, it's a vendetta, isn't it? Monte Christoph and Bertuccio the Stewart and the Dentist Corporation. You couldn't resist the drama, could you? All from Dumas' novel. But why? Why do you want to play the con of Monte Cristo? What did Gosden do to you to merit all this revenge? Tomorrow. It'll be over tomorrow. And with that, he clutched at his heart and fell forward at my feet. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. If you've been searching for mystery on Saturday night, put away your magnifying glass and follow these clues. Dial this NBC station tomorrow evening and listen for the chimes, and then you'll be off on a perilous trip with The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall. And if you've been searching for music, too, on Saturday, then Eileen Wilson is your dish as she stars in your hit parade with Snooky Lanson and Raymond Scott's orchestra. Now back to the Vendetta Caper or the Revenge of Monte Christoph. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I bent over and listened to his heart. It was okay. Monte Christoph had just keeled over, apparently, from a crescendo of emotion. He blacked out. I didn't want to be held up by his henchmen, so I left the room and walked out of the house without calling anybody. I walked down the road, and good luck, there was an empty cab cruising along. At Chandler Gosden's, I found him pacing the living room in a state of physical and mental disorder. I told him what I knew. Vendetta? Why? I never heard of him. I never did anything to the man. Why would your wife go and see him? I don't know. Why don't you ask her? Because she hasn't been home all day, and here it is, one o'clock in the morning, she still isn't in. Tell me, is there something special happening tomorrow? Christoph seemed to think that everything would be settled tomorrow. It's our annual corporation election, just a matter of form. I'm elected president. A few other people voted into office. Always the same people. Well, then he must plan to swing the election his way. Maybe put you in office. Oh, he's got a fat chance of that. I don't care how much stock he buys. Ginny owns 10%. I own 41%. That's 51%. If he bought 49% in the open market, that still wouldn't be enough. We could still outvote him. You're sure you've got the stock in your position? Sure. I saw it last week when I was down in the vault looking for my birth certificate. Stupid me. Forgot I don't have a birth certificate. Huh? No, that must be Edson, my lawyer. Called and said he had something on his mind. Chandler. Chandler, I have bad news for you. It can wait. No, no, it can't. This is Sam Spade, Ralph Edson. How do you do? Sir Spade. Now, Chan, listen to me. All right, what's biting you? Just this. We're liable to lose that election tomorrow. What? What are you talking about? We can't. I just found out that Monte Cristo has 59% of the voting stock in Gosden Electric. 15? He can't have it. Oh, look, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If my wife sold her stock, he could have 59, couldn't he? He could. Spade. Hmm? Are you positive you saw her coming out of Christoph's house? I'm afraid I did. I'm going to find her. I'm going to find her. And if she sold any of her stock to Christoph, I'll kill her. I tried to dissuade him, but he brushed me and the lawyer aside and ran out of the house. I called the police and told them to try and find Virginia Gosden before her husband did. Then I went looking myself. The first place I tried was Monte Christoph's mansion. There were lights on, so I entered, gun in hand. 
I didn't have any time to dicker with servants and bodyguards. And Kristoff appeared in a matter of seconds. All right, Spade, what is it you want now? Virginia Gossin. She hasn't been here since the last time you saw her. You know where she is? I haven't any idea. Well, if you know, tell me. Her husband's looking for her with homicide in his eyes. I can't say I'm sorry. Well, that's a nice sentiment. She sold you her stock in the Gossin Company, didn't she? Since you seem to know about it, yes. Why? Is she in love with you? I think maybe she is. And you're in love with her? She's a stupid, empty-headed nothing. I can't stand the sight of her. I hate her. I... Now hold it now. You'll knock yourself out again. Yes. Yes. Come over here. Take a good look at that. No, it's a pillow. An ordinary pillow. So? You notice how dirty it is? Yeah. Notice that it isn't even stuffed with feathers? They were too good. It's stuffed with dirty cotton rags. Well? My father's head was lying on that pillow when he died. I've kept it ever since as a reminder of who killed him. Who did? A man named Elwood Gosden. A man who cheated and lied and stole everything he had in his life. Chandler's father, huh? Yes. My father and Elwood Gosden had a hardware store once. My father invented an electric iron. Ever heard of the Gosden iron? Yeah. It should have been the Moffat iron. Elwood Gosden stole the plans from my father, registered them first, and then drove my father out of business. He made a fortune out of it, and then went into other electrical appliances. Well, things are beginning to gel now. My father became a peddler and died poor and broke and ill. My mother died 20 years before she should have from overwork. While the Gosdens grew fat and respected on the Moffat brains. So you started your vendetta, huh? I started it the day my father died. I set out to make one thing in this world, money. And I made it in handfuls. You can look me up. Barney Moffat, Chicago. Gambling, black markets, gun running, slave trading, anything and everything that had a big profit in it. And then I set out for San Francisco... To break that Creighton son of Elwood's and his whole family. And on the way, you lost a guy named Barney Moffat. What difference? Huh. Look, you've got money now and everything you need. Why go on with it? I don't care anything about money. I only want to use it against them. Do you know why I had all those parties? To buy stock from people. Yes. Huh. Stock in the Gosden Company. I paid twice, three times what the shares were worth. But right now, I own 59% of the Gosden Enterprises. And tomorrow morning, when the two of us meet at the stockholders' meeting, I'm going to vote him out of office and take over the company. And then, I'm going to drive it right into bankruptcy. And you got Mrs. Gosden's stock by making her fall in love with you. I had to. Don't let's talk about it anymore. About Chandler Gosden. He's a man with a very short and violent temper. He might come gunning for you. That's just what I hope he does. Ask the man at the door to show you out. I spent most of the night trying to find Virginia Gosden with no luck. Chandler didn't return to his house, so I didn't know what he was up to. It was early the following day when I got my first report. Lieutenant Randall called me down to police headquarters. We found her, Spade. Dead or alive? Oh, about halfway in between. She was shot in the chest at close range. Hmm. Gun right up against her. But she's still living. And what are her chances? Fair. Where'd you find her? In a walk-up apartment on Polk Street. It was registered to her. Looked like a love nest, a place where she met a boyfriend or something. No weapon. I see. I figure murder attempt, her husband. We have a pickup on him right now, but so far he's vanished. Shame, fine old San Francisco family. <laughs> what do you know, Sam? Well, give me a free hand for a couple of hours, will you? Maybe I can do something for this fine old San Francisco family. <laughs> I had no more idea than the police where Chandler Gosden was at the moment, but I had a good idea where he might be later in the morning. I put a call into Ralph Edson, his lawyer. A stockholders meeting of the Gosden Company was to be held at 11 o'clock at their executive offices. Edson got me in, and at five minutes to 11, Monte Kristoff walked in. There were three of us. None of us spoke. We just sat around a long, polished table, alternately watching the clock and the door. At 11.3, the door opened. Chandler Gosden stood there, rumpled, red-eyed, vicious. He had a gun. The first man who moves is going to get a bullet right in the face. Chandler, for heaven's sake. Shut up. I... Is that the gun you tried to kill your wife with? It's the gun, but I didn't try to kill her. She did it herself because he drove her to it. Me? Yeah, you, Christoph. You were meeting her in an apartment. Don't think I've been dumb. Put the gun away and let's get on to business. Are you kidding? I got the same gun she used on herself, and I'm going to use it on you. Well, stop talking. You can get it over with. 
You act as if you want me to do it. All right. Edson, Spade, clear out of here. Gazin, use your head. I said get out of here. Now go on. Okay, but don't take your eye off him. He's got a gun in his pocket. Don't worry, I won't. You were working for him. Working for him all along. Everybody was. No, now listen to me. He wanted you to kill him. He doesn't care about himself. He just wanted you to be put away for murder. Spade, this is our affair, not yours. Now look, both of you shut up and listen. This is a tough thing to try to settle something that's been boiling up in you, Moffat, ever since you can remember. You spent all of your grown-up life trying to get back at the wrong man. It appealed to some ironical sense of yours to carry out the Monte Cristo revenge story. Now, let me ask you this. You remember all about Monte Cristo and how he ruined the people who had ruined his life and how his father died heartbroken. But do you remember the end of that book? Go on. He found that he couldn't bring himself to revenge the wrongdoings of families on their innocent children. That reads good in a book, but I don't feel that way. Well, maybe you will when you hear this. What? This man right here that you've spent 20 years getting ready to ruin is not even a Gosden. Huh? What? He's an adopted son. Uh, Mr. Spade, Elwood Gosden I, adopted I... him from an Oakland orphanage on October 11th, 1907. I got the records to prove it this morning. I don't believe it. I would have known. Mr. Edson, you've always been the family lawyer. Isn't this true? It was a long chance that Edson would play along with it. But to bring it off, it needed the final clincher. Lawyer Edson looked at me, then looked at Chandler Gosden. He gulped her. And licked his lips. It's true. It's true, Chandler. Adopted? Uh, your, your father never wanted you to know. Chandler didn't move. He just stood there stunned. But Barney Moffat sank down into a chair and buried his head in his hands. Edson and I looked at each other and waited. And finally, Christoph looked up and spoke. Start the meeting. Mr. Edson? Uh, um... I hereby declare the annual stockholders' meeting of the Gosden Company open. <clears throat> uh, uh, Mr. Gosden? I don't care what happens now. I bow to the majority stockholder. Oh. Uh, Mr. Christopher... I beg your pardon, Mr. Moffitt? As the majority stockholder, I vote that the chairmanship of the Gosden Electrical Corporation remain as it has for the past 20 years... With Chandler Gosden. Period. End of report. Oh, Sam, you were magnificent. It was rather a stirring scene, wasn't it? I was good. But it was superb. It really was. Mm -hmm. Did he sign over the stock and everything? Oh, he did indeed. Oh, Sam. Hmm? Do you think the world will ever get to a time when everybody has all he wants... And instead of trying to get more, everybody spends his time just, just trying to enjoy life. Well, you know best, Effie. Do you really believe that, Sam? Well, you've got to believe something. It's better than nothing. I guess. I have a theory, too, Sam. Well, spout it out. Well, if everybody in the world picks somebody else to be nice to, there'll never be any more trouble anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you figure that? Well, before you can be nice to somebody, you have to think nice thoughts. Mm -hmm. See? And once you start thinking nice thoughts, well, you can see how silly the bad ones are. Effie, come here. Huh. You know, I might just put you up as a candidate for a chair of philosophy at Columbia. Oh, Sam. Mm. I know who you picked out to be nice to. Me. True. And I picked you. Mm. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Sam Spade was produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn, Lorene Tuttle as Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by John Michael Hayes. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Tomorrow, Dennis Day and Judy Canova entertain you on NBC.
This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend at Master Detective Sherlock Holmes. Well, this is it, New Year's Eve. And I wish you could be here with us this evening so we could toast each other with a glass of Petri California Port. As you know, Port wine has long been a favorite wine for celebrating a happy occasion. That's because Port is a wine rich in tradition. And you couldn't ask for a more delicious Port than Petri Port. Petri Port is a deep, glowing red color. Beautiful to look at and wonderful to taste. With a hearty, full flavor that's right from the heart of the grape. And when you serve Petri Port to your friends tonight, or, or any time, remember you can serve it proudly, because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wine. And now I'm sure Dr. Watson's waiting for us, so let's drop in and see. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Drop your usual chair. Thank you. Uh, that's it. Well, did you enjoy the Christmas holidays? <laughs> well, I've, I've had a whale of a time, thank you, but I don't think I can face a turkey or a mince pie for at least another year. <laughs> How about you, Doctor? Oh, I had a very pleasant week, too, my boy. Parties, visitors, and a flattering number of Christmas messages to be answered. Oh, say, you got a new pipe. Is that a Christmas present? Yes, new pipe, new tobacco pouch, and a pound of my favorite tobacco. All of them sent to me from London by an old client and a friend of mine, Sir Ian Dunbar. An old client, huh? Well, do you mean he was one of your patients, or was he someone that you and the great Sherlock Holmes helped? The latter, Mr. Bartell. As a matter of fact, it was receiving this gift that reminded me of the story I've decided to tell you tonight. A story in which Sir Ian Dunbar played a prominent part. And how did it begin? The day before New Year's Eve in 1899, Sherlock Holmes and I sat in opposite corners of a first-class railway carriage. So he sped towards Edinburgh in the Flying Scotsman. What took you and Sherlock Holmes up there, Doctor? It started off as a holiday visit, Mr. Bartell. My old friend Sir Walter Dunbar had asked Holmes and me to spend a few days with him at Dunbar Castle, about 20 miles outside Edinburgh. After we left King's Cross Station, Holmes, his sharp, eager face framed in his deer stocking cap, dipped into the bundle of fresh papers which he'd brought with him. We left Bedford far behind us before he thrust the last one of them under the seat, leaned across, and offered me his cigar. Care for a cigar, Watson? No, no, thanks, awful. I'll, I'll stick to my pipe. The flying Scotsman's living up to its name. They're going splendidly. Our present rate is 53 and a half miles an hour. Oh, I haven't noticed the quarter mile post. Nor have I, but the telegraph posts on this line are 60 yards apart. With the aid of a watch, the calculation is a simple one. Watson, my dear fellow, we have several hours ahead of us. Now tell me more about Sir Walter Dunbar. I have a feeling that he's in some kind of trouble, but you haven't wanted to talk about it. Well, it's not exactly trouble, Holmes, but there's a strange problem that confronts the Dunbars, a problem that'll be settled at midnight tomorrow. Oh, indeed. Night of New Year's Eve, eh? Yes, exactly, but to, to really appreciate the story, I have to begin by telling you of the death of old Sir Thomas Dunbar. The father of the present baronet, I suppose. Yes, he was severely wounded at Waterloo, though he managed to last out long enough to get back to Dunbar Castle. The story goes that as he lay there on his deathbed, he told his wife of his plans for their unborn child. Uh, dinner grave, lass. I'll fetch the baronet's here home from Waterloo. What if I fetch the mortal wound as well? Oh, hush, lass. I'm not afraid to die. All that niggles me is that I shall never see the child you bear. Is Sir Wattle Scott now coming yet? Eh, uh, can he visit the deathbed of his old friend? Uh, who's there? Is that you, Sandy Murdoch? Aye, right, Thomas. It's me. Uh, I'm leaving an unborn son behind me when I die. Now, I don't trust women or children or banks for that matter. Put the best part of my wealth and gold in the big iron box you'll find under the bed. The money's there. 
I'm something else for a rainy day. You have to keep that box in trust for me, Sandy. You can turn it over to my boy on the New Year's Eve before his 21st birthday. And he'll be a man and wise enough to know how to use it. You understand, Sandy? All right, Thomas. But supposing your bairn's a girl. A girl? I tell you, it'll be a boy. And we'll name him Walter after my good friend, Sir Walter Scott. Very interesting story, Watson. And that child, of course, is the gentleman we are going to see now, Sir Walter Dunbar. Exactly. And the first baronet was a friend of Sir Walter Scott while his son composed of your acquaintance. Why, it's a, it's a family singularly rich in literary friendships. That's not very funny, Holmes. Uh, to continue, I suppose you can guess what happened. Sir Thomas carefully drew up a document to specify. The New Year's Eve before the baronet's 21st birthday. And the poor child was born on February 29th. <laughs> It was a leap year. Oh, so poor Sir Walter is still waiting for his iron box full of gold. Yes, he'll be 84 next year, and yet legally, with only one birthday every four years in the eyes of the law, he'll at last be 21. A most amusing situation, <laughs> though I'm afraid Sir Walter finds it far from entertaining. Hmm? The lawyers must have been extremely scrupulous in abiding by the letter of the document. Yes, old Sandy Murdoch is dead now, of course. But he too is a great-grandson, William Murdoch, who still handles the Dunbar estate. He'll be at the castle tonight to formally hand over the iron box. I'm delighted you accepted the holiday invitation of Sir Walter. My dear fellow, I've needed a rest, but uh, I've always loathed too strict a one. This situation may pose a nice little problem for me. Problem? Yes, I'm reasonably certain that the aged Sir Walter Dunbar will not get his iron box full of gold on this New Year's Eve either. But we shall see, old fellow. We shall see. <laughs> Dr. Watson, I'm glad to see you and Mr. Holmes here at the castle. Thank you, my boy. Holmes, this is Ian Dunbar, Sir Walter's grandson. How do you do, Mr. Dunbar? I'm very proud to meet you, Mr. Holmes. I've heard a lot about you. A grandfather will be down in a few moments. Let's go into the library, shall we? Well, I imagine Sir Walter's quite excited about tonight's ceremony, isn't he? <laughs> Wouldn't you be? If you'd waited 63 years too long for an inheritance. <laughs> Thank the Lord I had the foresight to be born on the prosaic date of August the 21st. <laughs> In the event of your grandfather's death, you would be the next baronet, I take it. Yes, Mr. Holmes. You see, my father was killed two months ago at Mafeking. Yes, yes, I read about it in the papers, my boy. I'm, I'm very sorry. Thank you, Doctor. The opening of the box isn't going to be the only ceremony at midnight. Dorothy and I are announcing our engagement. Uh, Dorothy? Uh, Dorothy Small. She and her father are staying here, too. My congratulations. Yes, yes, indeed, Ian. Indeed, mine, too. <laughs> Thank you. It's It's been quite a battle with her father, though. He's a businessman and isn't impressed with titles when they aren't accompanied by a suitable income. But when we told him about the inheritance, he relented and gave his consent. Ah, here's Dorothy now. Dorothy, darling, I want you to meet two friends of mine, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Now, how do you do, Miss Moore? Uh, how are you, my dear? From what this young man's been telling us, I, I gather that congratulations are in order. Thank you. <laughs> I finally persuaded Father that Ian would make a worthy son-in-law. For a while, I was afraid we'd have to elope to Gretna Green. Live in a cottage on bread and cheese and love and brave the parental wrath. Just as they do in the storybook. Oh, Sir Walter, there you are. Uh, Watson, my dear boy. Uh, how are you? And this must be your friend Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, Sir Walter? <laughs> Vera well for a young nipper who'll be 21 at midnight. <laughs> oh. Uh, gentlemen, may I introduce Mr. Herbert Small? How do you do, do, sir? I believe that we have to congratulate you on the engagement of your daughter. Hmm. That was supposed to remain a secret until midnight. Mm -hmm. The Dunbar box was finally open. Oh, didn't oh, be grouchy, oh. Herbert. The children are in law, and I'm going to settle money on Ian. And it's New Year's Eve. Let's enter into the spirit of the occasion. Bring out the glasses, Ian. I've had some bottles of my special pride put out. Oh, it's the finest <laughs> port in Scotland. The cream of Dunbar. Uh, my father laid the first bottle down the year before I was born. And a drink of the brew will surely warm the cockles of your heart. Well, my mouth's watering already, Sir Walter. <laughs> when is this uh, lawyer fellow, young Murdoch, getting here? Oh, any moment, Herbert. As soon as he arrives, we'll have dinner, and then we'll be ready for the evening ceremony. He's bringing the famous iron box with him, Sir Walter? If he doesn't, they won't get any dinner, Holmes. Ian, pass the glasses around, my boy. Ah, 
There you are, Murdoch. Good evening, Sir Walter. Oh, you've got the box we are see. Now the party's complete. Oh, let me introduce you. Miss Small, her father, Mr. Small, my grandson, Ian, you know. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? I'm sorry I'm late, Sir Walter. My train was delayed. Oh, that's all right, Murdoch. You're here, and you brought the box. That's all that matters. Uh, Ian, give our young lawyer a drink. Here, I'll help you pour it. I nice. must say that this is rather exciting, Holmes. The famous iron box with its inheritance of gold. Yes, and from the size of the box, at a rough guess, I should estimate its cubic content in gold at around 5,000 pounds. Not a vast sum, perhaps, to a businessman like Mr. Small, but a windfall to an impecunious Scottish baronet. Yes, I suppose it is. A strong young man, Mr. Murdoch. How do you mean strong, Holmes? A box that size, full of golden sovereigns, would weigh a considerable amount. And yet the lawyer carried it single-handed. I know that we're all assembled. I'm going to propose a toast. Though it's still some hours off yet, let's drink to the new year. It means a lot to some of us. To 1900! 1900! We should toast more than just 1900, Sir Walter. We should drink to the new century that's about to begin. Good idea, Dorothy. Oh, I'm afraid that wouldn't be quite appropriate, Miss Small. To be accurate, the 20th century won't begin until January the 1st, 1901, and not 1900. Of course. That's it. Dorothy, I'm afraid your wedding can't take place for some time yet. Father, what are you talking about? I read an article in The Guardian the other day that said just the same thing as you, Dr. Watson. And what's more, it said something even more important. It said that 1900 is not a leap year. Oh, rubbish. Leap year comes every four years. There was one in 1896, then obviously 1900 is one. I think Mr. Small may be right. What do you say, Mr. Holmes? Do you know? Well, I hope no one would bring up this point, but uh, it's the little problem I referred to on the train, my dear Watson. Yes, Holmes, for heaven's sake, answer. Is 1900 a leap year or no? I'm afraid it's not, Sir Walter. No? Because of a slight imbalance that would otherwise be produced in the calendar. Of the even century years, only those divisible by 400 are leap years. In other words... 1600 was a leap year, the year 2000 will be a leap year, but uh, 1800 and 1900 are not leap years. Then you have no birthday next year, Sir Walter, and I'm afraid I can't open the box tonight. And the Dunbars won't get their inheritance. And you, my dear, don't marry for a few more years. I won't allow you to marry a pauper. Mr. Holmes, are you sure of your facts? I'm very much afraid that I am, young man. Oh, this is terrible. I can't stand any more. No, 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 don't take it too bad, Sir Walter. Here, here, sir. Here, drink this. Oh. Uh, that's it, after all. You only have to wait another four years. Another four years? At my age, young man, at my age. Oh, no. I shall never live that long. Hey, what is it, Angus? Dinner is prepared, Sir Walter. You can serve it as soon as you're ready, sir. <laughs> Walter's gone to his room, the young lovers are nearly in tears, and Small and the lawyer Murdoch seem to be positively gloating. Yes, a most depressing atmosphere in which to welcome the new year, but let us at least make the best of it. I think I'll go and have a talk with Sir Walter, and you, my dear chap, why not try and cheer up the young folks? Mm. Some of your experiences in India may make them their minds off the trouble. Yes, quite an idea. I'll join you in the library. Call me if you, if you want me home. Ah... There you are, my dears. Hello, Dr. Watson. All alone in front of the fire, eh? <laughs> I'm afraid we're not in very good spirits. Sir. Oh, nevertheless, I'll sit down here and join you, if you don't mind. Misery loves company, you know. <laughs> so, so very kind, Doctor. Oh, not at all. I was just trying to persuade Ian to elope with me. But he's being most ungallant. He won't even consider it. How can I, darling? I've got under 200 pounds a year in my own right. How could we live on that? I was counting on the money the grandfather was going to give us to get me started. Now, 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 Miss Small, a little earlier, you talked of brick to green and bread and cheese and <laughs> love in a cottage. Yes, <laughs> there's a lot to be said for it, you know. Well, to be said for it, yes, Doctor. But have you ever tried it? Not literally, my boy, but uh, I may tell you that when Mary, my wife, and I were first married, I had very little money. In fact, my income was just about the sum that you mentioned. And uh, we were very happy. Ah, but you have a profession, Doctor. Look at me. I've been trained for nothing except to be lad of Dunbar Castle. I can't support a wife on tradition. But you're young, Ian. You can get some kind of position. I'm sure you yes, can. Yes, of course, of course. As a matter of fact, I think that... Holmes, what is it? What's wrong? The devil's work afoot, Watson. 
Come with me, old fellow. And you, Mr. Dunbar. Mr. Holmes, what's happened? It's Sir Walter. I went to his room. It was in darkness, but in the moonlight I saw two figures struggling by the open casement. One of them was Sir Walter. As I entered, he disappeared from sight. His attacker had pushed him out of the window into the moat. How dreadful. The other angle away in the darkness. We must get lanterns and go out to the moat at once. Though I'm very much afraid, Mr. Dunbar, that your grandfather is beyond our help. <laughs> Dr. Watson will be back in just a second, so I'd just like to remind you that if you want to serve a wine over the holidays that you're sure the ladies will enjoy, serve Petri California Muscatel. Petri Muscatel is a golden wine with a wonderful flavor, the flavor of big, plump Muscat grapes. And you know what a flavor that is. I'm sure you'll find that Petri Muscatel is the favorite wine of all women, just as Petri Port is the favorite wine with men. And incidentally, if you're not sure which to get, Petri Muscatel or Petri Port. Don't buy one, buy two. Get them both, and you'll be sure to please everyone. Now, to get back to our story, someone had pushed poor old Sir Walter out of his bedroom window and into the moat below. Isn't that right, Dr. Watson? Yes, Mr. Bartell, of course. We grabbed lanterns as fast as we could and rushed outside, but it was a hopeless task. The water was eight or ten feet deep, and it seemed obvious that the elderly Sir Walter wouldn't have a chance of saving himself. But we searched on... The flicker of bobbing lanterns and the scurrying figures in the frosty moonlight, forming a weird, fantastic. Angus, bring a lantern over here. Aye, sir. Can you see anything, Holmes? Not a thing. Well, I don't see why your friend doesn't call the police, Dr. Watson. He's accomplishing nothing. We thought there might be a chance of finding the old man alive, Mr. Small. He wants to avoid a scandal, if possible, for your sake, sir, as well as the Dunbar. The scandal can't touch me or Dorothy over this. Her engagement was never announced. Thank That's a great pity, sir. I should think some new blood in your family would be a great improvement. You're all being confoundedly impertinent, and Doctor. And you'll be confoundedly heartless, sir. Well, Holmes, have, have you given up hope? I'm not, I'm afraid we'll never find him without dragnets and grappling hooks. I have to call the police. What time is it? Sir Ian, you know the time? What did you call me, Mr. Holmes? Sir Ian. My joke, yes. It does seem a bit premature, Holmes, but of course you're right. If your poor grandfather's dead, Mr. Dunbar... You're the baronet now. And the time, Sir Ian? It's it's a quarter to twelve, Mr. Holmes. A quarter of an hour to the new year, Sir Ian. Doesn't that fact suggest something to you? Yes. Yes, it does. So I'm the new baronet, am I? Very well, then. There'll be no more talk of the police for 15 minutes. I want all of you to come back to the castle with me. As the last chime of midnight rings out, I shall have a statement to make. A statement that I want you all to hear. Oh, what's he brought us all back here for, Holmes? There's something very funny going on. I tell you, I don't like the look of it. And I, Watson, like the look of it very much. I wish you wouldn't be so dashed mysterious. What are you up to? You haven't taken a step yet towards finding the murderer? Haven't I? And I wonder what causes the... Beads of perspiration on Mr. Small's brow. Small? You mean that Small... Listen, I wonder point? what causes the singular look of apprehension on the face of Murdoch, the young lawyer. You remember, of course, on my remarking how easily he carried the large iron box. Chris Scott, yes. And it took a strong man to throw Sir Walter out of the window. What's huh? The new year is approaching. Ladies and gentlemen, in view of our recent tragedy, this is one New Year's Eve when none of us feels like song and jollity. But there still remains a ritual duty for me to perform. Mr. Murdoch, open the iron box, please. But, but, but I can't do that. It was only to be opened for your grandfather. No, Mr. Murdoch. The phrase was that it was to be opened on the New Year's Eve before the baronet's 21st birthday. I am now the baronet, and I shall be 21 next year on August 21st. Open the box, please, Mr. Murdoch. Ian, darling, how practically clever of you. Good lad, I hope you think of it. Sir Ian. Murdoch, open that box. Very well, Sir Ian. But I'm afraid you're in for something of a shock. Great, Scott, the, the box is empty. Except for a sheet of note paper in the bottom. What's the meaning of this, Murdoch? Read that paper, Sir Ian, and you'll understand. I owe you 4,000 sovereigns. And it's signed Alexander Murdoch on behalf of Murdoch and Murdoch, lawyers. You'd better explain this. It's the family skeleton, Sir Ian. That note is signed by my great-grandfather. The one that witnessed the original deed concern in the box. As soon as Sir Walter was born on that February the 29th, my great-grandfather realized 
The money wouldn't have to be produced for 84 years. And so he stole it. He borrowed it. He always intended to pay it back, but he was never able to. When he died, he told my father of his secret. And my father, in turn, told me. We've always planned to put back the money, Sir Ian, but we've never been able to. This is daylight robbery. You should prosecute them, and The firm's still in business. You can ruin them. You can sue them for every penny they have. Mr. Small, you've already shown a marked aversion to my family. I suggest you allow me to handle their affairs. Bravo, Ian. How dare you, Dorothy? Go to your room. No one's going to their room. No one's leaving here until the police arrive. I'm convinced that one of you murdered my grandfather tonight. And if you ask me, it's obvious who that someone is. Who, Dr. Watson? You, Mr. Murdoch. You came here planning to kill poor old Sir Walter because you never intended to open that box. You thought that your secret would die with him. That's a lie. I was going to tell him everything and then ask for time to pay the money. I didn't kill him. Of course he didn't. There's your murderer. You yourself, Ian. Father, what are you saying? I'm saying that Ian's the murderer. He saw that the box wasn't going to be open for another four years. He realized that the money couldn't marry Dorothy, so he killed his grandfather and then ordered the box open. You're trying to cover yourself. You pushed grandfather out of that window tonight. You thought that if he died, the box would never be opened. So Dorothy couldn't marry me. You, you... You gentlemen, gentlemen, please. Upon my soul, Holmes, you seem remarkably calm. Do I, my dear Watson? I must say I'm absolutely fascinated by listening to three people accusing each other of murder. And each of them producing perfectly sound motives. It's a remarkable example of the dangers of reasoning from motive alone. We should profit by experience, Watson. Mr. Holmes, how can you be so calm? There's a murderer in this room. I suppose this game of charades is getting a little out of hand, Miss Small. Let's conclude it. You'd better come out now. Street. It's moving. A happy new year to your old grandfather. Sir Walter, how am I seeing a ghost? Oh, Sir Walter, you're all right. Well, what kind of a game have you been playing? It's a funny game that Holmes and I invented. You might call it forcing the issue. I was determined to have the box open before the next four years were out, whilst I was still alive to look inside it. But the trickery of your family, Murdoch, has made me a very unhappy man. Sir Walter, I shall pay back the money in a few years. I swear I will. It'll be too late to do me any good. But I'll take care that Ian gets it. I have half a mind to prosecute you. Grandfather, the money isn't important now that you're all right. Uh, you were counting on it just the same, my boy, so that you could marry Dorothy. I know that. Uh, she'll never marry a pauper. I won't allow it. When I'm 21, you can't stop me, Father, and I am going to marry Ian. Be quiet. Sir Walter, it's a very unsavory business. Uh, I think that you owe us an explanation of your behavior tonight. You tell him, Holmes. I fancy a wee drop of cream of Dunbar. Watching you all search for my body in the moat has made me thirsty. <laughs> The explanation is a very simple one, ladies and gentlemen. When you arrived here tonight, Mr. Murdoch, I knew from the way you handled the box that it could not contain the sum of gold it was supposed to. And so you, you suspected fraud and devised a plan to force the opening of the box, Yes, huh? and Sir Walter was an eager conspirator. Of course I was. Ian is 21 next August. Supposing, supposing I had died after he came of age and before my next birthday, four years hence, the box would never have been opened. And so we invented the fake murder story. By the way, Ian... I must congratulate you for grasping the possibilities of the situation so speedily. If you hadn't demanded the opening of the box, the Murdoch's secret might still be a secret. Well, it was a clever plan, Holmes. It's too bad that it had to have such a miserable ending. I'm not sure that we have finished with the matter. Uh, Mr. Murdoch. Yes, Mr. Holmes. You say that your family took 4,000 pounds from that box? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Curious. I would have sworn from its size that it would hold closer to 5,000. And in your account of the legend, Watson, you told me that Sir Thomas Dunbar... Stated on his deathbed that he had put something else in the box. Yes, right. Something for a rainy day, is that yeah. it? Mm -hmm. Did the Murdochs find that extra something? No, Mr. Holmes. They found nothing but the gold. Oh, that's very odd. I think I'll take a closer look at that box if you don't mind. Since this seems to be a night of telling secrets, I think you might as well know, Father, that if you don't give your consent, I shall elope with you. Oh, bravo, my oh, dear, bravo. No such thing. <laughs> I admire your resolution, young lady, but I hardly think it will be necessary. What do you mean, Holmes? Permit me to show you all the treasure of the Dunbars. What are you found, Holmes? The something for a rainy day that old Sir Thomas spoke of. You see, since the cubic contents of the box obviously differed from my calculations, I deduced the existence of a false bottom. I was correct. And in that space, I found this. Oh, it's, it's a manuscript. Quite so, the manuscript of a book. Look at the title page and see the author's name. Uh, History of the Dunbar family. By Sir Walter Scott. Oh, I, was Scott. I think, Sir Walter, that an original and unpublished manuscript by your distinguished namesake will prove worth several times the gold that is missing from that box. You've saved the day for his homes, my boy. God bless you. Oh, oh, this has been a stranger new year as ever I knew. But it's turned out to be a bonny one, thanks to you, Holmes. Well, fill up your glasses. <laughs>
We're going to drink a toast to the New Year. Ah, Joe, yes, Sir Walter. This is really a happy occasion. Then let's complete it by singing the traditional song of the season, Old Lang Syne. And in this case, when we sing, Should Old Acquaintance Be Forgot, I feel that in our hearts we should be thinking of Sir Walter Scott. He died over 60 years ago. He's made us all very happy here tonight. Uh, should old acquaintance be forgot and never Doctor, that turned out to be a very happy new year for all concerned. Yes, that's one new year that I'll never forget. Well, I sure hope you'll always remember this one, too. Oh, just a second, my boy. That calls for a glass of port. Fine. Uh, well, to a, to a happy new year, my boy, for you and for our many friends listening in. And to you, Doctor. <laughs> oh, thanks, boy. <laughs> ah, that's good. Doctor, this has indeed been a pleasant association for me. Oh, I'm glad to hear. You're the best storyteller I've ever known, and the Petri family makes the best wine I've ever tasted. <laughs> I hope that, just as they've been making wine for generations in the past, the Petri family will continue to make fine wine in the future. Uh, uh, Mr. Bartell, I know that you'll always be here to tell us just how good that Petri wine is. <laughs> well, I hope so, Doctor. <laughs> and I hope you'll always be right here beside me to... Tell another swell story about oh, Mr. Holmes. So too, my boy. <laughs> oh, and incidentally, Doctor, what new adventure are you planning to tell us next week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a weird story. It starts with a series of murders on Hampstead Heath and ends with a battle to the death in a burning waxworks. I call it the strange case of the murderer in wax. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Silver Blades. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California... Invite you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. 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 So you think you're smart, eh? You're nobody's fool? <laughs> Brother, you can be taken. CBS presents Bunko Squad. <laughs> The Bunko Artist, the Swindler, the Con Man. He comes in a thousand disguises. He has a million tricks. He can make a sucker out of you. Be on your guard. For the protection of you, the American public, we open once again tonight the files of Bunko Squad. Authentic cases drawn from the police records of the nation. You will be guided through a case of Bunko step by step, as it actually happened, as it could happen to you. Now, here is your host and guide, the noted authority on Bunko schemes, Captain Frank Trumbull. Good evening. We call the confidence man a Bunko artist because in his evil way, that's exactly what he is. The slickest cleverest, most dangerous artist in the underworld. Perhaps you haven't thought that bunco schemes can be dangerous. Well, then, listen. It's just me, Wilbur. 
I swear that Miss Blanchard is helpless as a baby sometimes. Wilbur! Wilbur, where are you? My land, you're never around. Wilbur! What you just heard is part of an actual case taken from the police files of St. Louis involving one of the most dangerous and vicious bunco schemes ever to come to my attention. Here is the case of the bookworm. The unfortunate victim in the case of the bookworm is a man by the name of Wilbur King. Mr. King is a retired heating contractor who had managed to save up a sufficient nest egg to live modestly with his wife, Jane, in a comfortable home just off Delmar Avenue. The Kings are honest, good, church-going folks. Actually, that's where the whole thing started. One Sunday morning in a church overlooking Forest Park. During the services, Mrs. King had noticed a strange couple staring at her and at her husband. And when the service concluded, she was surprised to find herself greeted most cordially by a woman she, she didn't know had never seen before. Why, how well, unimaginable imagine running into you here. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid you have us mixed up with someone else. Well, oh, dear Charles, they're not the Pearsons at all. I was afraid you were mistaken, my dear. Oh, and after the way we stared at these poor people, too. Yes, please forgive us, folks. Oh, a natural mistake. <laughs> you see, we're new in St. Louis. We don't know a soul. I guess it was partly wishful thinking on my part. I am sorry. Not at all. I know how it is in a strange town. Now, come now, dear. These folks aren't interested. Oh, uh, uh, perhaps you could tell us where we might catch a bus to the Radcliffe Hotel on King's Highway. Why, that's right on our way home. We'd be glad to drop you off. Oh, I wouldn't think of putting you to all that trouble. Nonsense. No trouble at all. Well, it's, it's very kind of you. Oh, and um, I'm Charles Hollister. This is my wife, Irene. Uh, how do you do? Uh, my name is King, and this is Mrs. King. I'm so glad to know you. Delighted to meet you. Yes, indeed. Most delighted. That meeting, accidental as it may have seemed, was part of a carefully laid plan. Try to put yourself in the king's place. They were friendly people, anxious to meet any new fellow churchgoers, so naturally they offered them a lift. But even if they hadn't, it wouldn't have mattered. The Hollisters would have pursued the accidental meeting in another manner. Once the contact was accomplished, Hollister made himself as charming as possible. By the time they'd reached the Radcliffe Hotel, he'd persuaded the kings to have Sunday dinner with him. And the next night, he invited them to be his guests at the Municipal Opera. And all the while, in casual, matter-of-fact conversation, Charles told Wilbur King about himself and his work, that he was a writer visiting St. Louis to do some scientific research at Washington University. And the Kings were most impressed with their newfound friends. But when the Hollisters were alone in their hotel room... A swell pitch this is going to be. That old bitty nearly yak my arm off. You know what she does for fun? She puts up preserves. Well, then, baby, you're going to put up preserves and like it. Because mm. there's a big pot of jam at the end of this rainbow. Fifteen grand worth. Fifty honest charm? Mm-hmm. Why, we only cased them for about eight. How'd you find out? <laughs> oh, charm, baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that old guy did everything but give me the key to his safety deposit box. Oh, darling, that's wonderful. I could kiss you for that. Uh, what's stopping you? Nothing. You lovely hunk of man. Mm. <laughs> Say, maybe we can shove this picture along a little faster, huh? Oh, don't get impatient, Cookie. It never pays to rush a mark. Okay, honey. You're the brains. Now, uh, get busy and finish copying that book I got from the library. All right, you great big famous author, you. <laughs> <laughs> During the next two weeks, Hollister played Wilbur King like a trout. It was flattering to be wined and dined by a younger, brilliant man. And an author at that. And when the game was finally set to land, Charles was ready with the gaff. He set the scene by inviting the kings to a mysterious dinner celebration at the Chase Room. Oh. Happy days. Oh, Mrs. King, let me fill your glass. Oh, no, please. <laughs> That's a beautiful watch you have there, Hollister. I've been admiring it. A beautiful watch you have, Wilbur. Here. It's yours. Oh, no, no, no. I couldn't dream of it. Nonsense, Mr. King. You take it. Charles can afford it now. Say, what is this mystery? I swear you've got me eaten up with curiosity. Yes, oh. what's happened? I uh, haven't found a gold mine, have you? <laughs> oh, you're not far wrong. Here, read this wire. Eh? The Board of Education excited about your manuscript. Wanted for high schools throughout the states. Hey, Hollister, that's wonderful. Isn't it? Read the rest of it. 
Advance order confirmed at 40,000 copies. Wire me hotel senator immediately if you can deliver by October Joseph Sterling. Who's Sterling? Oh, he's my literary agent in Jefferson City. Oh, I'm so happy for both of you. 40,000 copies. Think of it, Jane. A toast. To the book, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> to the book. <laughs> hey, to the book. <laughs> Say, Wilbur. I've been wondering if I could ask you to do me a favor on this thing. Of course, Charles. Anything. What is it? Well, as I was saying to Irene last night, wasn't I, honey? Mm-hmm. This is a tremendous break, of course, but it also means I'll have to interrupt my present work to get this book printed. Irene came up with a wonderful idea. Why not ask you to help out? You have the time, the brains, the organizational ability. I'd be glad to do anything I could, but... Isn't that the publisher's job? Oh, Wilbur, you don't think I'd go to a regular publisher? Accept a piddling royalty with a firm order for 40,000 books in my pocket? <laughs> oh, not on your life. I intend to publish this myself. I have a printer in Jefferson City all set to go. The way I figure, it'll cost around 30,000. I'll gross 150,000 on the order. A net profit of $120,000. That's a lot of money. Isn't it, though? Yeah. And it'll mean a lot of work. Every student in the state will have to use a copy of my book. And that's only the beginning. There are 47 other states. <laughs> of course, Wilbur, I wouldn't expect you to take on the selling and distributing job for nothing. But it's out of my line. Oh, Wilbur, nonsense. Since when is a $60,000 profit out of anybody's line? <laughs> $60,000? Surely. Look, you come in with me and share in the initial printing cost. And as soon as the books are ready, you take over complete supervision of sales and delivery from then on. And I'll cut you in for 50% of the profit, including the order I've already got. Wilbur, what an opportunity. Oh, no, no. It's an opportunity for me, Mrs. King. You see, I, I'm a writer and a scientist. I, I've got no head for business, and I'm not interested in it. It'd be a godsend to have a businessman like Wilbur to handle things. A partner I can trust. Now the enticing bait was out, and Hollister felt sure that Wilbur King would snap at it. Well, wouldn't you? A chance to make $60,000 on a $15,000 investment? And at absolutely no risk. What would you do? If you're like Mr. King, you'd probably ask for time to think it over. And you might not want to trust your own judgment completely. You might, as Mr. and Mrs. King did, seek advice from your lawyer. Black lead gas common. A Monsanto stock, brown shoe... Wilbur, do you realize you're selling everything you own? Sure, John, we realize it, but it's only for a short time. Sixty days, Mr. Hollister said. I don't know. I don't like this. But it's such an opportunity, and the Hollisters are such nice people. You said yourself that Hollister was perfectly right to handle this himself instead of through a publisher? I know, I know. Well, he's, he's leaving for Jefferson City to pay the printer in a day or two... And I've got to put up half the money if I want to share in the profits. Well, it's just that I hate to see you take a chance with practically all the money you've got. What kind of chance? Why, Mr. Hollister is known and respected by every big scientist and educator you can name. You should see the letters he has from them. Stationery can be obtained and letters can be forged. Forged? Why, you suspicious old codger. Well, that's what lawyers are paid for, Wilbur. To be suspicious old codgers. But what about the telegram from Mr. Sterling saying that the Board of Education had agreed to take 40,000 copies of the book? Say, I've got that wire right here in my pocket. I forgot to return it to Charles. May I see it, please? Uh, sure. Mm. Sterling, eh? Excuse me a moment. Miss Kennedy, put through a person-to-person -person call to Mr. Joseph Sterling at the Hotel Senator in Jefferson City. Uh, buzz me when you've got him. Thank you. Just an extra precaution, Wilbur. I'm sure your friend, Mr. Hollister, would appreciate that you're the type of man who makes a thorough investigation of a deal before he puts up his life savings. But Charles and Irene are such wonderful people, I'm sure why they wouldn't even suggest that Of we... course they wouldn't. This is just plain foolishness, John. I've been a pretty fair judge of men in my time, and I tell I know, you... I know, Wilbur, but a man can always be wrong. We'll see. Hello? Mr. Sterling? Mr. Joseph Sterling? Mr. Sterling, this is Judge Rowan in St. Louis. I represent Mr. and Mrs. Wilbur King in connection with a partnership that they are forming with a Mr. Charles Hollister. Yes? Yes. I understand that you are Mr. Hollister's literary agent. I see. Oh, really? Well, about the order from the Board of Education. Yes? Yes, 40,000 copies of the book. 
I see. Mm-hmm. Yes, I see. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Sterling. Goodbye. Well, what did he say? He says it's the greatest book of its kind he's ever handled. He says the 40,000 order is only the beginning. He expects every school system in the country to take it. Oh. Well, what do you say now? I knew it. What an opportunity. The Hollisters are such wonderful people. Yes, the Hollisters were very wonderful people. And smart, too. Smart enough to have their accomplice, Mr. Sterling, waiting in Jefferson City just on the chance that the Kings might call him. Naturally, he confirmed the order. And so John Rowan, the lawyer, had to admit that the deal sounded okay. And Wilbur King sold out his securities, his only bulwark against old age, and handed Charles Hollister a check for $15,000. The next day, the Hollisters left for Jefferson City to sign the contract with the printer, they said. The bunco scheme had worked. Any mail, Wilbur? Just a circular. I'm going across the street to Miss Blanchard's for a few minutes, dear. She's... Ha- Why, what's the matter? Well, nothing. Only we haven't heard a word from Charles and Irene for over two weeks. Yes, that is strange, isn't it? Well, I'll be back in ten minutes. I do hope nothing's wrong. They're such nice people. Yes. Such nice people. Operator, get me the hotel senator in Jefferson City. That's right, Charles Hollister. But I know he went there. Are you sure? Never registered? Thank you. Boatman's Bank? Chief Teller, please. He cashed the check the same day? Yes, I understand the check was in order. Of course you had to honor it. Operator, I want to put in another call to Jefferson City. The purchasing agents of the Board of Education. It's just me, Wilbur. I swear that Miss Blanchard is helpless as a baby sometimes. Wilbur, Wilbur, where are you? My land, you're never around. And... Wilbur! Wilbur! We'll return to Captain Trumbull and tonight's Bunko Squad story in just a moment. To politely paraphrase history, George Burns while Gracie fiddles, and the result is, of course, the laugh riot heard every Wednesday evening over many of these same CBS stations. George and Gracie are two of America's best purveyors of nonsense and two neighbors everyone enjoys visiting. You can never tell what Gracie has up her sleeve, but you can always bet it'll get George into trouble. Be sure not to miss the Burns and Allen Show this Wednesday and every Wednesday at that spot on your dial marked CBS. Now here's Captain Trumbull again to continue tonight's Bunko Squad story, The Bookworm. In a game as carefully constructed as a fine watch, Charles Hollister had, as the bunco artist would say, roped his mark, told him the tale, given him the convincer, and had taken off a nice touch of $15,000. As a result, Wilbur King was in emergency hospital at death's door and attempted suicide. The next day, Mrs. King went down to police headquarters and told her story. No, no. Do you recognize any of the pictures, Mrs. King? No. I've stared at these pictures until they're all beginning to look alike. Lieutenant Scott, I didn't want to come here. I should be at the hospital. Mr. King is in competent hands. You can help him best by helping us catch these suspects. I still can't believe it. They were such nice people. They're always nice people, Mrs. King. Uh, When you've gone over all the pictures, will you come into Detective Lebec's office and make out a crime report, please? Yes, Lieutenant, I will. I'll wait for you there. Uh, 
No luck yet, Lee. She's still looking. She'll sign a complaint? Oh, yes. Yeah. She's upset, but she'll come through. Here's all we've got to go on, Skipper. It's not much. Oh, this is the book? Authentic looking job, all right. Mm-hmm. Well, see what you can do with it. Will do. And uh, this watch. Mm. Beautiful. Well, what's the connection? Oh, King admired it, and Hollister took it off his wrist and handed it over. Oh. You know these con men when they're building up a mark. Lend me your knife, will you, Lee? Sure. Here. Oh. Serial number. Yeah, jot this down. Five two three one four one eight. Gruen. I'll run a make on it. Say, did you see the piece in the Globe this morning about King shooting himself? Yeah. And if Hollister sees it, he'll take off for the moon. Maybe he won't see it. Fat chance. Anybody as smart as that bird is watching the papers, all right. Lieutenant Scott had his con man figured correctly. After paying off their confederate, Joe Sterling, for his assist in answering the telephone in Jefferson City, Charles and Irene Hollister were taking it easy between jobs at the Hotel Southern in Memphis. Charles. Oh, don't bother me. Can't you see I'm reading? Oh, that silly St. Louis paper. What's so interesting in St. Louis you have to read the paper every day? Just careful, sweetie. You never know when a sucker might get panicking and run to the coppers. Doesn't cost much. You... What the... What's the matter? They held a copper already? Oh, worse than that. That jerk king shot himself. Oh, no, let me see. Here. Yeah. Wilbur King, 54. Cause given his despondency when a team of confidence workers... Built him out of his life savings. Why, that's stupid. Condition very critical. You know what that means? If he dies, that's technical murder. Chuck, they can't tie it to us, can they? We were careful. Shut up and let me think. Tried to cover everything. There's nothing in the book. He didn't write any checks. Oh, what do you take me for? No, I didn't do anything they can tri... Wait a minute. What is it? My wristwatch. I gave it to King, remember? It wasn't engraved, was it? It might as well have been. It's got a serial number, and I used my right name when I bought it. Oh, no. In Toledo, remember? I might have known you stupid fool. You would pull a bonehead play like that. Now you've got it. Now, <laughs> don't you crack up on me. That's all I need. But they'll trace that one. It may take days. And if I have anything to say about it, they'll never trace it. Come on, now, start packing. We've got a long drive ahead of us. <laughs> Okay, here we are. Everything clear? Yeah, I think so. Oh, Chuck, I don't like this. And I love it, I suppose, I huh? I don't know, but... Look, I... you just keep this car running. I'll be out as soon as I can. I've got to get the sales record from that jewelry store before the cops trace that watch. Be careful, Chuck, please. Yeah. October, November. December. Where's December? No. Oh. Charles, quick, hurry. Yeah. Your numbskull, get this thing going. I'm trying. I'm trying. Oh. Come on, come on, step on it. Yeah. Keep going, we can make it. Take the next corner fast. We made it. Yeah, don't stop. Keep this thing moving. Yeah. Did you get the record? No, the alarm went off before I could find it. You'll never get it now. The cops will blanket this place in no time. Yeah, I know. Head for St. Louis. St. Louis? Why? I've got to get that watch back. Our only chance is that Mrs. King hasn't told the cops about it. Now step on it. When things were going his way, Hollister was a smooth, affable con man. But now, in trouble, over his depth, cornered, the veneer came off to reveal him for what he was. A desperate, dangerous criminal... Ready to stop at nothing. Meantime, in St. Louis, Bunko Squad was making headway. Detectives Scott and LeBeck were beginning to fit parts of the puzzle into place. Hello, Lee. 
What's new on the King case? Well, this for one thing. I got it at the public library. A book, huh? Science Progresses by James Whitmark. Published 1941. Mm-hmm. And guess what? Yeah, I know. The manuscript Hollister showed Mr. King is an exact copy, word for word. Right. No wonder King thought it looked okay. Well, that locks up the intent to defraud, Angle. Yeah. Oh, we'll say, here's something else. I got a report from the manufacturer on the watch Hollister gave King. It was sold by Levine and Wise in Toledo. Levine and Wise? Yeah. Why, why? What's up? I just saw a teletype. Levine and Wise were knocked over last night. Uh-oh. That isn't all. Nothing was taken. What? But all the sales records were disturbed. This is a break, Lee. Hollister must have broken into the jewelry store trying to get the sales slip on that watch. That means he bought it in his own name. Yeah. And suppose he didn't get the sales slip. Well, we can check that. If he didn't, he might come back and try to get the watch on the chance that Mrs. King forgot to tell us about it. Lee, get that watch out of property, will you? Sure, sure. What have you got in mind? I think it might be a good idea to give it back to Mrs. King. I'm scared, Chuck. Oh, stop it. You're getting me jittery, too. Seven years without a hitch, and then this has to happen. Suppose something goes wrong. For Pete's sake, lay off. Look, we cased the house for two days, haven't we? Yeah. Not a cop in sight. She goes to the hospital, she comes home. It's all clear, I tell you. I'd feel better if you'd ditch that gun. I said I wouldn't use it, didn't I? Okay. Here we go. Chuck, remember, no gun. Oh, brace up, Cookie. We won't need a gun. We can con her out of that. Watch blindfolded. Okay, honey. We're on. And don't forget to keep her occupied while I look for that watch. <gasps> Irene! Mr. Hollister. Darling, I'll bet you thought we'd never get back. <laughs> we sure missed you, folks. I'll say. Say, where's Wilbur, the old son of a gun? Wait till he sees what I've got for him. Why, why it's a check. <laughs> oh, and what a check. First return, $64,000. Why, didn't Wilbur get my wire? Why, why, no. Can you beat that? Well, half of this is Wilbur's. Oh. <laughs> what? Darling, what's the matter? Wilbur's in the hospital. What? He shot himself. Oh, no. Oh, yes. you poor dear. He thought, he thought you'd swindled him. Swindled? He yes. thought that? Yes. Oh, but that's terrible. Because he didn't hear from us? Oh, then it's all our fault. Oh, my dear. Oh, no. Please don't feel that way. Oh. Why, where did Mr. Hollister go? Uh, uh, Mrs. King, don't go in there. Why, Mr. Hollister? I thought I told you to keep what her... What do you expect with all the noise you were making? All right, can the chatter and let's blow. Fast. You got the watch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Then, then you are thieves. Oh, shut up. What'll we do with the old lady? Chuck, we can't leave her loose now. Uh, in the closet. Yep. Come on, Grandma. In you go. No, please. No, yeah. no. Don't peep out of you. You'll get this gun across your head. <laughs> get in there now. <laughs> Slow down now. Yeah. I don't want anybody to see us running. You sure she'll be all right, Chuck? Stop worrying about her. Somebody will find her. Get in the car. King, you're safe now. They were just here. They took the watch. We know all about it, Mrs. King. We've been staked out here for several days. I saw every move they made through the window just now. You were in no danger. You were outside? Then why didn't you stop them? We let them go on purpose. Lieutenant Scott is trailing them right now, right to wherever they've hidden your money. I hope. <laughs> Galveston and Mexico City. That's us, Chuck. Yeah. Hurry. That Not until we get that little package. <laughs> Got the locker key? What a question. <laughs> Let's see. Number 587, 56. Uh-huh. Oh, Chuck, hurry. With you. Relax, beautiful, relax. Plenty of time. That's right, Hunter. Uh, what? What? Plenty of time. 
About ten years apiece, I'd say. Oh! Why, you, don't you? You want it this way. Um, Jack! All right. Get up. Yeah. Hold out those hands. Yeah. And I'll just take that package out of the locker, if you I don't look, mind. Look, you've got nothing on us. I want an attorney. I know my rights. Oh, brother. If only one of you would think up a different line. Just once. <laughs> So there you have the case of the bookworm. It was taken from the files of Bunko Squad through the courtesy of St. Louis Chief of Police, Jeremiah O'Connell. And now we have a message for you from Chief O'Connell himself. Thank you, Captain Trumbull, for the opportunity to expose one of the most vicious swindles ever attempted in St. Louis. Thanks to Bunko Squad, nearly all of Mr. and Mrs. King's money was recovered. And I might add, Mr. King recovered, too. The Hollisters were convicted of grand theft Bunko burglary, and assault with a deadly weapon. Both are now serving a two- to 14-year sentence in the penitentiary at Jefferson City. Thank you, Chief O'Connell. It has recently come to my attention that the bookworm bunco is again being tried, this time in Cleveland, Minneapolis, and Oklahoma City. We trust that tonight's dramatic presentation of this case will serve to warn the citizens of those communities. Next week, we open the files of the police force in Albuquerque, New Mexico, for another unusual and dangerous bunco game. Be sure to join us then for the story of the vanishing freight cars. Until then, this is Captain Trumbull saying good night and leaving you with this warning. The bunco artist is clever. The bunco artist is vicious. The bunco artist is dangerous. So... Be on your guard. <laughs> The elements of tonight's case were true. Only the names were changed for the protection of innocent persons. Chief O'Donnell was represented in proxy by his permission. Next week, Captain Trumbull again opens the files of Bunko Squad for another authentic case drawn from the police records of the nation. Join us then, won't you? And meantime, be on your guard. Bunko Squad, produced and directed by Ralph Rose, is written by Larry Goldman and Troy Leonard. Original music was composed and conducted by Del Castillo. Joe Walters speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I'm the Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine presents the case book of Gregory Hood, starring Elliot Lewis, with our guest star, Gail Storm. In just a moment, you'll hear tonight's story, Fifth Avenue, with Gail Storm at Night of Miles. Say, do you know who's the best judge of wine in all this world? Well, as far as you're concerned, you are. That's right. What other person can decide what kind of wine you're going to like? So here's my suggestion. Try Petri wine. You know, Petri wine is the one and only wine for thousands of people. But the only way you can be sure it's the wine for you is to try it. Once you've done that, I'm pretty sure you'll agree that Petri wine is the wine to suit your own particular taste. And the reason it's so good is because the Petri family took time to bring you good wine. Many generations of knowledge, skill, and experience go into the making of every bottle of Petri wine. Only the finest of luscious, big, sun-ripened California grapes are used. And Petri wine is always made in the Petri family's own honored tradition. So Petri wine is a wonderful buy. A real wine value. Why don't you try a bottle of Petri wine tomorrow? Those five letters on the label, P-E-T-R-I, are your assurance of good wine. Petri wine. Well, it's that time again. Time to join Gregory Hood and his friend and attorney Sanderson Taylor for another story from Greg's casebook. Greg and Sandy are in New York City on business for Greg's world-famous importing house. It's a bracingly cold night, 
But in spite of the cold, Greg has insisted that he and Sandy climb aboard a Fifth Avenue bus and settle down for a tourist's eye view of the famous thoroughfare. The bus is deserted except for a very beautiful young lady sitting across the aisle from them. Sandy is complaining bitterly about the draft. This is the craziest thing we've done in the last five years, Greg. Could be in a nice warm cab where they keep the doors closed. Oh, you've lost the spirit of adventure, Sandy. Yeah. We're going back to California tomorrow night. A little cold weather will do us good while we can get it. Improves the circulation. Puts a sparkle in your eye. Uh, hey, what's the matter? Look, there. That mansion. You recognize it? Huh. That one? Yeah. Well, it does look familiar, Greg. Familiar? We spent two of the happiest hours in our lives or thereabouts in that house, Sandy. Night before last. Are you losing your mind? I've never been in that house. Night before last, Roy Del Ruth invited us to that screening, his latest picture. Well, that's what I mean. That's the mansion that Aloysius T. McKeever spends his winters in. Remember? Oh. Well, of course. And that picture, it happened on Fifth Avenue. That's right. Oh, yeah, sure, that's that. Well, I'll be done. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see Victor Moore and his hobo get up going through that hole in the fence. Oh, what a wonderful cat. <laughs> I don't know when I ever enjoyed a picture as much, Sandy. I'd like to see it again. You'd like to? Boy, I'm going to. I'm going to take Mary to see it as soon as it opens in Berkeley. You know, Charlie Ruggles has always been a favorite of hers. Oh, wait till she sees him in this part. He was one of them. Well, the it? whole cast. I fell in love with Gail Storm. I've always been mad about Ann Harding. Everyone gave swell performances, especially the leading man, Don DeFore. Yeah, he sure did. You know, it must be a lot of satisfaction to make a picture like that. Yeah. Roy Del Roots made a lot of fine pictures, but this tops them all. I... Oh. Uh, excuse me. Allow me to pick your bag up for you. Oh, nothing much to fill down. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. I don't want to seem inquisitive, but why are you carrying that gun? I... Please, give me my bag. Look, I'm not just being nosy, but... If you're scared to death and carrying a gun, that's a bad combination for a little girl like you. Give me my bag. My name is Gregory Hood. If you're in trouble, I want to help you. I'm not in any trouble. Give it here and please go away. I don't want to talk with you. Okay, Miss Miles. You know my name? Yes, on this envelope in your bag. <laughs> I'm very observant. You might be sorry you noticed that. Now, please go away. I'm getting off the bus at the next stop. Do you want me to get off with you? Bodyguard? But... No. Now, go away, please. I don't want to talk with you. Okay. <laughs> well, you didn't make uh, much of an impression on that young lady, did you, Greg? Yeah, I'm afraid not. Something the matter with that girl, Sandy? Ah, because she didn't throw her arms about you? No, cynic. Because it's a little unusual for a girl as lovely as that, draped in that many thousand dollars worth of mink, to be carrying a thirty-two automatic pistol in that full-grown alligator bag. An automatic? Yeah. And she's scared silly. <laughs> she's getting off, eh? I'm going to follow her, Sandy. I'm not going to get off at the same time she does. We'll jump off in the middle of the block, and we'll keep our eye on her. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Okay. Uh, Greg, hmm? uh, that girl, she left a package on the seat there. Oh, Yeah. Well, give us an excuse for chasing her. I'll get it. I'll take that package, buddy. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to return it to the young lady who left it here just a minute ago. Give it here. Don't be a hero. Look out, Grace. Just hang on to that gun arm, Sandy. Give me that gun. I have to have that package. He lost to me. Grab him, Sandy. Yeah. Oh. Stop him, Sandy. Hey, wait until the bus stops. Get away. He got away, Grace. Yeah, I lost my balance when he let go of the gun. Come on, Sandy. I don't want to lose that girl. Let's get hey, off this bus. What are you trying to do? Break your neck. No, jump, Sandy. Come on. <laughs> Hey, what's the matter with you two jumping off that moving bus? You're crazy. What happened to the man who jumped off just ahead of us? Hey, he ran across the street against the light, the idiot. What's all this about? What's going on? Oh, look, officer, nothing's going on. A young lady left a package on the bus. I jumped off to return it to her, that's all. She got off at the corner back there. Small girl, brunette, mink coat. You notice her? You think I got nothing to do but watch who gets off the bus? She didn't jump, I didn't see her. Thank you. Come on, Stanley. Mm -hmm. mm. You see her? Mm. No, I don't. Now she's gone, Greg. Mm. Well, I know her name. Come on, let's go back to the Waldorf and try to locate her. This package she left behind must be pretty important. Oh, well, Sandy, there's no night of miles listed in the city directory or telephone book. I guess the only thing to do is buy an ad in a paper and advertise the fact that we have that package. Yeah. What do you suppose is in it, Greg? What does it feel like? 
Feels like a leather box, Sandy. Because that's what it is. Uh, that's not much of a help. Take it down and ask the clerk to put it in the safe, will you? Aren't you going to look and see what's in it? Why, Sandy. I'm surprised at you. Well, I'm the one who's surprised. Hmm? Well, I'll take it down, Greg. Meet you in the lobby in a half an hour. Yeah, I'll be ready by then. Quick shower and shave. Wish I could locate that Miles girl. I want to get this package back to her. And... She was a very uh, pretty girl, Greg. No, well, it's that, too. Uh, be within a half hour, sir. Okay, in the men's bar. Right. Nida. Hello, operator. Uh, this is Gregory Hood in the tower. Yes. Uh, I want you to check all the Class A hotels for me. I have a friend named Nida Miles. Miss Nida Miles. I know she's in town, but I don't know where she's staying. Yep. That's right. M-I-L-E-S. Hmm? And uh, there's a $20 bill in it for you if you locate it for me. <laughs> well, you're welcome if you find it. Right. And thank you. Nida. Oh, darn it. Nida. Step back in that room, Mr. Hood. I don't want to have to use this gun. Oh, no, not you again. Sorry. I've been waiting to see you along, Mr. Hood. I've been telling you ever since you grabbed that package this afternoon. You shouldn't have done that. Why? It wasn't yours. But the boss wanted it. The young lady wanted to have it. Hmm? You aced your way in where you weren't wanted, Hood. Now, where is it? I haven't got it. Get it. I can't right now. It's too bad. Now, Mr. Hood, we're going to take a little trip. The boss wants to see you. Look, you're out of a book. Go away. This is the Waldorf. You can't kidnap me out of here. Don't go betting your life on that. There's a car waiting downstairs. Walk through the lobby and get in it. I'll go with you just to keep you from making any mistakes. Well, this is ridiculous. Isn't it? Come on, get moving. Don't take it too hard. You'll be in good company. We're entertaining a dame there called Nida out of the place. What? Yeah, she's waiting for you. If you don't arrive, it might kill her. So don't be tricky, Mr. Hood. Keep moving. As soon as we get past this light here, Joe, twist it over to Lexington. Right. I want to put the blinders on Mr. Hood here. You're going to blindfold me, huh? Yeah. I hate to cover those pretty blue eyes you have. Well, thank you. There's not much sin in the room. Oh. Anyway, oh. it's anyway. I didn't do anything to have with a cab jockey behind me ramming. Come on, the light's changing. Take out of here. Yeah. Uh, lock bumper. <laughs> this is pretty embarrassing, isn't it? Just keep your seats. Uh, no, I think I'll get out and help on the hey, lock you... bumpers. You wouldn't want to do any shooting in all this traffic. <laughs> Come on, Clancy. See you later, Lucky. Hey, hey, Craig. Craig. Huh? Oh, Sandy. Uh, what happened, Greg? Where'd you come from? Well, I, I saw you leaving the hotel with that fella. Oh? Huh? Looked to me like he was holding a gun on you. So I grabbed the cab and followed you. How come you always do the right thing? I was in a little trouble, Sandy. Well, that's what I figured. So I gave my driver $20 to lock bumpers with the car you were in. Oh, sheer and... genius. Now, well, let's get back to the hotel and get my suite changed. I want privacy when I take a look at what's in that confounded package. <laughs> girl that left this package in the bus, Nida Miles. Did the operator manage to find her registered one of the hotel? No, and please stop taking words out of my mouth. An alligator jewel case with a sterling silver coat of arms. Black pearl. Beautiful, Sandy. A fortune's worth of black pearls. The most beautiful strand I've ever seen. Now, what in the devil was that Miles babe carrying them around with her for on a bus? Well, even I can answer that. Hmm? She was making a rendezvous with somebody on the bus to pick them up after she left them on the seat. Sandy, well, you're getting to be a great deducer. This strand of pearls must be well known. The manager of our branch here will probably be able to tell me who they belong to. That's the next move. You think the pearls were, uh, were stolen? I don't know what to think, but we're in it. We might as well find out what it's all about. Tell you what, get on the phone... Uh, Mm -hmm. Who is it? Mr. Hood. No? 
Yes, who is it? It's Miss Miles, Nida Miles. Huh. Speak of the angels. Hmm? Hello, I'm... Hey! Get back into the room, Mr. Hood. Please don't make me use this gun. Well, okay, but... but... Back up. Yes, ma'am. Now, give me those pearls and get into that closet, both of you. And don't try to get help for five minutes. Well, you're welcome to the pearls. They're yours, I suppose. Get in the closet. Forget about me and the necklace. If you don't, you're going to be killed. Greg Hood and Sandy are riding on a Fifth Avenue bus in New York City when Greg notices that the young lady sitting opposite them has left a package on the seat. He picks up the package intending to return it to her when a large gentleman attempts to get the package away from him. Greg manages to hang on to the package, is kidnapped, rescued by Sandy, and returns to the Waldorf to see what it contains. He opens it, finds a priceless string of black pearls, is admiring them, when the girl from the bus comes in, gun in hand, locks Sandy and Greg in the closet of their room, and leaves with the warning to forget all about her and the pearls. Not Greg. Released from the closet, he goes to see the manager of the New York City branch of Hood & Company. Now, it, it was the most beautiful strand of pearls I've ever seen, Mac. Graduating from the size of a pea up to the size of a... Oh, as big around as a penny. Hmm. They were in an alligator jewel case about eight inches long by about, oh, three inches wide. There's a crest on the case. A coat of arms, two tigers rampant against a wreath. And a shield. Some Latin words I don't remember. Here. It looked like this. I'll try to draw it. I know about the pearls, Gregory. Oh? I know the man who owned them. I've seen them many times. We restrung them for him several years ago. Oh, who is it? The gentleman who owns them is named Carruthers. Huh? Charles P. Carruthers. Has an apartment in Park Avenue. Fine gentleman. Very old family. The pearls, as a matter of fact, have been in the family for several hundred years. Have been. Uh, look, Mac. Could you call him and make a date for me to drop over to see him? Tell him I, uh... Well, I want to buy the pearls. Or if he won't sell them to me, at least I want to see him. I'm sure I can arrange that, Mr. Hood. Just a moment. Oh, fine. Get me Charles P. Carruthers on the phone, please. I hope you don't think this is just idle curiosity, Mr. Carruthers. Oh, indeed I don't, Mr. Hood. As a matter of fact, I'm quite flattered that a collector of your prominence would be so interested in my pearls. Yes. I admire the tone of your phonograph, too. <laughs> Of course, uh, there could be no question of my selling them. They've been in the family for hundreds of years. Oh, I can understand that. I would like to see them, though. Black pearls just happen to be one of my hobbies. Uh -huh. Hood and company have sort of specialized in them for a couple of generations. Yes, I know. I'll get them for you. Oh, thank you. I keep them here with me in this wall safe. I like to look at them sometimes, even when I'm here alone. No? I've had them out more than usual lately because of my approaching marriage. Oh, I... Didn't know about that. You getting married soon? Yes, in two weeks. To a very lovely girl. One will wear these pearls as they should be worn. Proudly. Uh, that's her picture there on the radio. Beautiful. Uh, you're a lucky man, Mr. Carruthers. Indeed I am, Mr. Wood. Here they are. The Carruthers pearls. Yes. I see. They are everything I expected, Mr. Carruthers. Hmm. Uh, I wonder if I could borrow them for a few hours. I know the request is a bit unusual, but I'm leaving for the coast in the morning, and I would like to have them photographed before I leave. Well, uh, Mr. Hood... I'm I... writing a book on famous jewels, the ownership of them, or their history. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't be complete without a mention and an illustration of your pearl. Uh, tomorrow morning, Mr. Hood. Well, look, uh... you know me. If you don't, you can establish that I am not an imposter by checking with the New York police and Mr. McIntosh, my local manager. Well, I... I have to have these pearls for just a few hours. Uh, Grace. Oh, quiet, Sandy. Mind your manners. I'm on the phone. Now, how 
How did you get that necklace back, Greg? Well... Well, howdy there, Skyline Kilroy. Uh, hello, Kilroy. Greg Hood. Now, what makes me so lucky? Uh, what do you want to know now? Uh, Charles P. Carruthers of the Park Avenue Carruthers is this, is engaged to marry a girl named Nida Miles. Well, now, that's startling news. I had it in my column a month ago. What paper do you read anyway, Greg? Oh, I love you, Kilroy, and we'll discuss that fact at great length later. Right now, I want to know where Miss Nida Miles lives. Well, just a minute. I've got it right here in my file somewhere. Uh, hang on, Hanson. Oh, flatter us. What is it all about, Greg? Oh, well, Sandy, it's pretty involved. I can't explain the whole thing to you while I'm talking to somebody else. You should c- try to curb that urge to be inquisitive. She uh, lives in an apartment at uh, 626 East 72nd Street. Uh-huh. Now, what else do you want to know? Uh, what do you know about the background of the Miles female? Where's she come from? Well, there you have me, Greg. Why, what's up? Well, if I tell anybody, I'll tell you first. There may not be anything to tell. You must have something on her background. Where did she meet and capture the wily Carruthers millions? Well, she was singing in a nightclub when that happened. Yeah? The club, uh, Managua. Oh? Old Charles P. saw her, loved her, asked her to marry him, and she said yes, being very much in her right mind. Oh, I see. Ah, uh, Managua. That's dude Defoe's joint, isn't it? Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll take you to lunch tomorrow. Good night, sweetheart. Come on, Sandy. We're going to take a cab ride over to East 72nd Street. Clerk? Uh, yes? Uh, what apartment is occupied by Miss Nida Miles? Uh, Miss Miles just went out a minute ago. I'm surprised that she didn't pass you in the entrance. Oh, thanks. Well, where are we going now, Greg? I don't know, but I expect to find out. Come on. Uh, uh, Dorman? Yes, sir? Did Miss Miles just take a cab away from here a minute ago? Yes, sir, she did. Would $10 help you to remember where she asked the driver to take her? No, uh, let me see. I have a very important message for her. I have to locate her right away. All right, Pirate 20. Oh, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. She asked to be driven to the Club Managua. Well, thank you very much, sir. That's okay. Is there any additional charge for whistling me up a cab? No, sir. <laughs> I just hope we get there in time to do some good, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about. Uh, Club Managua on 52nd. Can you make it in five minutes for a dollar a minute? I can make it in four minutes for two dollars a minute. It's a deal. Get us there fast. Uh, take a look inside, Sandy. Maybe she beat us here. All right, Jake. Yeah. There you are, driver. Hello, Miss Miles. Fancy meeting you here. Come on. Where are you taking me? Well, let's just drop in this restaurant for a minute before we go to the Club Managua, shall we? No, I have Come to... Come on, or I'll call a policeman. I want to talk with you. All right. I couldn't be in any more trouble anyway. Uh, here, let's take this corner booth. Get in there. All right. Now, we talk. I'll bring you up to date. You're engaged to marry a lot of money, the Carruthers millions. Somebody's blackmailing you. Who is it? I can't tell you. I'll tell you. It's Dude Defoe, isn't it? What's he got on you, youngster? Why should I tell you? Because I want to help you. What's he got? Letters? Pictures? Yes, both. I have to get them back. Oh, we'll get them back, all right. Let me see your purse. No. Yes. Give it here. Ah, still got the black pearls. Gonna give them the dude. He planned this whole thing, didn't he? It would take a crook like him to plan anything as clever as this. I had to do what he told me to. I had to. You can think whatever you like, but I'll be a good wife to Charles. He's good to me. He has respect for me. I'll make him happy. Look me right in the eye and tell me that, baby. All right. I'll be a good wife. I'll make him happy. I love him. He's good to me. Okay. Come on, let's see dude and give him those pearls, shall we? Office, huh? All right, let me handle it. Oh, hello, Nida. Hello, dude. Why would you bring this guy with you for? I'll answer that. I'm here to see that she gets a square deal. 
Where are the letters and pictures? Where are the pearls? Give them to me, Nina. All right. Thank you. Let's have your material now, hot shot. There you are. Look them over, Nina. See that they're all there. All right. Uh, you look familiar. No? Huh? The name is Hood. Gregory Hood. I've got news for you, dude. After we finish our little deal here tonight, if Miss Miles ever is bothered by you again, she gets in touch with me and you talk it over with the police. I stand pretty good with them, you know. Yeah, I know. I've heard about you, Hood. How come uh, you're mixing into this caper? Dull evening. Oh. Just remember, next time you'll be dealing with me and not a scared little singer. They're all here, Mr. Hood. Okay. Here are your pearls, dude. Okay. All buttoned up. That finishes it, Hood. Thanks, Nida. You're not welcome. But you can have them this time. Tear those letters and stuff up, Nida. We're going to use them as a burnt offering to the god of matrimony. Right here in Dude's Ashtray. Okay. Well, Greg, now maybe you'll tell me why you gave those pearls to that blackmailer. I know some things I think you do. Hold on, I'll make it simple. Dude Defoe knew about that black pearl necklace Charles T. Carruthers owned. He also had a fine stack of blackmail literature on the girl Carruthers was going to marry. So he had her get the pearls one day. He had a paste copy made up of the strand and a duplicate alligator case made. Oh. Oh, I see. Good. So, the next opportunity Nida had, she switched the phonies for the real pearls. Uh-huh. She was supposed to leave the real ones in her seat on the bus where one of Dude's gorillas could pick them up. We interfered, and that started all of the, uh... Excitement. Mm, well, it's a little clearer now, but... Uh... I'll take you all the way. I had in my pocket the phony pearls, which I borrowed from Carruthers, when I met Nida outside the Club Managua tonight. Uh-huh. While we were in the restaurant, I switched them for the real pearls while Nida was looking into my eyes. Right now, I've got the real pearls in my pocket. Huh? Dude's got the phonies in his safe, and Nida has burned up all the evidence he had to blackmail her with. I return the real ones to Charles P. Carruthers in a few minutes, and... Everybody will live happily forever after. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to be there when Dude finds out he has his own pearls. Well, well my goodness, Greg. That, well, as usual, everything has worked out all right, and you, you've you managed to escape alive, but there's a law of averages, you know. That... Hey, it's 11.30. I have to get these pearls back to the owner, and we have a date to meet Roy Del Ruth and Gail Storm at 21 at midnight. <laughs> I want to tell them my story about... It happened on Fifth Avenue. Uh, no, I don't think I will. They'd never believe it. <laughs> Why does everything happen to happen to me, Sandy? Interesting story, Greg. You do let beautiful women lead you into the most amazing adventures. Oh, I'm easily led, her. I, sh- I should think you'd have been scared. After all, she was carrying a gun. Oh, but that's it. I like my women with arms. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, I'll let that one go. And what's our story going to be about next week, Greg? Well, Herb, next week I'm going to tell about an adventure Sandy and me and Ray Driscoll, the designer, had in San Francisco a few months ago. It concerns a good-for-nothing son-in-law... An irascible father-in-law, and fifty thousand dollars in a suitcase. We call it ransomed. See you next week, Herb. The Case Book of Gregory Hood is written by Ray Buffum. Original music composed and played by Dean Fossler. Elliot Lewis plays the part of Gregory Hood, and Sanderson Taylor is played by Howard McNear. Gail Storm was heard as Nida Miles. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. The Case Book of Gregory Hood comes to you from our Hollywood studio.
This is Herb Allen saying good night for the Petrie family, the family that took time to bring you good wine. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Casebook of Gregory Hood. Presented by the American Broadcasting Company. His office is high in the tower of a skyscraper overlooking San Francisco Bay. His name is Gregory Hood. By day, president of the Hood Importing Company. By night, criminologist and man about town. Tonight's story from out of his casebook, The Carnival of Death. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Gregory Hood. Let's understand this from the start. I'm not a playboy. But when a hot blonde who's due to inherit a cool million suddenly writes me, Be sociable, Greg. Drop around for a drink. (laughs) It's three to one. I'll drop around. That's how I got involved with Leora Thorne. I was in my office with Sanderson Taylor, my attorney, nose to the grindstone, sticking to business, when along came Leora's invitation. Uh, excuse me, Sandy, but this letter's been lying on my desk all day. Ah, perfume. Mm-hmm. Dear Greg, just because an old flame has got herself happily married, that's no reason to cross her off your books. How's about dropping her on for a drink tomorrow afternoon? I want you to meet Bradley, my new husband. You'll like him. (laughs) From uh, quite a lady, Greg, judging by your smile. Remember Leora Littleton? She's now Leora Thorne. Oh, the one who's coming into old Colonel Littleton's money? One million dollars next year. She wants me to drop over this afternoon. What for? Just for Auld Lang Syne, I guess. Probably giving a big cocktail party. Has she still got that big estate on Shore Drive? Mm Mm-hmm. Swimming pool and all the trimmings. Oh, uh, take my advice and you'll stay put. I'm sort of curious to see Leora again. It's been a whole year. Now, Greg, don't get involved. Oh, oh, nonsense. The gal's happily married. She says so. (laughs) Haven't you ever noticed, Greg, that your ex-girlfriends never invite you to their homes unless there's trouble brewing? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Sanderson, you're a cynic. (laughs) I'll be back later to finish those contracts with you. Greg, I'm warning you. My attorney, Sanderson Taylor, is heap smart engine. I should have avoided that perfumed billy do like rat poison. Because when I got to Leora's, there wasn't any party. There wasn't so much as a friendly Greg. How have you been instead? Greg... You're just in time. Hey, what gives? This is Brad, my husband. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Hood. I've been meaning to drop around ever since I read about you two getting married. Never mind the chit-chat. Go into that small room over there. And listen. Listen to everything that's said. Wait a minute. All I came for was a nice sociable visit. Greg, I need you. I'm desperate. That's right, Mr. Hood. We're both desperate. Before I could say, I'm booked for this waltz, thank you, and walk out, they'd pushed me into a small powder room. I watched them go into the library right alongside. I watched the butler usher in a little runt who wore a face like a dachshund plus a twitch. An unsavory type. I listened to Docko Face talking to Leora and Brad. My boss says to tell you an old Chinese proverb. Confucius say... A Welsher gets it in the neck. I'm not Welshing. Three grand worth. I don't owe him a penny. What about the IOU? The game was crooked. I only signed it to get out of the place. Better pay it, girlie, to stay out of a coffin. Say, look, whoever you are, have a heart. That crap game was rigged. My wife was cheated into losing all that money. Please, I need time. Tell your boss to give me time. A week from today, my boss says. What? What about a week from today? That's how long you get. Or else... Girlie, that chassis of yours won't look so pretty with a bullet in the upholstery. Oh, Brad, Brad, what am I going to do? Oh, precious lamb, you've simply got to pay off. I can't, I can't. Now we'll sell your jewelry, rent this house, anything. Just so your life isn't in danger. Oh, please, please, precious lamb. Now, look, you two. You've roped me into this, so you'd better give me the lowdown. Great. You heard that little man. Mm-hmm. Where have you been gambling, Leora? 
Out at Pacific Playland. Pacific Playland? That's an amusement park. I begged Leora to stay away. You didn't drop 3,000 on ping pong and darts, did you? There's a floating crap game out there. People never tell me these things. Who runs it? I don't know his name. They just call him the boss. A rigged dice game at a honky-tonk carnival. Leora, have you lost your senses? I... I can't explain it, Greg. Every now and then I get this itch to gamble. It just grabs hold of me and... Well, this time I got in too deep. I tried to stop her, Mr. Hood. Hmm. Well, my advice is square up. I didn't like the looks of Jojo, the dog-faced messenger boy. I can't pay, Greg. What? I haven't the money. Leora Littleton, NG on the credit? I don't come into the bulk of Grandfather's estate for another year. You know that. Right now, I'm in debt all over town. Darling, we'll sell things off. It's the only way. You're right, Thorne. Take that wristwatch you're wearing, for instance. What about it? I handle lots of fine Swiss watches at the Hood Importing Company, but nothing that unusual. I've never seen a heart-shaped design like that. I had it made like a heart because I gave it to Brad. As a wedding present. Well, that watch alone at some high-class hawk shop. Oh, no, I can't let Brad part with it. Oh, but precious lamb, for your own safety and for my peace of mind. Your husband's very sensible. Don't risk your life, Leora. Well, then help me, Greg. Find out who's after me. Well, I'll think it over. Oh, you were the one person, Greg, I knew I could turn to. If you help us, Mr. Hood, you'll never find two people more grateful. Well, I have to go now, but you'll be hearing from me, Leora. I'll show you to the door, Mr. Hood. This way. I'm so worried about her, Mr. Hood. Naturally. Oh, sometimes I wish Leora didn't have, well, all this. She's a swell kid. It just needs taking care of. I'm doing my best. You know, I think you are. I think you have a pretty level head in your shoulders. Oh, thanks. Well, I'm so crazy about her. A lot of folks probably think I just married her for the money. Well, anybody can see that isn't the case. Well, chin up. Don't let Leora get too upset. Well, I'll try not. Good meeting you, Thorne. It was grand meeting you. And please, help us out of this mess. <laughs> Well, Greg, uh, how was Leora's cocktail party? What cocktail party? Ah, oh. I thought so. She only got you out there to rope you into something. Put your hat on, Mr. Taylor. We're going places. What What? What about these business contracts? They'll keep. We're going to Pacific Playland. The amusement park? What goes on out there, it seems, isn't so amusing. <laughs> What did you find out, Greg? I've been pumping some of the concession owners. Do they know anything about a floating gambling game? They do. They're keeping mum. Uh, what about the man they call the boss? Couldn't learn a thing. Oh? Uh, what about the little man who threatened Leora? Dockleface? Yes, he works out here. They recognized my description of him. Who is he? Name's Benny Baker, known as Hot Licks Baker. <laughs> Hot Licks? Used to be a trap drummer until he found an easier pitch. Well, he sounds like a charming character. They tell me he works at one of the concessions, some daredevil trapeze act, the incomparable florette, whatever that yes, is. Yes, it's over there. You see that neon sign? Well, hanging over that big tent. Well, come on, let's go visiting. Tickets, Sandy. Uh, Greg, hurry, uh, hurry, hurry. Uh, that Barker. What about him? I have a feeling he's looking at us. No law against giving his customers the once over. No, it's just that, well, he kind of nodded when he spotted you. As if. Look out, Greg! That neon sign is coming loose! Greg, get out of the way! Are you all right, Greg? Me? Sure, Sandy. Oh. You. Lucky thing you push me. Oh, I. I had heart failure. You were standing right under it. You had heart failure. Yeah. Brother, I could feel the breeze as that sign went past me. Oh. Everybody okay out there? Oh, boy. Uh, accidents will happen. We'll have the debris cleaned up in a jiffy. In the meantime, just step up, ladies and gents. See, Florette. Florette being comfortable. Florette, the wonder girl. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Uh, Greg, 
That was not an accident. Sure it was, Sandy. The sign just tore loose. When you were directly under it? I think somebody wanted to kill you. Oh, nonsense. He's right, Mr. Hood. Huh? I said your friend is right. 200%. She was dressed in a kind of spangled costume, a carnival performer. She'd inched her way to us through the crowd. She pulled Sandy and me over onto one side and talked in quick whispers, as if there wasn't much time. He knows you're after him. Who does? The boss, the man I work for. Who is he? What's he look like? Where does he hang out? What's it worth to you, Mr. Hood? To find out who's threatening the Ord Thorn. Suppose you tell us first who you are. What's a diff who I am? Make with the cash you offer and you'll get what you really want to know. Fifty. Oh, chicken feed, Mr. Hood. A hundred. Come again. Double or nothing. Step in, folks. Big show's about to commence. You will see Florette being comfortable. Well, that's my cue. i got to go in the tent. You're Florette. Yeah, yeah, for a crummy 65 a week. All right, you win, Florette. $200. Let's have it. Where can I find this man they call the boss? Well, he's always at the same place. You'll find... Oh, look, I I, I ain't got time to talk now. Why not? Wait. Come back here. After my act. Meet me back at the tent in my dressing room. We bought our tickets, Sandy and I, and followed the crowd into the big tent. Pretty soon, the girl appeared and climbed a rope ladder, a hundred feet up at least. Four times a day she did this stunt. She must have had nerves of iron. don't get it, Greg. Get what? Well, uh, a trapeze artist, a honky-tonk character. What possible connection can she have with a girl like Leora Thorne? That is what we're going to pay her $200 to find out. Are you ready, Miss Florette? All ready! Ah! Greg, she missed! They're taking her to the dressing room. She'll never live after that fall. Wait, let's get out of here, Sandy. Keep your seats, ladies and gentlemen. Please keep your seats. It was an accident. An accident. Please keep your seats. Excuse us, please. We have to get through. Keep going, Greg. I'm right behind you. This time, I'll bet my most sincere necktie on it, Sandy. That was deliberate. What? Did you notice the fellow who was beating the temple for her? Oh, the little fellow with the drum? Uh-huh. Uh, yes, what about him? He took a powder as soon as she missed that second trapeze. Well? He was Benny Baker. Uh, the man who went to see Leora Thorne? That's right. And this was murder, pal. Deliberate murder. <laughs> Comparable Florette was dying a death I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. We pushed our way through before anybody could stop us. An ambulance intern was already there, shaking his head. A policeman was there, too, making duck tracks in his notebook. I could see what was in the wind when I heard the copper say, Open and shut case, looks like. Just an accident. We may as well get out of here, Greg. Not yet, Sandy. But it's too late. The girl won't be able to talk to us. Maybe she will. Look at her eyes. Her eyes? She's staring at us. I think she wants us to come closer. (sighs) Can you speak, Florette? Try. Try hard. (sighs) Who is he? This boss person. The man who made them do this to you. Oh, Greg, it's no use. Wait, wait. She's moving her lips. The, the death. The death ride. What's she saying? Something about death. 
Something about a death ride. Shh. Listen. Last boat. Last boat. On the death ride. Come on, Greg. She's dead. <laughs> Didn't get very far, did we? Not yet, but you may quote me as saying I'm hopeful. Oh, Greg, for Pete's sake. What? Call the Orathorn. Tell her you're washing your hands of this. Not a chance. But we have we have work to do back at the office. But this is ridiculous, traipsing around an amusement park. I'm going to find out who the gentleman known as the boss is. He's responsible for Florette's murder. What makes you so sure that Florette was murdered? You'll see. Right now, I'm wondering what she meant by that death ride, death ride stuff. She may have been referring to Leora. It could be. But on the other hand, hey. What, Greg? Down there on the midway and colored lights a mile high. The death ride. 25 cents. An amusement concession. Well, things are adding up. Come on. We ran down the midway, past the bingo joints and frozen custard stands. For only two bits, the death ride looked entertaining enough. It was a long tunnel filled with water. Flat-bottomed boats chained together took you on a dark and dismal voyage. But we didn't go on it. Not yet we didn't. Because just as we got there... What's the matter? Did you see what I saw? Where? Over there, the ticket booth. He was buying a ticket on the death ride. Then he spotted us and ducked. Who? Benny Baker. There he goes up that alley. Quick, Sandy, we can corner him. Hit him off, Greg. I'm trying to. All right, slow up, Baker. End of the line. Okay, okay, okay. You're out of training, Hotlicks. It's the life you lead. Who do you want? Hold him, Sandy. Got him. Get, get me alone. Quite a trick, Hot Lakes. Who put you up to it? Up to what? Florette's belly flop. That was an accident. Slight correction, a murder. You're wacky. Listen, Benny, I know how trapeze artists work. They practice a certain beat till every muscle is adjusted to it. And when that beat is changed, even by a split second... So that's how he did it. That's how he did it, by changing the drum beat. A couple of Weissenheimers, huh? Well, try and pin something on me. We both heard that drum. So did a hundred other people in that audience. You're cooked, Benny, unless you talk. Who put you up to it? Sup- Suppose I sing. What then? A deal? Yeah. I don't do business with rats, Benny. Here's what I do. Hey, get it out. I'm sick, I tell you, I'm sick. Who's the man that hires you? Start singing. All right, all right, only stop. I figure he's a middle-aged guy, maybe. Kind of fat, maybe, judging by his voice. I, I never actually seen him. But he paid you to threaten Mr. and Mrs. Thorne and to take care of Florette. Yeah, yeah. Only I never actually seen him. Well, where is his gambling place located? He ain't the gambler. He ain't the guy Leora lost the money to. No? He's only using that, see? To pull some other racket on Mr. and Mrs. Thorne. Some other racket? What kind? Don't ask me. I just follow orders. Well, how if you've never seen the man? The boss gives me orders on the phone. How does he pay you off? Well, he meets me now and then, but always in the darkness. In the darkness? Oh, Greg, he's lying to us. I ain't. I ain't. Where I ain't. Look, over there, where I'm pointing that's where he meets me. On the death ride? Yeah, the last boat. You believe him, Greg? Hmm. Could be. Remember the girl's dying words to us? Yeah. I think he's telling the truth. What, uh, what, what are you going to do to me, mister? Until the police take over, I'm leaving you in the capable hands of Mr. Taylor here. Uh, uh, Greg, uh, where are you off to? A sudden yen has come over me, Sanderson. I haven't tried one of those amusement rides since I was a small boy. you you're going on the death ride? If anybody wants me, I'll be in the last boat, keeping a date in the darkness of the tunnel. I strayed over to the ticket booth and put down my quarter. It was past midnight now, and I was the only customer. I waited by the entrance gates. A string of tiny boats emerged from the tunnel, slowed up, and disgorged a load of giggling bobby soxers. Then it was my turn. I asked the old geezer who was in charge 
Mind if I ride in the last one? Ride anywhere as you please, mister. The death ride got underway, with yours truly as the only passenger. Suddenly, I felt lonely, as if I didn't have a friend in the world. The boat's headed into the long, black tunnel. I couldn't see my hand two inches in front of my face. In the inky blackness, I lost all sense of direction. I felt stifled, beads of perspiration collected on my forehead. But, so far, no fellow passenger. You know that feeling you get in a dark room? That a stranger is right alongside you? Well, suddenly I knew. I could sense him sitting behind me in that last boat. I waited for him to speak. But all I could hear was the water in that tunnel and his watch. The ticking of his watch. I remember how it echoed. Finally, when he talked, his voice was muffled. But when I answered... Tried to sound like Mr. Benny Hotlick's dockle face Baker. Fat you, Benny? Yeah. Take care of Florette? Yeah. Good boy. Got another job for you, Benny. Okay. Up near Tahoe. Gonna be an accident up there. Tomorrow morning. What kind of accident? Fallen rocks. Automobiles are going to get out of control. Will someone get killed? A girl. Suddenly, a shaft of light. There must have been a torn place in the canvas that lined the tunnel. Suddenly, he must have seen that I wasn't Benny because... Okay, Juan. I couldn't turn around. His hands were on my throat. I still couldn't see who he was, and the hands kept gripping tighter. Tighter! And then Roman candles started shooting off in my brain. Bonfires danced before my eyes. And then, I blacked out. So long, Hood. Here's where you get off. Only two feet of water, but enough to drown you. (coughs) Greg. Take it easy, old man. Oh, my throat. Just lie on that bench for a while. Where'd you find me, Sandy? On the death ride. Floating face down. You deserve a Carnegie Medal for life-saving. How come such perfect timing? Well, uh, he got away. Baker? I was running after him. Just as we passed the death ride, I saw a passenger climbing out of the last boat. It wasn't you, and I got worried. That passenger... What did he look like? I didn't wait to see. I grabbed a flashlight from the old man and went sloshing into the tunnel to find you. I never saw that other passenger either. Too dark. That was the boss. Yes. Any idea of his identity? None. His hands suddenly... Sandy. Yes? I just remembered that fellow's hands, his left wrist. What? Never mind, it'll keep. We'd better get after Benny Baker. I've learned he's a professional killer with another job on tap for tomorrow morning. Oh, and I let him get away. Come on, we've got to stop him. What are you stopping for, Greg? We won't have to look any further for Mr. Benny Hotlicks Baker. Where? I don't see him. Look. Now do you see him? Where you're pointing? Yes. That concession over there. Hilbert's Waxworks Museum. Those figures on display outside. Look at those wax figures. Oh. Oh. Greg... How fantastic. Fantastic was the word, all right. Three of them standing upright and motionless. Napoleon, Mary Queen of Scots holding her head in her hands, and Jack the Ripper, all built of wax. Alongside, slumped over and equally motionless, was Benny Baker. They made a lovely foursome. Oh, that... That green spotlight on them, you'd you'd almost swear that Benny was a wax figure, too. Yeah, except for the bullet hole and the blood. Sandy, let's get back to the car. Ah, Greg, 
Where are you driving to? You'll see. This isn't the direction to my house. I'm not taking you home, pal. Oh, now, see here, Greg. Enough is enough. I've got a home and a comfy rest mattress waiting for me. Yes, and a wife who's probably ready to divorce me for staying out all night. Here we are, Leora Thorne's house. I agree. I know it's late, Leora, but I've got to see you. This is Sandy Taylor, my attorney. How do you do? How do you do? Come into the library, Leora. I want to talk to you. I'll wait out here in the hall. Yes, Greg? Are you, by any chance, planning an auto trip? Well, how did you know? A little birdie told me. In the morning, Brad and I are driving out of town for the weekend. Up to Lake Tahoe? Well, who told you? You're not going, Leora. But, Greg, Brad and I were the counting... The trip is on... off for a very simple reason. If you value your life... If I... Greg, what are you talking about? Why, hello, Mr. Hood. Oh, Brad, darling. You better come in and listen to this. Well, I woke up as I heard you going downstairs, precious. Greg insists that we call off our trip to Tahoe. Oh? Well, why is that, Mr. Hood? Falling rocks. What? There's to be an accident on that mountain road to Leora's lodge. Leora is scheduled to be a corpse. Greg! What? You mean they actually kill her because of that gambling debt? That petty crap game operator hasn't been threatening Leora at all. Well, then who... Somebody who figures this is a perfect time to put you in a nice marble mausoleum while he can use that gambling debt as a cover-up. But who? I haven't any enemies. But you're absolutely sure of this, Mr. Hood. I've met the gentleman in question. You've seen him? I didn't say I'd seen him. We met in the darkness. He tried to kill me. What? Oh, he's a bad boy. He had two Confederates working with him. When they talked too much, he put them both out of the way. It, it all sounds so, so fantastic. I... Mrs. Laura's right, Mr. Hood. It's like a bad movie. You don't care for melodramatic doings, eh, Thorne? Well, I guess I'm just not used to them. You like things to be calm and serene, eh? Well, yes, I guess you'd call me the matter-of-fact type. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell me something, Thorne. Yes? Don't you ever get tired? I'm tired of what? Of playing cat and mouse, you filthy Greg, swine. you're out of your mind. He knows you love him now, Leora. He knows he's mentioned in your will. He also knows how changeable you are, and he'd rather be a rich widower than a poor ex-husband. What? Get out! I'm not listening, Brad. I'm just not listening. You used to work in carnivals in the old days, didn't you, Thorne? With Florette and Benny, you knew they could be hired for a price. Brad, don't let him say these things. That's right, Thorne. Don't let me say them. Okay, Hook. This is how you want it. Stand up. Grab that gun. You too, precious lamb. What? You once told me you'd die for me. Here's your big chance. Oh, no. You see, he's right. You are too changeable, precious. You'd be getting tired of me one of these fine days, and we mustn't have that. What, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Finish up what I started. Okay, Sandy, you can come in now. Watch out, Sandy! Ah! I'm okay. He shot with wire. Drop that gun, Thorne. Drop it. You dirty... Drop it. Drop it. Grab him, Sandy. I've got him. All right, Thorne. Uh... Are you coming quietly to the police, and we play more patty cake? How come? Quietly. I knew it was you ever since that excursion on the death ride. You knew? How? Say goodbye to your wife. Goodbye, precious lamb. Now take off the wristwatch and give it to her. I don't want it. But your love gift to him is what put me onto him. What? Uh, In the darkness, Thorn, it was like an engraved calling card. Uh, a wristwatch? Heart shaped. Extremely unusual. And you forgot all about the luminous dial. You have heard The Carnival of Death, an adventure from the casebook of Gregory Hood, written this week by Jerome D. Ross, directed by Martin Andrews and produced by Frank Cooper Associates. Listen again next week at the same time over this ABC station for the story of the Mutton Jade Buddha, another adventure from the casebook of Gregory Hood.
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting The Cases of Mr. Ace, starring George Rapp. Yes? Uh, my name's Eddie Ace. Oh, yes, you're the private detective. Yes. There was a message at my office from a Dr. Gale. Asked me to come right over here. Is he in? I am Dr. Gale. Come in. Please. Hmm. So, you're Dr. Gale. <laughs> Shouldn't I be? I didn't expect you to be a woman. Uh, what can I do for you? I want to retain you to talk to me. To, to talk to you? You'll be amply repaid for your time. Well, you don't have to bribe me. All you have to do is tell me what I'm to talk to you about. Your experiences? Why? You see, I'm a psychoanalyst, Mr. Ace. I'm planning a book dealing with criminal psychology. And I intend to do something different. And there, I need your help. I want the material fresh and unbiased, so to speak. From the point of view of a private detective. Of more specifically, an Eddie Ace. You make me feel very important. Is that a trick of a psychoanalyst? No. That's a trick of a woman. What do you say, Mr. Ace? All you want me to do is to come here whenever I'm finished a case and tell you about it. Mm-hmm. The strange people you meet. What they said, how they reacted, what they were after. I guess you know what you're after, Dr. Gale. All right. When do we begin? I'm listening, Mr. Ace. I'm listening. <laughs> The Cases of Mr. Ace, starring George Rapp, and produced and directed by Jason James. You're sure my typewriter won't disturb you, Mr. Ace? I don't think the typewriter will bother me. But I'm not so sure about the typist. When you arrived, you said you didn't expect me to be a woman. You were right. I'm a psychoanalyst. Shall we begin, Mr. Ace? Mm. I see what you mean. Yeah. Well, it, it all started with a killing that was no business of mine. The murder of Frederick Miller. You know, the corporation lawyer. His body had been found in his apartment. Three bullets in it. As I say, it was no business of mine until I arrived at my office over on 6th Avenue in the morning after the killing. A man was waiting to see me. He was very small, very dark, very smooth. He smiled and showed me all his teeth. He had a lot of them. I opened my door, and he followed me in. Ah, merci, monsieur. Sit down. You're French. Ah, uh, you are very observant, monsieur. What can I do for you? Uh, permit me. My name is Sir Espore, Pierre Foray. Uh, I have selected you to perform for me a very important service. Oui, a service. Such as? Uh, uh... Oui, oui, oui. Now we come to it. Uh, last night, monsieur, I performed a most impulsive act. I killed a man. I see. You're a big boy now. You must learn to control yourself. Ah, uh, you are right. Uh, but uh, that is how I am. I killed him, and I do not feel regret. I feel only pleasure when I look into my eyes and see him die again and again. Oh, that's better than a double feature. I had warned this man, monsieur. Twice I had warned him to stay away from Sally, my wife. He would not. So I killed him. It is simple. You make it sound reasonable. Who is the lucky lover? A pig named Miller. It is in all the papers. Oh, such a fuss. All for one pig named Miller. Oh, Frederick Miller, eh? A week. Cochon. What are your plans? Uh, that is why I've come to you, monsieur. I am now on my way to the city hall of justice. Giving yourself up? Oui, but it is not serious. When I explain to the man in charge of the justice why I killed this, this Miller, uh, he will let me go. Yes, you're sure. He's cute that way. Uh, well, uh, why did you come to see me? To all for me two things, monsieur. 
One, a five hundred dollars. And uh, two, this little key. Oh, this, uh, this key, eh? Here we. You will hold it for me until after the man in charge of the justice has heard my case. When I return, you will give it to me. Suppose you don't return. Oh, fit is certain. How do I know? Because I am a Frenchman. But, but I say, if by some silly mistake I am detained, then you will give it to my lawyer. But only if I am detained by what you call a conviction of guilty. Why not give it to your lawyer now, yourself? He still remains to be selected. And I do not wish to surrender myself to the justice dispenser with the key and my person. Mm, I see. And this 500, what do I do with it? That? You keep it, monsieur, for your uh, trouble. Ferre left, and I sat fingering the 500 and the key. It's a small brass key, the kind you use on your trunk. No marks on it except the number, 427. I had Ferre doped as a nut. Anyway, uh, Ferre confessed to the killing of Miller. The final edition stole out Timothy Hogan. The wild Irish criminal lawyer came forward with an officer to defend the prisoner. The next morning, Hogan came into my office. I had a hunch he would. And as sure as I'm sitting here in your office, Mr. Ace, I'm certain that Pierre Ferre did not kill Miller. He confessed. Confessed? Ha! <laughs> so there you have a darling confession. A Frenchman, a crime of passion, and he gives himself up. No, oh, no, not Ferre. Not after talking to the man. And what's your best guess? Think, man, think. Can't you see it? Maybe I'm looking in the wrong direction. And that you are. The Ray is covering up for someone, someone he loves. His wife? Aha, uh-huh. that's the thought, Mr. Ray. That's precisely the thought. And that's why the case attracted me. There's uh, no money in it. But it's sentimental and violent. And uh, <clears throat> I'm Irish. Well, it could be. But if he's covering up for his wife, how are you going to get him to sing? I must. If I can get him to recant a confession from his wife, well, I could get her an acquittal with a twist of the wrist. Good heavens, man. Look at the elements. Self-sacrificing husband, outraged and betrayed wife. She comes forth at the last minute. Why, it's better than Mother McCree. I'll have the jury swimming in their own tears. I like your script. How are you going to get it on the stage? Aha, uh-huh, that's, uh, that is the problem. And there I need your help. I know this much. Yesterday, before he gave himself up, Ferre came to you. What did he tell you? Nothing. He gave you something? Nothing. Oh, I don't think you're telling me the gospel truth, Mr. Hill. I'm not. Hmm, I see. Very well. I tried to persuade Foray to give you his permission to talk to me. That's better. But in the meantime, Mr. Ayers, in the meantime, you might try to sound out the wife for me. Very, very discreetly, understand? But sound her out. Are you hiring me? Yes. Will you see what you can do? Well, I'm practically there now. <laughs> Yes? Mrs. Ferre? Go away. All day you reporters have been I'm a detective. What do you want? Sit down. Say what you want and get out. Do as I say or I'll take you downtown. You don't frighten me a bit. I'm ready. Mm. I see what you mean. Okay. I'll level with you, Mrs. Ferre. I'm not from the police. I'm a private detective. I'm working for your husband's lawyer on the Miller killing. You knew Miller. Yes. Yes, I knew him. What is that to work on? That rat Pierre killed him. I hope he dies in the chair for it. Pierre says you were seeing Miller. That might save him from the chair. Let him prove that. Just let him prove I ever saw Fred Miller outside of his office on business. When did you see Miller last? None of your business. Get out. Sure. But keep this in mind, Mrs. Ferre. Your husband confessed to the murder. But maybe you'd be able to give the jury the impression that he's covering up for someone else. Someone maybe like his ever-loving wife. I said go on, get out. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, did you ever see this key before? No. Now get out of here. And tell that rat Pierre I'll do my best to get a ringside seat for his execution. I 
went back to my office, opened my door, and then I saw him. A man was sitting behind my desk. He got to his feet. He didn't introduce himself, but I could tell by the bulge in his right pocket that he had a very good reference. You are Mr. Ace. What do you want? The key, Mr. Ace. What key? Please, Mr. Ace, do not act childish. Give me the key. I'm bigger than you are. But if you force me to use this gun, I shall be liver than you are. The key, please. He pointed a stubby little revolver at my head. I gave him the key. He thanked me politely enough and left. I counted ten, then raced down the hall to the fire exit, slammed down the iron stairs, and picked up behind him as he was leaving the building. He went straight to the Times Square station. I went right behind him. He went directly to the locker. I was right behind him. He inserted a key in the locker number 427, threw the latch, pulled the little door open, and then... It must have been hours later when I opened my eyes. I was still in the station. Near me and around me were maybe a dozen more. Cops and interns milled around. But bending over me was Detective Lieutenant Walsh. Feeling better, Ace? Yeah, right. Oh, my head. What happened? Bomb exploded in a locker. Anybody killed? Yeah, the man who opened the booby trap. Blown to bits and uh, three bystanders. You were lucky. You can say that again. All right, I will. You were lucky. And I mean lucky that you didn't open it yourself. I? How could I open it? With the little key you showed Sally Foray. You certainly get around. Where'd you get that key? From Pierre Foray. Oh, Pierre Foray, eh? That's the name. He came to my office. Gave it me to hold. You can ask him. Well, suppose you ask him, Ace. But you'd better get yourself a good spiritualist. Pierre Foray hanged himself in his cell two hours ago. <laughs> police headquarters. He talked to me for two hours. He didn't learn a thing, but I did. Pierre was visiting his cell by Hogan and Mrs. Ferre just before he strung himself up. It was Hogan who found his body when he went back to talk to him again. I asked Walsh what he knew about Hogan, and he didn't know much. I left police headquarters and went around the corner to Jenny the bail bond. Jenny had been around New York longer than the city charter and runs the biggest bail bond mill in town. I asked her what she knew about Timothy Hogan. She didn't know much offhand, but promised me a rundown by morning. I said I'd call her and left it at that. Outside, the rain was just beginning to wash the town. A hack pulled up. I opened the door, bent to get in when... The butt of the gun came down across my skull, and that was that. It was the cold water that brought me out of it. I opened my eyes. A ceiling and a chandelier spun around. I closed them again. Leo, douse him again. Ace. Ace, you hear me? Get up. The man said get up and the man meant it. The man was big. Big enough to lift me to my feet with one hand. I tried to open my eyes. There were battleships tied to the lashes, but I made it. Two other mugs flanked me with Mike in front of me. The rug was wet with blood and water. The water and the rug were theirs. The blood was mine. Somebody must have taken a bad working over. I began to figure it must have been me, but I couldn't remember. In fact, I didn't even know who Ace was when Mike barked the name. You hear me, Ace? Give me... Give me a drink of water. Leo, give him a drink. Uh, better. Oh, you're making a lot of trouble for us, Ace. It ain't necessary. Now, look what you look like. Busted nose, busted lips, busted eyes. You think we like to do things like this? And just look at me old lady's rug. Don't. Don't let it break you up. Just look at yourself. And for what? Tell me. For what? Because you get stubborn. You you mustn't be impatient. Uh, I'm not very bright. What am I? 
What am I stubborn about? All we want to know is where is the envelope Poiré gave you? Michael, how much longer will you be? Uh, j just a few more minutes, Ma. Oh, well, just look at that run. I'll have it cleaned. Well, hurry up. The hot catch is getting all burned. All right, Ace. I'm through talking nice. Where's the envelope? Poiré didn't give me any. Leo, take it. <coughs> oh. I remember there was the old hack screaming about her furniture. I know I smashed a chair when I went down, and that made me feel pretty good. I felt the water hitting my face again. I got my right eye unstuck. I was on my back in a field up in the Bronx. The rain washed over my bruised face, and that felt fine. But I couldn't stay to enjoy it. I remember there was a phone call I had to make. And by the time I let myself into my apartment over on 3rd Avenue, the sun was up. I looked into a mirror. I never saw a guy before in my life. But even if he was a stranger, I had to do something for him. I wrapped some ice in a towel, held it over my face, and then I picked up the phone. Jenny's bail bonds. You sleep in that ratty office of yours, Jenny? Well, there's citizens being arrested, you know, day and night, Ace. I'll take Schmier on holding for you. How does he shape? Well, he was the mouthpiece for the old Ringo mob. Back in Prohibition, you know. Ringo got pushed over, rest his soul. Hogan fronted for the policy boys in Harlem. And finally, he broke away from the heist guys. Went into straight criminal law. Only the very highest types of criminals. Where does he hail from? Why, uh, he's from, uh, says here it says, uh, Timothy Hogan, Washington University... Class of 28, X. X? What's that mean? X, it says here, it says. I see, you didn't, didn't finish at Washington. No record of any other school. I see. All right, thanks, Jenny. Yeah? Anything else I can do for you? Yeah. Keep a nice fat bail bond warm. I may need it. What? Oh. oh. Don't let the face frighten you, Mrs. Foray. I'm just breaking it in for Boris Karloff. What? What happened to you? Mm, what happened to me shouldn't happen to a private detective. But it did. Sit down. We're going to make with a little talk. Look, I'm, I'm in an awful hurry, Mr. Ace. I was just going out. What did you and Hogan tell Pierre in his cell yesterday? Well, I didn't want to go. That lawyer, Hogan, he insisted. Well, I, I guess I blew my top. I... I told Pierre I was going to tell the jury the truth. That, that Freddie, Freddie Miller begged Pierre to give me a divorce. He wouldn't. Instead, he took money from Fred to keep his mouth shut and not make a scandal. And you figure that's why Pierre strung himself up. So there was no chance for him. That's the one thing I regret. He didn't go to the chair. Mm -hmm. You must have had quite a burn for this guy, Miller. When, when I love a man, I love him. I love him. I... Do you <laughs> kind of... Lost now, eh? I loved him, Eddie. It's going to be awful tough. Freddie was... Freddie... Oh, what's the use? I... I wind up with memories in four walls. The kind of memories you can't forget. I kind of cut your heart out every time you breathe. Come here. What am I going to do, Eddie? How can I forget it? Easy. You call me Eddie. Just try calling me. Ready? All right. I'll try it. I'll try it. A little later, I remembered that Sally was just on her way out when I arrived. I asked where she was headed for. She hedged a little, but then I saw the court orders on the desk. She was going down to the First National Bank to open Pierre for a safety deposit box. I went with her. The small vault contained some jewels, an insurance policy, and a bulky package wrapped in brown paper. The jewels are mine. I'll take them with me. Maybe we better see what's in this package. Oh, I can't imagine what it could be. Money. Thousand dollar bills. Must be fifty of them. Fifty thousand dollars? Well, where do, 
Where did he get all that? Not in the private eye business. In this envelope. I think we'd better open it in the presence of a lawyer. Look, I'm going upstairs to see if anybody's around that looks familiar. Here, take this nickel. Yeah. Call police headquarters. Lieutenant Walsh. Tell them to meet me right now at Timothy Hogan's apartment. This is important for both of us, Angel. So don't trip. I'll wait for you outside. <laughs> I waited. Four minutes later, she joined me. Told me Walsh was starting out. We got to Hogan's apartment first. Well, Mr. Ace, Mrs. Foray, sit down, sit down. Hmm. What happened to your face, Mr. Ace? I ran into an open gun cell in the dark. Oh, really? Now, where? I didn't get the address. But it was the home of that mug named Mike you keep on your payroll. I see. What else do you know? Put that heater away, Hogan. Walsh is on his way up. I'll give it to you fast. Frederick Miller, the lawyer used to needle in court. Dug into your background. Found out you weren't a member of the bar. Never finished law school. Why, you aren't even a shyster. And that's why I killed him. Right. But Foray confessed. That was the deal you made with him. Fifty G's if he confessed to the murder of Miller. And you think a man would confess to a murder for any amount of money? You convinced him you'd get him an acquittal. On the unwritten law. But before he agreed, he wanted full protection. This little envelope we got out of his safety deposit box. That's true, Mr. Ace. That's true. I had to give him my signed confession. Just in case anything went wrong. And plenty went wrong. He didn't trust you. You'd try to get that confession back. But you'd watch every move he made before he confessed to the police. That's why he came to me. Gave me a key to a booby trap. He figured you'd try to get that key from me. Open the booby trap. And get your head blown off. But you sent one of your mugs instead. You leave nothing for me to say, yes? Is there anything else you'd like to know before I kill you? Yeah. How did you manage to kill Foray in his cell? That, my friend, that is the trade secret which I cannot divulge. Too bad, Hogan. Right guy like you. I know that Walsh will feel the same way about it. But he's a city cop. Mr. Ace, you are priceless. But you made just one little mistake. You see, Sally here wasn't in love with Miller. You didn't even know him. Sally was and always has been in love with me. That true, Sally? Here's your nickel, Eddie. I didn't make that call to police headquarters. <laughs> so little Sally wasn't three-timing. She was four-timing. You know, Ace, it's remarkable you've stayed alive as long as you have. Can you give me one good reason why I shouldn't kill you? Can I skip that question and take the $32? Go home, Sally. Yeah. Yeah, I'm... I'm sorry, Eddie. Believe me, I am. Go on home and shop in your stiletto. <gasps> Going somewhere, Mrs. Foray? Look out, Walsh. He'll shoot. Yeah. Oh, no. yeah. That's a darling break. Tim. Sally, get your... Number... No! Get your car! No! No, I didn't, Tim. Honest, I didn't. I'm the dying. It's easy. Stop wailing, Sally. He can't hear you. He's dead. And I wish he'd killed you. A brilliant man like him shot down like a dog and you stand there. Okay, Walsh. From here on out, it's your party. The confessions in the envelope will give you the score. Sally is right. He was a brilliant man. And that's how Timothy Hogan died. Here I called Walsh when I left Sally for a minute at the bank. She could have been held as an accessory to the murder of her husband in his cell. But Walsh never got her down to headquarters. She took a header out of the window. I guess it was better for her like that. Well... That was a gory business, wasn't it? Gory? Oh, I, I thought I'd give you the mild ones first. Mild? Good heavens. Do you mean that this sort of thing goes on with you all the time? Only when business is good. Well, for my sake, then, I hope business improves. Good night, Mr. Ace. There's, uh, there's something I'd like to say, Dr. Gale. Yes? Yeah? Well, it's... Uh, never mind, uh, Maybe next time. Or maybe the time after that. You're reading my thoughts, Mark Private. Good night, Dr. Gale.
George Raft as Mr. Ace will be back in a moment with news of next week's case. But now a word from our sponsor. Thank you. And next week I have another appointment with Dr. Gale. I'm going to tell her about a murder that shouldn't have happened. Not even to a corpse. And George will all be waiting to hear that. In the assisting cast tonight, you heard Jeanette Nolan, Kathy Lewis, Theodore Von Elts, Leo Cleary, and Stanley Farrar. The music was composed and conducted by Sandy Courage. This is Carlton Cadell speaking and inviting you to listen again to George Raff in the cases of Mr. Ace. <laughs> National Broadcasting Company presents Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Harding, Counter Spy, calling Washington. United States counter spies, especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. These counter spy reports to the American people are brought to you each week at this time. Now, the case of the invisible insurrectionist. <laughs> Maria, the baby is crying again. Oh, see, she does not sleep. And the doctor says it is sleep that she needs. I know, Maria. It is no good for her here in the city of New York. It is no good here for all of us, Juan. We should go back to Puerto Rico. We will go back soon, Maria. Now, please try to make her stop. Please, my Maria. See, si, I will try. Salinas, my friend, come in. Menard, I came as soon as I could. On the telephone, you sounded troubled. What is it? Salinas, we have been cheated. Cheated? I uh, do not understand. The man who promised to give us jobs in the mill in New Jersey. You do not mean Mr. Franklin? See, si, Mr. Franklin, the man to whom we all gave $50. The man who promised us jobs for that money. The man with whom we signed that contract. Salinas, he is a cheat, this Mr. Franklin. Menard... How do you know this? I have been there today in New Jersey. You went to the mill? Mill? There is no mill, my friend. It is all untrue. No mill? No job? My $50 is gone? Yours and mine and all our friends who have come here from Puerto Rico for work. We must go to the police, Salinas. No. But this man, Franklin, must be punished. First, we will go to this man, Franklin. I know where his office is. We will get what is rightfully ours in our own way. That's quite an interesting story Menard has just told us, huh, Louis? Sure is, Mr. Franklin. You have cheated us all. Me, Salinas, and, and the others who have come here from Puerto Rico. I want my money back, Mr. Franklin. So you want your money back, Menard. And you, Salinas? You don't feel the same way about it, eh, Salinas? See, si, he does. Tell him, Salinas. Eh. No harm will come to Menard. You promised, Mr. Franklin. Salinas! You were smart to bring him here, Salinas. I, I do not understand. You he... promise you will not harm Menard. Mr. Franklin always keeps his word. That's correct, Lewis. I'll just see that Menard gets back to Puerto Rico. With what he knows now, it'd be unwise to allow him to remain here. Salinas, you are this man's accomplice. You have helped him steal from me and your other friends. It had to be done, Menard. To take money from people who have so little... Oh, it was not for the money. I am not a thief. It was for the good of our nation. Puerto Rico. Our nation, Puerto Rico. See, si, for its liberation. We must throw off the yoke of United States tyranny. Then, then you are with the nationalists. They have made you betray your friends. Oh, no, the cause... You do not understand, oh, Menard. I understand. You have been deceived by the real enemies of freedom. 
It is they who would impose tyranny upon us. Salinas, listen before it is too late. Salinas understands that all sacrifices must be made for the good of the cause. Is that not correct, Salinas? Yes. That'll be all, Salinas. You may leave. I cannot believe this, Salinas. All our lives we were such friends. Louis Menard is shocked. I suppose you give him some shock treatment. Sure, Mr. Franklin. What now, Mr. Franklin? I take him down the back way and load him into the car. Okay. And Lewis. Yeah, Mr. Franklin? Now bring your gun with you. You'll need it. Office. Braden, this is Harry Peters, phoning from Counter Spy Patrol Boat 41. I just received word that Mr. Harding's been trying to contact me. Yes, Mr. Harding left hurriedly for a conference at the State Department with Mr. Jordan from the Puerto Rican Affairs Division. He instructed that you meet him in his car outside the State Department building at 11. The conference will be over by then. Mr. Harding said it was an urgent matter. Got it, Braden. I'll be there. First stop, my house. What's it this time, Chief? Here, Peter. Read this bulletin. Came in early this morning from our New York field office. Hmm. How does this concern us? The well, Juan Menard, the man who was found shot to death, is one of an undetermined number of Puerto Ricans who were taken in by a job placement racket. Only the jobs didn't exist, is that it? That's it. After my talk with the Puerto Rican Affairs Division, I'm convinced that the racket is more political than financial. You mean in view of what's been happening in Puerto Rico? Yes, Peter. We've come across all types of sabotage, espionage, enemy propaganda. This is probably the most subtle plan ever conceived of creating anti-United States feeling among Puerto Ricans. Chief, you mean these people come here from Puerto Rico with the promise of work. They're defrauded, then they go back to Puerto Rico with stories of how they were taken over by some Yankee swindler. Yes, that's right. And Juan Menard's murder could be the strongest propaganda point of all. You can understand now, it's not just another murder case. It has overtones of insurrection attached to it. We've got a big job ahead of us. Anything specific to go on, Mr. Harding? Only a vague description of two men connected with the job placement racket. Okay, Chief, when do I pack? Now, you've got just enough time to stick a toothbrush in your pocket. We're flying to New York within half an hour. Can I do something for you? We're looking for Mrs. Juan Menard. I'm David Harding of the Counter Spies. This is Agent Harry Peters. Oh, I'm Mrs. Gladys Milford. Won't you gentlemen come in? Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Menard is out to have a drug prescription filled. It's for the youngest of the children, the baby. I take it you're here concerning her husband. Yes, that's right. Are you a friend? I suppose so, in a sense. I'm with the Welfare League. We give family counseling and aid in such neighborhoods as this. Mm -hmm. You've known the Menards for long, Mrs. Milford? Since they arrived here several months ago, I arranged for the two older children to go to day nursery. At the moment, I'm looking after the infant in the next room. I see. Well, is there anything you could tell us about Juan Menard? I knew little about Mr. Menard. We met only once. This has been a terrible blow to his wife. Yes. We're doing everything for her we possibly can. Oh, did the oh. baby cry, Mrs. Oh, Maria... These men are from the counter-spies. Counter-spies? They want to ask you questions about your husband. About my Juan? My name is Harding. This is Mr. Peters. Uh, we won't stay long, Mrs. Menard. Just a few questions and then we'll leave. Why did they kill my Juan? He was a good man. He did not hurt anybody. Well, Mrs. Menard, do you remember your husband ever mentioning the name of the man to whom he gave money for a job? He did not tell me the name of this man. Oh, the baby, I must go to I'll her. I'll take care of her, Maria. Give me the medicine. See? Si. Now, you do what you can to help Mr. Harding. Oh, gracias, Mrs. Milford. Gracias. Now, Mrs. Menard, who were the other men who gave money to this person? Please, I... I do not want to talk about it. Juan is dead. You cannot bring him back. No, Mrs. Menard. But we can bring his murderer to justice. Justice? There is no justice in this place. We should have never come. 
My Juan would still be alive. Mrs. Menard, your husband was sacrificed to an evil political cause. I do not know about politics. I only know that we came here and my husband was killed. I only know that it is bad here, that the people here are bad, that we cannot... Mrs. Menard, listen to me. That's exactly what certain people want all Puerto Ricans to believe. Now, if we don't find your husband's murderer, if you don't help us, there'll be other murders. More than that, there'll be possibly a great deal of bloodshed in your homeland. Now, you wouldn't want other wives and other families to to suffer as you have, needlessly. Would you? Would you, Mrs. Menard? No. No, I would not want that. Then who were the other men who gave money for Johns? Well, when Pedro Salinas told them about it, they all gave. Pedro Salinas? Si. Salinas and Juan have been friends for many years. Where can we get in touch with Salinas? I, I do not know where he lives. He, he was here with Juan the night that... He left the house with Juan that night, Mrs. Menard? Si. And you don't know where we can find Salinas? Oh, the, the girl he has, Lola, maybe she knows. You have her address? Oh, no, but she works at a restaurant on 110th Street. It's called the El Toro. I see. You, you will find the one who killed my Juan. We're going to try, Mrs. Menard. And we'll start looking with Pedro Salinas' girlfriend, Lola. Lachlan and Mandel Kramer. Lionel Rico speaking. Counter Spy is a Phillips H. Lord production. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Counter Spy. Seven eighty-five east. One flight up, not twice. You didn't see him after that. Uh. Uh-uh. Or hear from him. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. No phone calls, letters, postcards, anything. Uh. Uh. Sure, you haven't heard from him since Juan Bernard was found in that alley, shot to death. Who's uh, Juan Bernard? As if you didn't know. Hmm? You two act like I'm a book of knowledge or something. Look, you got me more questions. I make my living here. The boss will get sore if he sees me wasting any more time. No, no more questions, Lola. Just a word of advice. Like what? Stay here in town where we can get in touch with you. (laughs) I ain't going anyplace. All right. Come on, Peter. Lola's the Lulu of a liar, Mr. Harding. You're telling me. Could have taken her in for questioning. We may do better this way. Which way? When we get out to the patrol car, radio the field office to have a stakeout put on Lola's apartment. I think that may offer us the shortest distance between us and Pedro Salinas. Hello. Peter Franklin, this is uh, Pedro Salinas. Salinas, where have you been? Why haven't you called me since the other night? I have been hiding. After what happened to Juan Menard, I... I was afraid. Uh, I'll uh, explain that later. I want you to bring me the contract, the one you've been persuading your friends to sign. Uh, you still have it, don't you? Yes. All right, bring it to me. And not at the office here. I'll be at the warehouse near Mott Street, you know where. Uh, get there as soon as you can. I'll be waiting for you. <laughs> Salinas, I'll take that contract now. Mr. Franklin, you promised that no harm would come to Juan Menard. He was my friend. What has become of your feelings for the cause? That should be far above personal consideration, Salinas. You promised me. It couldn't be helped. He made things difficult for Lewis. Isn't that correct, Lewis? That's right, Mr. Franklin. You lied to me, both of you. You wanted one dead. You're trying my patience, Salinas. You give me the paper with the signatures. Do like Mr. Franklin says. I do not have them. What? I did not bring them with me. Where are they, Salinas? I will not tell. 
Lewis. Okay. Oh, my arm. My arm. I'll break oh. it off. The paper, oh, no. Selena. No, 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 no. Oh. I will not tell. I will. Oh. Come on. Stop. Please. Please. Stop. Stop. I can't stand it. The paper. Oh. In, the, in the house of, of one man Oh. He's out on his feet. Now, Lois, we'll visit Mrs. Menard. We'll leave Salinas here. That way, Mr. Franklin? No, Lois, not that way. This way. You are listening to the case of the Invisible Insurrectionist on Counter Spy. Tonight, there's another broadcast of NBC's Sunday evening extravaganza, The Big Show. Tallulah Bankhead will preside as usual, and tonight's stars are Bob Hope, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, Louis Armstrong, Rosalind Russell, Dorothy McGuire, Frankie Lane, and Meredith Wilson with his orchestra and chorus. And Sunday over most of these NBC stations also means another visit with the mischievous Harris family, Frankie, Julius, and all their friends on the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. The chimes are your invitation every Sunday to the big show and the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. Now, back to Counter Spy. New York Counter Spy Field Office, Harding speaking. Yes, I certainly do. Go ahead. Yes, I have it. Well, thank you very much. Yes, of course. I'll let you know what happens. Goodbye. Peters, order a car to be ready for us out front immediately. What's up, Chief? That was Lola. Selena's told her to call us in case of trouble. Does she know where we can locate Selena's? Yes, Peters, if we're not too late. Maria, you must try to rest. Oh, you are very kind, Mrs. Milford. There are some people here in the city of New York who are so good, like you and... Some are so bad. Were you expecting anyone? No, I didn't. Now, you but... stay right where you are. I'll see who it is. Yes? Back but... inside, lady. You're not a peep out of here. Who are you? Close the door, Lewis. What is the Shut meaning? Shut your mouth, lady, and no one gets hurt. Mrs. Milford, who are these men? What do they want? I don't know, Maria. It's all very simple, ladies. Juan Menard had in his possession a paper. I want that paper, Mrs. Menard. I... I... I do not understand. The work contract. Contract? I, I do not know what you mean. Oh, well, perhaps you don't. Lewis, commence searching. Okay. This is unlawful. Isn't it? You can't expect to get away with a thing like this. But I intend to, madam. Really. Any luck, Lewis? No, not yet. Be seated, ladies. Please. Thank you. I'll just wander around myself and help Lewis. Yeah, it's not much of a view from this window, is there? Or is there? Come on, Lewis. Come on? What about the paper? A car just pulled up downstairs. Two men got out and entered this building, and they certainly don't look like tenants. Maybe cops. We'll take no chance in finding out. Let's go. I warn you, ladies, stay right where you are. Come on, come on. Let's get going. They're coming up to this floor. We're trapped. No, we can get up to the roof. Come on. Coppers, Mr. Franklin. Now, this will slow them up. Uh, my arm. Keep going, Lewis. Uh, almost there. Uh, Keep going, Lewis. We'll make it. We'll make it. Uh, well, they made it, Mr. Harding. They got away over the roof. Well, their luck won't hold out, Peters. We'll get them. Plenty of blood stains on the stairs leading to the roof. One of them is hurt. He'll have to get to a doctor sometime. Uh-huh. Everything all right here in the Menard apartment? No damage. Just woke up the baby. Mrs. Milford's inside helping Mrs. Menard. Did your men catch them, Mr. Hardy? No, Mrs. Milford. This has been terribly upsetting for Maria. Yes, that poor woman's had plenty of trouble. They said they wanted a paper, a contract of some kind. Yes, we knew that from Pedro Salinas. You found Salinas? Just a few moments before he died in a warehouse. He was shot by a man named Franklin. There was also another man called Lewis. Salinas told us to get here fast. Well, did those two find the paper? I don't think so. Good. 
All right, Peters, you get started on that other matter while I take up where those two left off. Peters in car C-1 to Harding, New York counter-spy field office. Peters to Harding. Harding, go ahead, Peters. Chief, I checked on Franklin at the address Salinas gave us. And? It was an office, but right now it's just an empty space. Whoever was there pulled out like a fast freight. Did you get any leads from anybody in the building? It was strictly a dead end, Chief. No one knows the man called Franklin or his helper, Lewis. All right, Peter. You may as well come back here to the field office. You had no luck either, hmm? I fared much better. You mean you found that contract in the Menard apartment? Yes. I sent the paper down to the lab for analysis. By the time you get back here, we should have a report on it. Get out of here, Mr. Franklin. Easy, Lewis. We'd be picked up in a minute if we left here. I, I, I gotta get to a doctor. My, my whole arm now is burning like it was on fire. You mustn't complain. We were lucky to find this empty barge to hide in. I, I can't stand it. Honest. You'll survive, I'm sure. Yeah. You can talk. You, you ain't got a slug in you. I, I, I don't want to die if I. If I stay here, I'll die. Believe me, I sympathize with you, but you have the counter spies to thank for your pain, not me. I'm getting to a doctor. Wait a minute. Let go. Are you crazy? You'll be caught. I'm, I'm giving up. I'll, I'll wind up in one piece that way. Get back down. Oh, my arm. You're not giving up. I'm not letting you. That, that gun ain't going to help you, Franklin. You, you fire one shot. And coppers will be swarming all over the spot. I'm not going to use it for firing, Lewis. I'm going to use the butt end for another purpose. There. Here's the lab report on that paper, Mr. Harding. I was on the way in when Parker handed it to me. Did you look it over, Peter? Quickly. It's an expensive type bomb. Oh. And uh, here's a list of retailers in the city who handle it. Mm, that's quite a long list. Mm-hmm. Should I sign squads to start investigation? Yes, right away. Okay, we'll do. And Peters... Oh, wait, just a minute. Agent Braden to Harding. Braden to Harding. Come in, Braden. The body of a man who'd been shot in the right arm was found a few minutes ago by one of our harbor patrols. Hey, go ahead, Braden. It was found in an empty barge. Report indicates death was due to severe blows at the base of the head. Identification in clothing shows him to be Lewis Troy. All right, Braden. Thank you. The man called Lewis. Mm-hmm. Well, Chief, that leaves one to go. Franklin. Yes. Well, now get to work on that list of paper dealers. We'll see where that leads us. Hello. Uh, this is Franklin. I have to see you tonight. Please. I'll need money. I'd better leave the country. All right, then. The swamp over in New Jersey. All right. I'll be there at 10 tonight. I thought you weren't coming. I was unavoidably detained, Franklin. You brought the money for me, Mrs. Milford? I brought exactly what you need. Franklin, you fumbled badly. You ordered me to get rid of Juan Menard. That was your idea. It wasn't my idea that his body should be found. That was Lewis's fault. It was your fault for choosing such an inefficient lieutenant. Was it Lewis's fault that you permitted that contract to get out of your hands so that you had to come to the Menard apartment while I was there? How did I know you were there? I had to act quickly. So quickly, you were almost caught by Harding. Franklin, your stupidity has put the entire cause in jeopardy. I and the others worked for months, years, to gain a solid foothold in Puerto Rico, where we could threaten the snug bourgeois safety of the United States. But I tell you... Be quiet. It took me years to place myself in a position in New York where I could help with the eventual overthrow of the capitalistic enemy. And you almost spoiled everything. You haven't been exposed, Mrs. Milford. You can still operate safely. Through no help of yours. 
You've put our schedule for the crew in Puerto Rico at least six months behind. We've waited so long, we can wait that much longer. Perhaps we can, Franklin. But you can't. Oh. What do you mean by that? You can no longer be trusted. Now, wait. I have been put in charge of this phase of our work. And it is my opinion that for the good of the cause, you should be liquidated. I, Don't move. I, but... As they say, Franklin, he who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. Or in this case, the gun. You, you and dare. As a matter of fact, Franklin, this is the only course I dare take now. Oh, wait, please. This meeting place you chose makes it very convenient for me. And for me, too, Mrs. Milton. Harding. Drop that gun. Stand where you are, Franklin. I'm not moving. How did you get here? Simple. We followed you, Mrs. Milford. Followed me? Through that contract paper. We thought the tracing of that type paper would lead us to Franklin, but it led us straight to your phony charity front. And on the way out in the car, my agents radioed me that they found some very interesting case histories in your files. With names and addresses of people here and in Puerto Rico involved in this plot. Had a nice setup, didn't you, Mrs. Milford? Passing yourself off as a welfare worker in a Puerto Rican district in New York. You were a welfare worker, all right. The welfare of the enemies of this country in Puerto Rico. Take them away, Peters. It gives me great pleasure to introduce a statement to Counterspy from the man who probably knows as much as anyone in the United States about the Puerto Rican people and their welfare problems here. The Honorable Raymond M. Hilliard, Commissioner of Welfare, City of New York. Here is Commissioner Hilliard's statement. Today's counter-spy story has its basis in actual fact. I can well believe that many Puerto Ricans living here have been the victims of cruel and crooked exploitation. And I am convinced that communist saboteurs have deliberately stirred up trouble and have tried to wreck the unity of the citizens of this city and of the nation. I know that there was a time when communists had achieved a strong hold among those engaged in welfare work in this city. But it has been my task during the past two and a half years to break their power, to throw out the communists, and to return welfare work to its proper place as an instrument of lawful government. We have found the Puerto Rican residents of New York City a decent and friendly people who hold that this government is their government. We are proud of them, and we know that they will not be deceived by those who would try to destroy us. Thank you, Commissioner Hilliard. Tune in every week, same time, same station, to Counter Spy. Listen next week for the exciting case of the pretty plant. A gracious guest brings her hospitable hostess a most unusual gift, and your counter spies are started on their way to the breaking up of an international spy ring. How a drugstore led to the disaster when treason had the fragrance of hyacinth will be revealed for the first time next week in Case... Of the Pretty Plant on Counter Spy. Tonight's Counter Spy program originated in New York, was directed by Marx B. Loeb, dramatized by Edward J. Adamson, and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer. Lionel Rico speaking. Counter Spy is a Phillips H. Lord production. chimes mean good times on NBC. Want to know who's on the big show tonight? Bob Hope, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, Rosalind Russell, Frankie Lane, Dorothy McGuire, Louis Armstrong, Meredith Wilson, and the glamorous and predictable Tallulah. No wonder it's the big show. And Sunday evening also means another outstanding production by Theater Guild on the Air. Tonight, it's Boomerang starring Kirk Douglas. Join Tallulah and her wonderful guests on the big show later on NBC. It's on the big show. Later on NBC. It's on the big show. Later on NBC. It's on the big show. Later on NBC. And now, the Gulf Oil Companies and your neighborhood good Gulf dealer present Counter Spy. Washington, calling David Harding Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. The 
The Gulf Oil Companies and your neighborhood good Gulf dealer are proud to present Counter Spy, a program especially designed to help investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. <laughs> This is David Harding. Last November, Congress passed the Boggs Act, an amendment to the federal narcotics law, providing for stiff, mandatory sentences for offenders. To implement this act, a special squad of 400 agents was carefully trained and assigned to narcotics duty. A series of nationwide mass arrests followed. The specific case you're about to hear has been selected from among hundreds because of its unusual nature. In the late afternoon of January 3rd, this year, a young woman, worry stamped heavily on her face, walked across the dingy lobby of a cheap hotel in Washington's Skid Row section. No rooms, girly. I'll take him. I don't want a room. I'm looking for someone who registered here. His name is Frank Stewart. Oh, hey, Curly. Never heard of him. I know he's here. What room is he in? All right, Curly, I told Will you. Will this I... help? Well, why didn't you tell me that? What room? 2A. Just up those stairs there. First flight. Last room to the right. Let me in. Go away. It's Elaine. Let me in, Frank. No, I don't want to see you. Open this door. I've got to talk to you. It's no use. Go away, please. Frank, I'm staying right here until you let me in. Why'd you have to come here? I've been looking for you for two days, worried half out of my mind. Why'd you have to come? Why'd you have to see me like this? It would have been better if you'd never found me. Sit down here on the bed. I want to talk to you. Oh, leave me alone. Just leave me alone, will you? Please sit down. Let me go. Can't you understand, Frank? I only want to help you. Can't you understand I'm beyond help? Can't you see her? You're blind. Go on, get out. Let me alone. Frank. Frank. I'm so sick. You're going to get better now. No. No, it's hopeless. I'll get help. Oh, it's too late. Three months ago, maybe even two. But not now. I've already spoken to a doctor. He said you can't... You only hurt yourself doing that. It must look fine, a woman with the kind of job you have. With a brother like me. You only shamed yourself. There's nothing to be ashamed of, Frank. Any more than any other illness. Now, come on. I'm going to take you home. I can't. The doctor will tell us what to do. I'll take care of you. Don't you see, Frank? Everybody will want to help you. But I don't want to help myself. You will. Don't you think I tried? It didn't work. It's no use. Frank, you're going to get well. You're going back and live a normal, healthy life. You're going to get well. You understand that? What I've put you through, Elaine. Oh, that's all past. I'm going to be proud of you, Frank. Very proud. Now you get dressed and washed. But, Do but... as I say. I'm going down to get you a container of coffee. I'll be back in a few minutes. Now you be ready. I'll be ready. Stop. 
Harding speaking. Mr. Harding, I asked to be put through directly to you. This is Agent Elaine Stewart. Yes, Miss Stewart. What is it? I must see you right away. May I come to your office? Why, of course, but what's this about? Murder. What? One just committed. And if I don't see you right away, I'm afraid another one will be committed. This time by me. It's no different, Mr. Harding. It's the same as as if my brother Frank was murdered. A little more water, Miss Stewart? No, Mr. Peters. I'm all right now, thanks. Sorry, I've made such a fool of myself, Mr. Harding. Oh, you didn't at all. I don't know what I would have done if you didn't see me right away. It's peculiar, isn't it? As an agent, I've worked on many cases, all kinds. But when you're personally involved, things are kind of different. Well, I've known you long enough, Miss Stewart, to know you do nothing wrong, no matter what. A cigarette, Miss Stewart? I would like one, yes. Thank you. You'd never know it, but I'm supposed to be the unemotional one in the family. Now, look, you've been under a terrific strain. I think you're doing just fine. Miss Stewart, is there, uh, is there anything else you could tell us about this? I don't know. I may have forgotten something. When did you first discover that your brother had become addicted? For sure. Only a few weeks ago. You didn't notice any symptoms before that? I knew something was wrong, but I just thought he was tired, nervous, maybe overworked. Uh. Mr. Harding, I'd give anything to get the people responsible for Frank's death. You didn't live with your brother, huh? No, we had separate apartments. You knew his friends? All of them, I think, with one exception. Who's that? A, a man who came to Frank's apartment once while I was there. My brother got rid of him very hurriedly. It could be the peddler, too. Yes, it could be. Do you remember what this man looked like? Short, thin, cheaply dressed. Oh, and one other thing. Yeah? He had a twitch in his right eye. I see. Fergus, this is Harding. Agent Stewart will be down there to identification in a few moments. Have the narcotics file ready for her to go through. All right, Fergus, thank you. Okay, if you want, Miss Stewart, you can rest here a while and then go down to Ident. No, I'd rather go right away. Fine. Well, Peters and I should be back in about an hour, and while you're going through the photo file, we'll see what we can dig up in your brother's apartment. <laughs> in the chest of drawers, Chief? Uh-uh. Come on, Peters. Let's take the clothes closet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll see what's in the box up here in the shelf. You go through that suit, Bill. Right. right. What's in the box, Chief? Well, dropper, syringe, empty bottle, small burner. Many with the main liner? Yeah. Gone as far as he could, I suppose. Anything in that suit? Nothing. One suit left. Sold himself out completely. In all ways. Oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. His hat. Anything in it? Yeah. Here, paste it inside the band. Phone number. Equator 2, 6843... Peddler's number, you think? Well, it must be if you went through the trouble of hiding it. I'll run it down. Do that right away. Then meet me back at the office. This is his photograph, Mr. Harding. Now, you're sure, Miss Stewart? Yes. This is the man I saw visit Frank's apartment. You have a look at him, Peters, again, will you? Now, there's no doubt about it, Chief. That's the guy. After I checked on that phone number, I went to the address. I saw him go in. What names are you using? Arthur Dodge. What have we got on him? Real name's Arthur Dayton, known also as Blinky Dayton. Any record? Four arrests on narcotics charges. Two convictions. Work the east here, hmm? No, all the west coast. Last known whereabouts, Delray, California. 
Got too hot for him out there, I guess. Well, we're going to make it even hotter here for Mr. Blinky Dayton. Say, on these cold winter mornings, have you noticed the peace and quiet broken by sounds like this? Bucking and sputtering like that is a pretty unpleasant way to start off the day, and unnecessary, too. You see, there's a gasoline that's made to give you quick starts and fast warm-up, even on the coldest mornings. That gas is Gulf Nonox. Gulf Nonox gets your car going quickly and keeps it going, without the stalling you get with so many other gasolines. It gives you full power at all times for fast pickup, smooth, safe passing. And you can count on Gulf Nonox to live up to its name. Yes, Nonox gives you quiet power without annoying engine knocks and pings. So drive in at your good Gulf dealers tomorrow. Switch to Gulf Nonox for quick starts, fast warm-up, and full quiet power. Gulf Nonox, the gas that makes driving a pleasure. <laughs> Back to Counter Spy. Yeah, uh, what is it? Is this the man, Miss Stewart? Yes, he's the one, Mr. Harding. Harding? Will you wait down in the car, please, Mr. Stewart? Yes, sir. Hey, what is this? We'll give you just one guess, Dayton. That ain't my name. You got the wrong party. Don't you wish it, Blinky. What do you want with me? What was that dame fingering me for? We'll talk about that inside. What do you want with me, anyway? We'd like to book you for murder. Murder? Yes. We'd like to, but we can't. Look, what do you got against me? Officially, peddling narcotics. Unofficially, the death of Frank Stewart. Stewart? An ex-customer of yours. Never heard of him. Look, you got me all wrong. I ain't peddling this stuff anymore. Gave it up, hmm? That's right. You expect us to believe that? You can, I swear. We don't believe you. You got the stuff here in the room? I told you, I'm out of the business. Where's it hidden? The mattress? Under the floor? Or where? I told you. I'm Where's out of the, the stuff? I don't know what you're talking about. I'll rip open the mattress. All right, Peter. That's as good a place as any to start. Wait. The mattress turned out to be the best place to start, Chief. Where'd you buy it, Dayton? What difference does it make? A lot. Now answer, Mr. Harding. Where? I don't remember. We may have a way of curing your memory. I don't remember. You ever hear of the Boggs Act, Dayton? I don't remember where I bought it. The act makes it tough on characters like you. The penalties for illegal sale of narcotics under the act are increased to two to five years for a first offender only. And you, Dayton, already have two counts against you. For a second offender, five to ten years. Third offender gets hit even harder, ten to twenty. Ten to twenty. Think about that, Dayton. Think hard. Ten to twenty for you. Ten to twenty. Sort of makes the peddling business real risky, doesn't it? Twenty years. Who did you buy it from, Dayton? Do I get any kind of break if I tell? I'm not promising you anything. Figure it out, Dayton. Can you be worse off if you tell? Well, Dayton? Okay, all right. We're listening. I got to stop over in Maryland. Where in Maryland? Glenton. Where in Glenton? Bowling Alley. Crystal Bow and Alley is the name of the place. Make a trip over there every month to pick up. Pick up from whom? Guy. What guy? Come on, Dayton. I don't know his name. That's so? Dealing with him for how long? About six months. About six months and you don't even know his name, hmm? Never formally introduced, is that it? I'm not kidding. That's the way the operation was worked. He knows the peddlers, but the peddlers don't know him. What do you think, Chief? Well, it's possible. The truth, huh? I'll tell you the whole layout, and then you can check. You'll find out I'm not giving you the business. You don't have to worry, Dayton. We'll find out. Come on. So you see, Miss Stewart, our next job is to find out who the seller is. You didn't get his name from Blinky Dayton. No, he said he didn't know it. Believe him? Well, I'm inclined to. Many times sellers play it that cozy. But you know where the seller can be located. Or if Dayton told us the truth, yes. Bowling alley over in Glenton. Uh That's where he made his purchase once a month. 
on the third Monday. I wish I could see this thing through. Well, you're going to. I'm going to put you on the case. Oh, good. But first, you've got just ten days for a rapid training course in narcotics duty. All right. And then what are your plans after that? Well, on the appointed day, Miss Stewart, you'll visit that bowling alley as Blinky Dayton's girlfriend. Ginger ale. One ginger. Okay. Not many bowling tonight, huh? Who well, fills up late here, 11, 12 o'clock? The joint's jumping. Here's your ginger. Straight. <laughs> Don't be fresh. Just being friendly. Well, just mop your bar and mind your own business. Okay, girlie, if that's the way you want it. That's the way. Pardon me for breathing. What's yours, mister? Beer. Beer. Coming right up. I didn't expect you here, Mr. Peters. Chief wanted me to check, Miss Stewart, and be sure you're all set. I'm all right. You let it be known around yet that you're Blinky's girlfriend? Yes, sir. Watch it. One beer. How much? Fifteen. Keep the change. Thanks. Know your stuff, Miss Stewart? Yes, everything. Blinky Denton's record? Back to his first arrest. The narcotic stones? Down to the last powder. You've got the number to call? Uh Uh-huh. If it gets rough, use it. I will. You'll be covered by agents anyway, just in case. I hope I won't need them. You never can tell. You scared? Pretty much. Remember what the chief said. You can back out any time you want. After what happened to my brother, what kind of a person do you think I am? Me? I think you're swell. in a row. I said nice bowling. So I heard you. Oh, another strike. Regular champ, huh? You're in my way. Oh, unfriendly type, huh? Not to friends. Well, maybe I'm not such a stranger. What's your name? Why? Maybe we got a mutual friend. Yeah. Who would that be? That would be Blinky Dayton. I've been waiting for you. Took my time looking you over. What's your name? Helene Stewart. Blinky calls me Ellie. What do I care what he calls you? I only care why you're here. I'm making a pickup for Blinky. What pickup? You know. Maybe I don't. Why didn't Blinky come himself? Sick. Sick from what? Same thing that always troubles him. His ulcers. <laughs> ulcers, huh? Oh, you know he complains about it to everybody. So he's sick again, huh? Don't believe me? Call him. You got his number. He'll be there to get my call? He's sick in bed. Where else would he be? Okay, I'll call him. He'll be there. Take it from me. He better be. <laughs> Pride HD, the new motor oil that cuts engine wear as much as 80% in the day-to-day short-trip driving that most of us do. Short-trip driving, taking the children to school, running errands to the store. That's the kind of driving most of us do. And it's the kind responsible for most engine wear. You see, short-trip driving can dirty up engine parts more than any other kind of driving. But now there's a new motor oil that keeps engines clean under all driving conditions. It's Gulf Pride HD, the new high-detergency motor oil from Gulf. Gulf Pride HD reduces harmful sludge to a degree never before thought possible. Keeps pistons and piston rings amazingly clean. And since a clean engine wears less, 
Gulf Pride HD cuts engine wear way down, as much as 80% in day-to-day short-trip driving. This extra protection can save you money by heading off motor troubles and avoiding repair bills. So don't wait another day to start using Gulf Pride HD in your car. Drive in tomorrow at your neighborhood good Gulf dealers. Change to high detergency Gulf Pride. New Gulf Pride HD. <laughs> Now back to Counter Spy. Hello? Elaine Stewart, Mr. Harding. I'm in a drugstore phone booth down the street from the bowling alley. Yes, I know. Agent Conway's in a car just down the block. He radioed the information to me. Did you make out all right? Yes, your plan worked to the letter. He said he called Blinky, and Blinky told him he was sick. Yes, we saw to that, too. I haven't been able to get our contact's name yet. Well, Peter spotted him talking to you in the bowling alley, and he recognized him as Charlie Vincent. We have a mile-long record on him. Now, what's your next step? I'm to meet him in an hour. Where? The basement of an apartment house, 22 Elm Street, the boiler room. He'll turn the stuff over to you then? Said he would. All right. That brings us up close to the finish. <laughs> You got the stuff? (laughs) You know I like doing business with you. Better than with ugly Blinky, huh? Uh, Blinky's expecting me back in Washington tonight. Uh, What's your hurry? Well, next time I won't be in such a hurry. Then I can look forward to a return visit, huh? Mm Mm-hmm. You'll see me again, I'm sure. Had a promise? It is. Now, how about the stuff? Got them right here. Two capsules of each. Take them. Suppose we uh, take them, Vincent. There's only one exit from this boiler room, Vincent. Come on, if you want to try a break. Cops. You can wait outside, Miss Stewart. All right, Mr. Harding. She's with you. This one of us. Get those capsules, Peters. That's all the evidence we'll need to wrap him up. You're not going to get her any. Hey, quick, Peter. Right, come on, you cough him up. <laughs> Too late, Chief. He swallowed him. <laughs> That's right, Chief. Too late. <laughs> Now, what are you going to do, huh, Chief? We have ways, friend. (laughs) Who are you trying to kid, friend? I read the papers. Supreme Court threw out a case last month because the cops got their evidence that way. (laughs) The Supreme Court is on my side. (laughs) Could I ask for anything better? You might be asking for a lot more before we're finished with you. (laughs) Who are you trying to scare? I know my constitutional rights. What can you do? We can hold you for 24 hours. So hold me. So what? You take it from me, Vincent. They could turn out to be the worst hours of your life. Let's go. That door. I can see it. Inside. Here he is, Mr. Harding. All right, Peters. Now you can ask Dr. Wheeler to step in. Hey, listen, you, uh, what's this please, all about, Dr. huh? Doctor, this is the man. Vincent, this is Dr. Wheeler of the Narcotics Division. Who needs a doctor? I never felt better. Vincent, you've been held here for six hours so far. Who's complaining? I can wait the rest easy. Now, before Dr. Wheeler speaks with you, I want you to realize that he's under oath as a medical man to tell you only the absolute truth. Truth about what? Doctor, you swallowed two capsules of heroin. Is that correct, Vincent? So? Now, I presume the capsule covering is composed of gelatin. So? The digestive juices are potent enough to dissolve even the strongest gelatins within 12 to 18 hours. Hey, what's he getting there? Your funeral, Vincent, maybe. What? Please go on, Doctor. Two capsules of heroin. 
even if the narcotic is only of 25% strength, are enough to kill a dozen men. What? A dozen? Not just one, Vincent. Now, I can safely say that if the capsules remain in your system, in a very short time, they'll prove fatal. He means you'll be dead, Vincent. Dead? I repeat, if the capsules remain in your system, in a very short time, they'll prove fatal. Thank you, Doctor. You're welcome, Mr. Harding. Well, Doc, wait. What is it, Vincent? Well, you... You can't let me die. It's not up to us. Doc, you can't let me die. Now, you've got to save me. He has to have your permission, Vincent. That's the law, Vincent. You're a stickler for the law. I must have your permission. Well, he's got it. He's got it for the love... He's got to help me. Well, the doctor is quite willing to cooperate. And he's ready to go to work. And okay, let him do it. We're wasting time. The doctor will work on you right after we get from you names and locations. Names? Of everyone you sell to and the people you buy from. What's the matter with you? We can't waste time. You're the one who's wasting time, Vincent. It's up to you. All right, all right. I'll tell you everything you want to know, but let's get it over with fast. Right, start the recorder, Peter. Right. All right, Vincent, go ahead. Into this microphone. Start talking. <laughs> Got it all, Mr. Harding? Everything, Miss Stewart. Agents are now rounding up the people involved with Vincent. Well, I, I guess you don't need me on this assignment anymore. No, but I just stopped by to thank you. It's all in the line of duty. Well, a bit above and beyond. You know how I wanted to help, Chief. Yes, I know. Of course, it doesn't bring your brother back. Well, if what I've done has helped others like Frank, then that's something. Well, it's a great deal more. Although they'll never know who you are or what you've done, I assure you, Miss Stewart, many people are very much in debt to you. You know, just about half the cars on the road today have one or more burned-out auto bulbs. That can mean real danger. But you can be sure your lights are working, even those you don't ordinarily see from the driver's seat, if you let your good golf dealer check every light on your car and replace any that may be burned out. This auto bulb check is a service your good golf dealer will be glad to perform. So drive in tomorrow. And for the life of your car, go golf. Tune in next week, same time, same station, to another exciting counter-spy report to the American people. Next week, case of the captain on the spot. In the relentless fight against the underworld combination which rules the criminal elements of this country, there are many methods of attack used by your law enforcement officers. One of the most successful is chipping away at the syndicate structure in as many different places as possible. Be sure to tune in next week for the never-before-revealed facts in case of the captain on the spot on Counter Spy. Tonight's Counter Spy program was directed by Marx B. Loeb and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer with the Oscar Bradley Orchestra. Bill Rogers speaking. Counter Spy is a Phillips H. Lloyd production for the Gulf Oil Companies and your neighborhood good Gulf dealer. Be sure to see We the People on NBC television every Friday night. Consult your newspaper for time and station. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, next week, Thursday, August 24th, Dragnet will be heard one hour earlier at 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet.
a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Juvenile Bureau. A vicious case of wanton and willful destruction of private property occurs in your city. Suspicion points to a juvenile. Your job, find him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. To give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, April 10th. It was cool in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Juvenile Bureau. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Inspector Bowling. My name's Friday. It was 9.35 a.m. when we got to 1335 Georgia Street. Captain's office. I want to ask you to sit down. We're not going to be here that long. You sound mad. Get your hats. Right away. Where's your car? Right out front. All right. What's up? A rotten mess. We got in the car and drove south in Figueroa till we got to West 103rd Street. According to Inspector Bowling's directions, we turned right and went about four miles. He directed us to pull up in front of a one-story frame residence that had been converted into small business offices. On the right side, going in, was a neighborhood jeweler's shop. We could see him working in the window. Over the door of the office on the left was a lawyer shingle. The gold lettering was new. It's this way. Lawyer's office. That's right. Name's Paul Wilson. It's me, Mr. Wilson. Oh, come in, Inspector Bowling. Mr. Wilson, this is Sergeant Friday. Romero, juvenile detail. I'm assigning him in this case. How do you, Sergeant? Oh, hey. Sergeant. All right, look at it. Just look at it. Look at that, Jim. Yeah, paint. It's all over everything. Look at that leather chair. It's ruined. The desk, smeared with the stuff. Green paint. Yeah. Looks like they threw it on the mop, and Rug soaked with it, the walls. Look, Joe. They even got the clock. Yeah. Take a good look. Remember it when you tag whoever did it. These are your law books, Mr. Wilson? Yes, sir. I didn't have to do this. Poured paint all over them. Yes, sir. When did all this happen? Sometime last night. Found it this way when I came in this morning. Any idea who did it? That's why he called us, and we're going to find out. I don't know who'd want to do a thing like this. Just opened my office three days ago, just hung out my shingle. You just started practicing laws, then? Yes, sir. Graduated from Loyola University Extension Division. Been looking for office space for a long time. Was anything taken? No. It was such a dirty, rotten thing to pull. Undoubtedly a kid. Well, it's pretty vicious for a kid. Can you think of any enemies that you might have had, Miss Wilson? No, sir. No one would do a thing like this. I can't understand it. There's no reason for it that I can think of. Crime report shows they got in the back door. Is that right, Mr. Wilson? Well, can you come back here? I'll show you. Okay. Yeah, here it is, right here. See, this used to be the kitchen when this was a flat. I was going to put a hot plate in here for coffee. Oh, yes. You can see where they cut through the screen door. It's all right. It's been checked. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see. Mm-hmm. Any pass key would fit the inside door here. Yes, sir, that's right. You can follow the trail of that green paint right from this door all the way through the house. Yeah. I don't know how I'll ever get it all off. You know of any cleaners that handle things like this? We're not allowed to recommend anybody, Mr. Wilson. If you have somebody in mind, we'd be happy to call them for you. Well, thank you. I'd appreciate it. I was going to make some calls, but I haven't got my phone installed yet. Estimated damage about $1,800. Is that right? That's what I figure, yes. 
My law books are over $600 alone. Borrowed the money from the bank for the furniture. You haven't noticed any kids in the neighborhood, none of them around while you were moving in? No, I didn't see any. I moved everything in myself, rented a trailer, made several trips to get it all over here. Guess that was a silly thing to do. Why? Well, the store where I bought the furniture said they'd deliver it. But I couldn't wait to see everything in. First office, you know. Yeah, we understand. Well, like I said, I made several trips with the trailer, and I didn't lock the office each time I left. Didn't figure it was necessary. The fellow across the hall, a jeweler, said he'd keep an eye on things for me. But you did lock up last night, didn't you? Oh, yes. As soon as I was moved in, I locked the place at all times when I wasn't here. That's it. We'll get right on it. I don't have to tell you again. I want a fast answer. Where do we start? With an empty paid can. Before we left attorney Paul Wilson, we took a sample scraping of the green paint to serve as a color check. We started to canvas the neighborhood door to door. We covered the area for a radius of six blocks, questioning the residents and checking out the youngsters. We failed to come up with anything. We figured another good angle was to try the schools in the area. We checked on the students who had been in any kind of trouble involving malicious pranks. We had the principals line their students up. We looked them all over thoroughly for any evidences of paint of any kind on their person or on their clothing. The few leads we found led nowhere. After a week without success, we went back and rechecked the neighborhood, the paint stores, to see if anyone had bought any green paint, anyone they might have forgotten to tell us about the first time through. No leads. Monday, April 18th, Ben and I stopped for a Coke at a hot dog stand in the corner of 103rd and Oakview Avenue. A couple of Cokes, please. You want to help yourselves in? Yeah, okay. Here's one. I don't see any more. There's one lying on the side. No, no, over there by the grape. Oh, yeah. Let me get it for you. Oh, thanks. There you are. Good. Every time I think of that boy's office, it makes me sick. Well, if we could... If we could just get some kind of a lead. Anything for a start. Pardon me. I'd be satisfied. There's nothing to work on. It's like stabbing in the dark. Joe. Yeah? Look down the street there. Hmm? This is 10 can day. Everybody's got them set out in front of the houses. Well, it's worth a try, isn't it? Let's try a place across the street and then work down the block. All right. Come on. I had a cousin move down from San Francisco. It took him almost a year to get used to this tin can system here in L.A. Is that so? Yeah, up there they throw everything into one garbage can. Tin cans, no. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, sure. Tad's my cousin. Never could get used to putting the cans out. The backyard was full of them before his wife reminded him to put them out. Yeah. Garbage kind of piled up, too. They wouldn't pick it up with the tin cans in it. Well, you want to check these here? Yeah, get all right. This bunch here. Okay. Don't see any paint can. No, none here either. How about those down there? Okay. Let's go. I'll get this box. Wonder if this is any good. What's that? Prune juice. See a lot of empty bottles. Any paint cans? No. Let's go. That's the way it went, block after block, house after house. We covered five blocks, checking the containers full of empty tin cans. Found a few paint cans, none of them the right color, or any combinations that would go together to make the right color. It was a tiring job, but we figured it was at least a place to start. Sure, a lot of cans here. There must be a new bride, huh? I don't know. Did you find anything? No, not yet. How about this? Huh? This one. One gallon can... Green. What's that? Yes? Police officers, ma'am. This empty paint can belong to you. You can have it if you want. We threw it out. Uh, do you have any children here, ma'am? Yes, a boy. How old is he? One year. Would you mind telling us what this paint was used for? We just moved here. Is there any law about throwing out the paint cans? Oh, no, ma'am. We're investigating the case. Just like to know what the paint was used for. 
Did old man Boone send you over? To make a pardon? Mr. Boone, the man we rented this house from? No, ma'am. I thought maybe it was him. He said we couldn't do any painting inside. No, we don't know anything about that. You sure? I don't trust him. No, ma'am. You say the paint was used to redecorate? Yes, come in, I'll show you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Whose idea was it to paint the bathtub? Carlos. He's going to night school learning English. The teacher told him the best way to learn was to speak it around the house. Yes. It's better for the little one, too. Well, anyway, Carlos gets paid on Saturday night. Then he stops at the little place where the fellas he works with has a little drink. He gets his paycheck cash there. Mm-hmm. When he came home, he said he was going to paint the bathroom for me. <laughs> this is all a little good. I was in the kitchen, and I yelled to him to paint around the top. Around the top, I said. Yeah. Like I said, he doesn't know English too good yet. We have a green top. I see. Well, thank you. He's going to clean the top next Saturday. We use the shower. Painted that, too, didn't he? Well, thank you very much, ma'am. We're sorry to have disturbed you. Well, that's all right. I'm worried about next Saturday night. Why is that? There's no telling what he's going to do with that paint remover. Four thirty p.m. We were no closer to finding out who spread that paint around a turn of the attorney's office than when we started. We continued checking the neighborhood, but we found nothing. A few minutes before five, we got a call to check back in with Inspector Bowling. You do any good out there? Nothing at all. Well, we had a little action. A new one. No, what's that? Came in about an hour ago. Somebody poured kerosene on three palm trees and set them on fire. Three trees, three different blocks. Yeah. Kept the fire department busy. Tied up the traffic for several hours. I've sent additional juvenile cars out there to cover happened in the same general area as the paint job. Mm-hmm. Any leads? No. Anyone who moved smear paint over an office might set a palm tree on fire. Same type of gag, malicious mischief. Think there's a connection between the two? Well, it's anybody's guess. Paint routine's a new one, so is the palm trees. They're both one-time only shots. Maybe the two connect somewhere along the line. Well, maybe. Well, it's got us stopped. We can't even find a place to begin. We've tried everything we know. Starting again tomorrow. It isn't going to make that young lawyer feel any better. Yep. Who? Did you take him down to the detention room? He does, huh? All right, I'll see him. Yeah, right now. Sixteen-year-old boy out there says he's got to see me. Would you like to talk to him alone? No, that's all right. You stay. Come in. You're the chief? My name is Bowling, Juvenile Bureau, yeah. Could I talk to you alone? Well, these officers work with me. Can you talk in front of them, son? I guess so. Well, come on over here. You want to sit down, son? I'd rather stand if it's okay. All right, what's on your mind? I want to confess. What do you want to confess, son? I murdered somebody. are listening to Dragnet, actual case histories taken from official police files. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to these case histories taken from the file marked Fatima. On this card, reporter Lee Silver's statement. I need an extra mild cigarette. No other long cigarette I've tried is as mild as Fatima. Here is Nurse Shirley Gilman's statement. When I go off duty, I appreciate a mild cigarette. Fatimas are extra mild. I can enjoy them more. On this card, the statement by drama critic Richard Watts, Jr. Anyone can tell Fatima contains the finest tobaccos. It's extra mild, has a much better flavor. All agree, it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And that's what more and more smokers are discovering every day. Yes, actual figures show extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. You'll agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Best of all, long cigarettes. Next week, Thursday, August 24th, Dragnet will be heard one hour earlier at 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. (laughs) 
6 p.m. Monday, April 18th. The boy identified himself as Arnold Waterman. He gave his age as 16. He told us that two days before at 98th Street and 2nd Avenue, he'd shot a man to death and hidden his body in the basement of a house. He was taken to the interrogation room where a police stenographer took his statement. Inspector Bowling sent Ben and I out to check his story. 9.30 p.m., we drove back to Georgia Street Juvenile and went to the interrogation room. Arnold? Yes, sir? Well, these two men have been out at 98th Street and 2nd Avenue checking your story. Did you find the body? No, there's no body out there. There should be. I put it in the cellar. There's no house out there. It's a vacant lot. We checked all the houses near there. You sure you killed somebody? Of course I'm sure. I stole a gun. I shot him three times in the back. What'd you do with the gun? I threw it in Westlake Park. Where? In the water. I rented a boat and rowed out to the middle. That's where I threw it in. Why did you kill the man? I don't know. I didn't like him. Now, look, boy. You didn't kill anybody. There's nothing to back up your story. There's not an ounce of truth in it. How do you know you haven't found a body? Just wait. You'll find him, then you'll see. I killed him, all right. Will you show us where you hid the body? Why should I? I told you, you can find it. These men have gone over that entire area thoroughly. There's nobody out there, and you know it. You cops are funny. When somebody won't admit a murder, you keep asking questions until they do. I'm telling you I murdered somebody, and you keep trying to talk me out of it. If we could find one shred of proof, we might go along with you. You can't be convicted without proof. How much do you need? You got my confession. I offered to sign it. They wouldn't let me. What more do you need? We need a victim, Arnold. If you knew where to look, you could find it. We've looked every place you told us to. You're lying to us, huh? Why? I never liked the old man. I hated his wife. I killed her, too. I wasn't going to tell you that. Where do you go to school? I quit school to sell papers. I had to support my mother. Where's your father? I don't know. My mother wouldn't tell me. That's where I met the old man I killed, selling papers. He was my boss. None of us liked him. Nobody had the nerve to do it but me. The rest of the guys were scared, but not me. What was the old man's name? I can't think of it right now. He was your boss. He never told us his name. We just worked for him. Where'd you sell papers? I don't remember. I had to sell papers. We were going hungry. I couldn't stand to see my mother starve. Couldn't your father work? I don't know where he is. I told you that. We tried to get on relief. They wouldn't let us. I made a lot of money selling papers. After a while, we didn't need relief anymore. I made $100 a week. Why are you lying to us, son? If you think I'm lying, why don't you let me go home? We have anything to hold you for. You can go home. Not until I have a trial. I already called a lawyer. He'll be over pretty soon. I've sent for your mother, Arnold. She'll come down and take you home. I didn't want her to know anything about this. I may have to go to the gas chamber. It would make her feel bad. You shouldn't have called her. It's no use. Let's go back to the office. His mother ought to be there by now. All right. Romero, you want to stay with the boy? All right. You better go out and find that body. Come on, Joe. I killed that old man. You can't say I didn't. The boy's a pathological liar. Well, it looks that way. Probably an inferiority complex. And this is the way of making himself important. Well, we all know he didn't kill anybody, but I wonder if he's got something else in his mind, huh? How do you do? You're Mrs. Waterman? Yes. Inspector Bowling? Yes, ma'am. This is Sergeant Friday. How do you do, ma'am? How do you do? I have to excuse my appearance. I slept a little late today. We've got your boy down the hall. He's all right. Trying to get us to swallow a few tall stories. Yeah, he's like that. What did he tell you? He tried to give us a story about killing somebody. Well, I'm not surprised. This isn't the first time. I'll never understand that kid. Has your boy ever been in an institution, Mrs. Waterman? No, he's not bad. He just likes to lie all the time. He's an awful liar. Went to his high school principal the other day, told him his father and I beat him. We wouldn't give him any lunch money. Where is your husband? He has a newspaper concession on one of the railroad trains. How often is he home? Oh, once a week, sometimes every two weeks. It's the only business he knows. Yes, ma'am. Maybe that's the reason the kid's the way he is. My mom always used to tell me a kid needs his father. So whenever my hubby's home, he always does the right thing. Arnold started telling these lies a long time ago, and ever since, his, when his father found out, he, he catches it. What do you mean? A good strapping. That's all a kid like him understands. His father knows how to handle him. Whenever he lies, he takes the strap to him. You think that's the best way to handle it? Don't you? Well, you know what you're doing, Mr. Waterman. He's your son. But if you wouldn't mind a little advice, do you mind my telling you? No, not at all. Well, that boy needs care, and he needs it bad. A strap's not the answer. He needs attention, good supervision, and a lot of companionship. I'm not conducting a class in child psychology, but care for that boy of yours. Care for him before the state has to. It's just those stories of his. That's what's wrong with him. Came on the other night with the wildest tale I ever heard. Yes, ma'am. Said he threw green paint all over somebody's office. 
Ben and I drove out to the Waterman home. We checked through the boy's belongings. His mother showed us his room. In his closet, we found a pair of corduroy trousers, a white T-shirt, and other articles of his clothing spattered with the same shade of green paint that had been found in the office and furnishings of attorney Paul Wilson. We asked Ms. Waterman where her son Arnold was on Sunday night, April 9th, the night that the office had been broken into and smeared with paint. She told us she didn't know, but that he came home that night with paint on his clothing. Ben and I went back to the office where we filed an application for a petition and detention, Section 700, Sub M, WIC, Malicious Mischief, one count. Two days later, in juvenile court, the calendar was called. Arnold Waterman's name was first on the list. The judge, the subject, and all those concerned in the case retired to the judge's private chambers. Ben and I, Arnold Waterman, and his mother. The subject was informed of his constitutional rights, and Judge Frank J. Smith read the findings of our investigation. Arnold... It alleges in this petition that on April 9th at approximately 8.30 p.m., you entered the office of Attorney Paul Wilson at 9218 West 103rd Street, where you willfully and without Mr. Wilson's permission did maliciously damage his office to the extent of approximately $1,800 by pouring paint over his rugs, furniture, books, and other articles in his offices. Is this true, Arnold? Yes, sir. Did you know Mr. Wilson? No. Arnold, I'd like to know why you did that. I felt like it. You'll have to give me a better answer than that, youngster. That's the best I can do. That's good enough, isn't it? No, it isn't good enough. We have a courtroom full of boys outside who probably want to be helped, and we're going to try to help them. We can't help you unless you want to be helped. You don't want to help me. You don't believe anything I tell you. Officer Friday. Yes, Your Honor. You and Officer Romero investigated this case from its inception? We did. As a result of your investigation, what's your opinion of this boy's truthfulness? Well, Your Honor, I think I can speak for Officer Romero here as well. In all our talks with the boy and our observations of him, it's our opinion, for what it's worth, that the boy's a pathological liar. Basically, he seems to have the makings of a good youngster. His environment's bad. Seems to have very little, if any, parental guidance. Tells lies, Your Honor. Lots of them. Well, that seems to be everyone's opinion. It's not mine. If you'd spend more time trying to find out if I'm lying instead of trying to put me on the spot, you'd earn your money. Your stories have been thoroughly investigated and double-checked by competent police officers. There is absolutely no basis of truth in anything you've said. I'm getting sick and tired of everybody calling me a liar. Do you hear me? Young man, sit down in that chair. We review a great many juvenile cases here in my private chambers, but that does not alter the fact that you are in a court of law. You will lower your voice, speak in a gentlemanly fashion, and tell the truth. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Mrs. Waterman, could you give this court any reason for your son's behavior? It's a mystery to me, Judge. Fred, that's his father. He can't understand it either. He's always lied. His father beats him for it. I guess he'll always lie. That's all you can say in your son's behalf? What else is there to say he's a liar? Arnold, I'm going to ask you once more. Why did you smear paint all over attorney Paul Wilson's office? I didn't like him. Why didn't you like him? I didn't like him, that's all. Tall, skinny, funny-looking guy. You mean you destroyed his property because you didn't like his looks? Something like that. He was cheap. I saw him moving in. He had a trailer. He was moving his own stuff in. Why didn't he hire a mover like everybody else? I don't like cheap people. You know anything about this man, Wilson? No. What Why? business was it of yours, whether or not Mr. Wilson decided to move his own furniture? Do you know that he's a young man, not much older than you, just graduated from law school, took a lot of time, took a lot of his money, money that he earned to put himself through school, and you sit there, a mere sketch of a boy, passing judgment on a fine young man like Paul Wilson. And boy, let me tell you something. I don't know if you're a God-fearing lad or not, but you'd better fall on your knees and ask forgiveness and hope that somebody hears you, that he hasn't lost patience with you. You better raise up those sights of yours, lad, and pray for forgiveness. I hope those tears mean something, Arnold. Now, do you have anything to say before I pass judgment on this case? Yes, sir, I have. I'd like to tell you about something else I did. There were some palm trees out there. I put kerosene on them and set them on fire. Oh, Friday, would you know anything about this? Yes, Your Honor, that checks with the reports. Any property damage? No, Your Honor. Kept the fire department pretty busy, that's about all. I didn't kill anybody. I just made that up. Yes, we know, Arnold. Do you have anything else to add, Mrs. Waterman? No. I don't know what else you can do with a kid. I'm glad it's somebody else's problem. According to the findings of the probationary officers and the investigating officers and what I've heard and observed in these chambers, I have no alternative but to remove this boy from his present home and environment 
and place him in a foster home where he will receive closer supervision and the care that he requires. Does that meet with your approval, Mrs. Warman? It's fine with me, Judge. Fred and I can hardly make ends meet now, and it's a shame to waste what money we have on this kid. It's all I can do to squeeze out the new clothes I need. Then you approve this plan. I can't wait to tell Fred. Well, when you tell Fred, you can also tell him the taxpayers are not going to assume the burden of the mistakes that you and your husband lavished on this boy. What do you mean, Judge? The expense of placing the boy in this foster home comes to the amount of $35 a month. You and your husband will pay this sum. The law covers that. It's an awful lot of money. The payment will be due on the first day of each month. You will meet this requirement or be held in contempt of court. I'm only sorry that's as far as the law goes. The laws of the state of California do not make the parents responsible for the thoughts of their children unless contributory negligence can be proven. In my eyes, it is contributory negligence on your part, but unfortunately, it cannot be proven. Any faults that this boy may have are yours. You as a parent are responsible. We did the best we could in raising the kid. Madam, you didn't raise him. Hearing the Smith. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On April 18th, the hearing was held in the private chambers of Judge Frank J. Smith, Juvenile Court, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. You have just heard the results of that hearing. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. The working detective in the process of apprehending criminals devotes his full time and energy to the job. His alertness, intelligence, and a great amount of patience. So, with a cigarette. The makers of Fatima cigarettes employ these same qualities in blending the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos to make Fatima extra mild. Best of all, long cigarettes. Now, if you're a long cigarette smoker like I am, then buy Fatima. You'll find, as I have, that every pack is extra mild. Smoke Fatima. Next week, Thursday, August 24th, Dragnet will be heard one hour earlier at 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Now hear Sarah's private caper. September 7th, it's Father Knows Best. On NBC. have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a forgery detail. An accomplished check forger is at work in your city. His victims, small businessmen. You know his M.O., you don't know his identity. Your job, get him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. 
Yes, Fatima is the king-size cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. To give Fatima a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, February 4th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of forgery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Elliot. My name's Friday. I was on the way home from the office, and it was 8.25 p.m. when I got to Collis Avenue. Number 4656. Joseph, that you? Yeah, Ma. We're in the living room. We have company. Oh, that's all? Hello, Joe. Well. You remember Mary Fowler, don't you, Joseph? I sure do. How are you, Miss Fowler? Just fine, Joe, thank you. <laughs> Doing some shopping out this way and thought I'd stop by and have a cup of tea with your mother. Well, it's good to see you. <laughs> How are things in the old neighborhood, huh? Oh, pretty much the same. Oh, Miss Daly, remember her? Mm-hmm. Finally died. Oh, yeah. I suppose it was for the best, though. I was just telling your mother, Jim and Louise Watson finally moved. Jim got a new job. Out by Aldadina. Oh, is that so? Yeah. My, you certainly looking fine, Joe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't you wear your police uniform anymore? Oh, my, no, Mary. Joseph's in the detective bureau now. He hasn't worn his uniform for years. Oh, that's right. I remember now. <laughs> that note you sent with your Christmas card year before last. What do you do now, Joe? Forgery detail. My partner and I handle bum check cases. My, that certainly must be interesting. Have you had your dinner, Joseph? Yes, ma'am. I stopped at a place out in Santa Monica and had some. Yes, well, Mary brought me some nice coffee cakes. Pineapple filling. Wouldn't you like one with a cup of coffee, Joseph? No, I don't know, Mary. Now you sit down in your chair there and rest yourself. You always look so tired. I have no idea how hard they work, those young fellas, Mary. You remember Genevieve, don't you, Joe? My oldest girl. Oh, yeah, sure. How is she? Oh, just fine. Lots of boyfriends, as usual. Going out all the time. Oh, that's good. She um, asked to be remembered to you. I, I think you and Jen were stuck on each other at one time, weren't you, Joe? Oh, we went to a couple of dances in high school. Well, I think she started going steady with another fella, didn't she? Hmm, young girl. You never know when they're well off. Here's your coffee, Joseph. I'll set it here on the end table. Thanks. I don't think I can use it, Mom. It's delicious coffee cake. You smell how fresh it is. Yeah, it's nice. Oh, my, quarter to nine. I should have left half an hour ago. Oh, you have to go, Mary? Seems our visits are always so short. Well, I got a lot of ironing to do, and I have to make Carl's lunch. He's always so fussy about his lunch. Yes, well, I'll get your coat. Well, it's nice seeing you again, Joe. Uh, do you want to be remembered to Genevieve? Yeah, tell her hello, will you, Miss Fowler? If you're over our way, be sure and drop in and see us, won't you? Genevieve's home off it's by six. She often says she'd like to see you again. Oh, Oh, thanks. Good night, Joe. You be sure to come and see us now. Jen will be looking forward to it. Okay, Miss Fowler. Good night. Yeah, and I'll show you to the door, Mary. Mm-hmm. You remember all the neighbors, won't you? All right, dear. I wouldn't do take care of yourself now. Good night. Good night, Mary. Nice person, Mary. Mm-hmm. Having a hard time trying to find a husband for Genevieve, though. Yeah. Hey, Ma, I'm not very hungry. I can't eat now. No? Oh, it seems such a shame to waste. That lovely coffee cake. Ben, you still on the same case, hmm? Yeah, same one. It seems to me it's taking an awfully long time. Well, we've been on it two months, yeah. You yeah, never understand it. Why people write bad checks. <laughs> Always get caught. Well, it's easy living while it lasts. Now you know what the man's handwriting is like. Don't you know who the man is? Well, we think so, Ma. We're not sure. There's hundreds of check men who work almost alike. Some of them even look alike. There's always a big enough field to pick from. Our problem's picking the right one. 
Now, I don't know much about it, but the whole thing seems kind of silly to me. Well, how's that? Hmm. What, what's this man supposed to be doing? Going around your small neighborhood stores, cashing $15, $20 checks? Well, if he got himself a job, he'd probably earn that much in one day doing good, honest work. Mm-hmm. See, Ben didn't call before I got home, did he? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wasn't he with you? Oh, he was going to interview one of the bum check victims on his way home, a grocery store owner down in Highland Park. Mm-hmm. Might be him now. Oh, now, don't hang on that phone, Joseph. Your coffee get cold. Yeah. Friday talking. This is Ben, Joe. I got a partial identification from that grocer. It's nothing great. Which mug shot did he like? Stanley Buback. Grocer thinks it might have been the guy who pushed the check. He can't be sure. Mm. 33 bum checks passed. Same M.O. Not one positive identification. Something's phony, isn't it? Got me stuff. We know the endorsements on every one of those checks was written by the same guy. He was practically the same story on every one of his victims. Yeah. Those 33 people are either blind or they're kidding us. Well, there's only one other answer. Huh? We're looking for the wrong man. For two months and two days in different shopping districts throughout the city, a man described as well-dressed and middle-aged had been passing worthless checks on independent neighborhood businessmen. Most of the victims were proprietors of small shops, meat markets, liquor stores, grocery stores. In none of the cases was the check written for more than $25. With the help of the stats office and our record bureau, we've gone through the list of experienced check men until we found one man whose description and M.O. matched perfectly with that of the suspect. The man's name was Stanley Buebeck. We can't locate him, Captain. Another thing, we can't get a positive identification from any of the victims. And find a suspect they can't identify You've been tracking the guy for two months. What's the big mystery? Well, we tabbed the man Stanley Bubeck, and his record and his M.O., his description, they all tie in perfectly. Now we're not sure it's him. What do you mean? Well, if it is Bubeck, it's almost a sure thing that one of the victims could have made him on one of his mug shots. None of them can make up their minds. Look, maybe one of you two would like to be captain of forgery for a day, sit in this office and listen to complaints come in over that phone about this guy, the front office, neighborhood businessmen's clubs, retail merchants. They tell me they're trouble, so I'm passing them on to you. Now, whoever this paper hanger is, we want him, and we want him fast. Lousy little $20 checks. We'd probably have a lot better target if he tried something bigger. And don't think he and a hundred other check men like him don't know that. You won't find them stealing company paychecks and flooding the town with paper. They take it from the little guy, and they take it in small amounts. But add up those small amounts at the end of the year, and they'll scare you. Yeah, that's the rotten part about it. None of those victims can afford a bad check. That grocer Donnelly. Stands on his feet all day and at a profit of ten, fifteen dollars. He gets tagged with one bad check and he's working for nothing. We got bulletins out on the suspect to all the small businessmen in town. They've all been alerting. Excuse me. Have Nelly. Yeah, okay, Don, right away. Don Myers. He went over the handwriting of those last three checks, wants to see you. Okay. How about that special bulletin you got out to the prisons on Stanley Bubeck? Any replies? Nothing yet, Skipper. All right, stay on it. Right, let's go, Ben. It's a sour deal. I'd give a right arm for a line on this guy. Yeah, well, it'd move a lot faster if somebody'd help us follow those checks closer. The way it's running now, we hear about the paper two weeks after it's been cashed. The Bubeck thing isn't helping much. No use trying another line, we get it settled. Mm. Hi, Don. Oh, hi. Uh, just finished up on those last three checks that came in. You want to give them a look? How do they shape up? Well, you can see for yourself. Right here. Yeah. Uh, here are the three I just went over. Mm-hmm. And uh, here are a half a dozen bad ones for cash last month. Now, the endorsements on this half doesn't match perfectly. And those other three? Well, I'd say they were endorsed by the same person. Now, look here. Huh? Yeah, you can notice the capital letters. Now, you still handle them the same way. Disconnected from the other letters in the first name. See? Yeah, yeah. But he connects the capitals in the last name. See? Mm-hmm. Not very bright. Yeah. Uh, not much doubt in my mind. All the other handwriting factors tie in. The form, skill shading. They all match up. Uh, the movement, the terminals, they're all the same for my money. Yeah, here, the way he writes the lower case letters. Yeah, that cinches it for me. How's that done? Well, here. The uh, inclination of the terminal stroke on the S. See it? Mm-hmm. Degree of slant above the horizontal is just about... 55 degrees in all cases. Mm-hmm. Now, the finger movement in his capitals have plenty of freedom. They're not shaded much. Mm, yeah. Nothing like this in his lowercase letters, though, you see? Here. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. Not much freedom here. Lots of shading. And the uh, pressure on the lifts. Here. 
They match mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. Same on the downstroke. No, I'd say the skill is medium in all cases. Embellishments, both class two. No changes at all in the style? Oh, he made the signatures look a little different. All eight factors match up, though. It's the same person. All we have to do is find him. Hey, uh, how about this fellow Stanley Bubeck? I thought you had him tapped. Now, we're not too sure about him, but it's the only line we got to work on, so we'll have to do for now. Mm -hmm. Romero, the man in the office to see you and Joe. His name's Loomis. Right, Fred. Be there in a minute. Okay. Well, thanks, Don. We'll check you later, huh? Mm -hmm. Sure, okay. See you. Let's go, Ben. How do you do? You Mr. Loomis? Yes, sir. Sergeant Romero? No, this is Sergeant Romero here. My name's Friday. Oh, how, how are you? you do? What can we do for you? It's about these checks, Sergeant. And these are right here. Yeah? You see, I run a delicatessen out on Sunset, and a few days ago, a new customer came in for a few things and paid for them with these checks. He came in twice. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I got the checks back today. They're no good. I tried to look up the man at the address he gave, but there's no such address. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see, one's for $15, the other one's for 20 yeah. The reason I asked for you, men, is because I know the man who runs the drugstore across the street, George Holmquist. He had some bad checks about a month ago. He said you took care of them. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Do you recall the man who passed these checks, Mr. Holmes? Yes, I think I do. He told me he was new in the neighborhood and he was looking for a place to trade. Well, I guess we're all anxious for new business. I took the checks. You got those mug shots there, Ben? Well, yeah. Here we are. Thank you. How about these men, Mr. Loomis? Any of them look anything like the person who passed the checks on you? No. Let's see. Now, this one, yes. It does look like the man in a way. I don't know if I could be absolutely sure. Stanley Bubeck, same memo. I beg your pardon? Well, it looks like you're stuck with a couple of bad ones, Mr. Loomis. Probably the same man who passed checks on your druggist friend. We're doing everything we can to run this man down. But what about the checks? Isn't there anything I can do about them? No, sir, I'm sorry. Not right now. We would like to have you make out a crime report, if you will, and would you leave these checks with us? Yeah, yeah. Friday, Romero. Jesus, Mr. Loomis. This just came in for you. Reply from Salt Lake City, Utah, on that bulletin you sent out on Stanley Bubank. Yeah. He's been in jail for five months. <laughs> We sent a request to Salt Lake asking him to question Stanley Bubeck if he knew of any forger who matched his description or used his M.O. Bubeck could tell us nothing. Wednesday, February 6th, we threw away the results of two months of investigation. We went back and started from the beginning. Despite all precautions and warnings, the checks kept coming in at the rate of half a dozen a week. The same M.O. was used, the same handwriting showed up in the signatures on the checks. Again, with the help of the staff and the statistician's office and the record bureau, we waded through hundreds of names of known check men and compiled a new list of 38 possible suspects. Each one fitted the general description of the forger. Each one, at some time in his forgery career, had used the same general method of operation. Well, after days of legwork, we finally boiled down the list of possibles to three names. George Roberts, James Young, and a Harry L. Johansson. We got out a flyer to all the small businessmen in the areas where the forger operated. Another week passed. The worthless checks kept showing up at the rate of two and three a day. On February 21st, Ben and I answered a call from a druggist in the Echo Park District. He bought some toothpaste and a carton of cigarettes, Sergeant. Asked me to cash a $20 check for him. Did you ever see the man before, sir? No, he gave me the same old story about being new in the neighborhood. That's when I remembered that uh, police bullet from the department sent me. Mm -hmm. Do you still have that bullet? No, I looked it over and then I guess it got mislaid. I wonder if you'd mind taking a look at these pictures here. Not at all. These right here. Mm-hmm. Sure. This one right on top, that's the man. You sure? I am. It only happened a few hours ago. Uh, do you know who he is? Harry L. Johansson. That's the name we have on him. It doesn't mean anything to me. He got real huffy when I wouldn't take his check. Stalked right out of the store. Very suspicious. Did you follow him? No, I told Ralph, my clerk, to follow him. Uh, Ralph. Yeah, Mr. Butler? You want to tell these officers about that man this morning? Oh, I uh, followed him down the street for a block and then turned the corner. That's where I lost him. Oh, it's too bad. Yeah, all I got was a license number. You are listening to Dragnet, 
The Case History of a Police Investigation, presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of Northwest Airlines stewardess Jean Metzen. You'll see her picture in leading magazines this week. Now, her actual signed statement. There's one thing I really look forward to after a long flight. A good, mild smoke. That's why I prefer king-size Fatima. It's milder than any other long cigarette I've tried. Yes, I agree it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And so do more and more smokers every day. Actual figures show extra mild Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. The king-size cigarette, which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. You will prefer Fatima's much different, much better flavor and aroma. You will agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Best of all, long cigarettes. September 21st, Thursday, 3 p.m. We took the license number which the drugstore clerk had given us. We went back to the office and checked it through DMV. We found the car was registered to a Russell Burroughs on Pico Boulevard. We checked him out. He told us that he had loaned his car the day before to a friend of his. He identified the friend as Harry L. Johansson and gave us his last known address. 614 Elderwood Avenue. We got out a broadcast on the car. The Elderwood Avenue address turned out to be a single-story wooden frame house in the southern part of the city on the edge of the industrial district. It needed a coat of paint. A woman in her elderly 30s answered the door and identified herself as Mrs. Johansson. She invited us into the living room. There was a baby playing on the floor. I don't expect my husband home for another two weeks, Sergeant. He's a cosmetic salesman. Travels all over the western states. When did he leave on this last trip, Mrs. Johansson? The first of the month. Why, is there anything wrong? What's the name of the cosmetics company that your husband works for? Harrington Universal. Offices are down on East Main. Mm-hmm. Do you know a friend of your husband's named Russell Burroughs? Yes, I do. He's kind of a friend of the family. Please, Sergeant, if there's anything wrong, I ought to know. We talked to Mr. Burroughs this afternoon. He told us your husband's in town. Burroughs loaned him his car. Harry? That silly is still on the road. He'd certainly let me know if he was coming back early. You sure of that, ma'am? <laughs> Would you excuse me a minute, Sergeant? I'll have to put the baby to bed. Certainly, ma'am. Come on, Bonnie. I'll be back in a minute. Kind of a funny setup, isn't it? How do you mean? Well, if Johansson's pushing bum checks, the money isn't going into his home here. Wife doesn't act like she knows anything. Seems cooperative. Well, afraid we're going to have to level with her if we're going to find out anything, huh? Mm-hmm. You sure got a cute little girl. I'm sorry, Sergeant. It's perfectly all right. Just a few more questions. Is it possible that your husband could be in town and you might not know it? I mean, could he be staying with a friend or some relatives? <laughs> no, if Harry was in town, he'd come home. Why would he stay with anyone else? When did you last hear from your husband? Last week. He wrote from San Francisco. The letter's right there on the mantel. Oh, huh. Well, besides that letter, do you have any other samples of your husband's handwriting on the house? Well, I, I think so, yes. Where did you say you were from? Central Division, forgery detail. You investigate checks, bad checks? Yes, ma'am, that's right. And you know about my husband? His prison record, yes. Harry promised me he was through with all that. He gave me his word. Sorry, ma'am. About a month ago, he had some extra money. He wouldn't tell me where he got it. Look, Sergeant, maybe you've made a mistake. Maybe it's not Harry at all. You're not sure, are you? Did your husband use the phone much, I mean, for out-of-town calls, say? No. Just that one toll call, a Long Beach number, I think. He has a business friend down there he used to call. Do you know the number, ma'am? I can show you. It's on last month's phone bill. Please, Sergeant, if Harry's done something wrong, he did it for us. Me and the baby. Harry's not bad. Yes, ma'am. He's done something. He did it for us. Harry hasn't had it easy. He wanted to get things for the baby. Clothes, a better house. All he wanted was a little happiness. A little happiness. You had it wrong, ma'am. Hmm? You don't buy it with bum checks. <laughs> Before we left Mrs. Johansson, we called and had a stakeout placed on the house, and then we got a sample of her husband's handwriting and 
the Long Beach telephone number that he was in the habit of calling. The next morning, Don Myers in handwriting compared Harry Johansson's letter with the signatures on the worthless checks. It matched. We called the Harrington Universal Cosmetics Company. They never heard of Harry Johansson. We called that Long Beach phone number. A woman answered and gave us the address where the telephone was installed. It turned out to be a swanky modern apartment house. In apartment 18, we interviewed a good-looking brunette. She identified herself as Harry Johansson's common law wife. She was well-dressed, and the apartment was richly furnished. Well, what's it all about? What do you want, Harry? Police business. You know where he is? Well, what's he done? Do you know where he is? Uh, he drove into Hollywood this morning. He might be back tonight. I'm, I don't know for sure. Is this your apartment? Yeah. Mine and Harry's. You're sure that uh, Joe Hunt is not here now? Of course I'm sure. Why? Well, and you won't mind if we come in and look around, huh? I have a right to know what it's all about. Johansson's wanted for forgery. Now, if you want to get involved, you help him hide out. No, I'm not asking for that kind of trouble. Go ahead and look. Mm-hmm. Take the bedroom, will you, Ben? All right. Never mind, cop. Thanks for the help, honey. I don't want any part of your troubles, Harry. I didn't know a thing about it, officer. Ben. Yeah. You better come along, too, lady. Well, tell him, Harry. I don't know what it's about. What's the idea of getting me mixed up in this? How do you think I was paying for this place? Taking you out and buying us clothes for you. I don't want any part of it. Three-room apartment, a couple of dresses. That's all he ever got me. You got no complaints, lady. Huh? That's more than he bought his kids. 1 p.m. Friday. Ben and I took Harry Johansson to the county jail where he was booked for suspicion of forgery. We called Mrs. Johansson and notified her. She immediately contacted friends and relatives and raised enough money for a writ to have her husband released from jail. Three days later, Johansson was arraigned and a date set for his preliminary hearing. After the arraignment, Ben and I took him back to the county jail for rebooking. I'd like to ask you a question, Johansson. Yeah? You got any money of your own left? Why don't you stick to your own business, copper? That family of yours is having a pretty rough time. Your wife borrowed every cent she could find to bail you out. Now, what's she going to live She's on? She's got relatives. No, there's the elevator. Come on, Johansson. not going to put me back in Folsom. Not in a hundred years. You've done two stretches already for hanging paper. You should have known better, mister. You got it all figured out, haven't you, Fuzz? Well, I'm not going back. Take it easy. You got a couple of more weeks on bail before the trial. Yeah. A couple of weeks. What's the matter with you? Don't you feel well? I won't get me back to Folsom. You're not making it any easier on yourself. All right, Archie. Don't you cops understand? I hate it. Every lousy bit of it. I'm not going back to Folsom. I'm not going back. Now, do you understand? It's a good idea, mister. You remember that when you get out. We booked Harry Johansson in the county jail. His bail was continued, and he was released pending the trial. During the next week, along with the district attorney's office, Ben and I helped prepare the case against Johansson. Three days before the trial opened, we had a phone call from Mrs. Johansson. She told us that her husband had disappeared. There was nothing we could do until he actually failed to appear in Superior Court at the appointed time. On Monday, April 3rd, the case of the State versus Harry L. Johansson officially opened. The defendant failed to show. A bench warrant was immediately issued, and we got out a broadcast and an APB on the suspect. Stakeouts were placed in his house and at the apartment of his common-law wife. Two days passed. No sign of him. Joe Bumley just checked it out. Yeah. How about those two ex-con pals of Joe Hanson's? Did you check with them? Yeah, nothing there. Mm-hmm. I don't see how I can last out much longer. One suit of clothes, no money. You still got a checkbook. Hmm. When did the skipper say he was coming back? On 7.30 tonight. 7.15 now. I'll get it. Forgery Friday. Jerson, this is your mother. Oh, yeah. Hi, Ma. I forgot to tell you when you're called earlier. You're supposed to be home tonight by 8 o'clock. What's that, Ma? Uh, Mary Fowler. She's coming over to visit tonight and Genevieve's coming with her. Yeah, well, look, will you try to explain to them that I'm working and I can't get away? Huh? Well, all right, 
Joseph, I'll try. Well, if I possibly can, I'll try to make it home by ten. Will that be all right? All right, Joseph. I'll see what I can do. Genevieve's going to be disappointed. Yeah. Uh, if I'm later than that, don't wait up for me, huh? Yes, all right, then. Bye, Ma. Yes. Bye, Joseph. Oh, hi, Skipper. The call just came in. Yeah. They found Johansson. Captain Elliot, Ben, and I drove out the highway to the Tahunga Wash. We turned off and headed into the Mount Gleason area. Captain Elliot directed us onto a dirt road. Halfway up one of the mountains, we spotted a group of cars pulled off on the shoulder of the road. We parked behind them, got out, and started over. Who found the cars, Kevin? One of the people living back in the hills. Spotted it on his way home from work. Mm-hmm. Huh? Coroner got here in a hurry. Yeah. Hi, Dave. Oh, how you doing, Joe? Captain Elliot. How long has he been dead? Since last night, I figure. Come on over. Yeah. You talked to the man who found Johansson's body, Dave? Yeah, he didn't touch a thing. What'd you find? Powder burns on the temple, powder on the hands. Boys from Homicide found the note. It's on the seat right next to him. Here it is, here. It's been checked. Yeah, thanks. All ties in, huh, Dave? Pretty tight, yeah. Gene Beckel from Homicide wants to talk to you, Captain. Okay, be right back, Joe. Right. Who do you address the note to, Joe's wife? No, the girlfriend. Look what he wrote it on. Yeah, blank check. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On April 9th, an inquest was held in the coroner's office on the main floor of the Hall of Justice, Los Angeles, California. In a moment, the results of that inquest. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. The working detective comes in contact with many people in his daily tour of duty. People who are willing to cooperate and those who won't even try. It's a difficult task, but the police officer has been trained to try to please everybody to the best of his ability. So, with a cigarette, the people who make Fatima try to please all long cigarette smokers. They carefully select and blend the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos to make Fatima extra mild the best of all long cigarettes. Now, if you're a long cigarette smoker like I am, smoke Fatima. Every pack is extra mild. Fatima. On April 9th, the coroner's jury returned a verdict that the death of Harry L. Johansson was caused by a gunshot wound in the head, self-inflicted. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Coming up, Duffy's Tavern. More good times on NBC. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. The lady tourist was a school teacher out after glamour, and she got it. But only after she learned that in Hollywood, the three R's could be reading, done in a dark room, writing, found in a dead man's pocket in arithmetic, that added up to murder times two. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's transcribed story, The Rustin Hickory. It was hot in my apartment, even at 10 o'clock at night. The sultry wind blowing through curtains at the far side of the room didn't help a bit. It was the kind of night that made me wish I was something else. A butcher, baker, candlestick, maker, anything. 
After a long hot day spent in the downtown courts of law, listening to the petty arguments of a petty larceny case, I was tired of petty people. The paper I had picked up on my way home wasn't helping any. Ten killed in an air crash. Mental cruelty, says local songbird. I made myself another highball. Lots of ice, easy with water. And picked up the paper again. It was still more of the same. Cy Nestor killed in office on Sunset Strip. Cy Nestor. <laughs> He'd hit the papers before. Bookie, B-minus picture producer, general racketeer. Somehow I wasn't too surprised he was on the receiving end for a change. My drink was good for ten more pages of equally dull reading, and I was set for the next in line when the phone rang. Mr. Philip Marlowe? It was the first attractive voice I'd heard all day. Mr. Marlowe? And you know, I thought she might be fun. My name is Joan Rustin, and I'm only here in Hollywood from Ferndale, Nebraska, on a vacation, and I wanted to have some fun. You know, see the nightclubs and the uh, stars hey. and that sort of thing. Hey, wait a minute, Joan. I don't want trouble, Mr. Uh, Marlowe. Hold it. I reached a ball uh, teacher. And... Hey. Yes? Let's back up a little, huh? Your name is Joan Rustin. You're from Ferndale, Nebraska, which you're right, I've never heard of. Also, you're a school teacher. That much I got. <laughs> but the rest about the sights, the last part, the trouble. Oh, but don't you see? They're the one and the same. Oh? I wanted to step out. Nightclubs, movie stars, glamour. But it didn't end up like that because he was shot, and then I didn't who know what was to shot? do. And his name's Aubrey Nichol. He's the man who took me out to show me the club. Anyhow, after it happened, I ran. Why? Why? The publicity, of course. Mr. Marlowe, I'd lose my job. You see, I'm a school teacher. Yeah, you said that, honey. Now, look, where are you, Joan? The Julep Room. It's a bar on Sunset and La Cienega Boulevard. You'll come right over, huh? Huh? Yeah, I'll come right over, huh? <laughs> Goodbye, Joan. Hey. Hey, Mr. Marlowe. Yeah, but where are you? Over here in this booth. Hurry. Okay, hurry it is. <laughs> Hello. Now, tell me why all the secrecy, and you... Uh, oh. And what? Oh, what are you staring at? You? I expected braids, Joan. Horn rims, calico, maybe. <laughs> Not ice blue satin, drape plunging, and, uh... Yes? Uh, yes. <laughs> Start at the top, honey, and slow this time, huh? Well, yesterday I met this man, this Aubrey Nickel I mentioned. Oh, he's really nice, Mr. Marlowe. He's a photographer, has a darling place up on the sunset, uh... Sunset uh, Strip. Uh, <laughs> You want that to have your picture taken? Uh-huh. I wanted something, well, something glamorous. That's easy. And look, look, here what I got. Oh, uh, by the way, I ordered a drink for you, a scotch drink. Here. You like scotch drinks, don't you? Yeah, I, uh... <laughs> scotch drinks are my favorite drinks, Joan, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, now, isn't it wonderful? The picture, I mean. I'll say it is. I'd never say school teacher. No, that's the idea. Just like a model in a fashion magazine, isn't it? Aubrey took it from inside his photo shop while I was outside on the street looking in his window. You know, like a smart career girl just strolling along the avenue. Mm -hmm. And see how he faded out the background? That way I'm the, uh, the focal center. Focal center. Oh, isn't it nice? Oh, yes, it is, yeah. But look, Joan, the rest of the story. Now, the man was shot. You don't want publicity, remember? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, we made a date, Mr. Marlowe, for tonight. I was to be at his place, his shop on the strip at 8, which I was. But when I got there... He was gone. Well, no. he might just as well have been for all the attention he paid to me. Oh? He had something on his mind. Acted as though he didn't even expect me. Why, well, I had to mention his picture here twice before he got it out of a drawer for me. But then, just like that, he changed. Said if I wanted glamour and nightclub, why not? Oh, by all means, why not? And off we went to Cyrano's, no less, and sat at a table with two men and a woman who was actually Ermgard Fury. Actually who? Ermgard Fury, the starlet. Oh. Don't you read the papers? Oh, golly, her picture's been in every theater section and magazine for the last six months. Of course, she hasn't made a movie yet, but she probably will. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Erm got furious. She has red hair, a figure, lots of each, huh? Oh, that's right. Mm. Oh, and so sweet to talk to. Well, believe it or not, when we were in the powder room and she couldn't find her lipstick, she used mine. Now, that's really democratic. <laughs> Look, uh, Joan, there was a shooting. You remember that. Now, you were sitting at a table with three men in this Erm God uh, fury? That's right. Uh, well, go on. What happened next? Well... When Miss Fury and I got back to the table, Mr. Lacey and his friend were gone. And then a minute later, Aubrey excused himself to make a phone call. And then? And then a waiter brought me a note from Aubrey which said I should go back to my hotel and wait there till I heard from him. Then it happened. Hmm. Look, Joan, if I'm going to help you on this, you've got to tell the whole coherent story. Well, uh. suddenly there were some shots, maybe from outside. And people were yelling. It was terrible. I was scared to death. And I ran outside. People were crowded around someone. It was Aubrey. He was dead. What'd you do then? 
I took the first taxi I could get to my hotel, the Beverly Crest. I started for my bungalow, but didn't go inside because because there was a man hanging around. I'd seen him before someplace, and I didn't like his looks, and turned away, and he called to me. Oh, he was awful, Mr. Marlowe. Awful looking like a frog, maybe? Sloping shoulders, bulging eyes? Yes, and when... Mr. Marlowe, how do you know what he looked like? Promise not to tell. Promise not to... Oh, Mr. Marlowe, he's here, isn't he? Mm Mm-hmm. Been watching us for quite a while. Oh, holy smokes, and I didn't get away from him. Oh, Mr. Marlowe, I had nothing to do with this shooting. What can I do? I simply can't be mixed up in this terrible business. Oh, please, Mr. Marlowe, I'll pay you anything only get me out of this, please. Uh, we'll talk about that later, Joni. Now, look, when we get up, keep talking and don't look away from me. Uh-huh. Then when we're outside and around the taxi stand there, duck away from me fast and get in close to the building and stay there till the frogman is gone. Uh-huh. And head for your hotel bungalow and wait till you hear from me. Now, you got that? Oh, well, yes, but... I don't understand why he's going to leave us. You will, if our little coup works. Come on. It played easier than I'd expected, because like a good shadow, the frogman gave us a small head start, which was all I needed. The second Joan darted away from me, I moved quickly up to the first cabin line, opened and slammed the rear door fast, said goodbye out loud to Joan, who was not in the back seat. Then slipped the driver five, winked hard, and practically shouted a very far away address at him. When he lurched in the curb, I stood there and waved a minute. It was what was still supposed to be Joan. Then, even as I saw the frogman dart across the street, pile into his own car and take off after the cab, I walked slowly back into the bar where I had another scotch drink and did some fast checking on the current location of Aubrey Nichols, which was the Dawson Memorial Hospital. Then I started outside for my car after stopping en route at the booth where Joan and I had been sitting to pick up a pair of gloves and glamour portrait my new little client had left on the seat. (laughs) The school mom had been upset indeed. Dawson Memorial Hospital, Dr. Chambers? Yes, one moment, please. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Oh, I want to know the condition of a patient who was brought in here a little while ago, Mr. Aubrey Nickel. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. We're not allowed to give out such information. You'll have to inquire at the superintendent's office. Sir, I wouldn't not... bother, Phil. Well, Detective Lieutenant Matthews, good evening. Good evening. Nickel is dead, Marlowe. We oh. did not get a statement from him. Oh, that's too bad. Any idea who did it? No. <clears throat> have you? Uh-uh. I didn't even know him. A, a client of mine. Yeah, uh, Mr. Smith. That's right. That's remarkable. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mr. Smith, he asked me to inquire about his condition. Uh-huh. Well, it happened about an hour ago in an alley behind Cyrano's. Aubrey Nickel was a photographer up on the strip, but pretty much of a phony. A big front boy, strictly. That's all there was to it, huh? Walk down here with me a little. Oh, bit. sure, sure. We figure there may be some connection between this shooting and Cy Nestor's death this afternoon. Nestor also had an office on the strip. What do you figure the tie-in is, my friend? A man named Ham Lacey. You ever hear of him? Yeah. He was one of Nestor's number one boys in the racket, right? Yeah, something like that. Mm. Of course, officially, Ham Lacey is known as the vice president of Nestor Enterprises Incorporated. Also production manager of that second-rate movie studio Nestor owned. Mm. Well, anyway, Lacey, another man, and Aubrey Nickel were at Cyrano's tonight with a starlet named Ermgard Fury... And another gal we haven't been able to tag yet. Now, tell me... Wait a minute, Lieutenant. When Nestor was killed, did it look like the usual mob tactics? No, no. Nestor was beat up by fists. Not sapped, not cut up with brass knives. Yet death was caused by a blow to the temple from a poker that was standing next to a phony fireplace in which he could have hit his head when he fell. Well, probably not Lacey and Associates, huh? Probably not. He's got an alibi. Yeah? Mm. Besides, we already got a fair line on who did it and why. We found a note in Nestor's pocket, signed D. Tobin, which threatened Nestor with a beating if he didn't stay away from the undersigned's wife and send her back home at once. Nestor, you may or may not happen to know, had this Im- Imgard Fury or something under contract to him, saw lots of her. So, again, the two deaths more or less tie together. Yeah, you've already talked to, uh, oh, by the way, her name is Ermgard Fury. I... No, 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 I ain't talked to her. I figured I'd wait till I knew a little more. Also, I didn't figure Nickel would die without saying anything. No. Oh. Well, now it's your turn. We found this negative in the alley near Nickel's body. This is a night shot of the Sunset Strip and nothing more. Means anything to you? No, why should it? Now, look, I told you before, Lieutenant, I never even met Nickel. Yeah, and I listened, didn't I? I noticed. Yeah, but now let's level a bit, huh, Phil? Who your client is and what he or she has to do with this is one thing as long as we're both on the same side. But playing dumb when it might count, is quite another. Now, once more, Phil, huh? The picture. 
Still zero, Lieutenant. Uh, Honor bright. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, just to save you a little time, Phil. Yeah, let's do. Ermgard Fury's address, 441 West Bedford Drive, Beverly Hills. You got a 441 West Bedford Drive. Now, play it close. Be sure to call when you think it's time. And if you're wondering about why all this help from me, try this. What you know and won't tell, plus what I know and will tell, might do the trick. Say goodbye to me, Phil. Goodbye. <laughs> Yes? Miss Fury, my name's Philip Marlowe. I must talk to you at once. About what? Uh, your husband. I'm a friend of his, and he asked me to get in touch with you. It's because of what happened this afternoon up on the Strip. Oh. Well, what's wrong? Is is Dave here in town? Yeah, right? yeah, he is, and he's in trouble. You see, the police are after him. All and right, I... hold it, mister. You've said enough. Huh? What are you, cop or a reporter? Oh, now, wait a minute, Miss Fury. I've already told you I'm a friend of Dave's. Whose name I... happens to be Douglas. Mr. Douglas Tobin. Keep that in mind when you try this next time. Good night. Uh-uh, not so fast, baby. The mistake was mine, but I still want to talk to you. So do a lot of men. I'll bet. Now beat it before... Em God. Uh, before I forget myself. What's the trouble, Em God? Oh, no trouble, Hamilton, darling. This gentleman was just leaving. He had the wrong address. He, um... He made a mistake. Didn't you, Mr. Marlowe? Yes. Yes, a blunder. A thousand apologies and, uh... Good night, Mrs. Tobin. <laughs> what it was worth at work. At the mention of the name Tobin, Ham Lacey spun around like he was built on a pivot, and his eyes that were narrow slits with all the come-hither look of a cobra has never left me. As I slowly walked away from him and passed the yellow convertible he'd just driven up in. License number 6969X, California. And on out to the street. All of which only meant that Lieutenant Matthews was probably right about there being some connection between Cy Nestor's murder and the death of Aubrey Nichol. When I opened the door of my car and started to climb in under the wheel, the voice in the night helped not at all. If you don't do as I say, I'll kill you. Okay, okay. Now get out. Take it easy. All right. Now close the door and turn around. You're back to me. Now look, if this is a stick-up, Busty, you can save us both a lot of time. Shut up. I... I'm not a hold-up man. Now move over there, close to those trees. Go on. I want to ask you a question. All right, that's far enough. Now, what have you got to do with Helen? Helen who? Helen Tope. Ermgard Fury, that's what she's known as now. What have you got to do with her? Tell me. Very little, Mr. Tobin. Tobin? You know who I am? And so do the police. So why don't you call it quits while you're still in one piece? Oh, no, no, oh, no, no, not quits. That's what you want, what all of you want. Me arrested and out of the way in jail and maybe out of the way for good. No, no. But that won't be. Helen's mine and you're not going to harm her. Careful, Tobin, you're getting excited. Yes, excited, excited enough for this. Go! Oh! In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, a thrill a minute, high tension suspense from the word go. Dramatic excitement that builds and builds until it explodes in a smashing climax. That's Inner Sanctum, the great mystery show that's another of CBS's top-notch Monday night programs. You'll find Inner Sanctum one of the most entertaining spots in your Monday night listening schedule. And remember, Lux Radio Theater is back for its 15th year of great dramatic presentations. Inner Sanctum and Lux Radio Theater every Monday night over most of the same CBS stations. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Rustin Hickory. When the whirling pinwheels of light slowed down to being street lamps again, Douglas Tobin had pounded shoe leather on enough sidewalk to be safely out of sight. But it took a full minute of rubbing the bruise where his pistol had glanced off my head before I, I finally remembered that it was a good time to call Joan. I looked back at Ermgard Fury's house first and saw the light still on, the cream-colored convertible still parked in front and all apparently quiet inside. So I limped as far as the phone booth on the corner to warn my client that the trick we pulled on the frog wouldn't hold up forever. But instead, I found out just how far this side of forever it had collapsed. Yeah, hello. Hello. Hey, what number is this? Well, the Shamus. You got the right number, Shamus. What are you doing there? Where's Joan Rustin? Oh, the babe's here, but she ain't in much of a mood to talk. Incidentally, thanks for giving me this free time, Dippy. What are you talking about? That fast shuffle you tossed me, Dippy. That 
Now you see her, now you don't gag with the taxi. <laughs> For an old shell game operator like me, that one was as tough to see through as a glass bottom boat. All right, all right. You get your diploma in the morning. But listen, you, if anything happens to Miss Rust, now break it. Skip it, skip it, skip it, Dippy. You're wasting your breath. It's already happened. I'll see you around. So long. <laughs> Joan. Joan, come on, baby. Come on. Snap out of it. Oh, I told you, stay away from me. Hey. Get out of here. Hey, you hold it. It's me, Joanie. Marlo. Right. Marlo. Yeah. Oh, oh, Marlo. Come on, honey. What happened? Are you hurt, Joan? That man, the one with the gruff voice. Yeah. He forced his way in here, Marlo. He was looking for something. I tried to stop him. I, I was going to scream, but I, I guess that's when he put the bite on me. That slug, baby. Well, anyway, he hit me hard. And I've never been treated that way before in my whole life. And you've never been buddies with murder before, either. Come on, honey, get up off the floor, huh? Easy now. There. Hey, he turned your place inside out, too, didn't he? What was he after, Joni? Oh, I don't know. He just told me to quit stalling and hand it over. I didn't know what he meant, so he shoved me. Then he pulled out all the books there and tore up the rugs. He and... was looking for something small and flat like a... Wait a minute, wait a minute, sure. The cops found a negative near Aubrey Nichols tonight, but it was worthless. There must have been another one, an important one. And Lacey and Froggy, who no doubt is Helm Bay, must think you've got it. Me? Well, that's impossible. All I had was my picture, and, well, I don't even have that now. No, but I do. Out in my car, and it gives me a great idea. Come on. Uh, well, where, Marlo? I don't get it. What's my photograph got to do with this? Maybe plenty. You see, when Aubrey printed that picture of you, he faded out the background almost completely. You remember? Uh-huh. That's a stunt in fashion photography to make a subject stand out. But in this case, Joan, I figure it was played strictly in reverse. Well, how do you mean? That Aubrey took you to Cyrano's tonight on business. Big business. And you were holding the merchandise for him all the way. Oh. Here. Let's take a look. Oh, Marlo, my pretty picture frame. Better this than your pretty head later, sweetheart, believe me. Ah, uh-huh, yeah, here it is. Look, see? A negative the size of a postage stamp. But I'll bet old flash bulbs the $10 bills this baby's really loaded. Ah, uh, my, Marlo, hmm? I'll bet that baby's loaded, too. What are you talking about? The gun in that man's hand there behind you. Oh, fine. Wait, wait. Easy, Marlo. I'm, I'm not looking for any more trouble. I just want to be sure that you'll help me first. You're a private detective. I I searched you before, so I know. I'm in a jam. It's worse than I figured. The cops are after me for murder. No kidding. I can't understand it, Tobin. All you got is a motive deep enough to swim in, and you've been dropping clues like Hansel and Gretel drop pebbles. All right, all right, but I didn't do it. Well, I beat up Sy Nestor, sure, but... Well, he was going with Helen. My Helen. I hated everything and everybody in this phony town because they took her away from me. Even changed her name for her. Ermgard Fury. But I didn't kill Nestor. I, I swear I didn't. You've got to help me, Marlowe. With that thirty-eight in your fist, are you asking or telling? Oh, I'm asking, brother. Here, here. Take it. Take the gun. I'm in a fix and I know it. Okay, hothead. I'm already in Dutch for hiding Matthew's key witness here. Think how I'll look keeping his chief suspect under wraps, too. Yet, yeah. Oh, maybe I'm a sucker, but I believe you. All right, where do you hang your hat? The country cottage is number seven. Mm-hmm. It's a kind of a motel court down on Melrose. Street. Number seven. Now go there and stay out of sight. And I mean, stay out of sight. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks, Marlowe. Say, uh, I'm sorry I batted you down tonight. That makes a lot of difference to the lump on my head. Go on, Tobin, beat it. Yeah, okay. okay. I'll keep in touch with you. Uh, and where are we going, Marlowe? Call a friend of mine. We need a big enlargement of a small negative. <laughs> Hiya, Shermie. This is Phil Marlowe. No kidding. Gee, how's business, Phil? Long, long, long time no see. Yeah, I know. Now, look, are you busy? I got a job that's right down your alley, Sherman. It's important. What is it, Marlowe? Well, it's a 35 millimeter negative. I want it blown up to about half as big as a house. Okay, bring it in. I can't. I, I, I've got to check a couple of other things at the same time. Now, look, Shermie, can you meet me at the Aubrey Nichols studio on the strip in about 10 minutes? Back uh-huh. door? Wait a minute. Back door? Yeah. How come? So we can kick it in without attracting too much attention. Sure, me, I'll see you in ten minutes. I piled Joan into the car, drove down the strip, and once past Nickel Studio, which was enough. Joan had posed for a picture in front of the place, and directly across the street, behind her, just as I knew it had to be, was the neat plastic sign reading Sign Esther Enterprises on the diminutive but glossy imitation Swiss chalet. 
where Nestor's body had been found. We turned double back through the alley and found Sherman bobbing up and down like a nervous gopher. Five minutes of not-so-subtle persuasion got us past the lock and inside Aubrey's studio where something else checked. The walls were practically papered with pictures of Ermgard Fury, taken from every conceivable angle, including some that were not. Things were beginning to make a lot of sense. Uh, Marlo, is this all right? Uh, coming in here, I mean, it's sort of uninvited and all. Breaking and entering, lady. You can get five years for it. I sure hope you know what you're doing. Phil. Yeah, this must be the dark room. Yeah. Now, here's the negative, Shermie. Do your stuff. Well, what do you really expect to find on the film, Marlo? A murderer, baby. It's got to go one of two ways. Douglas Tobin for jealousy or Ham Lacey for ambition. Aubrey Nickel caught one of the two in the background when he took your picture. And he was familiar enough with all parties concerned over there to think he could put the screws on somebody. How's it coming, Shermie? He can be out in a minute. Mm -hmm. Fifteen by twenty, okay? Yeah, it's good. If there isn't a man in the background, I'll eat it. Better get the salt and pepper, pal, because it's nothing but a car. See? It can't be. It... Oh, brother, that's more than a car, Shermie. It's a yellow convertible that belongs to Ham Lacey. Look, you can even see the license, 6969X. Six, 6969X. Nine, six, nine, six, oh, now how do you suppose... Well, what, what's the matter, Marlowe? I just thought of something. Without this picture, both Tobin and Lacey are suspects. But with it, we have proof Lacey is implicated. That means Lacey thinks he has Tobin sitting in the perfect frame, right where he wants him. Oh, Marlowe, listen. Now, look, you two get out of here. Go back to the paper. I've got to get to Tobin fast and let him know. Oh, Phil, listen, look, I baby, don't... you're no doubt terrific in the third grade. But some things they don't even teach in college are going to pop any minute, so I'll take it from here, huh? Stick with Shermie, honey. I'll call you. Oh, but Marlo, wait, listen. I made it from the strip down to Melrose and then east to the cluster of dusty lean-tos with bath known as country cottages in something under ten minutes. Parked down the street and cut back through the alley on foot. I got to the door of cottage number seven with about 30 seconds to spare. No, no, no. Wait a minute, mister. You got me wrong. Oh, no, I haven't, pal. You can tell me you didn't knock off Sign Esther, and I'll believe you. But Nobody you... else will. I've got you right where I want you. Now, wait a because minute. Because of your note found in Nestor's pocket. You're the jilted boyfriend. The hick from back home who came to Hollywood with murder in your heart and knocked off the guy who stole your wife. Now, look. Yeah, here. and then you went after the cheap photographer who gave her her stuff. Oh, yeah. And after that... You knew you couldn't escape, so you blew your brains yeah, out. Fine. And by the time I leave here, that's the way it's going to look. Not tonight, Ham. Uh, yeah, stand still, Lacey. Toss the gun over on the bed. Go on. That's better. So you figured Aubrey was lying about having a picture that pegged you as Sinester's killer, didn't you? You figured Aubrey saw something but had no proof, so you shot him. But you were wrong, Ham. He had all the proof we need. Oh, my, 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 Jones, who's out there? Oh, Phil. Jones. Phil. Jones, are you all right? Jerry, I hit her. She's the one who killed Sign Esther. I tried to tell you that. I followed you here to tell you, but instead I saw her with a gun pointed at you. I, I grabbed the first thing I saw, this broken rake handle, and I hit her with it. I hit her awfully hard, Phil. She, but she isn't moving. You don't think she's... Dead? No. Oh. <laughs> she's probably thinking over the big lesson you just taught her with that stick there. <laughs> what? Well, what's the matter? Hey, Teach. You know what that rake handle's made of? What? It's hickory, isn't it? Yeah. What else could it possibly be but a hickory stick? All right, Marlo, all right. Nobody can hear us. Now, what is it? Well, it's that Miss Rustin here is a school teacher, Matthews, and it's imperative that we keep her name out of this. Oh, well, we can arrange that. Oh, good. You know, Matthews, it's funny how one step leads to another. Yeah? Ham Lacey never would have gone so far as to kill Nestor on his own. But when he learned that Ermgard had done it, he saw an opportunity to turn the whole situation to his advantage. He and the girl agreed to frame Tobin and then go along as a team. You know, of course, that that's just your theory. Just a minute. Now, what do you mean? sit down over there and be quiet for a change while uh, Miss Rustin and I wind this up. Matthews, listen. Now, quiet, I... please. Pulling rank, huh? Phil. Now, <clears throat> Miss Rustin. In solving this case, Just you, a minute. Uh, she didn't solve the case. I... Miss Rustin, if you hadn't solved it, and right when you did, you'd be talking to this guy exclusively via Ouija board from now on. Let's face oh, it. Oh, what a corny pitch. Now, tell me, Miss Rustin, uh, how did you peg Ermgard Fury? Well, when we got the picture of the yellow convertible, I remembered that I'd gone to the powder room at Cyrano's with Miss Fury to freshen our makeup. But she couldn't find her lipstick. She emptied her purse looking for it. <laughs> she finally had to borrow mine, you know. Oh, how democratic. I said that. So now you own it? Now, tell me, Miss Rustin, how do you figure the lipstick figures? Oh, it wasn't the lipstick. 
I happened to notice among the things from a purse a, a keychain a chain with car keys on it and an identification tag in the form of a little license plate. Oh, and the numbers were... 6969X. Six, six, That's right. And since Ham Lacey had an alibi and those keys were in Miss Fury's bag, you figured it was her who'd been driving. It was she who'd been driving, yes. Isn't this revolting? Yeah, she, yes. Yeah. She wanted to kill Nesta because he wouldn't turn loose of her so she could claw her way on up to the bitter top. And when she found him unconscious, it was easy. How literary. Uh, well, that's that, I guess. Thank you very much, Miss Rustin. I I hope your stay in our town has be- was. Oh, what's the matter? Tony, baby, don't cry. Uh, I just thought of the most dreadful thing. I've had a wonderful time. I went to Cyrano's. I, I hit a movie star on the head and I helped solve a murder. But I'll never, ever be able to say one single word about it to anybody in Ferndale, Nebraska. Darn it all. It took a few minutes to put on a new touch of mascara and get the pink off her nose. But she was smiling again when we said goodnight to Matthews and stood on the steps at headquarters and looked at the glittering lights of Hollywood. There was still plenty of time for supper and even a dance or two, and she wanted to go. But suddenly, from somewhere, there was a smell of autumn in the air, of dry leaves on the ground and ripe red apples for the teacher. <laughs> she shook her head wistfully and spoke of an appointment she had bright and early next Monday morning. It's a very important appointment, Phil. So, I took her to a hotel and said goodbye. All the way home, for some reason, I kept wondering, whatever happened to Skinny McDonald? The only kid in school who could shoot a better spitball than Marlowe. <laughs> Has it really been that long ago? Adventures of Philip Marlowe star Gerald Moore and are transcribed and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... There was a tapestry found under a tomb. They were all after it. The worried importer, the man with half a face, the Englishman in an L.A. slum and the lady wearing a green veil. But before it was over, none of them had it, and two of the four were dead. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. This time a bride to be, a corpse in a plush bungalow and a southern drawl behind a gun. All had one thing in common. They moved through the same deep shadow. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Deep Shadow. Hello. Uh, Mr. Philip Marlowe, please. This is Marlowe. Oh, my name is Harvey Kettering. And I'm to be married in four hours at nine shots. Oh, congratulations. I hope you'll be very happy. But my bride is gone. It disappeared. I need your help. Now, look, if you've been left waiting at the altar, I can't... But no, 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 it's nothing like that. She's in, she's in trouble, Mr. Marlowe, I'm sure. Oh? Shirley loves me. 
Now, I'll pay anything you say. 200, 300, anything. Only get out here fast, please. Now, wait a minute. Where is here? At 3840 Sunswept Drive. It's a studio city just across the hills mm. from Hollywood. 38. Take Laurel Canyon. Well, now, look, Mr. Kettering, oh, please, I... Please, Mr. Marlowe, please. Okay, okay. All right, Mr. Kettering, I'll see you. <laughs> The address he gave me turned out to be a healthy chunk of old Spain. A whitewashed house that spread out for at least a hundred yards under a pink-tiled roof. As admitted by a butler with owl eyes, no shoulders, and a small bay window, and we played follow the leader over cool marble ankle-deep Persian rug and inlaid Philippine mahogany. Finally, I was ushered into the ballroom, which was big enough for a highlight match. It was decked out for a wedding from the champagne buckets and dead over ice lobsters to a pink rose-covered canopy at the center. And in the middle of it all, chained smoking while he worried, was my new client, Harvey Kittering. Well, Mr. Marlowe, I'm afraid there isn't a moment to lose, so I'd better tell you what I know quickly. Uh, but uh, let's step outside on the patio. All right, Mr. Kittering. Uh, Mr. Marlowe, last night, Shirley and I... What's went your to full the... name, Mr. Kittering? Doyle. Shirley oh. Doyle. Oh, yes. Here. Uh, here's a snapshot of her. Mm-hmm. She's 25, blonde, and as you can see, Mr. Marlowe, very attractive. You're so right. You started to tell me about last night. Oh, yes. Uh, we were out together at a nightclub, the Blue Chip. On Ventura Boulevard? Oh, yes. Now, we'd never been there before, yet I think that's where it started. What do you mean, started? Well, when we were leaving the place about midnight, I called a cab. I was just giving the driver Shirley's home address, the Moore Park Court Apartments, when suddenly she told me to get in and told the driver to start at once. You know why? No, I thought perhaps she'd, she'd seen somebody coming from the club. But when I asked her about it, she said it was... Just her nerves, since tomorrow is her wedding day. I see. Then today she was supposed to call, but she didn't. At two, I called her. Talk to her? No, she was gone. Mm. But I talked to the day maid. She said when she arrived, she brought in a note that had been left outside Shirley's door. There's one of those leave a message pads in a box on her porch rail. Mm-hmm. She said it seemed to upset Shirley terribly. M- Mr. Marlowe, what are we going to do? Now, look, have you been over there to Shirley's place? No, I haven't. Got a key? Yes, I do. All right, Mr. Kettering, you have the key, so let's go. But uh, what shall I do about the guests? The, the Nothing mis- right now. We may be lucky. Uh, there are only three rooms, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, uh, what do you suggest we do? Well, first, let's look for that note. She may have left it here somewhere. Oh, you try the bedroom. I'll start with the wastebasket. Full of papers. All right. Just a few seconds, Paul. Yeah, sure. Uh, Endicott Clinic. 321 North Russell. Say, um, Kettering, what does Shirley do for a living? Oh, she was a receptionist, Mr. Marlowe, at a medical clinic on Russell. Oh, that figures. Oh, Mr. Marlowe. What? Mr. Marlowe, I found it. The the note the maid spoke of, it's the same paper written with a soft pencil like the one attached to that box outside. It was on her dresser. Give it here. Let's see it. Dear Shirley Doyle, guess who I ran into last night? Francis Dragato. Suggest you meet me at the corner of Ventura and Woodsett Boulevard at 10.30. Outside, huh? Is Francis spelled with an E? Yeah, yeah, the girl's name. I've never heard Shirley mention any Francis Dragato. Mm. And a public street corner wouldn't be much of a place to check five hours after people met, would it, Mr. Marlowe? No, I suppose not. Uh, Mr. Marlowe, what, what have you got? What is it? Hmm? Oh, a page torn out of the classified directory, a listing of theatrical agencies. Line through by pencil, made down at sea. Well, the last one crossed out is Capital Artist. Yeah, that makes Drake Talent Agency next. Well, she never had anything to do with show business, Mr. Marlowe. What do you think it means? I don't know. Uh, you going to check with the Drake Agency? No, my first stop's going to be where you were last night, the blue chip. I know the owner, Eddie Shaft, and Eddie knows an awful lot, including things that uh, aren't always exactly his business. May be able to help us if he wants to. Uh, sh- shall I come along, Mr. Marlowe? No, no, you go home, Kettering. I'll try to deliver your bride before nine. All right. Uh, oh, shall I pay you now? I will let it go, COD. <laughs> I have the slightest idea what I'm going to run into. The snapshot of Shirley Doyle my client had given me reminded me of the kid you went to school with. You know, she had the kind of well-scrubbed look you knew was quick to smile, but... I knew that she could be in a lot of trouble if she was tied in at all with the dapper Eddie Shaft. Hey, 
After dark, the blue ship was one of those cozy, soft lights melting on thick drapes kind of places. It made you forget all about the stiff prices for limp food. But now, at a little better than five in the afternoon, under wide-eyed, unblinking work lights, it had all the cushion come hither of a union hall. In one corner, a skinny musician with a golf ball complexion was working over a clarinet. While in the middle of a dance flow with no more diameter than the hole in a candy lifesaver, a girl was standing on a piano stool. She was smoking and looking straight ahead at nothing. Her red shingled hair, promise of a nose and plunged neckline, tagged her as the singer on the posters outside. One Miss Corky Netherlands. The place is closed, soldier. Glad you told me. Never would have known. Never mind the routine, soldier. Just come to the point. What do you want? Uh, just a few words with the boss. Eddie around? No. No, he's not. Uh-huh. How about his bungalow in Coldwater Canyon? You mean it hasn't hit the papers yet? What's the connection between Eddie and the headline? Soldier, Eddie was stabbed to death sometime this morning. You've got to be kidding. Sometime between 9 and 11, the cops say. Well. <laughs> so long. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Coffee. You. you have any idea who did it? No. Except that maybe it was a dame. Any description on it? The law isn't gabby about things, soldier, believe me. If you don't, try Eddie's bungalow yourself and find out. Oh, yeah, and Mooney, don't forget to have that fingerprint crew go over his other car on that back porch rail. Okay, Lieutenant. Hey, can they start the body downtown now? Yeah, I guess so. We're not going to get any smarter staring at Hi, Matthews. Huh? Oh, hello, Phil. What brings you up here? Curiosity. I was in the neighborhood. What's the setup? I hear it's supposed to be a woman. Could be. Where do you hear this? Sing her over at the blue chip, Corky Netherlands. Oh, her. Yeah, well, she's clear. She yeah. was home right up until noon, and she can prove it. Mm-hmm. This happened a little before noon, an hour or so. But it was a woman, all right. What makes you so sure? Oh, Phil, fresh lipstick on a glass and a cigarette, a kitchen knife for a murder weapon, etc. No. Also, some long-nosed neighbor saw a girl. Said she was young, maybe blonde. She wasn't sure. So I'll run out of here a little after 11 this morning. Mm-hmm. All this uh, adds up to somebody in particular, huh? Well, it should, Phil. Norma Mayetta. Who? She was... Norma Mayetta is her name. She oh, was Eddie's yeah, dearest, yeah. you see. It should add, but it doesn't. She left town last night for Chicago on the 1 a.m. plane. We checked it. Of course, Eddie Shaft went with a lot of girls. Uh, excuse me. That's so uh, right. He uh, just got hold of that night cashier over at the Blue Chip. Yeah, what do you say, Money? Shaft took 50,000 bucks in small bills out of the office safe last night. Oh, what time? About 2 a.m. Had it in a large manila envelope. Yeah. Nothing even close to manila envelopes turned up here, has it? No, Lieutenant, but that gives us another angle to shoot at. All right, Mooney, pass the word to the boys. Okay, Lieutenant. Look, Mono, just a passing thought. Fine. You sure you're just curious? You sure you don't want to play one and one makes two with me? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure, Lieutenant. Well, look, I'll see you. I'll give you a call. Oh, if I... huh? Wait a minute. Yeah? Look, I know all about your professional ethics, you know, relations between client and private detective. Yeah. We won't go into that. We're going to go into something else very briefly, Phil. You know, the law in many points is quite clear, Marlowe. Clear like what, Matthews? Clear like the status of an accessory before or after the fact in a murder case. And like aiding and abetting a criminal. Like a lot of things you know all about, Phil. Keep them in mind, will you? Okay, Matthews. Yeah, I'll see you. Since the lieutenant hadn't mentioned Francis Vergato, I didn't see why I should. All of which made it a good time for me to cross my fingers and check the name which had been on deck on the list in Shirley's apartment. The Drake Talent Agency. The place which was on Sunset Strip was strictly coy colonial from a miniature Mount Vernon front to an oversized mirror polished brass knocker on the front door that said my tie was crooked. And I was sure that the gentleman who answered the door noticed it. It was impeccable. In cocoa brown gabardine, white high at the throat, tad shirt, and also cocoa brown silk tie. And at the bottom, there were thick soled cordovans with leather laces. At the top, a crew cut over jet black horn rims. He took the glasses off, and long, soft fingers toyed with one stem while he talked. Yes, sir? Now, my name is Philip Marlowe. I'd like to talk to Mr. Drake. I'm Mr. Drake. Oh? What was it you wanted, Mr. Marlowe? Well, I'm not exactly sure. You see, I, uh. 
Hey, Drake, this picture here is Corky and other ones, right? The third one over, yes. Uh, she's a client of ours. But this picture isn't what you came to talk about, is it, Mr. Marlowe? What's her home address? I beg your pardon. Come on, quick. It's important. And confidential. This isn't a lonely house, yeah, but... club, Mr. Marlowe. I was playing a long shot when I knocked on your door, Drake, but now it's paid off, so tell me. Any stranger call for Corky's address today? I don't know, and the secretary's already left. Look here, Mr. Marlowe. What's this all about? Murder, Mr. Drake. Murder? A messy one. Now, do you give me the address, or do I start after it myself? Well, I, I don't know. Come on, answer up, Drake. The Towers, an apartment hotel on Ivar. Now, one last thing. Don't call her after I leave unless you want to hit your hand-stitched lapels and cops. <laughs> Just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, you might think that after several years with Gracie Ellen, George Burns had seen everything, done everything, been everything. But this Wednesday night, you'll find George in a brand new role, that of a Floradora girl, with costume and complications by Gracie Ellen. The Burns and Allen show is heard every Wednesday on most of these same CBS stations, along with the Bing Crosby show and the Groucho Marx program. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Deep Shadow. I left the glossy Mr. Drake in his glossy little agency with his mouth hanging open and drove down to Hollywood Boulevard to Ivan from there up the hill to a five-story air-conditioned monolith with Venetian blinds called The Towers offered about as much sanctuary as the Yankee Stadium. I parked heading downhill and walked in across the buzzing green and silver lobby draped with pale pink curtains and blasé women to the elevator and rode up to the third floor. Corky Netherland's apartment was the fourth down the hall to the right and quiet, but the door was ajar two inches. So I rapped hard enough to swing it all the way open. The answer sounded like a cry for help from the bottom of a well. When it came again, I went in, and it took me a few seconds to realize that the noise was coming from a closet. And when I got it open, Corky Netherlands reeled out, looking like she'd been she through a threshing machine. She was here. She was after the money. Who was after she what money, Corky? Who? Some dame. I didn't know her, but she... There she is. Shirley! Miss Doyle, wait a minute! It was Shirley Doyle. She'd been hiding inside near the door. She grabbed a handy oversized mm-hmm. ashtray and let it fly at us and beat it. I made it to the hall just as the elevator door closed, so I took the stairs and raced it down to the lobby. I got out on the street in time to see Shirley with a large vanilla envelope in one hand, pile into a sleek new Hudson, and take off. I ran to my car to follow over, but that was as far as I got. I was stopped cold. I had a nasty little gut in the hands of a southern accent behind a pair of strictly Hollywood dark glasses. Be a good boy, honey, and hold it. Now, look, right sister, there. who do you think you are? Now, what I'll are you... ask the questions if you don't mind. Why are you in such a fuss over the girl who just made off? I was trying to get her out of a jam, believe it or not. Well, now, isn't that the darndest coincidence you ever saw? So am I. Only you want to catch her, and I want her to get away. I guess that's life, isn't it, honey? Yeah, in the raw, in the raw. You said it. We got big business together, her and me. And it sure don't include you. Uh, Just a minute. This adds like you could be Francis Dragato. Francis who? Uh, Dragato. Me? Yeah. Oh, 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 that name's much too fancy for the likes of me, honey. I reckon we can break it up now. So why don't you just give me the keys there in your hand? My keys? Come on, give. Yeah, well... That's a good boy. Now, don't try anything silly. And, uh, don't fret, honey. I'll leave the car two or three blocks down the street here. Look, maybe you ought to go back upstairs and... Console little sugar child up there. Maybe take her to a movie or something. You know, to cool her off. Well, that's a nice, fresh soda. I'm loaded with yeah, it. Yeah, you're Try loaded. me again sometime. So long. Dames. <clears throat> Someday I'm going to get a case where there's no dames connected. Either directly or indirectly. Parking my car three blocks away, that's fine, fine. Just fine. Hey, hey, going up. Flower, please, sir. Three. Did you catch her, Marlowe? Did you get her? No, no, she got away. Which leaves you and me, Corky, to make cozy conversation about that mention of dough you slipped on when I let you out of the closet. 
Come on back in the room, honey. What money? Now, look, you worked for Eddie Shaft as a singer in his club, but what else was Eddie to you beside boss? Just a minute. I don't see what business that is of yours. It's easy, it's easy. He was murdered. The cops have already talked to me, soldier. I'm clean. Those negotiations can be reopened at any time. Well, one thing, you forgot to tell them anything about Doe, and yet they're very interested in 50,000 missing bucks. The 50 grand was right here in the apartment, wasn't it? Well, you can't blame a girl for trying, Marlon. No, not unless she tries too hard. Now, what does the name Francis Trigato mean to you? Francis Trigato? Okay, skip it, skip it. Where'd you get the dough? Eddie gave it to me to keep for him. Why you? I thought Norma Maeda had the inside track with Eddie. Not after he fell in love with me. Oh, no, no, that's not good enough, baby. There was a double cross. Where was it? Now, look, Corky, you might as well be smart about it, huh? All right, I didn't kill him. But if you can get that dough back for me, I'll split it with you. Right down the middle. I'm listening. That club of his is dying on its feet. The blue chip's going broke. Eddie and Norma Mayetta raised $50,000 to keep it going. But Eddie decided to get out for Monday. He got rid of Norma by sending her to Chicago in a trumped-up deal. And he put all that cash in one lump and gave it to me to hold. We were going to run out together. Only somebody got to him, nailed him, and that left you holding the bag with 50 grand in it. That's nice. Stepped in a girl who belongs in this mess like a great-grandmother belongs in a high hurdle race, stepped in and took it away from you. With the help of a southern accent and dark glasses. Who are you calling? A friend of mine at Homicide. Why, you... Sit can... down and shut up. So far you've been lucky, Corky, don't push it. Darren Matthews, Homicide. Marlo Matthews, listen, on that Eddie Shaft case. Yeah, what about I got a couple of things you might be of help to you. Now, look, item one. That missing 50 grand is being sought after by a southern accent and dark glasses. A woman? Yeah, she pulled a gun on me. Item two. The name Francis Dragato. It ties in. D-R-A-G-O-T-T-O. Ring any bells? Dragato. That's what I said. Yeah, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember, yeah. Yeah, but it's nothing, Marlon. It's ancient history. Dragato I know was a third-rate burglar shot and killed resisting arrest down the Sandbar District about five years ago, way back when I was a prowl car sergeant. Look, what about this... Tell me, did Dragato have a wife? No, no, I think there was a daughter around. Name Francis? I don't remember that good, Marlo. Look, what is this Dragato business anyway? Well, so far it's a hunch. That's what I thought. Climb off of it and get down to facts, will you? Who's the dame after that Eddie Shaft money? Where did you run into her? I lost her on Ivar. That's not what I asked you. I know that's not what you asked, but anything else would be a breach of my client's confidence. All right, look, Marlo, I'm real serious. I'm going to give you just one hour to notify your client and get down here and spill. After that, I'm putting out a call to have you picked up for withholding evidence. Matthews ain't kidding this time. You, uh, didn't say goodbye. That's quite a tightrope you walk, Marlo. Yeah, sometimes. Mm -hmm. You're good. And I'm a girl of my word. You get that money back for me and it's 50-50. You're my only chance. Don't kid no kidder, baby. You're a girl of two words. Double and cross. Good night, Corky. I found my car all right a half a block from Sunset Boulevard. It took 20 minutes to get from there to the Sandbar District. And it was downhill all the way. It was a neighborhood squeezed and cramped in by a solid wall of massive factories. And as fested as the bottom of a bent garbage can. At the corner of River Street and 3rd, I found the house. Three sagging, rotten stories of tenement that squatted in the eternal shadow of a huge gas tank like a sick, dirty old man. The proud, gleaming giant of City Hall was only seven blocks away. I just as well have been 70 miles. I went up to the door and knocked, and finally it inched open, just far enough for a face the color of dishwater to peek out. She hissed at me for a minute through the gap where her front teeth should have been, and then told me she was Ma Hargis, the manager, motioned me inside. The living room looked like something swept out the back door of a down-at-the-heel museum. So, you want to know about the Dragotas, huh? Yeah, they lived here, didn't they? Maybe, maybe not. Cops got the old man about five years ago? Possible. Yeah. What became of his daughter? Where's Francis Dragato? Why? What are you being so cagey about, Ma? Because the bird that asks questions has got an angle, always. <laughs> and the one who knows the answer has got a price, huh? Always. Yeah. Okay, how far will a couple of bucks go? From here to the door. Two bucks won't even buy a buzz on beer these days. All right, we'll make it five. Here. Oh, that's better. 
Well, Dirk Gregoto and his kid, Francis, had the second floor here for 15 years. His wife died of TB first year they was here. Oh, she was a smart one, that Francis. Had a hit on her. Mm. She always said she was going to get off the sandbar someday and be somebody. <laughs> oh, I told her she'd never make it. It's too far, mister. Kids down here get dirty. And it's the kind of dirt you can't wipe off. It gets inside of mine. No. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, what happened to her? I don't know. When her old man got it, she left, and I never seen her again. Not to this day. Probably left town and wound up working the gin mills in some other place. Except they for five bucks do. worth? Huh? Well, <laughs> you bought sight on the scene, sonny. Tell me, you got a picture of her? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I have. Good. She was uh, 17 at the time. It's kind of fuzzy, but uh, you can see hey, she... Hey, wait a minute, Ma. Huh? Are you sure this is Francis Dragato? Say, she lived in this dump for 15 years, Autumn. Sure, I know. She looks like somebody else. The girl who was supposed to get married tonight. I got another picture of Francis here someplace. Wait a minute, now. A better one. Let me see now. Yeah, here it is. This was took down on Oliveira Street, one of them stands. Oh, that's her best friend there with her, Norma Maeta. Norma Maeta. <laughs> Norma was a tough little egg. Folks drank all the time and let Norma run wild. Oh, fine. Mm. Francis Stragato and Norma Maeta, friends. I'll say. Them two was quite a team. I always wanted to do something for them girls, but what can you ever do in a hole like this for anybody? You've just done it, Ma. Here's five more. Buy yourself another light bulb. Throw a party with the change. So long. The eyes of one young woman and the chin and mouth of another, side by side, smiling into a camera, had cleared up a lot of questions. But there was one more that needed an answer fast. I called Matthews in the first phone booth I came to, brought him up to date in a hurry, and then asked him to check Norma Maeda's place and if that was blank to meet me at the Moore Park Court Apartments the only other likely place I could think of. I crowded traffic lights all the way out, but he and Sergeant Mooney got there almost as soon as I did. And I led them back to Francis Tregato's well-lit cottage. The one she'd taken in her new name, Shirley Doyle. Mooney went to cover the back while Matthews and I moved in up front. Your hunches are banging off tonight, Marlowe. Oh, yeah, they're in here all right. Yeah, come on over this way. The window's open. We can catch a little conversation first, you know, and my help. Yeah, if you keep quiet, we can. I'm due in Chicago. Thanks for your help. Francis, dear. Yeah. I had to get this money. Now more than ever. You've got it, Norma, so goodbye. Now that stuffed shirt you're going to marry, you'll never know where you really came from or who you really are. Did you get that? Oh, and one more thing, dear, before I go. Yeah. I killed Eddie Shaft this morning. You what? Good nothing, Jim. I killed Eddie Shaft. When he put me on the plane for Chicago, I figured something was fishy, so I got off and I came back. And I found out he was selling me short for that little jerk, Corky Netherlands. We had an argument. I killed him. Of all the dumb... Then I remembered seeing you leave the blue chip last night. I needed someone like you to get the money for me, Francis. Yeah, there's your tie in. I couldn't afford to be seen here in L.A. when I was supposed to be in Chicago. Not with a murder on my neck. But you were seen by that man who chased me at the hotel. Who, Marlo? <laughs> He's still looking for a southern drawl and dark glasses. You're the only one who knows the truth, and That's you're in it with thinks. me now. I'm not going to let you involve me in a murder, Norma. Getting that money was one thing, but I'm not going to be mixed up in a killing. I don't care what it's called, and I'm going to tell the whole thing. You're a fool, Francis. I got a good alibi for one murder. It'll work for two. Let's go, Matthews. Yeah, you're fast. Not to Come on. Stop me now, Francis. Oh, no. Nobody is. And who's that? All right, hold it, girls. We're police. You're not taking me! All right, Matthew. Yeah. Police, stop her! Hey, stop! Come it, lady. No! Come on, Marlo. I, I think she's dead, Lieutenant. She wouldn't stop. She was shooting at me, but she's a woman. All right, morning. I got in her hand. She was a killer and nothing more. Yeah, I suppose she was. If you ask that kid inside, she could tell you what made her that way. Oh, well, let's get out of here, Matthews. Oh, I can't 
thank you enough, Mr. Marlowe, for bringing Shirley, uh, that is Francis, back to me safely. Oh, believe me, Mr. Kettering, it was a real pleasure. And uh, you, Lieutenant Matthews, for your cooperation on withholding the publicity aspects of this horrible no, thing. Oh, no, it's okay, Mr. Kettering. Glad to help out. We're going to be married, you know, right away. Shirley told me the story and wanted to postpone the wedding, but I wouldn't hear of it. Good. After all, I'm not marrying her for the past. I'm marrying her for the future. Yeah. Best wishes, Mr. Kettering. Yeah. Maybe tomorrow when Shirley's calmed down. Give her my congratulations, will you? Well, after a long cup of coffee and a lot of conversation about people with Matthews, I finally got in my car and headed home to my apartment on Franklin Avenue. Which isn't the best street in town, but it is lined with palm trees instead of garbage cans. And the sun hits it all day long. Yeah, but that reminded me again of River Street. The deep, perpetual shadow that hangs over it. A dirty shadow that Ma Hargis said could never be rubbed off. A shadow that spawns the Norma Maedas of the world. I was still thinking about it while I got ready for bed. I knew Ma wasn't 100% right. I'd seen the exception of the rule. But she was 99% right. Just enough to disturb my sleep. Oh, well. One guy can't change things. Can he? Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Gerald Moore may currently be seen starring in Republic's The Blonde Bandit. Featured in tonight's cast were Lillian Bieff, Joan Banks, Verna Felton, Yvonne Patey, Jeff Corey, Jack Crucian, and Tom Holland. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time I started with a Romanian from left field. Got misled in the Philippine jungles, chased an English accent clear to Venice, and wound up at a Shinto shrine with a friend from Siam. All without ever leaving Los Angeles. Dr. Christian, the kindly physician of River's End, has a most unusual case placed in his hands this Wednesday night on CBS. His patient, a 16-year-old girl who's in love with an older man, and the man, Dr. Christian himself. CBS cordially invites you to hear this Dr. Christian story, The Rainbow Trail, on most of these same CBS stations this Wednesday night. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. It's the Rocky Jordan Show. And I'm Rocky Jordan. We take you now to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine for a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. Did you ever hear of the Munda Oasis to the south of Algiers? It's surrounded by sand, miles of it in all directions. It's called the Land of Fear. And how did I know? They told me. They were tall, wore blue flowing robes and long black veils, and each had a knife sheathed to the wrist. 
From a little ways off, you might think they were women. They weren't. They were men on a mission of murder. The Café Tambourine. Crowded with tourists, camel drivers, women, cheats. Forgotten men down on their luck. The lonely and the lost. For this is Cairo, gateway to the ancient east, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Veiled People. A tambourine gets all sorts of people, but this kind of man was new to me. Tall, muscular, with piercing dark eyes, black silken hair and thin beard, sun-baked skin that turned light below the eyes. In spite of his size, his hands were delicate, and he might have been graceful except for the ill-fitting white robe and his complete uncertainty. I watched him as he came back to where I was wiping some glasses behind the bar. My name is Gerald. I would work for you, sir. Uh, I get all the help I need. Sorry. I need money. I will work very hard for only a few francs. You don't pay in francs around Cairo. Where are you from, anyway? If I do good work, you do not care. Well, you ought to be a good caravan driver. Look up Ali Ben down at the camel stalls. I do not want to drive camels. I would work hard for you, scrub floors, sweep. With this broom, I will show you. I stay on the other side of the bar. I said nothing doing. I clean up very good. You will see. Cut it, will you? Look out with that broom. Gerard! Oh! oh. I am most sorry. I bet you are. That was expensive liquor. It'll cost you plenty. But there is no money. So now you see, I have to work for you. Is that not so, sir? Yeah. All right, get busy, Jaron. There was nothing to do but let him work it out. It was all new to him, but he was tireless. And by night, he had the place as spotless as my grandmother's kitchen. The Cairo streets had him confused, so I helped direct him to an address on the Sharia El Gama. But he was back bright and early the next day, hard at work. That evening, I told him he'd worked off his debt, gave him a few piastres, and said he could stay on. Whoever he was or where he came from, he seemed like a good man to have around. He thanked me and hurried away. I figured the tambourine had had its fill of strange characters for a while, but a few minutes later, there were two more. They were tall and erect, dressed in blue robes. It wasn't just the fact that they blocked the door that sent me hurrying up front, but something else. The black veils that covered their faces. Look well over the room, Jeb. The eyes regard each person, Olga. All right, M. She boys, the fun's over. Take the masquerade someplace else. Tell us now where he is. We'll talk when you take off the disguise. You know, your wives will be missing those veils. He insults, Olga. So now we show him the knives, Jeb. You see? Sheathed to the wrists. Sharp for the throat of the offender. Yeah. Now... Where is the one who calls himself Gerald? Gerald? What's your interest? It is one which brings us from far across the sand. From the land of fear we come. Silence, Jeb. We talk only of the shameless one. As you say, the one who calls himself Gerald. He's not around. But he will return here. Maybe. You got quite a wait. The people of the desert are doomed to patience. We will wait outside until the shameless one returns. Police headquarters, Sergeant Greco speaking. Uh, hello, Greco. This is Rocky. Put Sam on, will you? The Captain Sabaya is not here, Mr. Jones. And where do I find him? He is in Port Said on an extradition matter. Now, kindly state your business. Uh, I want some of your men over here on the double. And why? A bunch of characters are scratching around outside, a little too anxious with knives. Indeed. Your tambourine has a way of attracting the disreputable... All right, just hurry, Gregor, before they make trouble. Proceed, please. Describe him quickly. Oh, you can't miss him. Three of them. Tall, wearing blue robes. You fear the fellahim? Well, these aren't just farmers, Gregor. They're different. Oh, and get this. They all wear veils. Mr. Jolt... Listen to me. You will leave them alone. Do not so much as look at them twice. Oh, cut it, Greco. They aren't women. They're men. Uh, men wearing veils, Mr. Jordan? Uh, you figure it out. Now get busy. Mr. Jordan, it appears that once again your mind is clouded from the wares of your cafe. I suggest you get some sleep. 
When you are awake, you may call me again if you remember anything. Until then, good night, Mr. Jordan. Oh, Greco, listen to me. Ah. That meant I had no help from the police, not with Greco on duty. As though that wasn't enough, Chris popped his head in the door just then with some news. He'd just been checking the cash in the register up front, and it was almost 100 pounds short. In spite of all the confusion, Gerard had only been gone 15 minutes. Chris had an idea, and so did I. That gave me one more good reason to look up Gerard. I ducked out the back way and headed east up the hill into the native quarter on my way to the Shari El Gama. I thought I'd shaken the veiled characters, but the blue robe flapping half a block behind told me different. I stepped it up, then hopped into a doorway and waited. As he came by, I was out, twisting his robe at the throat. Ah, talk fast. What's it about? Why do you want Gerard? The knife will answer. He suddenly twisted away, and I couldn't hold. His hand went for the sheath of his left wrist. My punch landed right below the ribs. He doubled but had the knife. I swung again. The knife clattered away, and that's when I yanked the veil off his face. No, not the veil. No. In the struggle, I had a good look at his face. Black, silky, thin beard, pale skin below the eyes. Not the face of Gerard, but a lot like it. By then, the noise of the fight was bringing a lot of people. A smart foreigner doesn't get caught brawling in the native quarter. So I let him have one right in the button, and he went down. I stuffed his veil in my pocket and then dug for an alley, kept it up till I was sure I was safe. Then I went on to the Shari El Gama. A dim streetlight pointed out the place I was after, a hovel fronting the street. A horse-drawn gary, complete with drivers, stood in front. Before I reached it, I had one more hurdle. Another time, out of the way, Imshi. For the unfortunate blind, for the eyes that do not see. Out of your cheek, Imshi. I shook him off as I saw a frightened native girl run from the house. She dumped a bundle of clothes in the gary and was climbing in fast. Quickly now, driver. Uh, just a minute, lady. I want to talk no, to you. No, It's about Gerard. I've got to see him. Where is he? Driver, whip the horse. Do not wait. A la tool. I had my hand on the gary, but it yanked away, and I went sprawling. By the time I was up again, the gary had carried the girl far down the street. Too fast to follow. Well, the door to the house was wide open, so I went in. I found a candle, lit it, and after a couple of minutes looking, decided I'd find nothing there. I was right, and I was wrong. Turn around, Signora Jordan. More carefully, so. I turned and faced the voice. He stood in the doorway, wearing a black flop hat over a mottled face. His crooked teeth were showing, but the grin wasn't pleasant. And he held a gun. Sit down, Signora Jordan. Sit down. We will talk about her now. Now, sit down, sit down. Sure. Now, tell me all about it. I must ask you, where did she go? I don't know. Obviously, you too have an interest in her, else why are you here? I came looking for Gerard. Now, only because he might lead you to her. Is that not so? No, no, I knew nothing about her. It happens Gerard works for me at my cafe. Yes, 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 I know. I followed him for a time from your cafe tonight, but uh, the wily one evaded me. Well, that's how you know my name. I uh, didn't get yours. Antonio Scorpio, signor. Now, how does Gerard concern you? Oh, none at all, except as an excellent bait. Now, let us forget about well, it. While you're about it, maybe you can explain a bunch of guys running around Cairo with veils over their faces. Let them return to their beds of sand where they belong. They're no fear of mine. Ah, but the girl is. Why? Senor, I'm beginning to wonder if you do know anything of this. Is it possible you do not know who she is? You got it right. Then you do not know her worth in gold or silver. I'm just waiting for you to tell me. Uh, yeah, I believe I will offer you something even better, my friend. This begins to shape up like a deal. Well, perhaps it is. It seems that you have won the confidence of this Gerard. It is possible that he places a certain uh, trust in you. You will wait to hear for him. Yes? Yeah. You have only to obtain the whereabouts of the girl whose name is Sheila. Bring the information to me, and you shall be well repaid. And what happens to her? And Gerard? That need never concern you. Well, senor? You think I'd go for a deal like that? Well, we who for reasons cannot return to our own country must live as best we can. <laughs> now, you answer. You tell me all of it. I'll decide then. Then you will get out of here. I will wait alone and you will get nothing. All right, have it your way, Scorpio. See, si, see. Si. 
Arrivederci, signore, ma... Mark you. Keep your lips sealed. Your life means no more to me than those of the desert. Now get out. <laughs> The next morning, I was reading the paper over some coffee when an item on page two caught my eye. Body of unidentified murder victim found in house at 1410 Sharia El Gama. Body taken to morgue. That was all. Now, but not for me. 1410 Sharia El Gama was the house I'd visited the night before. I went to headquarters to pay my last respects to Gerard. Greco was still sitting at Sam's desk. I repeat, Mr. Jordan, the Captain Sabaya is in Port Said. I am in command. All right, you'll do, Greco. You brought in a body from a place in Shari El Gama last night. I'd like to see it. You seem to have a special zest for the dead. Cut it. Just take me to the morgue. You think you can identify him? Yeah, I think so. This way, Mr. Jordan. <coughs> you seem most tired. Perhaps the affairs of the night? Yeah. Could it be that you saw more of the men with veils or perhaps the masks on their faces? That's right. You want to hear about them? Indeed not. Your dreams obviously confuse Cairo with Chicago. Over here. Hmm. This the one? Feast your eyes, Mr. Jordan. What? That's not... Your obvious surprise does not escape me, Mr. Jordan. Who is he? Not who I thought. Name's Antonio Scorpio. Antonio Scorpio? How'd he die? From the knife, of course. Oh, this one on the table here? Do not touch the knife, Mr. Jordan. Oh, I wouldn't think of it. You ever see a knife like that? In my time, I have seen many knives. They're all for one purpose. No, I have other matters. Are you coming, Mr. Jordan? Yeah, sure, Greco. Thanks for everything. I followed him up and went out. My thanks to Greco had been for the knife I pocketed as he turned away was exactly like the ones carried by the veiled men. I caught the first taxi and made it across town to the Cairo Museum. After a little waiting, got in to see the curator of the weapons division, the kindly white-topped Mr. Winters. I introduced myself and laid the knife on his desk. Well, it's not the best specimen, Mr. Jordan, but it seems authentic. Wicked-looking thing. Where did you get it? Well, let's say I found it, Mr. Winters. Who'd use a knife like that? It is the favorite weapon of the Toreg. They sheathe them to the wrist for instant use. Toreg? Yes, Toreg. Remarkable people. Nomads living in the heart of the Sahara. Called by many the land of fear. Yeah, that much checks. I'm trying to remember there's something different about the Toreg. <laughs> I should say. By some, they are known as the Desert Raiders. By others, and I think more appropriately, the people of the Vale. Of course, the Vales. They all wear veils? No, no. Not the women, Mr. Jordan. Only the men. The Litham, it is called. Black cloth that hides the faces of the men day and night. I still don't get it. Well, who can say? An answer lost in antiquity. Custom gone into reverse, you might say. In fact, a mild form of matriarchy exists. Uh, Mr. Winters. Yes? Supposing one of the Tariq wanted to get away from the tribe, then lose his identity. How could he best do that? Why, well, really, I couldn't say. All he'd have to do is change to other clothes and take off the veil. His own people might not even recognize him. <laughs> but hardly likely. They consider removing the veil as shameful. Why, the thought. Is it uh, possible that you are a writer, Mr. Jordan? Uh, nobody'd ever believe this story. Well, thanks, Mr. Winters. Oh, not at all, not at all. Uh, please let me know how your story turns out. Sure. If I ever find out myself. Well, I suppose I could have dropped it right there, but I was thinking about the frightened native girl I'd seen running from Jared's house. Maybe I remembered the hundred pounds Jared had snatched from my till. Anyhow, I decided to try for more, and that took me back to the native quarter. I found the blind man not far from where he'd been begging the night before. for the blind. Hey, we met last night, remember? Ah, the voice of the foreigner who offered no piastres. Well, I got plenty today. Allah will bless you. A native girl got into a gary here last night. There was a driver. My ears heard the sound. A whole handful of piastres for the name of the driver of that gary. If any, the driver, I do not know. But on the gallery, the number is very clear for everyone to see. In English, it would be 27. Thanks. Here you are. What the Shakir offended? Faxish! Faxish! 
It took half an hour to locate the driver of Gary 27, and a half pound to get him to tell me where he'd taken the girl, to a little town south of the Nile called Helwan. So I invested some more money and had him take me there. Helwan turned out to be nothing more than a tiny boat stop. There were a few windowless shacks along the Nile banks. The driver pointed to one and was gone. I got to the open door of the shack and went in. I waited for my eyes to get accustomed to the dim light. So even to this sad place you choose to follow? I saw her then, standing across the room at the wall. It was the girl, Sheila. Small, oval-faced. She stood erect, but helpless. Like those of the Torag. Like the vicious Scorpio you come to torment us. I only came to find Jared. Find out what this is all about. Where is he? I would not tell. What do you know of Jared? He worked for me in my cafe. Oh, then then you are the good Effendi Jordan of whom Gerard speaks well. Yeah, and from whom he took a hundred pounds. Oh, he will repay. He took it only to help me escape, to pay the driver who came for me to get us away. But why? Scorpio was after you. What for? Who are you? I am Sheila, daughter of Sheikh Amenekal, a man of wealth and position on the Munda Oasis to the south of Algiers. You're a long way from home. Would, would you hear my story, Effendi Jordan? All right, Sheila. Go ahead. Well, first you must know, Effendi, that at home I was not happy. My father had betrothed me to one I did not love. Then one night the Torah graders came and took me into the desert, holding me for ransom. You can understand my terror. I, who had been protected always from the world. They would have been cruel to me, all but Gerard. He was tender and shielded me from the others. Such is fate, but... For the will of Allah that that I should come to love Gerard. And, and he loved me. He aided me in my escape. Together we went to the city and I became his wife. I dared not return to my father who would not accept Gerard as my husband. Gerard removed the blue robes and the veil, hoping that the vengeful tribesmen would not find him. But it was not so easy. We went from one place to another, even to Cairo, but still they followed well, that's quite a story, Sheila. Well, what about Scorpio? Oh, somehow he learned of me. Perhaps for reward, for, perhaps for the ransom he would take me, but I, I'm not sure. That's why Jared killed him? Oh, no. No, Effendi, Jared never returned to the house. Jared was waiting here. And I return now. Oh, Jared, no! Let it, Jared, drop that knife. Jordan, sir. Do not harm him. He comes in peace, my husband. Only you come, Jordan, sir. That's right, Jared. Sheila's told me everything. You should have told me to begin with. No, then you would not want me to work for you. For money to take her away. Well, you found other ways of getting it. Those of my tribe came too quickly. I will repay. The promise of the Torek is good. Well, what's your plan now? A small passenger boat arrives at dusk. We would board it and travel far south to the interior. Where we trust they will not find us again. You would not stop us, Effendi Jordan? No. Not even if I could. We are eternally grateful. I waited there with him the rest of the afternoon. When evening came, Sheila picked up her few belongings, and we went down to the small dock on the river. And well after sunset, a boat slid up to the dock's edge. A narrow gangplank came down, but the deck was strangely deserted. All we could see was the pilot up in the cabin, and his face was straight ahead. Something didn't look right. Jared, I do not understand this. Come, Sheila. We must not wait. Hold it, Jared. Who's on there? Speak up! Where's the crew? If you are coming, get aboard. Quickly! As he says. No, no. Better let me check. Wait here with Sheila. Hey, where is everybody? So, hey. again, the offender. Here, I'd get up here. I caught you, I caught I was pinned from behind. He was heavy, but too anxious, and I sent him sailing over my head, blue robes and all. As Gerard reached the deck, a second of the veiled men was mixing in. A third was scrambling down from the pilot's cabin. My foot slowed him. By then, a lot of knives were flashing, and I looked to the safety of Sheila. That's when I saw something else. A horse-drawn Gary racing down to the water's edge, loaded down with uniforms that came piling out, headed by none other than Sergeant Gregor. Step it up, will you? Onto the boat, quickly! He's on the boat! How'd you get here, Gregor? So, Mr. Jordan... Is not the fact that I am here enough? Yeah, can't say I ever cared for your face, Grego. But I'm sure glad to see it now. Well, with Grego and the police swarming around, the veiled men gave it up before too much damage was done to anybody. 
About that time, the pilot of the boat, who'd been held at the wheel by the Torek's knife, came scrambling down. He was glad enough to turn the boat around. And with all of us aboard, we went back down the Nile and docked at Cairo. The three veiled men got a cell apiece. Gerard and Sheila waited outside as Greco commanded me into Sam Sabaya's office. I will now complete the dossier on this case. Sit there, Mr. Jordan. Yes, sir, Greco. Oh, by the way, Sam always has coffee. It can wait. Now, first, the matter of 100 pounds stolen by Gerard from your cafe. Well, I'm not preferring charges, Greco. Gerard will pay up. Um, very well, as you wish. They've both been through enough. Gerard asked for it when he helped Sheila escape from the Torig. I can understand why they didn't go right to her father, Sheikh Amenakal. Gerard's life wouldn't have been worth much. Oh, is this boring you? Well, quite to the contrary, Mr. Jordan. Well, the Torig must have been asking a fancy ransom. Somehow, Antonio Scorpio got wind of it. He located Sheila and Gerard and followed along, figuring to cut in. When the veiled men found Scorpio at Gerard's house last night, it was their chance to get rid of him. Of course, you didn't check on Scorpio. You would be disappointed. Antonio Scorpio was a notorious criminal, last known operating in Algiers. Well, good boy, Greco. Sam's going to be real proud of you. That is my intent. You were most kind to help. Me? It is so easy to follow the Occidental mind. What are you getting at? It happens that I intended to do nothing. But the matter of the knife which disappeared from the morgue, it was so like you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, yeah, it's all yours, Greco. At that point, I invoked the command of the Captain Sabaya when he left me in charge. That should you again become involved in one of your usual escapades, that questions would prove futile. I was only to watch you and follow. It was simple for us both to take the same path. How'd you find me down at Hell One? The driver of the gary take both you and Sheila to the Nile town. Could he not also take those of the police? Sure. Just one thing, Greco. No rough stuff with Gerard, huh? Sheik Amanakal will be notified immediately, Mr. Jordan. It is a duty. And what then? But do not be concerned. Their marriage seems quite legal. Her father cannot force the girl's return. The man Gerard, under surveillance, may remain with her in Egypt. Yeah, yeah, that's the way Sam and Anna. As you say, the Captain Sabaya will be most pleased with my report. <laughs> This is Rocky Jordan again. Next week, I want to tell you about the trouble I had trying to figure whether something was very old or very new. I'll tell you this much now. It had to do with a bird who kept bees. Rocky Jordan, starring Jack Moyles with Jay Novello, is presented each week through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Sunday is a big day on CBS. Jack Benny and Bergen and McCarthy, Rocky Jordan and our Miss Brooks, The Whistler and Red Skelton. Yes, for varied entertainment, Sunday is a big day on CBS. 
Now, Del Monte Foods brings you a world of adventure with... Rocky Jordan. His name was Carl Kleist. K-L-E-I-S-T. For the past three years, I'd see him around Cairo. I'd nod to him, he'd nod back. And that was the sum total of our relationship. 120 pounds of insignificant little guy. I thought, how wrong can you be? Carl Kleist turned out to be dynamite with a short fuse that figured to explode my face. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Yes, Del Monte, the best-liked brand of canned fruits and vegetables in the whole wide world, takes you now to the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo, gateway to the ancient east where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story... The Mystery of Carl Kleist. It started when the sound of the burglar alarm cut into the quiet night air. It wasn't my alarm. It came from down the street, the Bon Voyage Tourist Agency, run by the brothers Willie and Carl Kleist. You know how it is when you hear a burglar alarm go off. You listen, look, say, somebody's burglar alarm, let it go with that. I probably would have done the same, but as I looked down the street to where the sound was coming from, I heard another sound. Someone inside the tourist agency was throwing heavy objects through the front plate window. I figured I'd better get down and take a look. I got there, a small crowd had already gathered. Someone is inside. I was passing by. The window began to break. I heard someone calling me. All right, let's go in. Or it's not, sir. I have to hide. Then we go in through the window. After we widen it, watch out. I'll just... Yeah, that'll do it. Come on. He's out, sir. How many stop the alarm, sir? Don't worry, I'll get it. That's why I'll do it. Hey, Sandy, over here. I have found him. Look, sir. Willie Kleist. He has been nice. So I see. Willie. Willie. Willie, it's Jordan, the tambourine, down the street. He is still alive. How is it possible for him to be alive with such a large knife in him? Ah, shut up. I'm truly amazed. Del Carl. Del Carl. They have come. Who has come, Willie? Who knifed you? They have come. Del. Del. Del Carl to hide. Zell. What has happened, sir? Has he died? Yeah. I knew it would be so. He could not live with such a large knife in him. Oh, you better stick around, Smiley. There are going to be some questions. I'll call the police. Well, the cash box is still full. Obviously, robbery did not enter into the killing of Willie Kleist in the slightest. Oh, I didn't think so, Sam. Not after what Willie said. Yes, of course. Well, the killer was not seen by anyone, huh? Apparently, he left by the back door. Leaving Willie for dead. But Willie was still alive and threw some ashtrays through the window to attract attention. You know what I think, Sam? Hmm? I think whoever did Willie in didn't come for Willie. Or at least didn't come for Willie alone. He came for Carl, too. Jordan, what do you know of his brother, Carl? Oh, not much. They ran this tourist agency together. Moved in a few years ago. They're Austrian. Carl's a little guy, quiet, always got a book under his arm. Seems completely lost in thought. Mm. Well, I will see if I can locate him. He undoubtedly will be able to shed a great deal of light on this affair. If you can find him. If he's still alive, I'll bet he's in hiding. From Zell? From Zell. Jordan, are you sure Willie Kleist gave you no description of this uh, Zell? Nothing which would make my task of locating him easier? No, nothing, Sam. Well, it does not seem I have much to go on. Well, keep me informed, will you? I'm going to be interested in seeing how you work this out. So I went to work, and I went back to the tambourine, putting the affair of the murder of Willie Kleist in the back of my mind. But it didn't stay there long. The next day, about three in the afternoon, I had a visitor. Tall and thin in her early thirties. You could tell she was a traveler, not a tourist. Mr. Jordan? Yes. 
I was wondering if I could speak to you for a moment. You can. My name is Ilza Altman. I travel for the Continental Hotel chain. I happen to be in Cairo on my way to Algiers. And I read in the paper this morning of the death of Willie Kleist. I see. Uh, the paper said that you were the one who, who discovered the... Uh, well, anyway, that is why I am here. Uh, this is the Willie Kleist who has a brother named Charles. Yes, Carl? Miss Altman, Carl, that's the one. I, I see. Well, Mr. Jordan, can you tell me where I might find this Carl? I'm sorry, I don't know. The police are looking for him, too. Captain Zabaya, the paper said. He is in charge. Yes, you might go see him. If anyone would know where Carl Kleist is, if he isn't dead, Sabaya would. Is there a possibility Carl, too, might be dead? You should know anything's possible. Why are you so interested in Carl? Uh, a personal matter. Ah, uh, it always is. You know him well? I did know him well. At one time, we were going to be married. Oh, I see. Now, our plans were changed, as plans like these often are. I would like to see him again, however. Tell me something, Miss Altman. Did you ever hear Carl mention anyone named Zell? Z-E-L-L? -L? Anyone? No, I do not believe so. Are you sure? Well, it is hard to be sure. After all, I have not seen Carl in some time, and I do not remember everything he said to me. You better go see Captain Sabaya. You can probably help each other. I'll phone him and tell him you're on your way. I gave her the address of Central Police Headquarters and walked her to the front door. She thanked me and was on her way, walking south from the tambourine. That's when I noticed the guy in the white linen suit. He was tailing Ilsa Altman, and it didn't look right. On the corner, she caught a cab, and Big Boy went for a cab of his own. I went for him and got there just as he was opening the back door. I stepped in close to keep him from moving into the cab. Hey, you got a match, mister? What? A match. I need a light. Get out of the way. It's not fair tailing Ilsa Altman. She may already have a boyfriend. But do you work for Zell? I said, get out of the way. His big hand reached up and grabbed me by the coat. I started to swing. I was pressed up close to the cab and couldn't get up much power. Besides, he was faster, and a hairy right caught me in the face. It had a lot of steam and shook me up. Before I could recover, he grabbed my shoulders and threw me to the sidewalk. That's it. Follow that cab. Hurry. By the time I picked myself up, Gorilla and his cab were off in a cloud of carbon monoxide in hot pursuit of Ilsa Altman. But I wasn't unhappy. I figured I'd slowed him up long enough for her to get away. When I get back to my office, the phone... Uh, Jordan speaking. Jordan, this is Sam Sabayo. Oh, I'm just going to call you, Sam. That was a girl... Jordan, I have called to issue you instructions. Instructions? You are to disengage yourself from any concern with the Geist affair. What? What I say is quite clear. I don't get it. What's up? Nothing you need know, Jordan. Just heed my word. You are to have nothing to do with the affair. As a matter of fact, you might do well to forget the murder of Willie Christ and even act as though you have never heard of a man named Carl Christ. That is all, Jordan. Goodbye. Oh, why, Sam? What's all this mystery about Carl Christ? Jordan, Christ's? it is impossible for me to answer that question because it is impossible for you to ask it. Remember, you have never even heard of a man named Carl Christ. Goodbye, Jordan. Sam. Jordan. This is not what you think it is. Heed my warning or there should be trouble. Well, it had turned into something important. That was easy to see. I mulled it over for a while, thinking about Ilsa Altman, the big guy tagging her, but most of all about Zell and who he was. The next day, I fell a little deeper into the Carl Kleiss case. I was walking down the Sharia El Mumar on my way to the barber when I heard a voice. Jordan! It was Yusef, an Egyptian shoeshine boy who worked the streets around the tambourine. A little guy who seemed to know as much about people as the secret police. I have seen him, Jordan Bay. I have seen him. Who have you seen? The man you are looking for. Who, Zell? No, the other one, Carl Kleist. I know where he is. Come, Jordan Bay, come. And with that, he turned and bolted down the street. I moved after him, jostled a lady carrying a load of vegetables, excused myself, and kept right on going after the scurrying Yusef. He led me up a couple of back streets and stopped in front of an old rat-eaten rooming house run by a German named Brombacher. Inside, Yusef took me down a dark, smelly hall to a door marked six. Inside, Jordan B. Inside. Carl Kleist is inside. I opened the door with caution, stepped into the room. Who's there? Cowering in the corner was 120 pounds of nervous man, Carl Kleist, and he held a gun. Go away. Go away. Carl, it's me, Jordan. Go away. Go away. 
car. The police are looking for you. They'll give you protection. Now, come on with me. He started to empty the gun in my direction. Yusuf and I hit the floor. The bullets cut into the wall, and then I moved for Carl fast, but he was wild with fear. He threw the empty gun at me and picked up a chair and began to whack me with it. So there was nothing for me to do but plant one right on his jaw. Just took an easy one to lay him out cold. Then I stood over him to bring him to. I opened his shirt. The first thing I saw tattooed on his chest was a four-letter word. Z-E-L-L. Zell. There it was again, and as big a mystery as ever. Del Monte Foods is presenting tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Ask most men to name their favorite foods, and I think you'll find that corn, sweet, butter-tender, golden corn, rates right up there near the steak and potatoes. And if you want to give the men at your house corn just exactly the way they think it should be, give them Del Monte Golden Whole Kernel Corn for sure. Yes, Larry, it makes a lot of difference which brand of corn you buy. It's a product you can really compare and tell the difference. So many women are finding Del Monte corn outstanding on every count. It's wonderfully sweet, with a high natural sugar content that's grown right in. Yet it's rich in hearty summer flavor, too. Not only that, but it's remarkably tender. Those plump, milky Del Monte corn kernels are so very thin-skinned, they all but melt in your mouth. You'll agree you've hit a new high in corn enjoyment the day you try Del Monte corn. I appreciate its dependable quality, too. But then I guess everybody knows you can't beat any Del Monte product for that. Why not enjoy delicious Del Monte vacuum-packed golden whole kernel corn tomorrow? Remember, it's thrifty, too. And now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Mystery of Carl Kleist. It had all started with the murder of Willie Kleist and the disappearance of his terror-stricken brother Carl. Mixed in someplace were Carl's former fiancée, Ilsa Altman, and a big guy in a white linen suit. Then a little shoeshine boy found Carl Kleist and led me to him. In the scuffle that followed, Carl got laid out, and when I opened his shirt, the tattooing on his chest said Zell. The same word Willie had uttered just before he died. Zell, whoever he was, was the crux to the entire mystery. Well, I sent Yusef to find a phone to call Sam and bent over Carl to bring him to. That's when Brombarger, the German who ran the rooming house, stepped into the room. Uh, what is happening? I heard shooting. Oh, what is the matter with Carl? Nothing. Some cold water won't fix. Here, help me get him on the bed. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Here. On the bed now. Here. Here. I guess I tapped him a little harder than I realized. There's the water now, huh? Uh, what is this on Carl's chest? Dead? Does it mean anything to you? Huh? Peculiar anyone should tattoo. Such a thing on a chest? I get the button now. Hey, just a minute. Who is Zell? Oh, Zell is not somebody. Ah. Zell is a place. Lake Zell. Zell is a lake in Austria. I have been there once or twice. Mm. Ah, now I get the button. So it wasn't a who, it was a what. Zell wasn't a person, but a place. Lake Zell. But even that didn't mean anything to me. Why should a place be so important? Why should its mention be feared? Why should it be one of the last words Willie Kleist uttered? While Brombarger poured some water and then proceeded to bring Carl to, these questions ran through my mind. Well, maybe Sophia would have the answer. He'd be there soon enough. But as it turned out, somebody beat him to it. Well, Mr. Jordan, you were not able to help me before, but you certainly have helped me now. Ilsa Altman, and she held a thirty-two. Standing alongside of her were two friends, a couple of muscular white turbaned Bedouin tribesmen with knives in their belts. Uh, Mr. Brombarger, I suggest you turn around and face the wall and remain that way until we leave. It will yes. be safer for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do that. Omar, 
You might do well to stand by Mr. Brombarger with the knife to the neck so he does not call out. As you wish, madam. Looks like I made a mistake, Miss Altman. You're on the wrong side. Yes, Mr. Jordan, you did. But don't feel too badly about it. We all make mistakes one time or another. Carl, are you all right? Yes, yes, I am all right. Oh, that is fine, Carl. You appear to be somewhat uh, shaken. Did Mr. Jordan injure you when he hit you? I am all right. Then, shall we go? She said she was once your fiancée, Carl. You pick rough women. No, she... She was not my fiancée. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, if you'd have given me a little more time, Miss Altman, I'd have probably figured it out. I'd have remembered you didn't crack when I said the police and I thought Zell was a person. You've been around. You'd be sure to know it was a lake in Austria. What's it mean? Mr. Jordan, why do you not realize that the less you know of this affair, the more secure your life is? Turn to the wall, too, like the good Mr. Brombacher. And in a moment, Carl Kleist and I will leave, and you need never let the thought of either of us cross your mind again. Though you won't get far. I sent a shoeshine boy out to phone Captain Sabaya some time ago. The police are probably outside now. Hmm? Not likely, Mr. Jordan. The boy did not reach a telephone. But do not worry, Mr. Jordan. He will not be injured. Neither will you or the nice, quiet Mr. Brombacher. All we want is Carl. Now come, Carl. We really must be going. Jordan, I told you distinctly upon the telephone that you were to disengage yourself completely from the Kleist affair. Sam, I'm telling you, I didn't have any choice. When Joseph told you he knew where Carl Kleist was, you should not have gone with him. You should have come instead to me. There wasn't time. Yusuf was off like a streak. I had all I could do to follow him, let alone get in touch with you. Oh, well, yes, yes, I suppose you had no other course. You will have to excuse my manner. It is that I am quite upset about the fact that Miss Altman now has Carl. What's it all about, Sam? What's the big mystery? What's this Zell business? The Zell business. Come with me into the other room, Jordan. There's someone there I think you might as well now meet. Mr. White Linen Suit? Yes, Mr. White Linen Suit. Jordan... This is Mr. Frank Sunday of the American Federal Bureau of Investigation. Oh. Looks like I got in the way of the wrong person. Yes, I'm afraid you did, Mr. Jordan. I guess it's my day for making mistakes. I'm sorry. Well, that's nice, but it's not enough. You sure fouled the works. Because of you, Ilsa Altman escaped me. She's a smart woman, Jordan, and a vicious one. She had Willie Kleist killed, and it's a good bet she'll do the same to Carl. Why? Why? Because of Lake Zell in Austria and what it means. Um, Sit down, Jordan. You might as well know. Story goes like this. In early 1945, an Allied troops were surging into Germany. There was a group of German scientists and aeronautical engineers working in a hideaway in the Bavarian Alps. They were at work on a project called INSEAN, a highly secretive and a highly important project. INSEAN was a pilotless plane that could rise 40,000 feet a minute... It carried a 1,000-pound warhead, which exploded on contact. An extremely advanced-type weapon. Oh, I'm still listening. Now, 20 such planes were constructed, but by then it was quite apparent to the Germans that the war was lost. And a special courier arrived at the Bavarian hideaway with orders from Hitler. The Enzians were to be destroyed. And all the blueprints of the project, plus all information of an advanced nature, were to be put into airtight steel cases and dropped into the waters of Lake Zell in Austria. And so the story goes, Jordan. If it is true, we must know the information of an advanced nature inside those cases. And Carl Kleist can tell. Yes. He was one of the high-wrecking aeronautical engineers working on the projects. His identification was that tattoo on his chest. Well, that clears up a lot of things. Ilsa Altman's still fighting the last war. Oh, the next one, Jordan. She and whoever she's working for... They don't want us to get Carl Kleist because of what he might tell. Now she has him. Can we get him back before he's killed, Jordan? It sounded like an invitation to help. But whether it was or not didn't matter. They were going to get my help anyway. I'd played it like a first-class sucker. I didn't like the taste it left in my mouth. Sabaya got out a call, of course, and his men started looking for Ilsa Altman and her Bedouins. I left headquarters and began to tap some sources of my own. 
camel drivers who knew the desert trails and the desert hideaways. Had any of them seen an encampment of Bedouins with a European lady? Well, most of them hadn't. But a wizened old character named Shalik had seen some Bedouins. Not one encampment, but three. Had any of these encampments had he seen the European woman? No. So Shalik and I rented a jeep and went out to look over the three encampments. Number one, seven or eight kilometers beyond the Bulak Bridge, turned out to be a dud. So did number two, some old ruins of Ramesses the second or third. Number three was a deserted oasis at the bottom of a valley. Oh, we had better stop upon the rise here, Effendi, so we will not be seen. Oh, yeah, okay. There, there, below is the encampment. One, two, three horses. One of them must have four ply. What, Effendi? Four ply, Shalik. Those are tire tracks down there going into that grove. Yes, so they are, Effendi. Well, this could be it. I'm going down and find out. Shalik, there's a big date farm a couple of kilometers back. Drive down and phone Sabaya. Tell him where I am. And tell him I'd like to see him very much with a half a dozen or so of his best men. Just in case. Well, I moved carefully through the sand, keeping in the shadows of the dunes. It was slow going. Sand was loose. I didn't want to start a slide for fear one of the Bedouins would see it and wonder about the movement. Slowly, I inched my way closer. The object being to get near enough to the encampment to get a look at the faces of the Bedouins sitting cross-legged outside of a tent. It was Humar's face, the face of Ilsa Altman's number one boy I wanted to see. Then I'd know and it'd beat it back up the rise and wait for Sam. Oh, and I saw it all right. He was one of the three men sitting there. But as I saw him, he saw me. He yelled at his men. I turned and ran up the rise, but it was rough going, my feet sinking ankle deep in the sand. They had it much easier. Humar and his men came after me on horses. I kept on going, but they got closer. In a moment, they were on me. Humar. Humar leaned down from the saddle, raised a heavy fist, and threw it with all his might into the back of my neck. In just a moment, Rocky Jordan returns to conclude tonight's story. If you'd like to make your salads, first courses, or desserts as bright and colorful as a May basket of spring flowers, you should get acquainted with Del Monte Fruit Cocktail. It's a regular bouquet of color and flavor in itself. I should say so, Larry. Del Monte Fruit Cocktail adds so much glamour to a meal. And it's easy, too. Yes, Del Monte Fruit Cocktail is good-looking, good-eating, and a real time and work saver besides. You get luscious peaches, mellow pears, and tart-sweet tropical pineapple, ready-cut and mixed with juicy seedless grapes and scarlet cherry halves. Just think, you don't have to select the fruits, pare them, cut them, or do any of the work yourself. And why should you, when you can get such a sparkling fruit combination ready-prepared and perfectly balanced for flavor? You'll be proud to serve Del Monte fruit cocktail on any occasion. Actually, that's one reason why I keep it handy all the time. So I'll always be prepared for last-minute company to dinner. It's menu help you should have in your kitchen day in and day out. Stock up with Del Monte fruit cocktail next time you shop. Now, back to Rocky Jordan for the conclusion of tonight's story. I woke up sometime later inside the tent with a large size headache. Pumar was there carrying a silly grin. Ilsa Altman was there, too, with a gun and a holster. And so was Carl Kleist. Mr. Jordan, why? Why do you insist upon placing me in a position where I must make difficult decisions? I guess I'm just nasty that way. Everything was so simple. Carl and I had a long talk, did we not, Carl? Yeah, we had a long talk. We discussed what was important to Carl. He did not wish to die insignificantly on his death up. He decided he would leave Egypt with me and return to our friends of long ago and continue in the field of aerodynamics to do important work for the future. Did you not decide so, Carl? 
Yes, sir. You are most convincing in our talk. There, Mr. Jordan. Carl and I were to leave Egypt quietly with no further bloodshed. And now you have upset everything. You have come to disturb the tranquility. What must I do with you? Oh, stop it. You're going to make me cry. Oh, well, quick decision. Huma? Uh... Kill him. Umar drew his knife and moved toward me. The silly look in his face grew larger and his eyes sparkled. He was in for some fun, he thought. Four steps were all he took. Uh, Not so convinced, Carl Kleist yanked Ilse's revolver out of her holster and turned it on Umar. Give me that gun. I will not go back. Uh, Why did you do that? Why? You had... You had... Let us take the gun, Mr. Jordan. Other two Bedouins may come in. More coffee, Jordan? Oh, no thanks, Sam. I've had my fill. Well, I will have a little more. Well, the affair of Carl Kleiss is at last at its end. Mr. Sanji will take him to the United States in the morning. And Elsa and Homar made the morgue. Mm, killed in a moment of desperation by a man who too long kept secret knowledge he should have told. Jordan, something has just struck me. <clears throat> What's that, Sam? Do you realize that we do not know the real ending of the Kleist affair? We do not know if the story of the steel case is the bottom of Lake Zell is true or not. Uh, I guess we don't. I guess we won't. Uh. Well, I suppose we do not have to know everything. If the story is not true, if there is not information of a, an advanced nature of aeronautics at the bottom of Lake Zell, most of this has been for naught. And if there is? Then I'm quite sure your American government will be able to get it from Carl Kleist. And all of this has not been for naught. And you'd like to know which is true for sure. Oh, well, Jordan, you cannot blame me for being curious. Hmm. What do you got there? Uh, a coin, Jordan. Um, observe. Heads, it is true. Tails, it is false. Heads or tails? Uh, well, what what could a coin tell? Mm. More coffee, Jordan? Heads or tails, Sam? <laughs> Neither. It fell in a crack and is standing on its side. <laughs> For superb flavor, for dependable quality always, enjoy Del Monte fruits and vegetables. Remember, buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. The brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Rocky Jordan, written by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool, stars Jack Moyles in the title role with Jay Novello as Sam Sabaya, and is produced and directed by Cliff Howell, with original music composed and conducted by Richard Arunt. Remember, you have a date next week at the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. Same time, same station. And the story is Horde of the Memlukes. Anytime you're thirsty, pour yourself a tall, sparkling glass of golden Del Monte pineapple juice. There's real refreshment for you, rich in the tropical, tart-sweet flavor of full, ripe pineapples. Make yours Del Monte pineapple juice next time. Larry Thor speaking. Rocky Jordan is presented over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hello? 
Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Kathy. I'm glad you called. Now I'll have to have a rain check, Angel. I'm leaving tonight for Italy. Yeah, I just heard when it comes to murder, there's no place like Rome. Once again, the National Broadcasting Company brings you the transcribed Adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. The Adventures of the Falcon, dedicated to private investigators everywhere. Those hard-hitting detectives who, like Mike Waring, risk their lives to aid law enforcement agencies. So join him now when the Falcon solves the case of the running waters. If you ever wondered why Rome wasn't built in a day, maybe I can explain. They didn't use American labor. I take a craftsman like Steve Waters. Mr. Waters is the rugged-looking citizen sauntering down the eighth-floor corridor of the Hotel Nationale. He just arrived in Rome an hour ago without baggage and without friends, and already he's got a gun and a girl. Now, that's what I call a fast worker. Yes? Uh, you Marie Antonescu? That is right. Well, I must say, this is a pleasure. I'm Steve Waters. I beg your pardon. You never heard of me? No. Well, that's funny. I'm an old friend of your family. Matter of fact, I just saw your father yesterday. You saw my father? Yeah, and he sends his love. Oh, but that is impossible. My father is in Bucharest. I do not understand... Romania is behind the Iron Curtain. Yeah, yet apparently I can get in or out any time I want. I guess I must be a magician, huh? You are a coming turn agent. Well, that's a possibility. What have you done to my father? Nothing, absolutely nothing. He looks real fine. You'd think prison agreed with him. He is in prison. Oh, didn't you know? I'm sorry. But you don't have to worry. He won't be there long, either way. Uh, a cigarette? No. You sure? I want nothing from you. Not even your father's life? What do you want, Mr. Waters? All right, I'll make it short and sweet. Now, you're kind of friendly with a boy named Kirby Patterson. How did you learn that? Well, I probably know more about Kirby than you do. Uh, for instance, did you know he's with American Intelligence? No. Yeah, yeah, he's a spy, just like I am, only he's working the other side of the street. And his current assignment is to meet a man in Rome named Mike Waring. Only, uh, he's not going to make it. He isn't? No, no, you're going to see to that. Get out. Okay. Oh, uh, anything you want me to tell your father? Wait. Ma? What is it you wish? When do you expect to see Kirby again? Tonight at seven. Uh huh. Well, now, suppose the two of you have a drink up here before you go out. Only, uh... When your poor Kirby's add the contents of this bottle. You expect me to poison him? Oh, now, let's not jump to conclusions. Now, this won't kill him. It'll only put him out long enough for me to keep his appointment you with mean... Mike Waring. You are going to pretend to be Kirby? Uh-huh. I will not do it. Look, Marie, let's not argue. We both know you will. Just take care of that bottle. Where are you going? Isn't this your bedroom? Oh, you cannot sleep in there? Oh, I don't intend to. Now, you see, I figure you and Kirby need a chaperone, what with this drinking and such. So, uh, I'll just keep an eye open to see that you don't get into trouble. <laughs> I don't like the way you look. You sure you feel all right? I feel fine, Kirby. What makes you say such a thing? Oh, your hands are like ice. I'm going to get your coat. Where is it in the bedroom? Uh, don't go in there. What's the matter? I, I hate to be treated like an infant, that's all. Someone would think I was helpless. Yes, but uh, you've got a chill. I tell you I'm all right. I, I, I just need a drink. All right. Where do you keep the... Never uh... mind. I'll fix it myself. <laughs> You're not going to let me do anything tonight. What will you have? Scotch on the rocks. Kirby, you know I love you. Well, I certainly hope you do. I would die if anything happened to you. Now, what brought that on? I just hope you understand. Sometimes we cannot help ourselves. Okay, Marie, let's have it. What are you trying to tell me? Nothing, darling. Here's your drink. Thanks. Well, salute. Salute. Okay. Get this stuff. Is, is something wrong? Well, it's got a peculiar taste. Oh, it's your imagination. How do you know you haven't even tasted yours? Oh. 
Oh, no, it is fine. I still say it's got an off taste. Here, you try mine. Oh, you're trying to be ridiculous. They were both ports of the same bottle. What are you getting so steamed up about? All I said was... Marie. What, what is it? I... I don't know. I... I can't catch my breath. Maybe if you sat down. Get me some water. Yes, darling. Hurry, honey. I feel like I'm gonna... Kirby! Kirby! You'll wake the baby. What have you done to him, Walter? What did I do? I'm just an innocent bystander. He's dead. No, no, no. He's gonna be fine. Now, why don't you just sit down and relax till Mike Waring's train pulls into Rome, huh? Oh, I sure hope it's on time. We'll have to give Kirby another treatment if it's late. <laughs> Right, pal, what do you think you're doing? Oh, scusa, signora. I uh, look for my friend. They tell me he's in this compartment. Well, did you think he was hiding in my luggage? No, capisco. In case you hadn't noticed, that's my bag you're handling. Oh, I, I uh, want to see if this is his suitcase. What does that tag say? Uh, Michael Waring. Well, now that we've got me identified, who are you? Roberto Stefani. Roberto Stefani? Si, what were you doing with my grip? Oh, you make a mistake. No, you did. You should have closed the straps. All right. I tell you the truth. I have to make sure you really are Michael Waring. Why? You work for American intelligence, no? How did you find that out? Did they not tell you in London a man would meet you on the Rome Express to give you your next assignment? No. <laughs> Maybe they, how you say, uh, double check. You are to go to the Hotel National and meet the Kirby Patterson there. Am I right? Keep talking. You are supposed to deliver some information to him which can be used by our friends in Romania. How come you know so much? I work for American intelligence, too. <laughs> That's pretty good. You do not to believe me? Oh, what a question. Uh, uh, Senor Waring, please. Uh, stand still. Oh, so you pack a gun, huh? <laughs> Naturally. In our work. Yeah, tell me more about your work, Roberto. I see your dues are paid up through August. Huh? Well, isn't this a membership card in the Italian Communist Party? Oh, oh. <laughs> well, uh, I can explain it, this, senor. Yes, I'll bet you can. <laughs> tell the comrades I enjoyed my entrance to Rome. Only next time, let me choose my own welcoming committee. <laughs> Get this straight, Waring. You mean this Roberto Stefani actually had the nerve to pose as one of our boys? Yeah, he even knew I was supposed to meet a Kirby Patterson in Rome. <laughs> but you're going to hand it to the bums. They don't miss a trick. No. Lucky I'm suspicious by nature. I used to say I wouldn't trust my own mother, so uh, naturally... You uh... want to see my credentials. Uh -huh. I was wondering when you'd get around to that. Come here. Andy Patterson, 5'9", 172 pounds. Brown hair, brown eyes, birthmark on left temple. Well, you certainly fit the description. Well, I ought to. I wrote it myself. Uh, when are you leaving for the States? Just as soon as I finish this assignment. Well, there's no time like the present. Where's the dope? Right here in this notebook. Uh, well, it's in code. Well, what did you expect? How soon do you think you can get it to your contact in Romania? Well, I'll have it by Thursday, maybe Wednesday. If... Expecting someone? No, put the notebook away. Right. All right, come in. Senor Wedding. That's right. My card. Julio Farinacci, Hotel National. I'm going to run along, Mike. Yeah, okay, Kirby. Uh, lots of luck. Yeah, same to you. Oh, lift one for me when you get back to Times Square. Huh? <laughs> I'll do that. Now, oh, what can I do for you, Julio? I am what you call the house detective here. Oh, well, I'm glad to meet you. The honor is all mine, senor. It is a great pleasure to greet my opposite number from the great democracy across the Atlantic. How's that again? Well, are you not the private detective they call the Falcon? Oh, only when they can't think of anything worse. You are here on business? No, I've retired, Julia. Oh, what a pity. I had hoped to be allowed to cooperate. No one knows the criminal mind like Giulio Farinacci. Hmm. Uh, I trust you will forgive me for mentioning it, but uh, as one in the profession, you will understand. What? The senor who was just here. 
You called him Kirby. What about it? It is uh, an unusual American name. No, not to. Why? In the lobby yesterday, I heard a foreign lady call a gentleman Kirby. He did not look like your friend. You sure? Yes. He was a tall, blonde man. Well, was Kirby his first or last name? I would have no way of knowing. Look, Julio, this is very important. Now, if you run across this other Kirby again, let me know. I'd certainly like to meet him. <laughs> Senor Waters. Well, what's the matter with you, Roberto? Can't you see I'm busy? But the Senor Patterson here. He is opening his eyes. Well, it's about time, too. Give him some water. Here, Senor. Huh? Drink. Hiya, Kirby. Oh. Who are you? Well, generally, I go under the name of Steve Waters. Steve Waters? Yeah, though lately I've been using yours. I, uh... I don't understand. Oh. Oh, your headache? Where's Marie? Marie? Marie Antonescu. Isn't this her room? Uh, yeah, yeah, now that you mention it, I believe it is. Where is she? Oh, one of my associates took her for a ride. I didn't think this was any place for a woman, especially if we wanted to have a little man talk. Um, you recognize this? Oh? It's a notebook I got from Mike Waring. Mike Waring? Yeah, yeah, only it's in code. Would you happen to have the key? Let's see now. Uh-uh, mustn't touch I got a Mickey. Hey, did you hear that, Roberto? He thinks he was drugged. But uh, who would do such a thing? Well, I wonder. Well, if I'm not the world's prized chump. Senor Waters. All right, put down that phone, Kirby. Operator. Look, boy, don't make me do something you'll be sorry for. Operator. Senor Waters. Hang up the phone. But he is dead. Well, then he certainly won't want to use it. Hang up, Roberto. We got work to do. You and your children can expect to live long thanks largely to better medicine and surgery. But you could expect to live even longer were it not for the danger of automobile accidents. If driver education could be taught in all of our high schools instead of only a third of them, it might someday help to save the life of your own son or daughter. If your schools don't have these courses, demand driver education for your children. And if your own automobile is not in the good repair it should be, be sure to have it fixed. Remember to drive as though your life depends on it. It does. Now back to the adventures of the Falcon. Well, that's life for you. One minute you got it, the next you haven't. Miss Kirby Patterson learned the hard way. But I had no idea what was going on. The first I knew of it was some eight hours later. I just finished tangling with the Messer Bragioli at Angelo's on the Via Cavour when I looked up and saw a gentleman dressed in blue standing over me. If his uniform wasn't a giveaway, his feet were. They were flat. He was a cop, all right. His name was Emilio Balbo, and he was a captain in the Carabinieri. It seemed the Capitano had heard of me and wanted to show me the local sights. It was a deluxe 50-cent tour. He started with the morgue, and that was my finish. You will be good enough to observe, Senor Veri. I'm observing. I would be most interested in your deductions. Well, offhand, I'd say he was either English or American. Uh-huh. Probably American, judging by his clothes. See, si, see. Si. And he must have been pretty handy with his fists. And what do you base this? The broken knuckles on the right hand. Ah, capisco. Uh, how come his clothes are so wet? Perhaps you can guess. You fished him out of the tiber? Exactly. Well, he wasn't in there long. Maybe four or five hours. Formidable. Uh, would you care to venture a guess as to his identity? No, I'm afraid not. The desk clerk at the Hotel Nazionale said he visited you this afternoon. Mm, he's out of his mind. Uh, perhaps I can refresh your recollection. His name is uh, Kirby Patterson. What? That's impossible. Or is it? If he's Kirby Patterson, who's the other one? What other one? The boy who called on me yesterday, and I gave him the... Listen, Capitano, you're positive this is the right Kirby Patterson? Absolutely. He was identified by a member of the American Embassy. You poor devil. You have no idea who killed him? Yes, I've got a big idea. Who? The fellow who called himself Kirby Patterson. What? The... Yeah, if you're confused, think of me. But maybe I know the man who can clear up this mess. Who? The house stick at the Hotel National. I'll let you know how I make out. 
Some more Chianti, Signor Waring? Uh, no, thanks, Julio. Right now I have more pressing problems. My ears are at your command. Uh, well, you told me you saw a woman with a man named Kirby in the lobby of the National. See, si, I did. Are you sure about that? The memory of Giulio Faranacci is not to be doubted, Signor. It has been said. Yeah, okay, okay. Who was the gal? Uh, let me think. Oh. She might have been a guest of the hotel. How do you arrive at that conclusion? Well, you said she wasn't Italian. So it's a good bet if she met Kirby at the National, she must have been living there, because he wasn't. Beautifully reasoned. Well, you know who she is? Uh, it escapes me at the moment. Okay, we'll start with the hotel register. That ought to give us a lead. Wait. Wait. I believe I know the very woman. Yes. Suite 813, Marie Antonescu. Marie Antonescu? She's from Romania, I believe. Thanks a lot, Julio. Uh, perhaps I can assist. No, no, you've done your share. From here on, it's up to me. Let's hope I do as well. Hello, Marie. I beg your pardon. Well, aren't you Marie Antonescu? Yes. Kirby Patterson sent me around. Kirby sent you here. In a manner of speaking. Oh, please come in. Thank you. Uh, sit down. Thanks. I imagine Kirby's feeling very angry with me. No, as a matter of fact, he isn't feeling a thing. Oh, I am surprised. And he's dead. No. Yes. I do not believe you. You are lying. Where's my percentage? But they promised uh, me that... now we're getting to it. What do they promise you? Nothing. Look, Angel, you're in a jam. Stop talking. I know nothing, Mr. Waring. You know my name is Waring. Uh, you, you said so? No, I didn't. Kirby must have told you about his appointment with me. Well, the Kirby Patterson showed all right, but he wasn't the right boy. How do you know? Because I saw the genuine article down at the morgue. They just dragged him out of the Tiber. He wasn't pretty, Marie, the fish. Stop it, stop it! What's the matter, getting sensitive all of a sudden? What did you do, take a walk while they killed him? He wasn't killed here. No? What's that rust-colored spot on the rug near the phone? Blood. It ain't borscht. But he told me he would only put him to sleep. Who told you? That's Steve Waters. Stocky lad. Brown hair, a little birthmark over his left temple. Yes. How much did he pay you? Oh, you do not understand. This Mr. Waters came here yesterday. He told me they had arrested my father in Bucharest, and if you I You didn't did... cooperate, you'd never see him again. Yes. Oh, come on, Angel. You can dream up a better story than that. I swear it is the truth. You must believe me. That was the first time you saw this Steve Waters? Yes. He had just flown in from Romania. Then he might be out of Italy, but... No, no, he wouldn't. That material is worthless unless it's decoded. What? Nothing. I was just talking out loud. He's got to stay in Rome till he solves it. We're all behind the eight ball if Mr. Waters is gone. Two equals A. 17 is I, and 23 would have to be O. No, it doesn't work. It ought to be so. That you, Roberto? See, si, Senor Waters. Wait a second. I bring you something to eat. Well, put it down on the table. What do you got there? Pasta, lasagna, vino. That ah, looks good. My wife make. Well, my compliments to the little woman. Uh, Senor Steve. No. You know they are looking for you. you do tell. They ask questions everywhere. My wife, she's very nervous. We have a little one on the way. Well, what's your excuse? Huh? You're nervous, too. And yeah, maybe you should be. Because when the chief hears about Mike Waring nabbing you on the Rome Express with a party card in your pocket... Uh, you would not tell him. He would kill me. Senor, I beg of you for the sake of my wife and my children. Yeah, we've got to consider them. Yes. Well... My youngest is only two years old. Yeah, and you've got another bambino on the way. <laughs> si, si. Well, that does raise a problem. I got it, Roberto. Why don't you quit the party? You think the chief would let me? Well, of course. What well, didn't you know? The party's like a social club. You can resign whenever you please. Sure. Hey, just let me talk to the chief. I can guarantee your troubles are over. <laughs> Yeah. Senor Waring. That's right. Julio 
Farinacci at your service. Uh, where'd you find out, Julio? Your friend, Stephen Waters, came to Rome by way of Berlin. Berlin? Uh, there is no airplane service direct to Bucharest. He had a return ticket. What's the next flight out? Tomorrow morning at 11. Well, then there's a good chance that Waters might still be in Rome. Yes, he is. According to my information, he's living with a despicable type named Roberto Stefani. Roberto Stefani? That's the comrade I ran into on the Rome Express. What's the address? Corso Vittorio, number 23. I got it. Thanks a lot, Julio. You're the greatest house dick this side of 42nd Street. Anytime you want a job at the Waldorf, let me know. Apparently, there is no one here. Apparently, Julio. Could it be my informant misled me? Well, let's find out. Wait. Senor Waring, what do you call that? Well, in English, they call skeleton keys. Anyone coming up the landing? I do not like this. It is against the law. That was murder. You think they take an oath not to use soap and water when they join the Communist Party? Those things they consider unimportant. Uh, what's behind that curtain? Oh, that is where they sleep. Senor. Yeah? That... That is Stephen Waters? That was Stephen Waters. He's dead. Yeah, well, I didn't think that extra hole in his head was for ventilation. We should not be here. All right, take it easy, Julio. I want to look around. He had some papers that belonged to me. Help me turn them over. If the senor will excuse me. Oh, what do you know? Here's a little item that did the trick. It is a German Luger. Yeah, that's what it is. Got a handkerchief? I do not think the carabinieri will approve of this. No? I uh, do not think they will. Ah, senor, well, we meet again, huh? Yeah, I know this sounds antisocial, Capitano, but you're the last man I wanted to see. My entrance was a trifle premature. A trifle? Mm. What a pity. I could have timed it to give you an opportunity to wipe your fingerprints off the weapon. Hey, now, wait a minute. You don't think I'd do that? Oh, I know appearances can be deceiving. Would you like to convince me here? Oh, wait till we get to my office. Every day last year on the highways, an average of 103 Americans like yourself or those in your family were killed in automobile accidents. But a lot of highway deaths don't seem to bother us much unless someone in our own family is killed. You can do your part in helping to fight disaster on the highways by being a safer driver and by working in your community and state for strict law enforcement that means safer traveling for all of us. At all times, you must remember to drive as though your life depends on it. It does. Now back to the adventures of the Falcon. If you know anything worse than being discovered standing over a cold corpse with a hot gun in your hand, I'd like to hear it. Just drop me a line and carry the Italian police in Rome. They'll know where to reach me. They don't have far to travel. Let me congratulate you, Signor Waring. You relate a very interesting story. So help me, it's the truth. Ask Julio here. Si, Capitano. I take an oath he does not lie. I was with him every minute of the time. From the Excuse moment... Excuse me, please. Barbo, qua. Si. Si. Capisco. Hai fatto benissimo. Sono molto gradito, grazie. Signor Waring, my apologies. Huh? You too, Julio. I do not understand. Oh, that makes two of us. You will be pleased to learn we have solved the case. You have? You are interested? Vitally. Back. The murder of your colleague, Kirby Patterson, is no mystery. He was killed by the communist agent, Steve Waters. Agreed? Agreed. But who killed Waters? You care to venture a guess? Yeah, Roberto Stefani. Wrong. It was his apartment. But Roberto had no reason. The death of Waters was motivated by revenge. I don't see it. You are forgetting the woman in the case, Maria Antonescu. Maria Antonescu? She was in love with Kirby. And you think she killed Steve Waters? To... Yes. Never. Then how do you account for the fact that the murder gun belongs to her? What? And her fingerprints were found on the bed near the body? Well, there must be some mistake. I hope not for your sake, senor. If there is, we shall have to return to you. But 
Let us see what the lady has to say for us. I tell you, you are wrong, Captain. I, I did not kill Steve Waters. I was in my hotel all evening. And the gun you say was stolen from your room? Yes. Ask Julio. I reported it to him this morning. She tells the truth, Capitano. Did her door show signs of forced entry? No. Then she was merely preparing an alibi. No, it is not true. How do you explain your fingerprints being found near Steve Waters' body? I cannot. Maybe I can. It would be most interesting, Sir Wery. Well, it's simple. She was there. No. Look, Marie, you've got to stop lying. You're panicky and you're not thinking clearly. We can buy that stolen gun routine, but not the fingerprints. You had to be in that room. I tell you... Well, I... don't bother unless it's the truth. Now, you went to Roberto's flat, didn't you? Yes. But when I got there, Waters was dead. But I did not kill him, I swear it. How did you learn where he was? Through a telephone call. Who's? He would not give his this name. This is most amusing. All right, give her a chance, Captain. Surely you don't believe her. Well, why not? What's so hard to believe about an anonymous phone call? You got one. Me? Or you just didn't blunder into Roberto's place? Someone must have tipped you off. True. Well, there you are. But if she did not kill Waters, who did? Aren't you forgetting someone? Roberto Stefani. Well, he's a possibility, Julio. Let's see if he meets the acid test. Now, this whole case is tied up with politics. Steve Waters was brought to Rome to do a job. But in accomplishing it, he killed Kirby. That made him a liability to the comrades. They had to get rid of him. Then the order to liquidate him must have come from a higher functionary here in Rome. That's right. But who could his superior be? Well, that's a good question, Capitano. Just ask yourself, who knew I was looking for Steve Waters? Who was in a position to remove Kirby's body from Marie's room? Who alone had the opportunity to steal her gun? Obviously, someone employed by the Hotel Nazionale. <gasps> oh, obviously. You, uh, you are referring to me. Who else? Yes, you did a nice piece of work, Julio. I'm sure the party appreciates your efforts. Maybe when you join Steve Waters, you can start a new communist cell. You'll find a lot of hot prospects down there. <laughs> That means me. Before you go, Senor Waring, on behalf of my colleagues, let me thank you again for your valuable assistance. Oh, my pleasure, Capitano. Uh, I know it is undiplomatic of me to inquire, but that notebook of yours, yeah. uh, did you ever find it in Julio's belongings? Uh, you know, I couldn't answer that. But don't bother looking for it. I understand. But I'm just sorry you could not visit with us long. Oh, I'll be back, if only for one reason. They say when in Rome, do as the Romans, but I never got a chance to find out just what it is the Romans do. This I got to learn. Arrivederci, Capitano. The Case of the King of Clubs. The Case of the King of Clubs. That's the title of next week's adventure of the Falcon when Mike Waring learns that when trumps are led, the game can be murder. The adventures of the Falcon are based on the famous character created by Drexel Drake, produced and transcribed by Bernard L. Schubert, written by Eugene Wang, and directed by Richard Lewis. Les Damon was starred as the Falcon with Susan Douglas as Marie. This program came from New York. Fred Collins speaking. <laughs> Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Carol. Now, you'll have to cancel me out tonight, Angel. Army intelligence is sending me to London. Yeah, it seems some gambler there will take a chance on anything. They want me to prove that murder is a bad bet. Once again, the National Broadcasting Company brings you the transcribed Adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. 
The Adventures of the Falcon, dedicated to private investigators everywhere. Those hard-hitting detectives who, like Mike Waring, risk their lives to aid law enforcement agencies. So join him now when the Falcon solves the case of the Jack of Diamonds. One nice thing you can say about working for Army Intelligence. It teaches you people are the same the world over. Now take, for example, Diane Halsey. Diane's the gorgeous-looking blonde at the corner table in Sherry, the swank cocktail bar in London's West End. To look at her, you'd immediately suspect something's wrong. She's not the kind of a girl you'd expect to see alone. But that's purely a matter of choice. Diane's only waiting for the right man to come along. And here he comes now. I'm sorry if I kept you, darling. Oh, that's all right, Bruce. I don't mind. Did you order? No, I thought I'd wait for you. Oh, sweet. What would you like? <laughs> that all depends. When I'm celebrating, I prefer champagne. <laughs> well, then I... I guess you'll have to settle for something else. Why? I didn't see DeSantis. You didn't see DeSantis? Oh, believe me, Diane, I tried. But I couldn't do it. I knew I was wasting my time. N no, don't go. Take your hand off me. Darling, please. You're going to do as I ask. Just give me a chance to explain. I'm not interested. All I know is you threw away 2,000 pounds. What makes you so positive? What do you mean? Well, you're depending solely on this Jack Diamond. So? So how do I know I can trust him? I never even met the man. I have. Well, what's his real name? You can't expect me to believe that Jack Diamond isn't an alias. Oh, now, look, Bruce. Oh, I'm getting at, Diane, is how can you be certain those photo stats he gave you are authentic? There's an accepted way to find out. How? Show them to DeSantis. If they're legitimate, Mr. DeSantis will think that 2,000 pounds you're asking very reasonable. Please, don't make me do it. You call yourself a man. Where are you going? That's no concern of yours. This time I would advise you to try and stop me. No, you can't. I, I won't let you. No? Well, what? Wait, I'll... I'll do it. I said. You will? Yes. When? Tonight. That's my darling. You do love me? Well, of course, silly. Now order us some champagne. I'm in the mood to celebrate. <laughs> Yes. Are you Julio de Saltis? That's right. Well, I'm Bruce Graham. Look, uh, hey, take it easy, Mr. Graham. I bet you think I'm intoxicated. Never. Well, I am. Well, Mr. Graham? Ever see this before? Uh, where, where do you get this photostat? In case you're interested, it's for sale. <laughs> How much is it going to cost me? Two thousand pounds. Uh, it's a lot of money, Mr. Graham, but maybe he's worth it. Huh? You want them in cash, no? You mean you're actually going to give it to me now? <laughs> you bet your life. Get away from that box. But you said... I said get away or I'll put a bullet through you. You're not fooling me. I'll open it myself. It's okay with me. Why, there's only money in here. Ah. Only money, he said. What do you expect? Well, I thought... Yes? Never mind. Count off 2,000. It's a pleasure. 500, 750, 1,000, 2, 4, 6. Oh, Mr. Graham. You dropped your gun. <laughs> no, don't. You know something? <laughs> you have it on safety all along. What? In your work, you should know better. <laughs> Go on. Get it over with. You think the Sanders want to hurt you? No. Here. What? <laughs> Go on. Take. But, but... Don't be shamed. And now for your money. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Do it. Quattro. Say. And four. Make uh, two thousand. There you are. What are you up to? <laughs> That's a funny question coming from you. <laughs> I think I behave very nice for somebody who's being blackmailed. Why didn't you kill me when you had the chance? It's not going to solve anything. Your friends know you're here. My friends? Oh, you never convinced DeSantis you're working alone. 
So I make the best of a bad bargain. You got the money? I got the photo stand. But I don't think I want to do this again, Mr. Graham. Please. Remember this, huh? <laughs> See, Bruce, there was nothing to it. He could have killed me, Diane. He could have shot oh, me. Don't be ridiculous, darling. You wouldn't dare. Not with what we know about Mr. Design. Well, I wouldn't go through it again for twice the money. How about a hundred times? Huh? Don't you see the possibilities? This was just a test case. As you pointed out, Jack Diamond could have been mistaken. Who is this Diamond chap, anyway? Don't you bother your pretty little head about him. I've got a right to know. All you need know, darling, is he delivered the goods. Now we've got Mr. DeSantis right where we want him. But you promised. I promised what? There would only be this once, that we'd take the money and go away. Oh, don't be absurd, pet. Jack Diamond made a dozen photostats, and we'll sell them to Mr. DeSantis one at a time. I'm not going to do it. Yes, you will. I mean it, Diane. So do I. <gasps> oh, darling... Oh, darling, I'm terribly sorry. Did I hurt you? No. Oh, let me see. There. Feel better? Yes. Oh, Bruce, it was your own fault. You shouldn't upset me. But I forgive you. I'm sure it won't happen again. DeSantis and Company. I'd like to speak with Mr. DeSantis, please. Who is this? Just tell him it's the chap who was up to see him Sunday afternoon. Just a moment. It's for you, Julio. Who is it, Ronnie? He didn't care to give his name. He said he was up to see you Sunday afternoon. Ah, yeah. Do you want to speak with him? Sure. Hello. DeSantis. That's right. How are you, Graham? Fine. That's good. You're probably wondering why I call. No. How much is going to cost this time? What? I ask how much is going to cost the poor DeSantis. 25,000 pounds. You heard me. Oh, sure. I'm just disappointed myself. I thought perhaps your first try would be your last. I'm serious, DeSantis. I know you are. Have it ready at 9 o'clock. My place again? No. You familiar with Park Slope near Wembley? Eh, I'll find them. You better. And just so there'll be no mistake, I'll be driving a blue Nash convertible. Hello? Hello, Graham. Who was that? Eh, just a fellow I know from business, Ronnie. Julio, is something wrong? Because if there's any way I can help you... You a good boy, Ronnie. You're making sport of me. No, honest. But uh, let me ask you something. Suppose a Mr. X have papers that can make lots of trouble for you. What would you do? You mean if I were being blackmailed? I think maybe we can call him that. Well, I'm not much of a hero, Julio. If I were in a jam, I'd give this Mr. X whatever he wanted. <sighs> You're right, Ronnie. In a case like this, there is nothing to do but to give my friend what he asks for. See? I always told you we think alike. <laughs> Hello, Diane. Why, Jack Diamond, of all people. Come on in. Thanks. You know, this isn't very bright of you, darling. I Graham... couldn't help myself. I'm worried, Diane. Oh, well, if it's about Graham, you needn't be. He'll behave. He's going to see DeSantis at night. No, he mustn't. Mustn't? Julio is simply furious. But do tell. I refuse to run the risk of having him discover that I'm involved. <sighs> Seems such a shame to quit now. Suppose I that... won't hear it. Graham mustn't see DeSantis. Now, are you going to stop him? Or shall I? You're not leaving me much choice, darling. But let me think about it for a little while. I'll let you know when I reach a decision. Four. One. One. Two. Hotel Carlisle. Uh, Mr. Waring, please. Michael Waring. Mr. Waring? 
That's right. My name is Bruce Graham. Bruce Graham? You don't know me, but... But you feel it might be worth my while if I did. Yes. I live at 427 Charleston West. That's right off Piccadilly. How soon can you be over? Well, not so fast. What's this all about? Well, it's about something you should be interested in. You're with American Intelligence, aren't you? How did you find that out? The same way I found out you were staying at the Carlisle. Which, of course, tells me nothing. It wasn't meant to. I'll fill you in on the details as soon as you get here. But it's got to be before nine. Well, this is all kind of vague, fella. I don't think I can make it. You've got to. You don't understand. Excuse me. Who is it? What? What are you doing here? You said... Hello, Graham. You said... Graham, what's going on there? We can't win a war or a political campaign or even a peace without a slogan. But it helps in a big way to do the job ahead. A good slogan makes people think. If it's repeated and repeated until it becomes part of our language, and if the thought it expresses becomes part of our lives and our daily actions, then that slogan does what it's intended to do. Take, for instance, the universal slogan, Safety First. All motorists should be sure to follow the tip of the best current slogan for them, Drive as though your life depends on it. It does. Now back to the adventures of the Falcon. Well, there's one thing travel teaches you. Telephone companies are the same in England as they are in America. But I had a hunch that more than the line was dead here, so I hustled over to 427 Charleston. When I walked in... There was no question that someone had Bruce Graham's number. He was lying on the floor with two neat little holes in his head. There was nothing I could do for him, so I made myself at home and looked around. Then in the corner of the room, I saw it. It being a 38 Colt automatic. I pulled out a handkerchief and picked it up. That was my first mistake. I didn't have time to make a second. I say, old man. What? what? I wouldn't do that. You're tampering with evidence. I don't think the police would approve. Oh, I wouldn't be too sure. I would. I'm Inspector Beecham of the CID. Oh. Well, I'm glad to know you, Inspector. You're just saying that to make me feel comfortable, old boy. But please, don't bother. I'm quite accustomed to this sort of thing. Oh, now, just a minute. You don't think I had anything to do with this? My name is Mike Waring. I'm with American Intelligence. If you'd like to see my credentials... I'd love to. This is to certify the Michael Waring. <laughs> it's most impressive. What was your connection with Mr. Graham? He called me at my hotel about 20 minutes ago. Said he had to see me. In the middle of the dialogue, I heard two shots. And naturally, you dashed over. Naturally. What do you suppose the poor chap wanted? I don't know. But it must have had something to do with security measures. He knew I was with American intelligence. Obviously, he felt the CID was hardly as efficient. You don't believe me, huh? Why, my dear boy, it would never occur to me to doubt you. Still, you must admit it's rather suspicious finding you standing over a body... Wiping off fingerprints. I wasn't wiping them off. I was just examining the gun. Of course. Now, look, I tell you, Graham was frightened of something. He claimed he had to see me before nine. Why? Well, I can only guess. But what do you make of this note I found scribbled near the phone? To Sanders, nine, Park Slope, Wembley. He must have had an appointment to meet this DeSantis there. Poor chap, I don't think he'll keep it. No, but I can. Now, what do you say, Inspector? Well, it might be a nice touch. Sort of a fitting memorial, don't you know? All right, Waring, you keep that appointment for Graham, and I'll keep an eye on you. DeSantis? DeSantis? Hello. What? I frightened you, huh? Yes, you certainly did. Get out of the car. Now, wait a minute. Sorry, I don't have time. That gun loaded? What do you think? I think I'd better get out. Hey, you're not Bruce Graham. That's what I tried to tell you. Who are you? Name is Waring, Mike Waring. I'm with American Intelligence. Oh, I'm sorry. You see, I expect someone else. Bruce Graham? That's right. Well, Graham couldn't make it. What happened? What's the worst you can think of? Murder? Thanks, DeSantis. You just won a bet for me. I had a hunch your mind would run along those lines. You understand, of course, Mr. DeSantis, that we have no desire to intimidate you. 
But if you'd like to make a confession, you'll find us most appreciative. You crazy, Inspector. I not kill Graham. What the reason I got? Well, I'm glad you asked me that, because I've come to the conclusion he was blackmailing you. I hardly even know the fellow. Then why did you arrange that appointment to meet him tonight? I don't arrange him. Graham does. He say he want to see me on business. And exactly what is that business? I'm in Port. Olive oil, wine, things like this. And where were you when Graham was done in? How should I know? Uh, what time it happened? What time was it, Waring? About 7.30. Ah, half past seven? Sure. I was in my office. Anybody with you? Just Ronnie. Ronnie. Ronnie Payton. He's a nice young boy who worked for me. That check, Inspector? Well, that's hard to say. Friend Ronnie is apparently vanished. <laughs> what do you mean, vanished? Disappeared. Perhaps you can tell us why. Well, Ronnie's very sensitive. Maybe all this publicity make him nervous. So he takes off when you need him most, huh? How Ronnie gonna know I need him for alibi? How indeed? Uh, wait a minute, Inspector. There's something that doesn't add up here. Does for me. Mr. DeSantis had an appointment with Graham. When you kept it, he greeted you with open arms and a loaded revolver. Yes, well, that's just it. Why should he take a gun to me at nine under the impression I'm Graham if he killed Graham an hour and a half earlier? Hey, I'm much obliged, Mr. Wedding. Well, you can make it up to me. Now, why was Graham blackmailing you? He wasn't. Are you affiliated with the Communist Party? Me? Of course not. Well, what other reason could Graham have for getting in touch with me? How should I know? Now, when you think of an answer, give me a ring. I'm at the Carlisle. Let me out, Inspector. I'm going home. <laughs> Come in, Mr. Wedding. Oh, thanks. I suppose you think this is very forward of me. No, there's nothing I like better than having people drop in unannounced. Who are you? Jack Diamond. Jack Diamond. Well, you must be quite a card. That isn't very funny. I know, I'm pressing. What can I do for you, Jackie? Well, you might ask me to sit down. I don't think you'll be staying long. If you're going to be insulting... Yes? No, I'm not going to get angry. <laughs> you thought I would, didn't you? I had hopes. You don't seem to understand, Mr. Waring. I'm here to do you a favor. Supposing I told you there's a communist cell in Paris. <laughs> there must be thousands. Well, I can give you the names of a dozen members, all with high positions in government. How soon can you leave? Oh, when would you like me to? Well, there's a seven o'clock flight to Paris. And by an odd coincidence, you happen to have made a reservation for me. Well... Yeah, so that's awfully sweet of you, Jackie, but you shouldn't have bothered... Now, suppose you tell me why you're so anxious for me to leave London. I told you. I hate communists. Yes, well, let's have the real reason. All right. You're investigating Bruce Graham's murder. Oh, I wouldn't put it quite that way. I would. It doesn't concern you, Mr. Waring. I demand that you mind your own business. You're going to make me? Yes. No. Why, you little devil. Let go. Will you be... Ow! Will you bite me? Will you... Now, sit down and behave yourself. I could kill you for that. Well, you may yet. I better have myself inoculated against hydrophobia. If I could get my hands on you... you... Don't you know when you're well off? You shouldn't let yourself be carried away like that, Jackie. It's bad for your health. Put time that phone. Now, listen, you... Oh, I didn't think your recuperative powers would be that good. No, and you never thought I might be carrying a gun. No. Hit me, would you? Oh. Now, how do you like that, Mr. Waring? I don't. No, you're like all the others, aren't you? You're quick enough to push people around when you're stronger than they are. Well, why don't you try it now? No, thanks. Yes, you're afraid, aren't you? A big, strong man's afraid. Be careful, Jackie. You're working yourself into a snit. Shut up! If you think I'm fooling... No, I don't. You'll have nothing to do with Julio DeSantis. Do you understand? If that's what you want. That's what I want. Okay. And don't think you can hoax me, either. Because I'll be watching every minute of the time. And the minute you break your word, you'll be hearing from me. <laughs> Are you Diane Halsey? That all depends. Now, if you were a bill collector, I'd be silly to admit it. Oh, you don't have to worry. My name is Mike Waring. That still tells me nothing. Well, if you want the story of my life, you'll have to invite me in. Is there any danger involved? Well, I couldn't say for sure. I am a creature of impulse. Come in. Thanks. Ah, say, this is nice. Sit down. Oh, never while a lady is standing. I was just about to mix myself a drink. Will you join me? Yes, if I can have a Smirnoff martini, about five pots vodka to one of vermouth. 
Ah, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Fine. Need any help? No, I can manage. Yes, I'll bet you can. Why don't you tell me about yourself? Oh, I've led a very dull life, Diane. Diane? I'm a great believer in shortcuts. Yes, I can see that. You are. Thank you. Just what is your occupation, Mr. Waring? I'm with the American British Assurance Company. Doing what? What I'm doing now. Mmm, that tastes good. You mean you get paid for this? Oh, no, this is my unexpected dividend. My job is to make settlements on life insurance policies. I don't understand. Well, you see, you were engaged to a man named Bruce Graham, whom we insured for 5,000 pounds. Would you mind repeating that? Now, didn't you know? You were one of the principal beneficiaries. This isn't a joke. Well, do I look like the kind of a man who would deceive a beautiful woman? When do I get the money? Just as soon as we observe a few minor formalities. Well, by all means, let's observe them. Well, as I said, Diane, you're one of the beneficiaries. There's another, and as soon as I can get a release from him, you can cut the pie. Uh, Graham told us we'd be able to locate him through you. What's his name? Jack Diamond. You're pretty clever. Bruce didn't even know Jackie. And the inspector was right. You did serve as a connecting link. You get out. Uh, well, just brief me on this. What was it you people had on DeSantis? Was he a commie? Are you going to leave? All right, Diane. But once a man like me finds a girl like you, you can't expect him to stay away. I'll be seeing you, doll. <laughs> Sorry, DeSantis. Now, have you any idea who this Jack Diamond might be? No. Look, you don't seem to realize you're on a spot. You know, they could hang you for Bruce Graham's murder. You say before there isn't any chance. There's always a chance. Now, you know who this Jack Diamond is. I swear. It's the boy who works for you, Ronnie Payton. You crazy. Look, according to your story, you met Graham for the first time last week. So? So it stands to reason that whatever he had on you came from a third party. And the third party wasn't Diane Halsey, because you didn't even know her. So Ronnie Payton must be our friend Jack Diamond. Well, you're wrong. Ronnie's like a son to me. Why would he do this? I told you. He must have been the instigator of the blackmail plot. And he was afraid that if you latched on to Bruce Graham, the whole story would come out. Then you think Ronnie killed Graham? Yes, I do. Now, where is he? If your friend, the inspector, say it's okay, I take you to him. What? Wasn't it nice of me to wait for you? How did you get in here, Diane? The door was open. You're lying. Oh, that's no way to talk, darling, after I came clear to Whitechapel to warn you. Warn me? About what? A man named Waring. I'm afraid I haven't had the pleasure. Well, he knows about you. At least he knows about Jack Diamond. He was up to see me tonight. What did you tell him? Nothing yet. What's that supposed to mean? Really, Ronnie, this whole thing's been a terrible disappointment. Now, it's almost enough to make you believe crime doesn't pay. We got 2,000 pounds from DeSantis. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that, darling. What did you do with your share? Why? I'm afraid I'll have to borrow it. <laughs> That's not fair. You know you'd never repay me. Well, probably not. But then if I spent the money on a trip to Spain, I'd be in no position to call Waring. You can't do this to me. It's blackmail. You should know. I won't stand for it, Diane. You hear me? I won't stand for it. Ronnie, stop that. I can't for it. You filthy little creature. Ronnie, please. There's one type of catastrophe to which most of us are exposed many times every day if we drive or ride on the highways. Because some drivers habitually travel on the wrong side of the road. They pay no attention to the painted lifelines of the highway that should never be crossed. It's these drivers who often pay with their lives for that foolhardy act. Drive as though your life depends on it. It does. And now back to the adventures of the Falcon. It's a funny thing about hunches. The first time I saw Diane Halsey, something told me I'd be seeing her again. Naturally, I didn't expect it to be so soon. But the credit for bringing it all belonged to DeSantis, 
But when he brought Inspector Beecham and myself to Ronnie Payton's little nest, there she was. Of course, she looked better at our first meeting. But then she didn't have those bruises on her throat, and that might have made a difference. What a tremendous waste of talent. Yes, isn't it? Think friend Ronnie is responsible? Oh, don't you? Excuse me, please, but uh, can I say something? Why not, DeSantis? It's open forum tonight. I think the lady is not dead. Mm. Huh? Right, Joe. Get some water. Right on. Is there something we can do in the meantime? Yeah. Help me lift her on the sofa. <laughs> Easy. Yeah, no. yeah, no. That's the way. Got the water, Inspector? Well, will you look who's here? Ronnie. Get away from me, Julia. You brought him here. I know, but... Uh, and who... What's that girl doing on my sofa? Well, I hope you don't mind. There was a draft on the floor. Who is she? Don't you know him? If I did, I wouldn't ask. Who killed her? She's not dead, Ronnie. She isn't? No. But don't feel too badly, old thing. You still got one murder to your credit. Here's the water welling. Thanks. You are Diane. You've got to believe me, Inspector. I didn't kill Bruce Graham. Then who did? Diane. You know, I rather suspected you'd say that. Oh. How's the patient welling? She'll be all right. I tell you, she killed him. Naturally, you've got an alibi for the time. Yes. I was in a cinema in Limehouse. Oh, how ordinary. I, 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 I'm I, disappointed in you, Ronnie. But I can prove it with the attendant. You see, we had an argument, and I reported him to the manager. I... But you you believe me, don't you, Julio? Well, uh... I don't know about him, Ronnie, but I do. Now, come, where is... Oh, he's telling the truth. You mean this? Uh, sure, DeSantis. How could Ronnie have killed Bruce Graham when we both know it was you? Hey, now we all know. Mr. Waring, you're quite talented in a peculiar sort of way. Why? Because I figured out that DeSantis was the killer? Uh-huh. Well, it was simple, Diane. Graham was murdered around 7.30, and DeSantis claimed at the time he was in his office with Ronnie. Well? Well, Ronnie had his own independent alibi. He was at the cinema. But if DeSantis killed Bruce at 7.30, why did he keep that appointment at 9? Well, he had to. What reason could he give for not showing up? He knew Graham was dead? Oh, that would really have ruined his act. I see your point. Good girl. Now, what I'd like to know is what you people had on DeSantis that started the whole thing off. So what would be your guess? Well, communism is not lord here or in Italy, so I got a hunch he's a member of the other end of the spectrum. I suppose he was a big wheel under Mussolini. Then, as a former fascist, a lot of people might be interested in his whereabouts. You are talented, aren't you? Oh, you have no idea. I know I'm the only man in London who can do the Indian rope trick. You mean you can make a body disappear? Just like that. <laughs> you want me wearing? Yes, she's all yours, Inspector, for blackmail. Why, you rotten, filthy... Oh, I'm sorry, Angel. I know exactly how you feel. Because making a body like yours disappear is a dirty trick on me, too. Good night, folks. <laughs> The Case of the Strawberry Blonde. The Case of the Strawberry Blonde. That's the title of next week's adventure of the Falcon, when Mike Waring learns that when a gal reaches for the peroxide, someone is bound to die. The Adventures of the Falcon are based on the famous character created by Drexel Drake, produced and transcribed by Bernard L. Schubert, written by Eugene Wang, and directed by... Richard Lewis. Les Damon was starred as the Falcon with Francis Cheney as Diane. This program came from New York. Fred Collins speaking. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, The Lineup. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment we will take you by transcription behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. 
This is the lineup. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, it's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, Treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. I was on a 24 that worked into a 48. I don't think I've had six hours sleep since Wednesday. The Bulati steak, huh? Yeah. And this weather. Oh, it's sure hot. Yeah. You have some witnesses? No. Just looking around. Dull upstairs. I'm glad we can use a lull. May I have your attention, please? I'll see you later. Yeah. You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Okay, bring on the line. All right, keep it moving. Right over here to the end of the stage. Now turn and face front, hands at your sides. Now, when I call out your number, step out and face the screen. Keep your head up so everyone can get a good look at you and talk up so everyone can hear you. Okay, number one, Leonard Strickland, robbery. Where do you live, Leonard? Uh, 77, uh, 65, Orangeville. What's your business? What do I do? Yeah, what do you do? What kind of work? Well, I'm not employed. I, uh, I used to be a carpenter. When was the last time you worked as a carpenter? The last time... Well, I guess that was about five, six years ago. Oh, yes, at least. What kind of jobs have you had since then? Oh, well, I've done lots of odd things. I was a window washer for a while. I worked at gas stations and labor gangs for the city. Oh, I've done a lot of things. Who were you with when you were picked up? Oh, a guy, Stanley Halloran. And he was picked up, too. Is he in the line? Sure. Point him out. Mm, him. First one. Number two, Stanley Halloran. Why, well, you want I should step out? No. To call my number. Stay there. When? When what? Do I step out? I'll tell you. He was just pointing you out to the people out front, Stanley. Oh. You're next. Okay. I'll take care of it, Leonard. He ain't so bright. Oh, wait. You ain't. Okay, right. knock it off. Yeah, I'm sorry. <clears throat> you just don't understand things. Who don't? You don't. Now, Come shut on. up. Just answer my questions. That's enough. Sorry. He talks to Shut him. up! All right. Shut up. Now, when you were arrested, Leonard... Yeah? Did you have any weapons on you? Weapons? Guns. Knives. You had the biggest shotgun you ever saw. Now, listen. Yeah. I told you not to talk unless you were asked. <clears throat> stupid. He's just playing stupid. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Leonard. Yes? Did I ask you how stupid he was? No. Then tell me about the shotgun. It was a shotgun. An old one. Double barrel? Pump? What? The pump. I bought it. What was the caliber? Uh, 16 gauge. Okay, Leonard, step back. Number two, Stanley Halloran, robbery. Well, come on, come on. Now? Yeah, step out. Yeah, see? Stupid. Get him come off on. the stage. Take him down to the tank. Uh, okay. Now, where do you live, Stan? Hello. I said where? Where do you live? Oh. Uh, I live down by Jefferson. You live down by Jefferson? Yeah, Jefferson, Big Long Street. What's the address? Uh, uh, 
2365 East Wilton. Uh, it's up from Lincoln. I guess it's really not down so much. Kind of in between. This is turning out to be my lucky night. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> Did you have any weapons on your stand? No, I wouldn't even carry the shotgun. Are you driving a car? No, I wouldn't drive it. I, I didn't even want to do the job much. I I didn't feel good. Was Leonard driving the car? Yeah, that's when he wanted me to hold the shotgun, but I told him, not on your life, and he had to put it in the back seat. What kind of a car was Leonard driving, Stan? I don't know. Was it a sedan, a coupe? Uh, it had a back seat. I suppose it was a sedan. What color was it? The back seat? The car. Uh, I don't know. All right, step back. Did I talk loud enough? Yeah, you did just fine. Now, step back. No, 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 the other end of the line. Did I get my safe place? The other end, Stan. Okay. Uh, number three, Arthur Willoughby, robbery. Where do you live, Arthur? <coughs> 99 North, 109. <coughs> I got a coat. What do you do, Arthur? <coughs> I'm a painter. What kind of a painter? House painter. Where do you work? I'm not working now. I, I, tour, I tour work for Ajax. Yeah. Oh, Were you arrested with anybody? I see you? No, for I was sure. alone. Any weapons? No. You have a car. Yeah, 37 Ford Coupe. <laughs> Pete really had himself a couple tonight. Yeah? How oh, was that? Just got a call from Small over on Adams. Oh, what is it? Homicide. Officer around the beat found a dead man in an alley. Okay, let's go. Hi, it's Don here. Come on, let us through, please. Let us through. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the officer on the beat, uh, Miller, is a new boy. Found him. Uh huh. Hello, Doc. Uh, hello, Ben. Crockett and I have been over the alley. We couldn't find anything. How long has he been dead? Well, let's see, uh, about an hour, not anymore. How'd he die? Beat to death. I'll tell you more as soon as I get him downtown. All right, boys, clean it up. <clears throat> Uh, got a cigarette? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, sure hope it cools off. Didn't sleep five minutes last night. Uh, thanks. All right. Uh, when do you want my report, Ben? Soon. Ten o'clock? Okay. Uh, see you. Good night, Doc. Uh, thanks for the cigarette. Sure. Any identification, Small? Well, there's a wallet. Here it is. That's all they had on him. The name's Farmer. Mm-hmm. Stanley Farmer. 79 East Weston. Hmm. That's not too far. Well, let's look around. <clears throat> I'd say the fight took place in this part of the alley. You see the big can? Uh-huh. Yeah, I caved in. Yeah, it looks like one of them fell over it. There's blood on the pavement near it. Mm. I shine the light on the wall. Now, over to the right. What are these buildings on either side? A warehouse and the department store. In a fight like this, someone must have heard something. A warehouse or a department store would have a night watchman. Well, if you heard anything, you'd have taken a look, but well, we'll check anyway. Let's walk down the alley. Right. Uh, cover the wall on this side and this part of the alley with your lights, will you? How about the other end of the alley? Where does it lead? It's a dead end. Hmm. Wonder what the other guy looked like. The dead one was really worked over. Well, might have been more than one guy working him over. Yeah, hold it a minute. They were even fighting here. More blood. Hmm. Scuff marks. Rubber heel shoes. They're fresh marks. Well, biggest part of the struggle looks like it took place back there. <laughs> but shine it down here. Well, what's that? What? Where? Shine your light down there. Down there, Small. No, over by those cans. There. Oh. Feathers. Feathers? Yeah. Looks like part of a woman's hat or something. It's a pretty funny-looking hat. The cans are dumped over here. Oh, this might be something. A lot of junk in this alley. Well, we'll go through every bit of it. Any other time, it would be just junk. We'll check it all. Keep the alley blocked off. I'll call in and have them send some boys down to keep it clear until morning. Oh, okay. Well, let's go, Dave. Uh, if you find anything, we'll be over at Farmer's house, then back to the station. I'll call from Farmer's and give a phone number. All right. Maybe he doesn't live with anybody. 
Boy, it's hot. Bring it again. Now, oh, wait a minute. There's a line. What's going on? Uh, we're police officers. Uh, all right if we come in? What do you want? Does Stanley Farmer live here? Yeah, he ain't home. We know he isn't. Uh, who are you? Frank Farmer. I'm his brother. Come on, what is it? What's wrong? Stan get into trouble or something? I'm sorry I can't tell you this any other way. Your brother's dead. Huh? I'm sorry. We'd like to talk to you about it. Maybe you can help us. If you don't feel like it now, we... No, can... no. No, it's okay. I... I guess maybe I should break up or something, but I don't feel anything. I guess I should feel awful, but I don't. Well, maybe if you had a drink. I, I don't drink. Dan's dead? He was found in an alley. Look. Come on in the other room and sit down. I can't think too straight. Been asleep. Gosh, fellas, this is... You know, miserable. I... 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 Just make yourself comfortable. Gosh, I think to wake up to you. Sleeping your head off and stinking doorbell. You know, it's funny, I was dreaming of a bad one. The doorbell just jarred me and it rang a couple of times. We didn't know if your brother lived you, you with You know, I, I swear that this is the darndest thing. I, I, I got along with my brother great. I guess I loved him as much as anybody. Loving a family. I just can't feel much. Sort of numb. We want to find out who killed him. Yeah. Do you have any enemies? No. No, if, if he did, I I didn't know about any. He's a nice guy. Early, so I have to get in the sack early. You work? Yes. Yeah, Stan and me would work together. We've got a service. To... I'm sorry for it. Get... Well, we can talk about it. No, later. no. Let's get it over with. I've got a job, and I'd like to help. Stan was a good kid. I'm older, that. The way I kind of always talked about him. He really isn't... A... <laughs> really isn't anything, is he, now? Look, Mr. No, Palmer, I... No, no, just... It took me a little while getting around to it. I, I haven't cried in a long time. I felt like I should. I... Go ahead. I'm Okay. What time did Stan go out? Before I went to bed. Early. Around seven, maybe. He had a date. A date? Yeah, he's seeing a girl. Her name is, uh... uh June. Uh, June, uh, he told me. Do you know where she lives? Hmm? Uh, uh, no, I... He told me June. June Colton... Colton... Uh, something like... Uh, Col uh, June Coleman. Yeah. Uh, June Coleman? Yeah, yeah. He's... We've been seeing her for about a week. I've never met her. And you don't know where she lives? No. no. Where we might be able to find her? He, he met her in a bar. It's Stillman's, I said. It's only about three blocks from here over on Madison. I don't know the address. Uh, we'll find her. You, th you think maybe she had something to do with it? Your brother say much about her? He liked her. Her name, he, he, he told me at once, maybe, maybe twice, and, and he liked her. That, that's all he told me. And you can't think of anyone who might have it in for your brother? No. Look, I, I'd, I'd tell you if I knew. I, I guess there was people who didn't like him or who likes everybody. But I, I, don't, I don't know anybody who'd, who'd want to kill him. Well, uh, we may want to talk some more. Sure. Yeah. And we'll check on the girl. Sure. It does. Look, uh, I, I guess I ought to see him. He's um, pretty badly beaten up. Is it somebody... Yeah, yeah. You'll have to identify him sooner or later, but, but if you don't mind a suggestion, wait till tomorrow evening or, or tomorrow afternoon late. Sure. Well, good night, Mr. Farmer. Thanks. Sure. Come on, Dave. Ever cool off? I don't know.
Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying outdoor sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Now, back to the lineup. talk to you. We're police officers. Okay. Watch for me, Sid. Be right back. We can talk in the kitchen. That'll be fine. Okay. You know Stanley Farmer? Stanley Farmer? Yeah, I know. A regular customer? Pretty regular. Been coming in for about a year, I guess. Know his brother? Yeah. A girl named June Coleman? Jim Coleman? Yeah. Blonde? We don't know. Friend of Stan's. Good-looking blonde. No, she's a friend of Stan's. He had a date with her tonight. Yeah, I know her. Real good-looking doll. Blonde, like I said. She came in with Stan tonight. You know where we can find her? No. Mind if I ask what this is all about? Stan's been killed. Stan? You say he was in here tonight with the girl? Yeah, that's right. What was she wearing? Huh? Do you remember what she had on? What kind of a dress, hat? I don't pay much attention to those things. Dean, dead? She was a pretty nice kid. That's too bad. How did it happen? That's what we're trying to find out. Uh, did the girl have on anything with feathers on it? Feathers? Yeah, like these. Oh. Hey, hey, yeah, she did. Funniest looking hat I ever seen. Feathers like that on top. What time does Stan come in with the girl? Hmm. Came in about nine or so. Left around, well, I guess it was here for a half hour or so. About 9.30 it left, I guess. And you don't know where she lives? No. How long has she been coming in here? Oh, about five, six weeks. She come in alone? No. First time she came in, she came in with Charlie. Charlie? Charlie Phillips. Been a customer for a long time. Uh, was Charlie with her the night stand met her? No. She'd been coming in for two or three days without Charlie. I figured they had a fight or something. And where does Charlie live? I don't know for sure, but he's a fisherman. Commercial fisherman. Is out sometimes on the boat for two, three weeks at a time. When I saw the blonde come in alone, I figured Charlie was out with the boat. You have his own boat? No, I know for a fact he don't. He always talks about getting his own boat when he's in here lust to the eyeball. Always he's going to get his own boat someday and make a lot of money. I always tell him as long as I make booze, he ain't going to save enough to buy nothing. He just laughs and just keeps on getting more and more tank. He catches fish and he drinks like him. Who does he work for? A fellow named Cassidy. Nice old guy. Brogue and everything. I don't know what the name of his outfit is. Probably Cassidy something or other. He's proud of his name and he probably uses it every time he gets a chance. If his business is named anything, you'd better it's Cassidy something or other. Well, look, um, if Cassidy or Phillips or the blonde come in, I want you to call the 16th precinct. The 16th precinct? Yeah, ask for Guthrie and if I'm not there, ask for Quine. Guthrie or Quine. That's right. 16th precinct, Guthrie or Quine. I got it. Thanks for your help. Sure. Stop in again. Yeah, we'll probably do that. sun comes out. If I could stop it, I would. What time's it been? Mm, it's close to five. Ah, Cassidy. You got a pretty big place. Mm, and a pretty big sign. Bartender knew what he was talking about. Hey! Yeah? Know where we can find Cassidy? You found him. Bartender for you. 
Uh, we're police officers, Mr. Cassidy. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Asher. Oh, how are you? And we'd like to talk to you. Well, don't have too much time. Just going out. Yes, sir. Taking the Cassidy fleet out. You have a man working for you named Phillips? I have. Charlie Phillips. That's right. Yeah, but if he don't show up in the next five minutes, he ain't going to be. Uh, what do you want him for? Well, we just want to talk to him. Well, he ain't showing up yet. Should have been here about two hours ago. Uh, you know where he lives? Sure, sure. I got his address in the office. I'll get it for you, but then I got to get the boat on the way, you know. Yeah. Come on over and I'll unlock. Oh, hold it, hold it. Here he comes. Phillips? Yeah. Well, come on, come on. Look at him. Been in a fight already. <laughs> where you been? The poor old late. Okay, okay, I'm late. I'll make it up. You, you bet you will. Uh, these guys want to talk to you. Yeah? Police officers. Police? Probably about the fight you got into last night. Who says I got in a fight? Oh, oh I suppose you got the shiner. I didn't get in no fight. Uh, we'd like to talk to you, Charlie. I got to get on the boat. Have to wait. Well, I can't. If you're not down in ten minutes, we'll sail without you. All right, all right. Well, come on, come on, then. Let's get it over with. Yeah. I'll see you later. Uh, thanks, Mr. Cassidy. Oh, don't mention it. Okay. What is it? You know a man named Farmer? No. Stan Farmer? No, I said no. I never heard of him. How about June Coleman? Yeah. So what? I know her. How long have you known her? Look, you guys, if I don't get on that boat, I lose my job. I'm sorry, but we need some answers. You'll get on the boat as fast as you give them to us. Okay. I've known June for a couple of months, I guess. Where does she live? What's this all about? Where does she live? Over on River, 245 South River. Where were you last night? Look, I'm going to miss Did that. Did you see June last night? Yeah. Now, look, you guys, I'm getting a little tired of this. If I lose my job, you guys are going to be sorry. Where were you last night? I was out. Out where? Out with June. June Coleman? Yeah, I was out with her until real late. Then I went home, ask her. I will. What time did you get home? About three this morning. What time did you take her out? About seven. And you were with her all evening? Yeah. Hey, there go the boats. Come on, get out of my way. I'm going to lose my job. Come on, move it. Don't get rough, Charlie. Listen, you stupid flatfoot. You just no, make... Now relax Boy, yourself. You relax. relax. Hold it. Okay. You don't have to pull a gun. I won't give you no trouble. Let's go, Charlie. Okay. Where are we going? I think we'll go over and talk to your girl. My girl? Yes, June. The one you were out with last night. What do you want to talk to her for? Where did you get the black eye? I got in the beef. Last night? No, the night before. Tell us about it. Well, there ain't much to tell. Some guy got nasty and one thing led to another. You know how those things are. No, Johnny. Tell us how they are. We got in the beef, that's all. You come out on top, Charlie? Oh, I don't know. I hit him a couple of times. I guess who wins a fight? Hmm. That's why you guys want me? For getting in a fight? That's right. Well, it wasn't anything. The other guy was all right. Who was the other guy? I don't know. Just some guy. You know how those things start. We were drinking, having a couple. Where you... were you drinking? Where? In a bar. What bar, Charlie? Well, I don't know. I was in a lot of bars. I don't remember which one I got in the fight. Well, maybe June will remember. I wasn't out with June. You said you were. I said I was out with her last night. I got in a fight the night before. Oh, yeah. You got to a bar last night? Yeah. Yeah, we went to a bar. Which one? Well, we went to a couple. Name them. Well, Stillman's. Over on Madison? Yeah. Get in, Charlie. We're going over to see June? That's right. She ain't going to like being waked up this early. We'll apologize. It's down further, 309. Oh, she's going to raise the roof. Oh, hold it, this is it. Look, Knock I... Knock on it, Dave. Guys are sure making a lot out of a lousy little fight. The fight we're interested in wasn't a lousy little fight. But I'm telling okay, you... Okay, okay, you told us. All right, relax, I'm coming. Hello, Charlie. For Pete's sake, what... Charlie. These are cops. We can handle it, Charlie. Cops? Can we come in, please? I just got out of bed. I told him I was out of You don't school. talk, Charlie. What is all this? Can we come in? Or do you want to come down to the station with us? Oh, I just got up. Come on in. Charlie, what's going on? I tried to I told you to guy. knock it off, Charlie. If you wasn't a cop... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I want to know what's going on. Jiggy, drag a girl out of bed. Charlie gotta... tells us you were with him until about four this morning. Yeah. That's right, I was. He picked you up about seven? Yeah. See... You know Stan Farmer? Stan Farmer? 
Yeah, I know him. Been out with him? Yeah. He was killed last night. He was? Oh, gosh, that's terrible. I didn't know him too good. He killed? And you were in Stillman's bar with him last night. She was with me. Yeah, I was. You were in the bar from about 9 o'clock to 9.30 with Stan Farmer. Charlie. And you were wearing a hat with feathers on it. These feathers. I told you. And we she... found those feathers in the alley where we found Stan Farmer's dead body. I don't know anything about it. Where did Charlie get the black eye? I got it. Nice you be... shut up. Look, you... Charlie, for Pete's sake, tell him. Shut up. No. No, tell him. I don't want to get in no trouble. Shut up. Keep your mouth shut. He killed him. He got us out together you and he... dirty little... <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, thanks, Ben. The big boy. All right, Miss Coleman. Tell us about it. Well, he caught us out. I've been seeing Stan. He killed Stan? Yeah. He, he caught us and dragged Stan in the alley. Stan didn't even see it coming. I ran, and then he came here later and told me he'd killed him, and if I ever went out with another guy, I'd do the same to him. He had me scared out of my wits. If I'd known what he was like, I'd never have started to go with him. Honest, I, I didn't have nothing to do with it. Ask him. He'll tell you I ran, and I didn't have nothing to do with it. Come on. Charlie, wake up and tell him I didn't have nothing to do with it. Charlie. Uh, you better get into some clothes and come on down to the station. But I swear I didn't... No, we just want a statement. A statement? Charlie will be out for a while. Big ape. Stan was a nice boy. He treated me nice. Big ape. You better get something on. Okay. He made me ruin the best hat I got. Big ape. <laughs> Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. The lineup starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie with Jack Moyle, the Sergeant Pete Carter, was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, Howard McNear, Hal March, Bob Sweeney, Peter Leeds, Dick Ryan, Jim Nusser, and Virginia Gregg. The lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is the CBS Radio Network. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pete Codley, Johnny. Guaranteed transport. Oh, hiya, Pete. Seen the papers? No, I just got up. Why? What's happened? Air crash, for one thing. Air crash? Where? Mexico. Flight 6, Aztec Caribbean line, Mexico City to Havana. Crashed in the mountains ten minutes after takeoff. Seven passengers and a crew of three. Survivors? The way it sounds, none. Oh, tough. How do you come into it, Pete? We underwrite a company that handles flight insurance down there. Three of the passengers bought policies at the airport. We're stuck for $75,000. This is a nice time of the year in Mexico, Johnny. What do you want me to do, find out why it crashed? No, I know why it crashed. Somebody meant for it to. What do you mean? That plane blew up in midair. I'll get you a reservation. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Flight 6 matter. Item 1, $173.20, airline fare and incidentals, Hartford, Connecticut to Mexico City. I checked my baggage through customs and started making inquiries, and more inquiries, and then some more. And after the 14th, Ken Sabe, maybe is better you ask him, I found the office I was looking for. Or at least I thought I'd found it. The flowery Spanish title on the door translated roughly into Inspector General of the Department of Civil Air Transport. But when I opened the door, I wasn't so sure. Come in, Jack. Make yourself to home. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking for I the... I found him. That's me. Don't let the big words on the door fool you. I'm all there is. There ain't no more. So come in. Shut the door. All right, thanks. <laughs> is uh, your name uh, Dollar? That's right, Johnny Dollar. Macklin here. Mac Macklin. One time mongrel from the south side of Chicago. I got a wire from your office. Said you'd be in on Pan Am Flight 12. Pull up a chair and squat, will you? All right. Or what were you expecting? <laughs> Spanish grandee with a white silk shirt, a black silk tie, and a second cousin on the cabinet? Well, maybe. At least I wasn't figuring on a south side make with a 17th century desk and a cotton sweatshirt. Uh, well, now, here's what little dope we've got on the crash. Most of which you probably know already. I left on 20-minute notice. All I've seen is one newspaper item. I can use a lot more. Well, you won't get much more out of that report. We got a crew over at the wreckage around two hours ago. Survivors? No, he didn't have a chance. That crate is scattered over ten acres of mountainside. Didn't catch fire, though, so we might turn up something or other. Oh, I've got a good man in charge up there, Juno Romero. You'll meet him later. I'm sending another jeep up there in a few minutes, and you can go along if you want. Thanks, I will. My company figures sabotage. Any chance they're wrong? Could it have been accidental? Equipment failure, personnel failure, something like that? Well, if I thought so, I'd be up there at the wreck myself. That'd be my kind of job. But this one's different. You know, it's detective work, your kind of job. And Gino Romero's. Now, he talks as soft as a girl out of finishing school. Looks a little like one, in fact. But underneath it, he's as sharp as a tack and tougher than an old boot full of nails. What actually happened when the plane went down? All I've heard is that it blew up in midair. That's right. Well, a few Indians were on the only ones who saw it. They were burning charcoal up on a slope at about 9,000 feet. They were watching the plane circle, gaining altitude. Then one big flash, the tail blew off. Pilot didn't have a chance. He rode it straight into the side of the mountain. The tail? That sounds like the baggage compartment. That's the way I figure it. An explosive of some kind. A time bomb smuggled on board before the takeoff. I'm covering that angle from this end. I'm rounding up every one of the baggage gang, the maintenance crew, anybody who had a chance to get near that plane before it left the field out there. And what have you found out? Well, so far, nothing. We're trying to check back, too, on the individual passengers, the plane crew, trying to find out... Who might benefit by having any one of them dead? Well, I guess that'll be your angle, too. Yeah. Yeah, at least as far as insurance is concerned. Well, there were three flight policies issued, and the names are in the reports here. Somewhere. Yeah, I know. I've got them. The home office gave them to me, along with the names of the beneficiaries. I haven't talked to any of them yet. I figured that you know how to go about it better than I would. Now, there's another possible insurance angle, and that's the cargo. Do you know if there was anything valuable on board? Worth destroying for the insurance, you mean... No, it was done by somebody who had deliberately set out to kill one of the ten people on board that plane. And who didn't mind killing nine others to get that one? It was premeditated, cold-blooded. Now, you get him, Johnny. Get him for me, and then just leave me alone with him for about... Uh... Come in. One of you is Senor McLean, Inspector General de Departamento... De yes, that, that's me. What can I do for you, Jack? They will not give to me any information, Senor McLean. Not the police, nor the airline office, nor oh, anything. Who are you? And what information do you want? I am Ramon de Lagos, Senor, and I am here... De Lagos? Wait a minute. That's the name of one of the... Yes. Guys. Look, uh, are you related to Maria de Lagos? My wife. She was on the plane. Now tell me, please, what news do you have? Have you reached the scene of the crash? Yes, we have. Two hours ago. And what did you... Is there any chance... I'm sorry, there were no survivors. No. Oh, no. Hey, I'm sorry, Senor de Lagos. It is too terrible. I, I didn't know you were here in the city, or I'd have, I'd have let you know right away. I sent word to your office in Havana. I, I have been here for six weeks. Maria came for a visit only a few days ago. No. I know, that's, that's a rough deal. 
I, I am sorry. Oh, uh, uh, this is Johnny Dollar from the States. Senor. Later, sir. He's here to investigate the cause of this thing. What is the use, senor? It will not return life to the dead. No, but I don't like to see a murderer get away with it. A murderer? Then the rumors are true. The plane was destroyed deliberately. It is hard to believe that anyone would... Senor McLean, what arrangements are being made? The, uh, the bodies will be brought down to the Federal District Hospital. And I'll see that you're notified. Gracias, senor. No, no, let's see. I, I believe your wife's brother, Don Serrano, is staying at the Hotel Reyes. Yes, he is. But I am at the Monte Cassino. Don Serrano and I are not friendly. I see. All right, senor, then I'll contact you at the Monte Cassino as soon as I have word. You are very kind. And again, I'm... Well, I, I'm sorry. I... Yes, that is all one can say. Adios, senores. Know anything about a Mac? Well, only what his wife filled out on the flight form. He's Cuban. Residence and business address, Havana. In the export game. And you know, of course, that his wife was one of the three people who took out accident policies. But naming her brother, Don Serrano, as beneficiary. I wonder why. Well, that's one of the six dozen questions you can ask when you start prowling. Look, I hate to rush you, Johnny, but I ought to start that jeep up the mountain. I'm ready any time. i let Gino know you're coming. And you check with me if you want anything. You'll have full cooperation from the federal police and the government. And to repeat just one thing, Johnny. Yeah, I know. Whoever did it, get him. Check. The jeep driver was a young Mexican boy who'd been brought up in the best and wildest chauffeuring traditions of the capital. He knew only one way to drive, with both accelerator and horn wide open. Since most of the other drivers were playing the same game, it was a sheer miracle that we ever got through the narrow streets of the city and finally reached the open valley. Maybe the colored postcard pasted on the dashboard, a picture of the Virgin of Guadalupe, had something to do with it. We finally left the last cart road and bumped along a narrow woodcutter's trail, cleared and widened enough now so that we could drive into the crash area and miss the mile-and-a-half walk the first rescue party had been forced to take. For some reason, only a small part of the wreckage had caught fire and burned, and the rest was strewn piecemeal along a great raw gash through the trees and brush. Men in uniforms of the Mexican army searched through the tragic debris, lifting, sorting, and collecting. And nearby, a silent group of Indians were watching with the age-old sadness in their eyes. Uh, you are uh, Senor Dollar, no? Yes. Uh, Gino Romero, Senor. Oh, glad to know you, Gino. It's a terrible thing, no? Yeah. Any ideas yet? Uh, not of importance, but it's certain now this. It was caused by one explosion which has occurred in the baggage compartimento. Uh, venga, uh, Come on. We have found many pieces which can be identified, uh, can be known which part of the plane they are in before the crash. I see. Uh, toward the front, these pieces are more large, but in the back, near the tail, they are very little. Oh, here, uh, you look. These are pieces of the baggage, uh, muy pequeño, hmm? uh, very tiny. Oh, yeah, the crash itself wouldn't have done this. It had to be an explosion. Seguro. Uh, look. Is burnt a little, each one of these pieces, but these more big ones from the seats of the plane, they are not burnt. Here, uh, you smell these ones. Hmm. Yeah, I see what you mean. Either dynamite or nitroglycerin. Or well, dynamite. We have found little tiny pieces of red paper from the wrappings on the sticks. Or well, dynamite. Any idea how much, how big a charge? One of the soldados, uh, Pascual who have used most explosive is, think, maybe 30 or 40 pounds. Light enough to be put on board in a piece of luggage. It's going to be tough, Gino. Plenty tough to... They're bringing out the bodies. The Indians set up a low, wailing dirge, and one of them taps softly on a native drum. A wordless terror before the ancient mystery, death. One by one, the bodies passed us, borne by the silent soldiers. Madre de Dios... Peace. Then, for the first time, I noticed the girl standing alone some distance away, watching without expression as the stretches passed her. She was young, blonde, and beautiful. Not conventionally so, but beautiful as a young animal is beautiful. And she looked very much out of place. 
You are observing the señorita, no? What's she doing up here? Quién sabe. She's strange, that one. Always she's look for danger. She's what you say, um, the, the daredevil. But it's like she always has the charm. Death has never find her. So perhaps she has come here to look on his face. Do you know who she is? Well, see, she's American. Her name is Marvel Terrence. Marvel Terrence? You have heard of her, senor? I'd heard of her, all right. And I'd wondered what kind of a girl would have a first name like Marvel. And now I knew, partly at least. And I planned to find out a whole lot more. Three of the people who died on that plane had taken out flight policies. Maria de Lagos was one of them. The other two were men, both of whom had named as beneficiary Marvel Terrence. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a fighting girl and a lucky break. And then murder cancels the score. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar here. Go ahead. McMacklin, Johnny. Is Gino around? Yeah, he's over across the slope at the moment. They're getting the bodies out of what's left of the plane. Well, how does it look? Anything new? Nothing we hadn't already guessed. It was an explosion, all right. Dynamite in the baggage compartment. Probably put on board in a piece of luggage. Well, that figures. I've run into something down here in the city along those same lines. What do you mean? The ground crew remembers one of the baggage handlers acting strange before Flight 6 took off last night. A man named Ramirez. What do you mean, strange? Uh, They say he had one suitcase that he wouldn't let any of the other handlers touch. Put it on the plane himself just before takeoff. Hmm. Hey, you know anything about tigers, Mac? Tigers? I'm about to tangle with one. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. I was taking Gino Romero's word for it that the girl was a tiger. His word and my own instincts. 
At first glance, she seemed soft, shy, and lovely. Then you sensed a wildness about her, a kind of suppressed violence that brought you up short and made you stop and reappraise her. She leaned against a tree, watching the bodies of the plane crash victims being carried down the slope and placed in the army jeep, with no sign of emotion on her face. Cool, detached. She had no reason to be here, and I wondered why she was. The only way I knew of finding out was to ask her. Yes, what is it? You're Marvel Terrence, I believe. That's right, and I've not met you somewhere before. No, but you're about to. My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm an investigator for an insurance company up in the States. I'm sure it must be very interesting work. Sometimes, on some jobs. Other times, it's only dirty and disgusting. Like this time, for instance. Well, we all have our problems. Maybe I can help you with yours, Miss Terrence. Run along, will you? I'm not in the mood. Oh, you amaze me. I think that seeing ten bodies picked up and hauled away ought to put anyone in a gay, carefree mood. Look, beat it. You came out here sightseeing, didn't you, 20 miles from town? So you must like this kind of thing. I had friends on that plane, Mr. Dollar. So did a lot of other people. But maybe not as good friends as you had. I don't know what you're talking about, and I don't care. E.H. Palmer and Jim Rourke. Were those your friends, Miss Terrence? Now, let's get this straight. I'm not interested in playing footsies or any other game you have in mind. You're wasting your time, Buster. Now, get going. Oh, well, wait a minute. Maybe you've got the wrong idea. This isn't just a social chat. No, you want to help me with my problem. Just one problem. I'm wondering how you're going to spend that $50,000. What? Yeah, that's a fair-sized chunk of money to drop right out of the sky. What are you talking about? What $50,000? The money you'll get from the deaths of your two friends, Palmer and Rourke. What do you mean? Say, tell me, were you with them at the airport last night when Flight 6 took off? Yes, I was. Then you must have known that they both took out flight policies and that both of them named you as beneficiary. No. No, I didn't know. I... I wasn't with them, exactly. At least, not up until takeoff. Then you claim this is all just a big surprise. Of course, I didn't know a thing about it. But it's just like them. It's what they do. Why did you come out here to the wreck, Miss Terrence? I don't know. Ed and Jim were my friends, and I... I don't know why I came, Mr. Dollar. She came because I brought her, mister. Hmm? No, Bill. But I didn't bring her here to be pushed around by some morbid curiosity, huh? No, please. This is Johnny Dollar, Bill. He's an insurance investigator. Bill Blakely, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hello. He was asking me some questions. Why you? Because Ed and Jim both took out insurance policies in my name. What? Flight accident policies, $50,000 worth. Well, I'll Mr. Be... Blakely, you said Miss Terrence is here because you brought her. I wonder if you'd tell me why you're here. I don't know that it's any of your business. Sometimes I make things my business. Then sometime you may get your teeth knocked out. They're in pretty solid, Blakely. Yeah? Well, maybe... Bill, stop it. Sorry, Marvel. Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke were Bill's business partners. What business, Mr. Blakely? Engineering. We're building some roads around Mexico City. How many partners? Just the three of you? Yes, just... That's right, Dollar. The business belongs to me now. What about it? Nothing about it. Congratulations. One more crack Bill, like I that. Bill, I said I've... stop it. Let's go, Marvel. I've got to get back to town. Wait for me at the truck. I'll be there in a few minutes. All right. Sit yourself. Dollar, just one thing. Don't push me. Blakely, ten people died over there on that hillside last night. They were murdered. I intend to find out who did it. And if it takes pushing to find out, then I'll push. See you around. Yeah. You probably will. This thing hit Bill pretty hard, Mr. Dollar. You have to make allowances. How long have you known him? A couple of months. And Palmer and Rourke? The same. Nothing serious, nothing romantic, if that's what you're thinking. It was all just for fun. Was that all it was on their side? Oh, men always claim to be serious. But that's only part of the game. What else do you do, Miss Terrence, besides play the game? That's all. I'm a wealthy orphan, Mr. Dollar, and my only career is drifting around the world playing the game. I'm ornamental, irresponsible, and rather useless. Maybe not entirely useless. Just being ornamental has some importance in this world. So you play too, huh? I meant it. I guess I was pretty obnoxious when you spoke to me a while ago. Well, I suppose I asked for it. I'm staying at the Hotel Monte Cassino. Are you? I'd like to see you again. I could teach you the game, Johnny. 
Well, that's a very attractive offer. Outside of business hours. But you think I'm mixed up in this? No, I'm not sure. Well, think about it, Johnny. And call me at my hotel. The Monte Casino. That's where DeLagos is staying. Happen to know him? Ramon? Well, yes, of course. Why? Well, one of the passengers killed on that plane was his wife. Didn't you know? I saw the name DeLagos, but I... I didn't even know he had a wife. Another? Just for fun? I think you've got some wrong ideas about me, Johnny. Come see me and I'll straighten them out for you. All right. I will. And something else. You'll find it out anyway, so I may as well tell you. Tell me what? I had reservations on Flight 6, too. I was going over to Havana for the weekend. I canceled out at the last minute. I see. Maybe that's why I came out here. To see for myself. I'm not afraid of death. I've tempted it too many times to be. But it does fascinate me. I stood there watching and thinking. It could have been me being carried down that slope. Except for luck. Why did you cancel out at the last minute? I was talked out of making the trip. By whom? Bill Blakely. I watched her swing down the slope, lithe, erect, and lovely. A strange girl with an air of aloneness about her. An air that I felt would be with her even in the crowd. Strange, but also compelling. Exciting. She might be involved or she might not. I didn't know. But I was sure of one thing. In either case, I was going to see her again. An hour later, Gino Romero and I were heading back toward the city in the government jeep, leaving behind us the wrecked plain, the crushed trees, and the lonely slope on the mountain. You have found the young lady of interest, senor? Yeah, I found her of interest. <laughs> Always she's doing the crazy things. Daredevil, flirting with the eyes, looking for danger. Playing the game, she calls it. Si, senor, playing the game. Que lastima. It is too sad that ten persons are not be playing the game now anymore. Oh, it's all right, Gino. I'm not that much under a spell. Que dice? If she's guilty in any way, I'll pin it on her just as quick as the next one. Oh, but I did not. All right, mean forget that... it. No, I do not think she's guilty. It is not a thing she will do, and she does not need the money. She's very rich. Do you know that? Everybody says so. Well, that's what I mean. It's worth checking into. It's possible, but. I still do not think she would do such a thing. It is too terrible. And she's too beautiful. <laughs> Maybe I ought to give you the advice, Gino. Before the beauty of a woman, senor, we are all as brothers, like senor Bla uh, Blakely. I see he will look very disturbed. Yeah, he did get a little hot under the collar. What do you know about him, Gino? Almost nothing. He's come here for three months now, making the road. And his partners, Palmer and Rourke, were killed in the plane crash. What do you know about them? The same. Nothing. They all arrive together, always. They work together, play together. Then along came Marvel Terrence. True. They were all rivals for the senorita. And there is one thing. What's that? They have the building for the machinery outside the city, the warehouse, you call it. What about it? In this warehouse, they keep much dynamite. Gino dropped me in my hotel, the Del Prado, on Avenida Juarez. I changed clothes, cleaned up, sent some telegrams to the States. At about that time, Mac Macklin phoned up from downstairs and asked me to join him in the bar. Expense account item three, $16.40. Drinks and dinner with the chief inspector of the Federal Department of Civil Air Transport. And then some more drinks. I've been here seven years, Johnny. I like it. I feel at home here. I like the people and their way of life. But it'd still be good to see you all shy again. The snow piling up along the loop. And the wind ripping in off the lake. The crazy little joints along Baker Street. When were you there last, Mac? 1932. Oh, then you're about due. Well, why don't you take a couple of weeks and fly up there? No, no. Too much water under the bridge, Johnny. Too many little wars here and there in the world since 32. And two of them, McMacklin, was flying in them. On one side or the other. Oh, what of it? 
Well, you know, Uncle Sam frowns on that kind of thing, Johnny, so we, we've got a sort of an understanding. I stay the heck away, and he forgets about me. I see. <laughs> I've got no complaints, actually. I'm I, I'm doing all right here, but, but sometimes I sure do get homesick for the old town. Of course, it's probably changed so much that I... Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, con permiso de telephone, uh, Senor Macri. Oh, thanks. I uh, plug it in. Hello, yeah? What? All right. Well, have you told the federal police? Yeah, I'll be here for a while. Adios. Well, we just lost our best angle, Johnny. What do you mean? That baggage handler, the one I figured slipped the dynamite on board the plane. The boys just now located him. His throat has been cut. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a bereaved relative lies, a frustrated lover comes up fighting, and a lovely lady in the case just vanishes. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Don Serrano de Almeida y Pico. Oh? We have not met, Senor Dollar. No, or I'd have been sure to remember the name, Don Serrano. Oh, wait a minute. You're Maria Delago's brother. That is correct. I was planning to call on you this morning, Don Serrano. Well, that will not be necessary, Senor. Since I am taking the liberty of calling on you, I am downstairs in your hotel at this moment. Oh, I see. I believe I may be able to cast some light on the unfortunate tragedy which overtook my poor sister and the other passengers of that ill-fated airplane. Do you know something that hasn't come out? Rather a great deal, senor. I know the crash which resulted in the deaths of ten innocent people was the evil work of a diabolical maniac. Yes, well... A product of the warped mind of a scheming, worthless, unspeakable dog, a sneaking, money-hungry snake, a scurrilous, unprincipled... Don Serrano! Si, senor. Come on up. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the flight six matter. Expense account continued. Item five, $3.90, room service. Breakfast for myself and a pot of coffee for my visitor. Don Serrano de Almeido y Pico, I think. He was a thin, straight man with a small goatee and the face of a hawk. Stiff, formal, unbending. A classy grande type from an old school long out of business. And a man of much suppressed violence and hate. Once upon a time, senor, there existed a gentleman's code for the settlement of such matters as this. The duelo, as it was called. 
But we are living now in lesser and more decadent times. A man is no longer permitted to kill his enemies. He must suffer interference by the police, the Civil Air Transport Department, the government. And even special investigators from the States, huh? Is that what you mean? I was not speaking personally, Senor Dollar. You are as much a victim of the times as I am. Well, it doesn't seem to be irritating me as much. More coffee, Don Serrano? Uh, gracias, no. Perhaps it is because uh, you have not lost your dearly beloved sister, senor. Oh, maybe. In that, at least, you have my sympathy. But let's get to the point. You've done quite a lot of talking about wanting to kill somebody, but I'm still not too sure who or why or what. It is very simple, senor. Not to me. Suppose we start at the beginning. As you like. But who can ever say what is the beginning of anything? All right, then let's be arbitrary about it. Let's start three weeks ago when your sister Maria came here from Havana to join her husband, Ramon de Lagos. I believe you said Ramon had been here for a month at that time on uh, some kind of a business deal. A business deal? <laughs> Do I look like a fool, senor? Oh, now, let's stick to the point. Women. That is his business, senor. Women with money. Then a week ago, Maria wired you, said she was terribly unhappy, and asked you to come at once. And when you got here, she told you what was the matter. She said Ramon was carrying on with an American girl named Marvel Terrence. A Jezebel, senor. So you took over. You got Maria an airline reservation back to Havana on Flight 6, the one that crashed, and told her you'd handle Ramon. Oh, she was putty in his hands. He lied to her every day since they were married. And she always ended up by believing him. I told her in the beginning he was interested only in her wealth. Which amounts to how much? Oh, much. Even after Ramon's foolish dissipation over the last few years. What happens to her estate now? Half of it she was permitted to dispose of as she wished. She made a will some time ago in favor of Ramon. Against my advice, I may say. What about the other half? Now that reverts to me, senor. Oh? It is a matter of family tradition. Who managed your sister's estate before Ramon came into the picture? I did, senor. And quite profitably. I did not waste my energies on the illicit follies and ludicrous intrigue. All right, all right. Night before last, then, you took Maria to the airport and saw her off on the plane. See, si. What was she planning to do when she got back to Havana? Was she going to divorce Ramon? My sister was a very pious woman. May she rest in peace. A religion would never permit such an act. I see. And, of course, there was the matter of family tradition. Oh, naturally. Did Ramon go to the airport with you? I had not seen Ramon since the night before, nor had Maria. We had uh, quarreled violently over his disgraceful conduct. Did Ramon know that his wife was taking Flight 6? I informed him the night before. Did you or Maria see him at the airport? Oh, no, senor. He was much too clever. He managed to keep out of sight. Then how can you be sure he was there? Senor Dollar, who else would be so vile as to place an explosive on board the plane... Oh, well, now I can follow your reasoning, but... The matter is self-evident. Well, look, I'm afraid we need more than self-evidence, Don Serrano. Uh, the problem of evidence is your responsibility, senor. I have told you who committed the deed. No, you've told me who you suspect. Do you doubt my word? Not as far as it goes. Sure you won't have some more coffee? No, gracias. Do you happen to know this girl, Marvel Terrence? Uh, by sight, I mean. She has been pointed out to me. Mm-hmm. Did you see her at the airport? See, si, I did. I was under the impression she was going to leave on the plane, but after it departed, she was still in the terminal. Did you notice her talking to anyone before the takeoff? Yes, to some American, I believe. Red hair, stocky build, about uh, 35? See, si, he would fit that description. Blakely. Did you see her talking to anyone else, uh, any of the baggage handlers or the ground crew? I'm afraid I did not notice. Is it important? It could be. Well, uh, thanks for your information, Don Serrano. My only concern is to see justice done. I'm sure it will be. And now suppose we take a look at what you didn't tell me. Senor? The fact that Maria took out a flight accident policy for $25,000 and named you as her beneficiary. Well, I considered it a, a mere whim of my sister's. But the way things turned out, it was a pretty valuable whim, wasn't it, Don Serrano? For you, I mean. Senor, are you implying... I'm implying that Ramon wasn't the only one with a motive. Wasn't the only one who'll profit by Maria's death. You'll do pretty well yourself. Half her estate and $25,000 cash, that's not a bad deal. 
I should kill you for such an insult. You'd like to, wouldn't you? You're very big on this killing business. That's how you planned to handle things with Ramon, wasn't it? As soon as Maria went back to Havana. It is only what he deserves. And now you're trying to use me to do it. That's why you came here. You don't care about justice. All you want to do is get Ramon. He is guilty. If he is, Don Serrano, I'll find it out and I'll pin it on him. But if he isn't, I'm not going to be pushed into framing him. So you can take these dirty, underhanded insinuations of yours and you can... Get out, Don Serrano. Expense account item six, $12.60. Taxi fares in and around Mexico City. I checked with the federal police first. They had their best men working on the murder of the baggage handler at the airport. And so far, they'd turned up nothing. They didn't have a single lead. I went through their files on the other seven people who died on the plane. Nothing. The two pilots and the stewardess were Cuban and apparently had no close friends or enemies in Mexico City. Two of the passengers were Brazilians and were only traveling through en route from the States. And as far as the other two were concerned, there seemed to be no motive. So it came right back again to the three I was already working on. Maria Delagos and the two business partners, Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke. The three people who'd bought flight insurance policies. And that left me with four possible suspects. Ramon Delagos, Maria's husband, Don Serrano, her brother, Marvel Terrence, and Bill Blakely, the partner of Palmer and Rourke. I checked with Inspector Mocklin, but he'd made no progress. With Gina Romero, no progress. I tried to reach Blakely, but he hadn't shown up at his office. I phoned Marvel Terrence and got a reluctant agreement from her to meet me for lunch. I waited for her at the Vendome for an hour. She didn't show up. Finally, at one o'clock, I went to her hotel. What can I do for you? I'd like to see Miss Marvel Terrence. I wonder if you... Ah, Miss Terrence. Que senorita tan bonita, tan hermosa. Yeah, well, if you'll... She's the most beautiful woman who has ever stayed at this hotel. Yeah, she's pretty gorgeous, all right. Would you mind Sometimes I think everybody in the world is in love with this senorita. All day long, it is one man after another which call up to talk to Miss Terrence. Well, would you ring her and tell her I'm waiting? Two times so many calls we get on the switchboard while the senorita is living. That's very interesting. And now would you You must forgive me, amigo. When I think of Miss Terrence, I lose all sense in my head. All right, all right. You're forgiven. Now, if you... What is it you wish, senor? Will you ring Miss Terrence and tell her I'm waiting down here in the lobby? Immediately, senor. Your name, please? Johnny Dollar. Johnny... Leo El... Leo... How do you spell it, please? D-O-L-L-A-R. L-A-R. Gracias. I will tell her at once that you... Sacre nombre. I had forgot. Forgot what? She's not here no more, senor. What? She has checked out of hotel at 11 o'clock this morning. Expense account item 7, $2.10. Lunch at the Monte Casino Hotel, alone. I was sorry she'd skipped... I guess I was secretly hoping Marvel would turn out to be in the clear. But if she were, then why run out? It didn't add up. I paid my check and started to leave the dining room. And at the entrance, I ran square into a man I was planning to see later in the day. He didn't seem very happy about it. Senor Dollar. How are you, Ramon? It is a pleasure to see you again, senor. And I'd now, like to talk to you a couple me. of minutes. Come on, uh, let's step into the bar. But I have a most important engagement, senor. Oh, this is important, too. I understand you're a friend of Marvel Terrence's. Percy, it is my honor and pleasure. Well, she's checked out of the hotel here. Do you know where she went? Oh, senor, I do not discuss the private affairs of my friends. Oh, knock it off, Ramon. This isn't a tea party. Ten people have been murdered by an explosion aboard a plane. One of them was your wife, remember? I cannot help you. I know nothing of Miss Terrence's plans. And now, I talked you to your excuse... brother-in-law this morning, Ramon, Don Serrano. He tells me you're the one who put the explosive on board the what? plane. It is a lie. He seemed pretty certain of it. He tells me you stand to inherit half of your wife's estate. Then he is better informed as to the details of the matter than I am. I do not know what happens to the estate, senor. He seems to think you wanted to get your wife out of the way in order to have a free hand with Miss Terrence. Don Serrano, as you may have noticed, is a bigoted and jealous old fool who thinks only of money. He knows better than that. What do you mean? Maria was different from the women of your country, senor. She understood such matters as my friendship with Miss Terrence. And accepted them? Except such times as Don Serrano goaded her into being foolish, yes. It is a difference of the Latin temperament, senor. I see. Then there was no trouble between you and Maria. None of importance. The trouble was Don Serrano. He has hated me from the day of our marriage, because from that moment on he no longer had any control over Maria's fortune. 
If you wish to discuss this further, senor, I will be happy to do so later, but I must leave now. Con su permiso. I watched him hurry out of the hotel. I had no real reason to stop him and no authority to. On sudden impulse, I crossed the lobby to the public phones, called the Hotel Regis, and asked for Don Serrano de Almeida y Pico. Don Serrano had checked out. No forwarding address. I called the Del Prado and asked for Bill Blakely. Mr. Blakely had checked out. No forwarding address. I left the phone booth and hurried back to the desk. The clerk was very sorry. Ramon DeLagos had checked out earlier in the day. No forwarding address. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... A rendezvous in a tropic port. And a lot of things come together. Things like romance, desire, and death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Inspector Monklin's office. Gino Romero. Oh, Gino. What did you find out? Did you locate any of them? Beneficiaries of the crash of Flight 6? Si, senor. It was an affair most simple. A matter of making a telephone call to the airport. Then they've left Mexico City. Si, senor. The senorita Marvel Terrence has taken the 10 o'clock plane this morning to Acapulco. Oh. Senor Blakely has taken the 11.30 plane to Acapulco. Senor Ramon de Lagos has taken the 2 o'clock... Plane to Acapulco. And what about Don Serrano? Oh, with him, he's different. At 2.45, he's departed from Mexico City in a special charter plane. Look, Gino, is there another flight to Acapulco this afternoon? But, of course, at 4.30. Already, I have two reservations. Good. I'll meet you at the airport. What's the flight number? Gino! I'm uh, scared to think of it. This one is also called Flight 6. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. Item 9, $63.45. Incidentals in Mexico City and plane fare to Acapulco. One more of the sharp contrasts of Mexico. We left the stiff formality of the city behind us, the cool, thin air of the high plateau... And 50 minutes later, we stepped off the plane and into the steaming heat of the tropics. Barefoot tourists in shorts and barefoot natives in white cotton dungarees. Soft brown skins and flashing teeth. Mangoes, papayas, and the heady scent of tropical flowers. Blue sky, blue Pacific, and a burning sun. And a bay so bright and beautiful it breaks your heart. Acapulco. Acapulco. 
Gina Romero of the Department of Civil Air Transport knew his way around. So I waited for him while he checked his contacts, airport police, custom agents, limousine drivers. And in a few minutes, he'd made his rounds and rejoined me in front of the terminal. It is an affair more simple, senor. A merely matter of ask the question and listen to the answer. What did you find out, Gino? The senorita Miss Turns is there at the Hotel Los Flamingos. So? Senor Blakely is also stay there. Ramon de Lagos is go to the Hotel Caleta. And Don Serrano is stay at the Club de Pesca. So you see? Yeah, I see. All right, Gino, let's get going. And where we are going is to the... Uh... We'll put up at the Los Flamingos. That is what I'm expect. Oh, she's very beautiful, senor. True, but there are even better reasons for staying there. Que dice? Well, in some way, I mean, I'm not sure how. I think this whole thing centers right around Marvel Terrence. You think it's possible she's guilty of the crash of the flight six to collect the insurance? Maybe. Or she might have been used. Or maybe... Oh, I don't know, Gino. But it's about time we found out. <laughs> Expense account, item 10, a dollar and fifty cents. Limousine fare from the airport to the hotel. The Flamingos is built on a point near the far end of the peninsula, set on a headland high above the white smother of surf below. And there, just before dusk, with the western sky, a yellow blaze of glory beyond the far rim of the Pacific, I found her. She was sitting on the open terrace by the edge of the cliff. And once again, she was alone. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. I suppose I should be surprised, but I'm not, really. I guess I rather expected you. Well, then wasn't it a waste of time to run away from Mexico City? I've always run away, I guess. And most of the time, I imagine you've been followed. Or maybe I wanted to face you here, where it's so beautiful. Where perhaps you'd be able to understand me a little better. Is that what you want, Marble? To be understood? Doesn't every woman? I thought it was more often the man. And usually it's his wife who doesn't understand him, isn't it? I see this isn't going to be just a social chat. <laughs> Oh, I doubt if it could ever be just a social chat. Not with you. Now, you've got too much impact for that. A compliment? That's no, a fact. There's no place else in the world with sunsets like the ones here. Every evening. It's like there's another land way off there in the west. A strange, bright, golden land. And it keeps calling, coaxing. Only in a little while, it'll disappear. And everything will be dark off there in the West. Maybe you do understand me, Johnny. Maybe that's why I'm half afraid of you. <laughs> Another reason I ran, maybe. I can be a fool, easy. Sort of hereditary defect, you might say. Oh, that's a common affliction. Rarely fatal. Rarely doesn't help. Once is enough. You know something... When I die, I want to be buried up there in the middle of a sunset. It'd be kind of lonely, wouldn't it? I think I've always been lonely. Do you know I haven't a single living relative in the world, not one? I was 14 when my parents were killed in an auto accident. I stayed in a boarding school, and the bank handled the estate. When I was 21, they turned it over to me. And since then, I've... I guess that's not what you want to know, though, is it? Not exactly... Want to tell me about it, Marvel? No. As a matter of fact, I don't. I don't even want to think about it. It would be better if you would. For whom? For me? I doubt it. I feel dirty, Johnny. Telling wouldn't change that. It might. Anything I'd tell you would be only suspicion, not fact. What in? Unless, of course, you're expecting a confession. Do you have one to make? No. But you know who caused Flight 6 to blow up and why, don't you? No. I can make a guess, that's all. Like to tell me that guess? You'll find out soon enough, Johnny, and I'd rather it didn't come from me. Eleven people have died, Marvel. I know. Ten on the plane that crashed and the baggage handler who was murdered later and You whoever... don't have to remind me of it. I couldn't forget it if I wanted to. I told you how I felt and I'll drop it, Johnny. All right, all right. I didn't know. That's all I can claim. I just didn't know. What do you mean? Nothing. Look. It's dark out there now. And sunset's gone. There's always another one. I wonder. 
Have you ever met Don Serrano, brother-in-law of Ramon de Lagos? No, but he was pointed out to me. Did you see him at the airport the night Flight 6 was blown up? I don't remember. I don't think so. Did you see Ramon? No. Did he know you'd canceled your reservation that night? He didn't even know I had one. Have Ramon and Bill Blakely ever met? Yes, they met. And detested each other on sight. Well, that's understandable in view of the circumstances. Oh, I guess, but... Why are people like they are? Did you arrange for Blakely to follow you here? I didn't tell anybody I was coming. And he was a good guesser. So was Ramon and Don Serrano. I know. They're all here. Why? They don't even know me. They don't want to know me. Not in any real way. But they're here. Oh, yeah, they're here. And I think you ought to tell me what you know, Marvel. Tomorrow, maybe. Not tonight. Let me have just one night, Johnny. All right. Take me to dinner. Dance with me. Laugh with me. Give me just one evening. Will you, Johnny? Sure. And thank my lucky star for the chance. You're sweet. I'm saying it now, without any strings. No matter how things work out, I'll still mean it. You're a sweet guy, Johnny. Give me time to change. I went to my room and made two phone calls while I waited for her. The operator at the club, De Pesca, informed me that Don Serrano was not in. The clerk at the hotel, Caleta, said the same thing about Ramon de Lagos. I didn't leave my name with either of them. Bill Blakely was staying in room 23, a few doors on down the terrace, so I decided to go have a talk with him before I went out to dinner with Marvel Terrence. But as it happened, I didn't have to go to that much trouble. Yeah, who is it? Blakely, I'd like to talk to you. Come on in. Do you always cover your visitors with a gun? Only when I spot them listening outside my door. I don't know. I what saw you're... your shadow against the shutter there. You've been standing outside for the last five minutes, Blakely. You listened to me make a couple of phone calls. Did you learn anything you wanted to know? Dollar, suppose you were suspected of sabotaging an airliner and killing ten people. Wouldn't you want to know what kind of a case was being built up against you? What makes you think you're under suspicion, Blakely? I know I am. Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke were my partners. When they died on that plane, I became sole owner of the firm. There's the motive. I've got a warehouse full of dynamite in Mexico City. There's the method. I can go even farther than that. What do you mean? You mentioned one motive. Why didn't you mention the other one? What other one? Marvel Terrence. That crash not only eliminated a pair of business partners, it wiped out a couple of rivals. <laughs> Just one thing wrong with that dollar. Marvel had a reservation on that plane herself. She only decided at the last minute not to go. I wouldn't have been gaining much if I'd killed her along with my rivals, as you call them. Uh-huh. Maybe that's why you cornered her at the airport and argued her out of going. Yes, I... I did talk her out of the trip. But not because I'd planted an explosive on board. How do you feel about her, Blakely? I'd give my left arm. It wouldn't do any good. I'm just not the guy. I never have been and never will be. Maybe you are. She says she's having dinner with you tonight. That's right. She is. How do you feel about her, Dollar? I don't know. Expense account item 11, $26.40. Taxis, dinner, drinks, and dancing for two. The Copacabana with its blue lights and the surf right at your feet and a million stars low enough to touch the warm water of the bay lapping softly at the pilings. The Las Americas, the Casablanca, music, champagne, and the tropic night. And then finally, much later. Good night, Johnny, and thank you. Tonight, for the first time I can remember, I wasn't alone. And then, only an hour afterward, I was wakened out of a sound sleep. Daddy! Senor Dollar. Right with you, Gino. What was it? It's a senorita, I think. She's a number eight. Come on. But she wasn't a number eight. Her door was standing open and the room was empty. We searched the terrace out toward the edge of the cliff where I talked with her at sunset. We saw the broken section of railing and found one of her slippers and a pack of her cigarettes lying nearby. In pitch darkness, we slid and scrambled down the steep path to the beach. And there by the edge of the surf, we found her. 
The warm foam reached out for her, as though to carry her away to that last sunset she'd loved so much. She looked very beautiful, but very much alone. As alone and as lonely as death. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a desperate killer is cornered and strikes back in a deadly counterattack. Final showdown. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Here is your call to Mexico City, senor. Oh, thanks. Hello? Macklin, Department of Civil Air Transport. Hi, Mac. Dollar, what have you learned in Acapulco? Uh, Not very much, I'm afraid. But you said you were following the girl down there. Marvel Terrence. Yeah, and a few others who might have had a hand in the explosion aboard Flight 6. Beneficiaries of the insured on that flight. What others? Ramon Delagos, whose wife died in the crash. Don Serrano, her brother. Bill Blakely, whose business partners were aboard. Well, have you and Gino learned anything from them? From the girl? Not yet. But you said she might know who caused that explosion aboard the plane. Right, and she promised to talk. Well? Your little helper, Gino, and I just pulled her body out of the surf down below the hotel here. Johnny. Murder? Yeah. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Acapulco, Mexico, to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account, final page. <laughs> Item 12, $1.80 for the phone call to Mac Macklin in Mexico City. I had to get Mac out of bed to tell him what had happened. That Marvel Terrence had been murdered. That somebody had silenced the girl around whom the whole case had seemed to center since Flight 6 had exploded in midair three nights before and carried the passengers and crew to their deaths. Mac was shocked and offered any additional help I might need. But he had no new information at his end, and it was obvious now that any answers would have to be found right here in Acapulco. As I hung up the phone, Gino Romero came rushing in from the hotel terrace. Senor Dollar. What is it, Gino? A prowler is out on the hotel grounds. The police cars go to block off the road at the bottom of the slope. Good, come on. The stairs are over this way, senor. Right with you. A little light wouldn't hurt anything down here. It's no time. This way, into the brush is a footpath. All right, lead the way. Over there is only 100 feet to the cliff. 
The other side is the road for the hotel. Here is the only place anybody can go. It's down this slope. Yeah, but there are plenty of places to hide. This is in your body. It's a matter... Oh, wait. Huh? Listen. Listen. We could hear someone moving through the jungle growth a few yards away. Moving swiftly but cautiously. Then a sudden silence. Whoever it was, it also stopped and was listening for Gino and me. We waited for the fugitive to move again, straining our ears, trying to tag the location. Seconds passed. Then a slight rustle ahead of us. Gino nudged me and we slipped quietly toward the sound. Get your hands up. Well, well. Well, it's not your senor daughter. You seem to be quite a night owl, Don Serrano. Not ordinarily, senor. The circumstances which place me in this rather awkward position are not usual ones, I assure you. You were up there prowling around the hotel. Why? I was looking for my unmentionable brother-in-law. Armando Lagos? Why? What made you think he'd be here? I went to his hotel... He was not in his room. I knew he had not been able to see Miss Terrence since she had spent the evening with you. So I assumed he might be waiting for her here, at her hotel. And my assumption has, of course, been proven correct. Did you see him? No, but I heard the police discussing the murder of Miss Terrence. It was obviously Ramon's handiwork. Still after him, huh? My feeling about Ramon is not a secret, senor. Nor his about you. So why did you go to his hotel? To kill him. Why else? Time was running out, so we took Don Serrano back to the hotel to the police. One very important person hadn't put in an appearance. Gina went down to Bill Blakely's room, knocked on the door, then opened it with a passkey and went in. Blakely wasn't there. We searched the room. The bed has been sleeping, senor. Yeah, yeah, I notice. But for how long, that's the question. It's possible he was wake up when the senorita screams before she escaped. He might have been... He must have dressed. His pajamas are there on the floor. I wonder. Quién sabe if it was a quarrel of lovers, the jealousy. He did not like it when the senorita was go with you tonight. I don't think it's that simple, Gino. Let's get this bag open. Have a look inside. Maybe we can. It's not even locked. He seems to have been traveling light. He. There on the top, senor. Yeah, I see. What is it? A box of thirty-eight caliber cartridges spilled open. And that piece of oilcloth. He had a gun packed in here. No, it's gone. He got up, loaded a gun, and left. Took the gun with him. If it was before the scream, that's one thing. But if it was afterward, then... What are you thinking, senor? I think we'd better take the police with us. Get over to the Hotel Caleta and check up on our third suspect. Ramon? But Don Serrano said he is not there. Don Serrano could say anything. I think we'd better get over there, Gino, and do it fast. Clerk said room 34. That's the second door down. Let's see. Let's go. Roman. Roman. Who is it? Johnny Dollar. Open up. Watch yourself, Gino. See. Si. Come on in, Dollar. You're Blakely. Yeah. Better hand over the gun, Blakely. You won't get a chance to use it now. The police are out in the lobby. Okay. All right, thanks. Ramon didn't show up, huh? I wish he had. That's all I was asking, just one clear shot at him. Are you sure he's the one who killed her? Sure enough. Did you see him? No, but he's the one. She was scared of him, Dollar. She told me earlier in the afternoon, before you got down here to Acapulco. Told you what? She said Ramon had followed her here from Mexico City, that he'd been acting strange. She said she was glad I was staying at the same hotel, that she didn't want to see him or talk to him. Yeah, it figures all right. It checks with what she said to me last night. If she'd only given me a little more to go on. She was a real great kid, Dollar. The greatest as far as I was concerned. Yeah. As soon as I realized what had happened, I loaded my gun and came here to wait for him. I figured he'd try to get back to his room. But he didn't show. It's too bad. She was a real great kid. And I'd have died for her if she asked me to. I loved her. She was the... I hear you saw it, idiot. Come on, Gino. Si, senor. Roman had been spotted. He started to enter the hotel, saw the police turned and ran. He was armed with a pistol. 
He'd fired a shot at one of the police officers and then jumped over the balustrade and disappeared into the dark curve of Kaleda Beach. The police cars quickly threw a cordon along the Bayfront Street and blocked off both ends of the stretch of shoreline. For the moment, Roman was trapped somewhere on that beach. He tipped his hand now, and he was desperate and dangerous, and he had a gun. Gino and I went out on the beach after him. There is many place to hide here. Not for long. They'll have some more police here within a few minutes. Come on. It's maybe better we wait here. I do not think Ramon is planned to be taken alive. I can still see that girl, Gino, lying at the foot of the cliff. Si, senora. I remember. I... I swear it. Oh, what is it? There, by the water, is... Oh, no, I am wrong, senor. It's only a boat pulled up on the sand. Yeah, it's a paddle boat. Well, I think it's better maybe we separate, senor. I look in the pavilion, the cabanas. You stay close by the water. In this way, we are have him between us. Good idea, Gino. But you've got the rough end of it. Take care of yourself. Yes, si, Well. Not much cover along the shoreline here. Yes. Do not move, senor. Do not make a sound. Well, Roman. So you were hiding behind that boat. I have nothing to lose now, senor. If you make one move or try to call out, I will kill you. Yeah, I think you would. All right, then, what comes next? This boat. You will push it into the water. But be very careful. If you make any noise, even by accident, I will kill you. Quickly now. Hurry. Relax, Roman. You don't have a chance anyway. We will see. Careful now. Be quiet. Good. Now get in, quickly. Sure. Take the paddle, head out across the bay, and be very quiet, or I will kill you. All right, Ramon. You're just wasting your time. They'll have a police launch out here within ten minutes. I do not think so. They will not know. Quiet! Quiet! One more sound from that paddle and I will shoot. Marvel Terrence. Why did you kill her, Ramon? He made me crazy. So beautiful. And with so very much money. I thought she would be most easy once Maria, my wife, was dead. Then it was you who blew up the airliner in order to kill your wife and have a clear field to go after Marvel. Marvel did not know I was married and Maria was going to tell so her. So you sabotaged a plane and killed her along with ten other innocent people. And what happened tonight? Did Marvel turn you down? He said she was suspicious of me. And she was going to tell you about it in the morning. And she said she was falling in love with you. She, she made me crazy. I wish you had got back into that hotel, Ramon. I wish you'd got there before I did, while Bill Blakely was still waiting for you with a loaded gun in his hand. Be quiet and paddle faster. We must get farther up the coast in order... What is that? Police launch. What did you think? I told you you didn't have a chance. No, they could not get here so soon. Well, I forgot to mention the fact that they'd already phoned for one. And then they do not know yet we are out here. Good. Keep paddling. Quickly. He half turned his head to look back toward the launch. He took a chance and swung the paddle. His shot went wild and he didn't get a second try. I caught him back in the air and he dropped like a log. The police located our boat a few minutes later and hauled him over the gunnel and into the launch. And that should have been the end of it. But none of us realized Ramon's insane desperation. He'd only been pretending unconsciousness. On board the launch, he snatched a gun from one of the officers and tried to take over the boat. He didn't have a chance. He took a full volley of shots from three police pistols square in the chest. Expense account item 13, $312.20. Hotel and incidentals in Acapulco and Mexico City and plane fare back to the States. Expense account total, $608.10. End of expense account, end of report. Remarks? I'll never see another sunset now without thinking of her somewhere out beyond it. I hope she doesn't feel alone anymore. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, a dead girl comes to life in a case that's packed with lies. Yet every one of them comes true. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ben Wright, Edgar Barrier, Don Diamond, Russ Thorson, and Jack Moyles. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And a bullseye of a hundred. One hundred and fifty points. Let's see you do better than that with three dots, Monahan. Go ahead, go ahead, toss them. Fifty. Thirty. On the line, almost a bullseye, but it's only seventy-five. What's seventy-five, Inspector Faraday? Twice your IQ. Who said you could commit a police headquarters, Blanky? Get out of here. Faraday, you've tried to escort me in here yourself a dozen times. What about it? Get out of here now, I'm warning you. One of these dots will go wild. How many points does it count if I catch it between my teeth? What do you want, Blakey? You, which shows how easy I am to satisfy. Okay. Monahan, get lost. We'll go on with our game a little later. I'd better be alone with this guy. Positive guy, that Monahan. What do you want, Blakey? Come on, I'm busy. I've come down here to make you a very happy person, Inspector. Well, leave now, and you got what you came for. Now get away from that target. <clears throat> 30? On the line, Faraday. It's only 10. Ever hear of a guy named Bellows? No. <clears throat> ah, 50. Lucky shot. Sam Bellows, a cripple. I never heard of him. Is that all you came down here for? <clears throat> 75. Ah, that's better. That's awful. I suppose you can do better. Then you? The answer is yes, no matter what you might be referring to. Give me the dot. A three is all you get. Then you get moving, you hear? I think you'd better go down and see the Sam Bellows, Inspector. Oh, you do. Uh, that's nice of you. Why? Because he's dead. <coughs> we'll die. That's a hundred. So he's dead. So what? So he probably died of natural causes. That's true enough. There's nothing unnatural about dying when you've been murdered. <coughs> Bullseye. hundred points more. Fellows has been murdered? How do you know that? Come on, come on, talk. Sure, Inspector. You see, I killed him. <coughs> Bullseye. <coughs> Now back to Richard Calmer's Boston Blackbeard. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friends.
how many more times do I have to tell you, Faraday? I killed the guy. You expect me to fall for a story like that? I'm beginning to see why I have to solve so many cases for you. You won't even believe a confession. All right, Blackie. What's the trick? Faraday, someday you'll be arrested for impersonating a police officer. It's no trick. I tell you, I killed Sam Bellows. Where's the body? Now you're getting smart, Inspector. In an old brownstone house at the corner of West Boulevard and 110th Street. All right. I'll go have a look. You mean we'll go have a look? I'll go have a look. You'll go get lost. You're wanting to go with me as some kind of a gag, and I'm not falling for it. My, how times have changed. You're usually trying to catch me for doing something I didn't do. This time I confess to a murder, and you want to get rid of me. If you don't get out of here, Blanky, I'll arrest you for... I'll think of something. After you found Sam Bellow's body, Inspector, maybe a reason to arrest me will occur to you. <laughs> Mary, that's probably Charlie Kingston. Let him in, will you? Oh, of course, Dad. Sure. Come on, come on, Happy. Hey, hey. I, I thought he's happy, but uh, what is he? Down, Happy, down, down, down. Where did you get your sidekick, Charlie? Oh, look. At a kennel or a stable? Look out, Blackie. Now he's going to jump all over you. Nice boy, nice boy. Down, down, down. Down, down. <laughs> You're going to have my right arm just as soon as I'm through. Down, 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 down. Oh. oh, Charlie, what is that? A dog. If that's a dog, what's a horse? <laughs> I'll admit he's a little large, Blackie, but he's harmless. <laughs> harmless? He tried to devour us before we were even introduced. <laughs> oh, no, 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 Mary. He was just making love to you. Happy is a very strange animal. <laughs> Pays no attention to me or to anyone else he knows well. He only likes strangers. Well, introduce us to him quick before we stampede it. Maybe i better put it in the kitchen. Good idea. Oh, close the hall door, will you, Blackie? Sure. Oh, come on, come on, happy nice boy. Nice boy. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, Charlie. The kitchen door opens out. Will you pull it towards you? Okay. <laughs> I hope you don't mind if happy plays in here, Mary. Of course she doesn't, Charlie. She wants a new kitchen anyway. Go on in. Go on. <laughs> What oh. kind of a dog is that, Charlie, besides big? We'll talk about Happy later. I want to know if you saw Sam Bellows. His house is impossible to break into, and he wouldn't see me in any normal way, so I went to Inspector Faraday and told him I had killed Bellows. What? Blackie. Don't worry, he didn't believe me. He went to investigate, but he wouldn't take me with him, so that idea is wasted. Maybe he went too far. Um, can't we talk about something besides murder just before dinner? I'm sorry, Mary. Oh, well, it's, uh... This is just before dinner, isn't it? Uh, forgive the delay, Mary. You can have anything your heart desires at any restaurant you name. Oh, wonderful. What are we waiting for? Charlie, isn't the girl in love supposed to lose her appetite? Well, that's the way I always heard it. Mary, how you must hate me. Come on, come on, Roland. Haven't you cut through that door yet? Come on, let's hold you up. This is just an acetylene torch, Inspector Faraday, not a 20-millimeter tank gun. And this is a steel door. Yeah. Now I know why Blanky gave me that cock and bull story about killing this guy, Bellows. Why? There's probably no such guy as Bellows. We rang every bell we could find, and nobody answered. And why did Blanky say he killed him? There's something in this house Blanky wants. And he figured he could steal it right under my nose once he got inside. What made him think you'd get him in? He knows I chip my way barehanded through a brick wall to pin something on him. Maybe nobody answers the door, and a corner of everybody inside is dead. Maybe Blackie wasn't lying. All right, that'll be enough out of you, Roland. Get busy with that blowtorch. I want to. There she is, Inspector. Now we can walk in. Whew. Door hasn't been open for a while. Well, somebody lives here, all right. There's a light at the end of the hall. Spooky, John. Ah, oh, you've been to too many movies. Hey, look, there's somebody. Hey, you! Sit here. Hey, you! Gosh, you're deaf to death. I told you, you saw too many movies. Hey, you! Just keep walking down the hall. Well, he's not dead, anyhow. Maybe he's a zombie. You've been to the movies once or twice yourself, Inspector. Come on, let's go after him. Hey, you! What's the matter? Can't you hear? Hey, wait a minute, you. Grab him, Rollins. I got him. What are you looking so startled for? We called you. Hey, Inspector, I was right. Guy's dead. Yes, you're right. Hey, you. Can't you talk? Look, look like this. I move my mouth. Talk. 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 Yes, I'm dumb, Inspector. I got it. Give me a pad and pencil. Sure. 
I'll write notes to this guy, and he can write back to me. Here. What if he can't write? Then I'll make him your boss. Get lost, will you, Rollins? Have a look around and see what's in the rest of the house. Sure. All right. You and I are going to have a little spelling bee. Can you write? No, oh, never mind. I'll just write out a question and see if you can write the answer. Does Sam Bellows live here? Now take a look at this. Well, I hope a nod means yes. You'll have to write this answer, though. Who are you? Here, now you write. I am the maintenance man, but I know nothing. You want to see Frank Lewis, Mr. Bellows' financial advisor, or Larry Addington, his nephew. Okay, I can remember that. Don't look so pained. I'll pick the paper up off the floor before I leave. Hey, Inspector Faraday! What's the matter, Rollins? Come here, quick. Okay. I don't leave here, you. <laughs> As if you could hear me. What's up, Rollins? There's something that ought to be sort of interesting, Inspector. Well, Blackie's confession was the truth, huh? Sam Bellis. Sitting in his big red wheelchair with a knife in his chest. Sort of dead, too. Sure is. And I've got Blackie sort of dead, too. Right. <laughs> well, thanks, Mary, for a wonderful evening. You're sure you don't mind if I leave Happy here in your apartment overnight? Oh, of course not, Charlie. He's a lovely dog. And he seems to like it there in my kitchen. Well, thanks, Mary. And thanks for the wonderful evening, too. And thank you for the wonderful dinner. And thank me for just tagging along, I suppose. Oh, now, I am not expecting anyone. Well, let's see who you are not expecting. Ah, last, it is my secret lover. I confess all. Oh, come, <laughs> come. Yes? Hello, Miss Presley. Inspector Faraday. Some secret lover. Blackie oh, here? Yes, yes, come in. He was just leaving. Well, the pleasant part of the evening is over. You're here, Inspector. What do you want? You, Blackie. Mary's got a priority. Thank you, sir. Uh, Faraday, this is Charlie King. How are you? How do you, Inspector? I think we met on the phone several weeks ago. Oh, that's right. So you did. I hope you enjoyed yourself this evening, Blackie, because it's the last fun you're going to have for a long time. Why? Are you resigning from the force? I'm arresting you for murder, Blackie. Now, who did I kill? Sam Bellows. What? I... Blackie, you said you didn't see him. I didn't. Oh, no, of course not. And how'd you know he'd be found dead? Was he? He was. Come on, Blackie. I'm taking you down to headquarters, Faraday. Don't be stupid. And put that gun away. I'll put it away when you're tucked away. In jail. Come on. All right, Inspector. You win. But let me get my raincoat, will you, from the kitchen? Oh, no, you don't. But all I want to do Go is... Go into just... the kitchen and duck out the back way. But, yeah. Inspector, I promise I'll you... I'll get the... your raincoat for you. Which is the kitchen door? Blackie, happy as you know. Yes, I'm happy about the whole thing, too. <laughs> uh, don't worry, Charlie. Oh, so everybody's happy, huh? That's fine. Now, which is the kitchen door? That one. Now, don't move, Blackie. I still have a gun on you. Yes, teacher. So long, Faraday. I'm leaving. Get me out from under this face licking pony. What? So you can arrest me for murder, huh? Nothing doing. I'm leaving, Faraday. But I've got an idea, though. Fight him. At least that news. <laughs> And now back to Boston Blackie. For a reason he chose to keep to himself, Charlie Kingston, Blackie's millionaire friend, asked Blackie to do anything in his power to see and talk to a man named Sam Bellows. Unable to break into Bellows' home, Blackie came to Inspector Faraday with a story that he had killed Bellows in his home and should be taken to the scene of the crime. But Faraday suspected Blackie's confession was a trick and went to Bellows' home alone. There he found Bellows, murdered. Faraday then tried to arrest Blackie for murder, but Blackie, as usual, escaped. It is early the next morning. As we return to our story, Blackie and Charlie Kingston, dressed as policemen, are climbing the steps of Sam Bellows' house. Are you sure we'll get by the policeman at the top of the stairs? Look at your clothes. 
Wear policemen, too, remember? Mm-hmm. Won't this police guard recognize you? Not with a visor in my cap, Paul Dan. Good morning, boys. Expect to send you to relieve us? Uh, the relief men are coming up in a few minutes. Uh, Faraday sent up for some uh, special detail, okay? Sure, sure. Go on in. Come on, Charlie. All right. Hey, wait. I'll open the door first. Thanks. Eh, uh, who else is here? Only Thompson. He's upstairs. Okay, thanks. Well, that wasn't hard, was it? No, but I'm not used to this sort of thing. You'll live longer if you don't try to get used to it, Charlie. Let's have a look around. What do you expect to find? Something that will lead us to Bella's murderer and take me off the spot. Well, let's hope we find it. Say, hey, Charlie... Look at this crumpled paper on the floor. Yeah. Seems to be a note of some kind. Let's have a look at it. There seems to be two different kinds of handwriting on it. As as if one person were asking questions and the other answering them. Faraday wrote the questions. I know that scrawl of his anywhere. Who wrote the answers? Someone who calls himself a maintenance man. He says he knows nothing but mentions a financial advisor named Frank Lewis... And a nephew, Larry Addington. I see. Faraday obviously met someone here in this house who could neither hear nor talk and had to write everything down. Uh, I suppose this information is useless, sir. Not at all. A nephew and a financial advisor might be a perfect combination for a murder. I think I'll go up and see that advisor as soon as we're through here. Mm-mm. Someone's coming in the front door. Probably the relief gun. That special detail you sent in the house now, Inspector Faraday. Oh. Special detail? What are you talking about? Oh, this is fine. Come on, Charlie, out the back door. What if there isn't a back exit? Well, in that case, we'll get up speed, put our heads down, and make one. Yes? Frank Lewis? Yes. I'm Special Police Investigator John Jones. You were Sam Bellows' financial advisor, weren't you? Yes, I've had one visit from the police this morning, Inspector Faraday. I told him everything I could. Faraday sent me back to ask a few more questions, if you don't mind. Well, I mind because I'm busy, but I suppose there's nothing I can do. What else do you want to know? More about the will. I told Inspector Faraday everything I know. The night before last, Bellows changed his will. Formerly, the entire estate was to be left to Larry Addington, his nephew with the exception of 5000 to Ben Atkins, the deaf and dumb handyman in Bellows' home. Who did the new will benefit? Atkins again for $5,000, but instead of the remainder of the estate, about $100,000 being left to the nephew, Bellows chose to leave it to some charity, a dog and cat hospital. Any reason for doing this? Just so his nephew wouldn't get it. Cigarette? No, thanks. Don't mind if I smoke? Of course not. You say the will was changed the night before last, and Larry Addington, the nephew, was cut out. Did Addington know this? I don't see how it was possible. Bellows and his nephew seldom spoke to each other. Then it's possible, isn't it, that Addington killed his uncle thinking he'd get his money? Possibly. He's in constant trouble living above his means. He needs money. Say, you smoke more of a cigarette than I thought. Why do you say that? Leave cigarettes in this ashtray here. I doubt if they've been puffed more than two or three times. Oh, they were left there by a client of mine who was here just a few minutes ago. Never, sir. Very. Look what he does to paper matches, takes the ends and rips them up the middle. Is there anything else I can tell you about the Sam Bellows matter? Yes. Where can I get in touch with Larry Addington? Larry lives at the Baker house. Thanks. You think Larry might have killed his uncle, believing he was still mentioned in the will? Yes, I do. And I have an idea that you're a little leery of Larry yourself. You have to stand still, Mr. Addington. Well, hurry up, will you, Martin? I'm trying to hurry, Mr. Addington, but I can't face the coat. You don't stand still. I don't like to stand still. Oh, we're going to be interrupted again. Come in. Tom, I told you not Larry to... Larry Addington in here? I'm Larry Addington. Good. I'd like to talk to you. Yeah, some other time. I'm busy having a fitting. Did my man let you come in here? Please, Mr. Addington, stand still. Uh, where do you intend going in that tweet, Addington? To a racetrack? Uh, your opinion is uncalled for, and so is your presence. Here, yeah, Mr. Addington, how do you like the way the coat hangs now? Oh. Well, I guess so. Why all the new clothes, Addington? Anything wrong with a few new suits? Since my uncle was killed, I'm rich. Are you? Yes, yes, I, uh... <laughs> 
want to look the part of a man who's just come into a fortune. Well, look the part if you want to, Addington, but you haven't come into a dime. <laughs> Wait till you read the paper. <laughs> Wait till you read the will. My uncle left his money to me. Uh, Mr. Martin. Yes? Don't just stand there. I don't have all day. Oh, I was interested in this man's remark about your uncle's will. What remark? Well, uh... Forgive me, but he said... I said uh, Addington here was completely cut out of his uncle's will. What? That's not true. I saw my uncle's will last week. Well, you should have seen it last night or the night before last, just before he was killed. He changed it? He made a slight amendment, Addington. He cut me off? Without a cent. How do you know? I just talked with Frank Lewis. He was your uncle's financial advisor. Why would he tell you anything? Uh, I have what you might call a slight interest in your uncle's murder... You aren't suggesting that If I... someone had suggested to you that your uncle was going to change his will, you might have killed him before he had had a chance to change it. I didn't know his will was going to be changed. That'll be hard to prove. Uh, well, just try to prove I killed him. You know something, pal? That's exactly what I'm going to do. Charlie, this is Blackie. Yes, Blackie. Mary said you were going to see Bellows' financial advisor or the nephew, Addington. How have things worked out? All right so far. I just left the nephew. Is he your man? I don't know. He thought he was going to get his uncle's money, so he might have killed him. The person we've overlooked is the deaf and dumb handyman Faraday found in the Bellows' house when he discovered the body. How could he be involved? He was left $5,000 in every will Bellows wrote. He might have discovered that Bellows had cut the nephew off and killed his employer, thinking maybe suspicion would be all on the angry nephew. Well, I suppose a man of his means would kill for 5000 wouldn't he? Charlie, there have been murders for five cents. I think I'm going to get some more dope on that handyman. But Blackie, you can get back into Bellow's house. Faraday will have his policeman checking everyone who comes within a block of the place. Now, I know it. I've been ducking Faraday so much today, I'm getting stoop-shouldered. <laughs> Is Mary there? No, no, she isn't. I thought I could send her into Bellows' house as a, oh, well, a, say, a newspaper reporter. She could get by Faraday's men with, with dark glasses and a new hairdo. I know where you can reach her. She just left here to take Happy down to the Mayfair Dog Hospital for a general checkup. Oh, thanks, Charlie. I'll go down there and meet her. Maybe I even belong with the dogs after the way Faraday's been hounding me. Something I can do for you, sir? Uh, yes. Is there a young lady here with a rather large dog? She brought him in for a checkup, I think. No, there isn't. This is the Mayfair Animal Hospital, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well, I guess I got here too soon. Mind if I wait? Not at all. Um, is there a, a chair or a, a bench around Perhaps here? Perhaps you'd like to wait in my office. Oh, thanks. Oh, this way. I think that chair will be comfortable. Thank you. No, I think I've seen your picture in the paper. Strange what papers will do for news sometimes. Yes, you certainly look familiar. Uh, I'm Seth Peters. Cigarette? No, thanks. Mind if I smoke? Not at all. Uh, there isn't by any chance another Mayfair Animal Hospital in town, is it? Not that I know of. Hmm. Mary and Happy must have been delayed on the way down here. Hmm, what did you say? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Oh. Do you, um... Always do that? Huh? Uh, take, do those, take those matches and tear them. <laughs> Nervous habit. I try to break it, but I can't. Oh, I see. Would oh, you mind pushing the ashtray over this way? Of course not. I'll put this cigarette out. How's your friend, Frank Lewis? Who? Frank Lewis, the financial advisor. I don't know any Frank Lewis. Why do you ask? That cigarette of yours makes me ask. My cigarette? Something wrong with it? Why, no. You put it out rather suddenly. Oh, I never take more than three or four drags. And you don't know Frank Lewis? Oh. Does he have the same habit? No, but you're lying when you say you don't know him. He has a client who does the same thing with matches and cigarettes. You. Well, now, here. Lewis said Sam Bellows left his money to a dog and cat hospital. I think if I looked at Bellow's will, I'd find that it was, uh, this place of yours. I don't know about that. You said you didn't know Frank Lewis. 
Yet you were up in his office this morning. Not true. The ashtray in his desk was filled with torn matches and cigarettes barely smoked. You own this place? Yes, I do. That doesn't mean a thing. It means plenty. It means you killed Bellows for his money and then went to Lewis to collect. The fact that he denied you'd been there makes him part of the scheme. Just because I own this place, you think I killed Bellows, huh? It'd be worth your while. Well, I don't own this place. I merely front for the man who does. All right, who's the real owner? Frank Lewis, he's the man you want. Didn't even know Bellows was dead until Lewis called me to his office this morning. Come on, Peters. You're going down to police headquarters. But I tell you, I didn't kill anyone. Lewis did. He forced Bellows to change his will night before last, then killed him. Set that story to music, Peters, because when we get to police headquarters, you're going to sing. Well, I guess that's about all there is to tell, Mary. When Peters got through talking, Faraday had Lewis in jail. That clears up everything, Blackie, except why you wanted to get in to see Bellows in the first place. Because Charlie here asked me to. I didn't know it was going to get you into such trouble, Blackie. Oh, I don't mind trouble, Charlie. But I do like to know why I'm getting into it. You never did tell me why you wanted me to see Bellows. Well, Bellows was an engineer in one of my plants a few years ago. He disappeared with some important blueprints. For business reasons, I had to find Bellows and recover the prints quietly. I thought it would be best to come to you. Well, we certainly had a quiet time of it, didn't we? (laughs) Hey, let's not forget that Charlie's dog helped solve this case. Yes, I suppose Happy did have a share in this, didn't he? Sure, I think Inspector Faraday should give Happy a medal. Or make him a member of the force. Oh, Blackie, don't be silly. How could Happy be a police dog? He doesn't even begin to look like one. Secret Service. Ooh, yikes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yikes.